uh, in the question and answer sessions which, uh, which is uh, at the end of each talk to make this program more interactive so without any further delay so let us all start the session one so i would request the chairpersons of the uh, first session dr sadhana ma'am hod department of microbiology aig hospitals dr ramakrishna sir professor medicity institute of medical sciences and dr shailaja ma'am hod and professor of pulmonology medicity institute of medical sciences to come over the dais and to start our the session academic feast for the next two days uh, so i invite dr praveen kumar tirlangi he is an dm in infectious diseases and is working as a consultant in department of infectious diseases in aig hospitals welcome sir and you are the first batsman now <clears throat> okay uh, so i am dr praveen thanks for that introduction ma'am thank you <laughs> So it is a humongous task to start with a microbiological diagnosis of tuberculosis uh, with clinicians, right? So the last thing I want to make you is sleep. So by the end of this presentation, all of you should understand why the microbiological diagnosis of tuberculosis is that important, and definitely you will know a little bit overview of all existing diagnostics. Uh, so it will be very relevant, clinically relevant cases and discussions, and how we are going to use these diagnostics. I want you people to be a little bit interactive. I have put some questions which are very very easy. even 10th class student can tell the answer so you should be able to tell also okay so the diagnosis of tuberculosis definitely it's not a uh, it's not a uh, rocket science most of the times when you see the patient clinically you know you you at least have, will have a uh, back background thought that it could be probably tuberculosis with the clinical history and then you will get a radiology which is supportive of tuberculosis then you do a biopsy which will show necrotizing or non necrotizing granulomas probably that is where you will be thinking a possible diagnosis of tuberculosis but what is that one thing that will confirm the diagnosis of tuberculosis that is microbiology unless you have a gene expert report in your hand which is saying it is tuberculosis mtb detected it may or may not be tuberculosis right okay uh, so what options do we have to diagnose tb we do a afb we do a gene expert gene expert ultra we do cultures both solid and liquid we take phenotypic sensitivity and we have line probe assays first line and second line we also have expert hdr right so many options we also have gene sequencing which is still in the research phase but it is very interesting so we won't be discussing more about gene sequencing but we'll discuss about each and every other diagnostic method for diagnosing tuberculosis the question number 1 will you ever say to your patient that you are not going to treat a life threatening disease for the next 6 months but instead you are going to give a medication that can cause psychosis neuropathy liver failure thrombocytopenia skin rashes joint pains and blindness yes or no no answers i will take it as yes probably so you people are psychopaths yeah so let us see first case a 48 year old male from west bengal presented with two months history of fever night sweat significant weight loss looks like tuberculosis recently evaluated and found to be rbd positive radiography was done which was showing generalized lymphadenopathy treated with empirical att which can cause all those complications i have mentioned for 6 months no response came to us biopsy it was showing a 2 to 5 microns budding yeast cells intracellular what is the diagnosis histoplasmosis so everything that looks like tuberculosis and feels like tuberculosis may not be tuberculosis 
there could be it could be many other possibilities there are many differentials tuberculosis can cause everything except pregnancy that's what we say right so there are many other possibilities uh, which can happen so only way to diagnose tb for certainty is microbiological diagnosis so if someone is saying i don't want to do gene expert then it is a crime okay L let us have one more question is it okay to give a poison that can cause liver injury and potential to cause liver failure if continued and i'm not talking about arsenic it is ATT, right so will you do that uh huh. Again, you people are psychopaths, yeah? Seriously. <laughs> so, 30 year old female underwent lab cholecystectomy. Post that, she, uh, she had a surgical site infection. Treated with multiple courses of antibiotics. Partial response. Finally, there was a sinus tract which was biopsied, which was showing AFB positive. Treated as TB. Is it right or not? Ob obviously, it is not right because there is no gene expert report. So, sh because she was not responding that well. Uh, biopsy was repeated and when we do a repeat, repeat biopsy we send a gene expert that and that is showing gene expert negative so if it is afb positive and gene expert negative what is it that is the first clue for diagnosing a non-tuberculous mycobacteria so take home message to all the things which are afb positive are not tuberculosis so there is no reason why you should not send gene expert or the brother of gene expert expert ultra interesting thing sometimes even nocardia can grow in mes mesit tubes okay so that is something which you have to keep in mind. So let us compare AFB strain with gene expert. AFB again, it's a rapid rap, uh, rapid diagnostics, but the limit of detection is 5,000 to 10,000 bacilli. That is the reason why the sensitivity is very pure, uh, very poor, hardly 10 to 20 percent is. Whereas gene expert can detect up to 131 less, uh, up to 131 colony forming units. At the same time, gene expert also gives our information about rifampicin resistance, which is very very important because depending upon the place you work. There could be a lot of percentage, like we have at least 10% of our tuberculosis patients who are MDR. So unless you have gene expert, probably you might not be able to tell whether, whether the particular patient is drug resistant or not. Let us compare gene expert with expert ultra. So there is two major differences. Expert ultra besides RPOB gene, which we detect in gene expert, also detects two insertion sequences. Insertion sequence 16, 6, 10, 61, 10 and 1081, right? So, because it is detecting large gene, the sensitivity is better. It can detect up to 16 colony forming units. The problem with uh, gene expert ultra is when you are detecting three genes, sometimes what will happen, the RQB gene, which is only are a small genes compared to insertion sequences, you will be able to pick insertion sequences, but not RQB gene. So, at that time, probably you might not be able to comment about uh, the rifampicin resistance, but you can still say that it is tuberculosis. So, it is tuberculosis, but you cannot comment about rifampicin resistance because the RPOB gene is not getting picked up. So, that is called trace call. Trace call doesn't mean that it is not TB, the diagnosis of TB is in dilemma. Trace call means that it is TB, but because the bacterial load is so low, we might not be able to comment about the rifampicin resistance and that is where we really need cultures, right? So, this is about the trace call. Case number three. 30 year old young female presented with fever, cough, and sputum for one month with significant weight loss. Now, AFB positive, TB PCR is positive. Started on ATT for one month, revisited to you at end of four weeks, still clinical worsening. So, probably you are thinking it could be iris, immune reconstitution, or probably INH resistance. But first time, you know, you got a TB PCR, which doesn't tell about your rifampicin resistance. So, I have repeated a, a sputum, which was showing. Rifampicin resistant detected gene expert. So this is one of the problem. We most of the times one of most of the hospitals are still doing TB PCR. So let me give one option. If I give these two cars, one is Nano, one is BMW X5, which will you choose for free? Someone asked me how will I maintain? Huh? So so basically, obviously, if you have any brains, like we will choose uh, BMW, right? And gene expert is done for free in government setup. So there is no reason really why we should be doing TB PCR. TB PCRs have to be they they are internally validated most of the times the lab has to validate and when you say do you have any publications which is peer reviewed they will say no and it is more prone to contamination because gene expert is more of a closed uh, system whereas TB PCRs may or may not be right and gene expert gives a vital information about RPO vision like uh, rifampicin resistance so you always have to send gene expert there is no place for doing TB PCR now. Case 31 old male presented with abdominal pain and weight loss treated with uh, tuberculosis. The radiology suggests for tuberculosis. First time when we did a biopsy, the AB is negative, gene expert is positive, and rifampicin resistance is not detective. 
so probably it is a drug sensitive tb on att right dose and good compliance sometimes people give a fdc combination single tablet a day which is bad right but this patient was on right dose and good compliance but after switching to continuation phase he worsened and radiology has shown progression at this point of time we are again thinking about probable iris or probably inh mono resistance so we aspirated the pus again this time it is afb positive and gene expert positive rifampicin is still since rifampicin is still not resistant okay so we don't call it as rifampicin sensitive because there could be some mechanism of resistance outside this rpo bgn as well so the typically the report says that rifampicin resistance is not detected now because this patient is afb positive there is one more investigation which we can do directly from that sample that is line probe assay now the problem with line probe assay is the limit of detection is very high it is 5000 to 10000 similar to almost afb sputum afb right so you cannot do line probe assay if the patient is afb negative and gene expert positive which happened the first time but the second time this patient was afb positive so we we have done a line probe assay which was showing a cad z mutation so we will discuss about all these mutations but the only problem with line probe assay is the limit of detection is high so if you are going to do a line probe assay, sometimes people do it in a sample which is AB negative and gene expert positive, but the yield, yield is going to be very, very low. So this is one of the major limitation, but the turnaround time, time is two, two days. So if you are not getting uh, AB positive, probably you can do the culture and you can do the line probe assay in that culture. That is the reason why when you send the uh, sample for line probe assay, you might get the reports after two months because they are waiting for the culture to grow. Right? case same case second time the pus aspirated afb is negative gene expert is positive and rifampicin resistance not detected so again this patient is not res responding and probably because he worsened after switching to cp where you stopped pyrazinamide you are still thinking about probable inh resistance but this time afb is negative probably you cannot directly do line probe assay probably you have to wait for next six weeks for the bacteria to grow in the culture medium do you have any other option to do here Anyone who can answer this question? Do you have any other option? So we have something called M uh, MTB expert XDR and this is beauty, right? The limit of detection is 130 colony forming units. So any patient who is gene expert positive, you can subject that to MTB XDR. The important thing is besides NH, it also gives the important information about quinolone resistance, ethanomide resistance and acid resistance. You can see the sensitivity and specificities. They are very good except for ethinamide because we are only looking at INH A mutation other there are many other mechanisms of ethinamide resistance so not great for ethinamide but who cares about ethinamide so quinolones aminoglycosides within hours so we usually do in our hospital we get a gene expert positive we call microbiology to, to run a mtb expert xdr this is not recommended at guidelines to do a do in drug sensitive tb but we still are doing in drug sensitive tb also and what we are finding is some of these patients are having actually quinolone resistance so this is very important because when you have a CLD patient where you want to avoid one of the hepatotoxic medication, immediate thought is to switch it to quinolones. What if that bacteria is quinolone resistant? So this gives a very, very good information. And this is really beauty. We, li we love this investigation. It's very, not very cheap, but it is okay. And it gives a very crucial information, right? So few more uh, clinical pearls I'm going to tell you today. So sometimes what you get when you do a, do a phenotypic sensitivity, so uh, it is it is MTB detected gene expert positive rifampicin sensitive and then you do a phenotypic culture sensitivity. What you found is uh, the bug is isolated pyrazinamide resistant. What does that mean? Which mycobacterium will have intrinsic uh, pyrazinamide resistance and it is detected in gene expert. That is mycobacterium bovis. There is a big clue here. Yeah. How, how will you differentiate I, iris from INH mono resistance? You are treating some patient deteriorating after one month. Probably it is iris. Deteriorating after two months, it could be still iris. But once you are switching the patient to continuation phase where, where you are dropping pyrazinamide and after that patient is deteriorating, think about INH mono resistance. Okay. Most of the times you get a gene expert positive report. But when you do a culture, you will be waiting for the culture, it will be negative. One of the major reasons for culture, gene expert positive and culture negative is a dead base LA. Probably your patient was already on treatment. Even though it might not, patient might not improve clinically, the drug concentration will be good enough to inhibit the growth of bacteria in culture bottles. Besides that, there could be many things which, which have gone wrong when you are transporting sample from the patient, when, when it is getting uh, uh, prepared in the lab, many other things which can go wrong. 
one more interesting uh, reason why there could be gene export positive and uh, uh, culture negative is sometimes is that sometimes when you have a bacteria which is very very slow growing it will sediment at the bottom so typically what we use is mj tube which is an automated tube which will detect the color change after the growth it will not be able to detect that color change so when you remove that tube from the uh, uh, system and you see there could be a sediment which is which is there at the bottom right so this is one of the reason why your midget is not picking up there is no no signal in midget tube but you still have gene expert positive so this is something which you have to ask the microbiology is it something like this which is happening in this patient so few more clinical pearls thanks to gautam for this picture so i will tell you about uh, i will tell you about how to analyze gene expert report so if you bug microbiologists a little bit more they will actually give you this gene expert report to you so here what you have to see is first thing is spc probe check and if it is detecting these are ct values i think after covid the ct value is not a, a great science everyone knows about the ct values so the principle is your ct values all the probes should be detected and the difference between the maximum and minimum ct value should be less than 4 then it is mtb detector rifampicin sensitive very easy so this patient spc is positive all the probes are getting picked up and the maximum minimum difference is less than 4 am i right so this is tb detected rifampicin resistance not detected going to the second case again spc is detected one of the probe is not picked up probe d so this is tb detected rifampicin resistant not a rocket science easy the third report spc is positive you have ct values for all but if you if you see the difference between minimum and the maximum 36 is the maximum and 26 is the minimum more than 4 so that is rifampicin resistance this is how microbiology is going to give you the reports case a patient was initiated on cat1 att pulmonary tuberculosis based on clinical suspicion while gene expert report is awaited so the patient lost to follow up after few months he came with the report that it is saying that it is rifampicin resistant but the patient has clinically improved now what are you going to do switch him to mdr tb regime or continue with the same your guidelines say probably you can switch you have to switch it to mdr tb regime the problem is there are something called silent mutations in uh, gene expert so especially when there is a codon 510 512 515 16 and 18 these are the areas where there could be low level resistance to rifampicin so patient can still improve despite your gene expert reports showing rifampicin resistance the call is completely clinical what to do after that yeah one more case uh, plha someone thought that rifabutin will not interact so rifabutin was started in, in place of rifampicin along with uh, art and uh, again the patient gave the sample but he uh, lost to follow and after few months he is coming with rifampicin resistance but the patient is clinically improving the question is whether if someone is rifampicin resistant can still respond to rifabutin there are possibilities there are some mutations where the patient can be sensitive to rifabutin but can be resistant to rifampicin these are all these are all like uh, very very few patients individualized patient you should not be doing for all these patients if you get a rifampicin resistant report please treat it as mdr tb so one more patient diagnosed with rifampicin sensitive pulmonary cox put on att for 3 months good clinical response on the follow up the over jealous resident he did the gene expert again after on 3 months att and patient patient was improving there was a repeat gene expert i don't know why what for it but you know when the bacterial load is very very low there could be a false positive gene uh, rifampicin resistance with gene expert there's something to know so never ever do gene expert for follow up unless the patient is deteriorating and you are actually thinking about rifampicin resistance so i'll be telling a little bit more about uh, lpas as you as you can see this is the second line lpa where you are looking for uh, quinolone and aminoglycoside resistance very easy if you get this picture if you bug your microbiologist again they will give you this picture so the idea of lpa is conjugate control and amplification control should show bands tub should be detected this is a tuberculous complex which indicates that it could be tb or ntm so if these three are is these three are showing bands and nothing else probably that is ntm because you expect the wild types of tuberculosis to be picked up here right so the principle is all the wild types should give band and mutations should not give band so this this in this particular report wild type 1 2 3 is giving band and there is no mutant which is giving band indicates that it is sensitive right again similar again similar again similar so this is this is sensitive there is no resistance but for this for example this uh, wild types one of the wild type is not picked up so if you see any mutation then it is mutant 
but if you are not seeing any mutation still you have to consider it as inh this a fluoroquinolone resistance inferred that is what we called inferred when wild type is not picked up okay so this is showing a mute 3c d94 nyhg all of there are high associated with high level if, um, uh, quinolone resistance so here you probably you cannot use either levofloxacin or high dose moxifloxacin right so these are uh, this is this is all about the microbiological diagnosis of tb probably you people have enjoyed it but i will end this presentation with a single question you have to answer this question in the next one year there is my mail id you can mail it to me so in hiv tb you know that sensitivity of gene expert drops in hiv compared to normal patient that indicates the basilary load is actually less in hiv which is causing disease but at the same time you see the hiv patient is immunocompromised so what is causing the disease it is neither immunity or nor uh, tuberculosis you don't have to answer this i am not expecting any answers right now but you can think about it and mail it to me thank you i'll be happy to take any questions and uh, xavier was actually dr gautam's idea so i am giving acknowledgement yeah so any questions or comments i'll be happy to take i think uh, we'll have the questions at the end of the session yeah sure because sure. we are already behind schedule this is the first lecture so great thank you yeah we'll invite the next speaker next talk is uh, challenges and troubles shootings in the treatment of drug drug sensitive tuberculosis by dr ripriya reddy challa she is a, a consultant uh, in internal medicine aig hospital good morning everyone i'm dr haripriya consultant infectious diseases at aig hospital uh, so my topic is challenges in drug sensitive tuberculosis uh, so i'll try to address all the issues once we start uh, seeing once the patient is started on uh, treatment for drug sensitive tb you may be thinking what's the big deal with drug sensitive tb it is just uh, uh, two months of hrz d and uh, four months of hre from as per the national guidelines of india but it's not that once you start uh, seeing your patients in opd uh, once you start uh, the patients will come uh, with all sorts of problems the gi intolerance liver injury skin rashes they interrupt the treatment they uh, and there are some special populations which which are to be addressed there are multiple drug interactions in uh, certain groups of uh, population uh, dr pravin was mentioning about iris we'll see what iris is when to suspect and how to deal with it and uh, what to do when even if it is a uh, there is no response to the standard regimen even if it is drug sensitive tb these are the things i'll be going to deal with in coming 15 20 minutes uh, the first thing being gi intolerance there are not really any guidelines or uh, uh, some uh, evidence based to what to do do if the patient is not tolerating once you start your patients on hrzd the first thing usually patient complaints is uh, pain abdomen vomiting uh, this ga intolerance if it is only ga intolerance without any uh, other systemic manifestations or uh, uh, af uh, alt or ast elevations you can just symptom at try and manage symptomatically or if if the patient is on fixed dose combinations maybe you can you can try and give uh, uh, you can stop the fixed dose and uh, try and treat uh, with the single single drug regimens if that is an op if patient is able to tolerate this is how we deal about ga intolerance in general uh, then coming to the liver injury liver injury so this is a full, uh, flow flow diagram from ATS, ats guidelines it is very uh, so they use they ask us to first rule out any sort of uh, other causes if uh, other uh, conditions that that may cause uh, liver uh, liver injury other than drugs so this is the um, how you monitor a patient for hepatotoxicity during the treatment of tb then you have to first see if the patient is uh, alcohol alcoholic if any other viral hepatitis or pre existing liver disease is there uh or, or any previous baseline how is the baseline lft so once you check the baseline lft then you they ask us to monitor the patients in uh, once in 2 uh, to 4 weeks but this this is also not very specific or uh, uh i can give you an example so this is one of my patients who started on on hrzd in uh, on september in september of 2022 he was doing well uh he was uh, mid october he was doing well for first two weeks and then he, on 18th of november his uh, 
LFT was more or less normal. As the guidelines say, we I've asked her to repeat it one month. This is on 23rd of December. See the see the LFTs. Bilirubin is 2.3, AST and ALT are sky high, 1000, 1100. So it is not really, we are not sure uh, how often or how frequent we have to repeat the uh, LFTs and see, but they say two to four weeks once you start on, and if the patient is, usually they are asked to monitor in the first two months uh, at uh, weekly. And this is after the patient HRZ is stopped and uh, patient is started on a levofloxacin, nethamutol and aminoglycoside. And after that, they on 3rd of uh, January, they, they are settling down on OPD basis follow-up. Patient is on uh, 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 aminoglycoside and uh, ethambutol levofloxin resumen. So, uh, they also drug-induced uh, liver, uh, liver injury. They define as asymptomatic and uh, more than five times of uh, upper limit of ALT. Or if asymptomatic, more than three times of upper limit of ALT, then we need to act. But uh, they usually don't comment on... Um, alkaline phosphatase or bilirubin but uh, I think we should change that view this is an algorithm or if it is uh, clumsy I will just go through it but if we, if we can try and uh, see we uh, if we can establish the pattern of the liver function we have to see if it is hepatocellular uh, both hepatocellular and uh, cholestatic pattern or if we are not able to actually establish the pattern if it is uh, only hepatocellular uh, enzymes that are elevated then most likely the cause is either isonazid or py pyrazinamide if both uh, it is hepatocellular pattern and bilirubin we have to stop all the drugs and if it is only cholestatic pattern that is uh, enzymes are being normal and uh, uh, only uh, bilirubin is high maybe the most likely causes rifampicin uh, in such patterns uh, you, we can just stop rifampicin in uh, this cholestatic pattern picture and um, uh, see if it if the cholestasis settles in uh, two weeks if it is not settling then maybe we have to discontinue all the ATT even the other ways in the hepatocellular enzymes when they are only hepatocellular enzymes are elevated with bilirubin alkaline phosphate is normal you have to stop isoniazide pyrazinamide and just monitor if it is settling uh, with uh, when you stop the isoniazide and pyrazinamide uh, then you can uh, follow the patient and uh, you can start reintroducing uh, if uh, once you have uh, you, once you are re re reintroducing drugs the first thing you usually begin with is rifampicin and ethambutol is not uh, not uh, a hepatotoxic drug so we start with rifampicin and ethambutol we follow three to five days we repeat the enzymes and then we add either uh, isoniazide or uh, pyrazinamide if it is very severe uh, impairment uh, they usually uh, advise not to rechallenge pyrazinamide the second issue being skin rashes so it can be of different types the patients may present with mild itching alone with the minimal rash locally or it can be uh, with systemic symptoms or it can be uh, associated with thrombocytopenia or it is a drug hypersensitivity rash like that is a, uh, drug reaction with isnophilia and systemic symptoms there are, uh, huge uh, variation in the skin rash after starting uh, ATT. It, it is usually seen in about 6% of patients on ATT. Uh, there can be any type of uh, skin rash. And uh, the most severe syndrome is exfoliative dermatitis and uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. Uh, the propensity of drugs is like pyrazinamide greater than uh, streptomycin, more than ethambutol, more than rifampicin, and more than uh, isoniazide, with pyrazinamide rates being 2.4%. So, uh, if, if it is a Steven Johnson syndrome, uh, it, it, it can be life-threatening and we have to suspect when there is mucosal involvement and systemic symptoms and fever along with the rash. Uh, so if you are if it is a rash with the thrombocytopenia maybe you have to think of a rifampicin uh, is as a likely culprit and when there uh, you have to stop all the att and when the rash substantially improved uh, you can restart the individual drugs at an interval of 2 to 3 uh, usually rifampicin is restarted first followed by uh, inh or pyrazinamide and ethambutol if the rash reoccurs, the last uh, added drug is stopped, and then that is uh, labeled as uh, uh, the cause. Uh, we have to. You can complete the regimen with either a quinolone or an aminoglycoside.
next coming uh, we have to deal with the drug interruptions patient usually stop the medicines on their own they uh, they feel like uh, drugs are not doing well or drugs are causing the problems they they stop and then again they realize they they need to get treatment again or they their symptoms worsen and they present with uh, to clinics and we have to see if we have to restart therapy or we have to we have to restart therapy or we have we can continue from where we have left so we have definite guidelines by the uh, cdc uh, for this drug interruptions so if uh, we have to see if the patient is in uh, uh, intensive phase or in the continuation phase if the patient is in uh, is the treatment is interrupted in in, uh, in intensive phase uh, see if the interruption is uh, if it is less than 14 days you uh, if it is less than 14 days you can uh, continue the uh, if it is less than 14 days and you have to just check if the patient if the initiation phase can be completed within three months if yes then we can continue from where the therapy is left if it is uh, we can't continue within the three months of sudden then we have to start the whole thing from first if it is more than uh, 14 days of interruption initial phase you start it again from first this is the algorithm for uh, interruptions during the intensive phase if the treatment is interrupted in continuation phase you have to determine so there is a certain number of doses that is required like uh, the total number of doses in intensive phase is 56 that is uh, two weeks and in uh, total number of doses in continuation phase is about 112 that is uh, that is about uh, four months four months so uh, when you are uh, dealing with the interruptions in continuation phase, you have to see uh, the total number, how much treatment the, did the patient finish. If the percentage of doses is less than 80%, uh, you have to uh, go ahead and discuss. Uh, if the percentage of, uh, uh, if the patient completed more than 80% of treatment, then you have, uh, the treatment will be based on the baseline AFB smear positivity or negativity. If the patient is baseline uh, AFB smear negative, pulmonary TB with baseline AFB smear negative, uh, so you can maybe further treatment might not be needed. Patient might have been treated by that time. If it is baseline, uh, if the baseline uh, is AFB positive, you have to complete the number of doses. If the patient uh, uh, percentage of uh, uh, treatment taken is less than 80 percent then you see what is the duration of the interruption if the duration of uh, treatment is less than three months you uh, more than three months sorry if the duration of uh, interruption is more than three months you have to start from the the whole thing from the first start the initial phase fr right from so you just uh, disregard the whole treatment he have taken till then and start again from hrzd if it is uh, interruption is less than three months you can uh, continue the treatment and complete the treatment so coming to the special populations uh, we have dealt with uh, what is what if the patient uh, start, get uh, problems after uh, liver problems after starting the injury but if you are if you have a patient who is already a known cld how do you deal about it so it, this depends on the uh, stage of the liver disease uh, if it is child pug a or b or c if uh, if it is a uh, child A, if you can uh, still go ahead with two hepatotoxic drugs and uh, maybe you can consider rifampicin and isoniazide and uh, complete the treatment from uh, uh, extend the treatment to nine months. But some uh, there's some school of thought that you can still use uh, load pyrazinamide also. Uh, but it but you have to keep monitoring and uh, if it is chail pug b ideally only one hepatotoxic drug to be used you pyrazinamide is generally avoided we use either isoniazide or uh, rifampicin and the duration can be prolonged to 9 to 12 months if it is chail chail c uh, no hepatotoxic drugs can be used so we have to go for the second line agents injectables it ethambutol fluoroquinolone and you have to extend the when you are using uh, uh, these drugs we we may extend uh, duration to 12 months so in tb uh, with the compensated cirrhosis the proposed regimens are uh, two hrzd usually uh, but it is better likely to uh, it is better to avoid uh, pyrazinamide you can uh, give a uh, two hre with the quinolone or aminoglycoside and four months of hr or you can just give two months of uh, hre with seven months of hr this is in compensated cirrhosis if it is a decompensated uh, you can use isoniazide or uh, rifampicin with uh, with uh, ethambutol, quinolone or aminoglycoside and uh, you can just uh, prolong the treatment duration.
so coming to the renal uh, renal uh, patients so what you do what is the drug adjustment for the patients with renal failure so isoniazid and rifampicin doesn't require any uh, drug uh, change in the dosing for but for pyrazinamide and dithambutol if the creatinine clearance is less than 30 or if your patient is on hemodialysis you need to give the regular doses on alternate days so that is about uh, liver and uh, renal patients so coming to the hiv uh, the main aspects uh, with the hiv patients are uh, drug interactions and uh, tb iris and absorption and response with the, so all the all your as a as a thumb rule remember when you are practicing whenever you have a patient diagnosed with tb ask for uh, viral markers ask for his uh, hiv status recently i had happened to see a patient who has diagnosed expert proven uh, abdominal tb from lymph nodes they have done a biopsy of uh, uh, ultrasound guided biopsy they have proved the uh, lymph node tb in abdomen as uh, lymph nodes in uh, abdomen as tb they have started on uh, hrzd patient improved and after six months he comes with uh, pcp pneumonia and we diagnose him as hiv so it is mandatory that uh, you uh, do uh, you do ask for a hiv test and uh, uh, see his uh, hiv status whenever you diagnose a patient with hiv so uh, the drug interactions mainly uh, and the issue with uh, TB and HIV is you have to start treating TB first and then later uh, start uh, HIV, uh, HIV medication. Uh, likely the early the better, at least uh, two, two weeks after uh, ATT you start your ART unless it is TB meningitis. Then we, uh, in with the drug interactions, we uh, rifampicin interacts with uh, a lot of ART. You, uh, we can't give uh, protease inhibitors, we can't give... Uh, uh, TAF or we can't give in, uh, we can give instis with uh, double dosing so when the one thing you have to remember is rifampicin has a lot of interactions whenever your patient is on any other medication you try and looking for drug interactions that is the take home message and then TB iris uh, Dr. Praveen was talking about iris 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 we I'll just uh, deal with it in uh, coming slides and also the absorption and response is an issue some there's a school of thought that we have to prolong uh, treatment in uh, uh, HIV TB patients for about a continuation phase to be prolonged for about seven months and total uh, duration of TB it to be considered for nine months if the patient is uh, not responding uh, as uh, and also if the patient is not on ART specifically. The other group of patients are transplant hosts. Usually we see transplant uh, TB post uh, solid organ transplant TB uh, within the first six months if the patient is uh, not worked up for latent TB which we there's a talk on an entire talk on latent TB we can see and it is usual you have to keep in mind that there are drug interactions with immunosuppressants if you are giving rifampicin uh, without uh, uh, considering drug interactions you may actually uh, uh, the it will decreases the levels of uh, you may actually uh, be failing with the uh, therapy. So these are the whole list of drug interactions with uh, uh, rifampicin. Uh, not possible uh, to go through each and every, but you have to, whenever your patient is on other, this is uh, from the ATS and CDC guidelines, you can uh, take from that. Uh, this is the entire list of guidelines. There are uh, interactions with almost all. Dr. Praveen was mentioning no pregnancy, but he only earlier told it it, it can also cause pregnancy because it will interact with uh, your uh, OCPs, uh, oral contraceptives and also causes pregnancy. So you have to be very, very careful when uh, you are uh, uh, any other medication with uh, while with rifampicin. So coming to iris. Uh, what is iris? Uh, this is basically a paradoxical worsening or recurring of uh, pre-existent tuberculous lesions or development of new lesions on effective anti-tuberculosis treatment. So, it is usually misdiagnosed as super infection, treatment failure, inadequate uh, anti-TB treatment, drug resistant treatment or TB relapse. The, so, you have to be careful when you are considering, uh, when your patient initially improves, uh, as I mentioned, you have to think if it is isoniazid mono resistance or it is, is it a uh, iris each blaming other so criteria to diagnose tb it, there is an initial improvement both in symptoms and uh, under our radiological findings and there is a paradoxical deterioration 
at the primary site usually usually it happens in primary site or also it can happen at uh, new new locations or uh, absence of conditions that uh, reduce the efficacy of uh, drugs you have to rule out all the others other uh, conditions like poor drug compliance uh, patient malabsorption or any side effects you have to exclude other possibilities of clinical deterioration so this is usual even uh, if this is with uh, hiv patients once you start uh, art if the patient is already on a known att and uh, he's on att once you start art there can be worsening this is uh, called paradoxical worsening if the patient is not previously on att there is no uh, symptoms or signs of att previously and once art started for a hiv then the tb is newly diagnosed this is called unmasking iris even if there is no uh, uh, hiv the, there is as such worsening uh, tb iris as such is also a known entity the, the treatment part usually they respond to no, uh, NSAIDs or uh, corticosteroids, uh, biologicals there are case reports with treating with biologicals like thalidomide, TNF alpha inhibitors and uh, there is a PREDART randomized control trial which uh, says that we have to start patients of HIV if the, on steroids if the CD4 count is less than 100 to prevent uh, and it causes a reduction in 30% uh, in the incidence of TB iris. So, this is with the uh, uh, HIV and iris. Uh, one more special population I would like to mention is about uh, pregnant females. The, uh, the guidelines says we can... Uh, we can go ahead and give the regular uh, HRZD, but uh, if uh, a teratogenicity is a consideration, usually they ask to avoid pyrazinamide. But if you are uh, dealing with uh, severe, uh, severe uh, on life-threatening, uh, extensive disease of TB, they ask to uh, go ahead with HRZD without uh, replacing pyrazinamide with levofloxacin. That is one issue. And another thing is about uh, ethambutol uh, in used uh, optic neuritis, uh, which I haven't kept in slides. So. It, it, that is usually uh, seen in high, uh, high dose of uh, ethamital. The percentage varies anywhere between uh, 5 to 18 percent. More seen with uh, when the ethamital doses are higher, when the doses of more than 25 mg per kg are given. And once ethamital, uh, once ethamital uh, is uh, known to call, once the optic neuritis set in, they ask to abrupt uh, initial. Uh, at once stop the ethambutol. Some also recommend to stop uh, isonizid because it also in rare conditions cause optic neuritis. Uh, some about 30 to 40 percent in uh, patients in various studies showed the uh, reversal of optic uh, neuritis with ethambutol. Uh, that is about ethambutol. Uh, so what do you do when there is slow or no response in your patients even if they are known to be drug, sen drug sensitive like the susceptible TB but still the patients are not responding so there are many causes for this first you have to look if the patient is actually taking ATT properly compliance is the first issue you have to address when patient is not uh, uh, responding as expected so the con so there is we can go ahead and do therapeutic drug monitoring it, it can be helpful in uh, certain conditions when there is poor response to tb despite adherence and fully drug susceptible mtb strain uh, when there are gastrointestinal when there are gastrointestinal issues when there is short bowel syndrome or drug interactions hiv infections diabetes and treating treatment using second in these conditions you can use therapeutic drug monitoring this is a trial where uh, they have done the therapy a sample size of about uh, 300 odd patients in which about 59 patients 59% uh, of patients have a uh, low level lower than therapeutic levels of isoniazide and 52% are having lower than therapeutic doses of rifampicin on standard uh, standard regimens of it so when your patient is not responding properly maybe you can consider uh, therapeutic drug monitoring in this uh, in this trial the they've noted that a simple increasing dose of inh and rifampicin uh, the patients responded and they were able to complete treatment and uh, with good clinical response uh, in india we uh, we are doing uh, this therapeutic drug monitoring at uh, nrit in chennai so if you are uh, having any such problem you can actually send samples but the but it is to be collected uh, within after the doses are administered. So these are the new. Uh, this is the new WHO alternate uh, regimens for drug susceptible TB using four month res four month regime regimens. Uh, so these are based on the trials uh, uh, published in NEJM. Uh, 
So one is the four, uh, standard for six. They observed, uh, they studied a randomized control trial with standard regimen with the four months uh, regimen with or without moxifloxin, and only uh, in regimen with the uh, moxifloxin uh, rep uh, replacing from the rifam rifab rifamcin replaced by rifapentin, dithambutol replaced with the. Uh, uh, moxifloxin, the regimen, uh, four months regimen was non inferior to the regular regimen, and the, the other is in children, the shine study, uh, total uh, duration of four months. These are the uh, new things in drug susceptible TB. Thank you. Any questions I would like to take? Thank you, Dr. Haripriya. Uh, well, we've been informed that we can take questions for both the sessions. We have five minutes for that. So the previous speaker also. So anybody has any query, please go ahead and ask. Dr. Subhakar. <laughs> yes, sir. I congratulate the, both the speakers for their lucid talks. Uh, but because the postgraduates are there, I have to make some comments uh, about the treatment of tuberculosis in pregnancy is nowhere different. There's no need to stop the pyrogenum. I'm telling you, just don't. You can start the same regime, except uh, you can uh, only contraindication is uh, immunoglycosides because. So you can safely give those things. And the second thing is uh, that new regimes where there is a 26% of quinolone resistance in country, I think this is not the right time to start those four months regimes in India at least as in today. We reserve those drugs for the MDR-TB. We have a one fourth of the global burden of MDR-TB. Of course, Smalati is going to enlighten on, on those things. So. Just only for your theory lecture, you can write. <laughs> when the question is given, uh, you can write for the theory lectures, but not in the practice. <laughs> Two comments. Thank you, sir. I have one comment here. Uh, we see a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies promoting moxifloc for COPD exacerbations. And I am really against it because we lose one very, very major drug for MDR-TB treatment. So, in my own practice, I really don't prescribe moxiflox. So I think uh, this also, any quinolones, it's it's very common that uh, we see a lot of people writing uh, moxi, levo, everything they'll write. So we should reserve that for MDR. Like sir said, we have a huge burden of MDR tuberculosis. So I think as seniors, we have a responsibility to make sure that uh, PGs who go out after uh, post-graduation they should always st stick to these kinds of clinical practices. I'm sure Dr. Subhakar agrees with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, quinolone containing regimens are not a, a new thing, which we, we people are trying to do a four month regimen for a long time. Uh, if you see the Cochrane review, uh, which is published on the same, the data at the two years, mo there are more relapse rates when you are using four four months regimen, right? So this particular study, it, it is not at the end of two years in the first place, it's the end of one year where you might be missing relapses. Second thing, this is a study, a classical study which every postgraduate has to read because there are a lot of limitations in non-inferiority studies. In this particular study, if you see the per protocol analysis, you will understand that the resume is inferior but it is not non-inferior. So you try to understand what it is, right? So, uh, and again, uh, there is a lot of resistance but we have MTB HDR, we can see for quinolone resistance upfront if you really want to use four months regimen but uh, I, I i don't think we are yet there rifapentin will cause a granulocytosis in 20 percent of your cases loss to follow mucormycosis or aspergillus he will come to me here don't do that yeah okay Fine. i think uh, getting a rifapentin with a lot of efforts we have imported rifapentin for treatment of latent tb infection at least reserve that rifapentin for the latent tb anyway i'm going to speak on that so one more thing which I want to tell is that regarding the duration of the treatment, uh, Dr. Lavanya's, Aripriya's, uh, uh, you can extend the duration in HIV, you need more than no, HIV, TB also the same duration. The case to case, it is the clinician judgment, which case needs more. Some cases, suppose if the absorption is very poor, 
the therapeutic drug levels are very low, then we may have to extend it. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment uh, on the diagnosis of TB. Uh, it's very important to send uh, everything like for culture also, just don't turn gene expert and stop there. Because we have seen uh, at least two cases where gene expert was negative and after about six weeks the uh, TB culture had come positive. So it is important to send all modalities, right? And also um, if the re uh, resistance is not detected, uh, but then your patient is not responding uh, what do you do? <laughs> there may be some, all the genes uh, are not included. There may be some genes, uh, you know, uh, which, which are causing resistance and which are not detected. So I think you should uh, think in that angle. Uh, at that time, if you have a culture, maybe you can do the uh, phenotypic susceptibility and then you would know. All genes are also not expressed. You may still have a phenotypic susceptibility. That is one important thing. And also when you get a lot of tissues, uh, very often we get uh, trace detected uh, because the it is not uniform, uh, the AFB are not uniformly distributed li like in a ball sample or sputum. Uh, and once we get it as trace detected, they would ask, uh, can you repeat it again? Uh, if it, it is not repeatable also. Uh, so, but once it is positive, uh, you should take it as positive uh, because a false positive gene expert is very rare. Yeah. I just wanted to make that. I have one question. So, how are we going to treat a case someone who has a malabsorption syndrome? Yeah. So, so the uh, drugs that you're going to put them. That's on? a nightmare to treat someone who is having malabsorption syndrome in the first place. The drugs you give might not get absorbed, right? So, one way of one of the reason why they are not getting absorbed is the involvement of GA with tuberculosis itself. That is the patient which I like to manage because what we will do is we'll augment the ATT along with some IV ATT, levofloxacin, lanizolid, and amikacin. Then once the TB starts responding in the gut, uh, the patient will start improving even with uh, when you switch back to oral regimen. So probably that is the way, but there is no clear answer. If you are saying if the patient is celiac disease or amyloidosis, I think it, uh, that uh, the primary cause needs to be treated along with TB. Do we have any IV drugs? No, Sorry? IV, IV anti-TB drugs available in India? Ah, yeah, levofloxacin, linozolid, and amicacin are three drugs which we can give IV. Rifampicin is not available in India, but there is IV rifampicin formulation. Okay. And the other thing is like the doing drug levels is fancy thing, right? You can always do a serum drug levels and see and adjust the dose. But the studies, whatever we have done, 10 mg versus 20 mg per kg rifampicin, there is no significant benefit. But see, the history of rifampicin is rifampicin used to be a very costly drug when it was, when it was produced. So 10 mg per kg, that is 600 mg of rifampicin is the least possible dose which is effective against TB. So to avoid that cause that is the dose fixed 600 mg because we cannot give 900 ml rifampicin is a safe drug unless the patient develops hepatitis of course but rifampicin a higher dose of rifampicin is still a possibility right so don't uh, think that 600 mg is some flat dose that is because the cost of the rifampicin it was very high in 60s i think that is when they decided we'll put it as a least possible successful dose so you can still increase the dose uh, that is something you can do you can do drug levels but these are all in research phase it's a very difficult case to manage if you have a malabsorption. Uh, Madam, regarding the trace uh, detected yeah. is more common with the gene expert ultra. Once the gene expert ultra has come. Yeah, especially from are, tissues. Yeah. yeah, tissues. And also in the tissues. Yeah. So as you rightly said, once it is detected, it is detected. Yeah. That is, but if you are interpreting the rifampicin resistance uh, in a trace, you don't. Yeah, usually don't it doesn't. Uh, it says indeterminate, yeah. actually. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so don't use that uh, yeah. Yeah, trace detected, rifampicin resistant detected, don't read. Uh, no, it, it never gives actually the gene expert. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, yeah, ultra you have three sequences, sensor sequence and then RPOB. If uh, RPOB is not getting picked up, you cannot comment on rifampicin uh, resistant. Yeah. That is the thing of trace, trace, trace never yeah. gives actually. Yeah. Gene expert will not, n will not give trace fall. The gene expert yeah. ultra will give. Yeah, it is. Fine. Yeah. If there are no more That's questions. Right. Any other questions? <laughs> PG students are sleeping here. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I, I know you people have a lot of doubts. Don't meet me outside. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So I think we'll go to the next speaker. I invite Dr. C. Sumalata um, for her uh, next uh, talk on treatment of drug resistant tuberculosis. Uh, she's an MD in pulmonology and her current affiliation is uh, she's with the National TB Elimination Program, uh, Directorate of Public Health and Family Welfare. Oops. 
good morning everybody thank you ma'am for your kind words of introduction so i think uh, i actually thank uh, aig hospitals uh, for inviting me for this interesting pndt uh, guideline session so before uh, going to the session uh, if all the post graduates are having your notepads we have a small exercise to do before i start the session so there is a there is a table where you have to identify all the anti tubercular drugs in the table within next 1 minute i have 25 minutes so 1 minute i can spare for you so what are all i just gave an example of rifampicin other drugs you can identify note down because i'll be asking 5 10 15 in terms of that and don't give me newer drugs we have enough newer drugs as of now Thirty seconds more. It is left to right and right to left, both the ways. Fifteen seconds. <laughs> Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Tell me how many have you done? Five and more. Oh, very nice. Ten and more. Okay. So let us see. So these are the few drugs. and one more drug which is not uh, you know marked here is pass okay so with this exercise we'll go ahead with our session okay yeah now actually my talk is made much easier by my previous speakers because they already told about uh, uh, different diagnostic technologies which are available so right now what ntp has in the program is all these tests gene expert or true nat the most peripheral point of test and uh, line probes and gene uh, liquid culture dsts at uh, higher labs where we have bsl2 and 3 facilities so what are we really looking at in cbnat thank you see in cbnat and true nat we are trying to know whether they are mtb and rpob gene so we have uh, when you when you observe in the previous talks also we were always talking about rifampicin so once you know what actually why are we talking about rifampicin your pmdt is made easy okay then when we, when we do have a first line lpa we have two drugs diagnosed in line, line probase i mean resistance to those drugs so one is rifampicin second thing is isoniazid with both INHA gene and CAD gene. INHA is a low-level resistance and an indirect uh, ethionamide uh, resistance. Also, it will tell, it will give you information. And uh, INHA, uh, sorry, CAD gene, high-level resistance. And second line LPA, if you see, you it has a class resistance. It says about fluoroquinone. It doesn't say about individual drug. If you try to decode gyrase A and gyrase B as Uh, told by my previous speaker so when you have mutation 3a 3b 3c in a uh, gyrase a mutation then you will be not using any fluoroquinone at all so i will not be going so much of detail because only i was because i'll be covering the treatment part so line probe said the turnaround time is 72 hours because it involves three steps okay and like liquid culture dst we have for the all the first line drugs and second line drugs now again coming to xdr which we were talking about so when when we read in our textbooks about what are the genes which are responsible for isoniazid resistance we read about 6 to 7 genes so but in our flnp we get only inha and cad g but other genes can be read in expert xdr if you see uh, oxidase redox test uh, stress in oxidase stress regulator and hpc and beta keta sl also can be read here and fluoroquinones also gyrase a and gyrase b okay so now what are the newer definitions and what are the tests we should have in our hand to say what type of resistance is mono resistance any drug resistance so we we all uh, in, according to the national drug resistance survey conducted a few years ago every uh, case i mean 20% of the entire tb patients are resistant to any drug 
it is not about rifampicin or isoniazid any drug let it be fluoroquinolone or ethambutol or any drug okay 28% in indian population okay so monorestin it could be a fluoroquinolone it could be a inh it could be a rifampicin so it could be anything so resistant to one drug is uh, monorestins h mono is resistant only to rifampicin uh, isoniazid and rif resistance can be identified in through and if that then we call it as mdr mdr plus fluoroquinolone is your pre xdr as per new york pmdt 2021 guidelines and mdr plus fluoroquinolone plus other group a drugs so if you see the group a drugs levofloxacin or moxifloxacin bedaclin and linazolid so if mdr plus resistance to all three drugs is is nothing but xdr that are the new york definitions so if um, we were speaking about you know how uh, in the case presentations so whenever sensitivity or resistance what do you do the next step so in the program also we have whenever you have done a nat and you know the result is rifampicin resistance not detected as shown in the green bar when it is not detected you can subject the second sample to the first line line probe assay and you can do subsequent investigations whether inh is resistant or not or and subsequent lpa can be done based on the result we get in the first line lpa but if you get to refamps and rest and you see the array of the examination of the results you do a first line lpa why we need a first line lpa we will be knowing in the next coming slides next is a second line lpa and a lcd st for all the group of drugs right now in hyderabad in our lab we are having for pyrazinamide clofazamine moxifloxacin and linazolid badaclin and delamide are in pipeline so our entire dogma of pmdt is in this when you have rif resistant and rif sensitive you know if you are sensitive you have to go for a drug sensitive regimen if you are inh if you are rifampicin is inh is resistant go for an isoniazid monorestin regimen if inh if you rif is resistant and inh is also resistant go for a shorter baraclin but you should see that both the genes are not resistant that is both cat g and inh if rif is resistant and all other additional drugs are also resistant go for it all are a longer regimen this is the simplest way to remember pmdt 2021 guidelines so what are the regimens we have so in inh mono resistant regimen we get the report through an flpa simplest regimen 6 or 9 months i am not telling it 6 to 9 months it is 6 or 9 months of levofloxacin rifampicin ethambutol and pyrazinamide whereas in rr rif resistant and mdr tb based on the criteria uh, whether uh, dst criteria or non dst criteria we either go for a shorter or a, or a longer regimen based on uh, duration also you can do give for 15 to 18 months between six years and next years it is compulsorily 20 months of and you have to have the results of flnpa slnpa and also lcdst for that particular cases so what are the drugs we have we have newer drugs bedaclin which is a bactericidal and uh, if you see the weight band less than 35 kg in adult also you can you have the dose of this jar so this jar contains 188 tablets so daily two tablets if they are less than 35 kg if they are more than 35 kg they can take daily four tablets for the first two weeks or accordingly next uh, intermittently of till 24 weeks so these are the pediatric dosages which are available with us this each jar contains Six tablets and each tablet is only twenty mg. So these are uh, 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 one one particular pediatric child will take eight jars of pediatric directly tablets. Okay. And delaminate is another new drug. This is also a bactericidal drug. Uh, this it is given right now in age groups of six to eleven years and more than twelve years. We can go as low as three years also. 6 years 50 mg bd 336 dose tablets total number of tablets and more than 12 years 100 mg tablets 100 mg bd 672 tablets in a total so let us go case so this are very simple cases 42 year old complaining cough fever cbnad is saying mtb rif resistance not detected and isoniazid resistance inh detected cat g resistance inferred what is the diagnosis i am not asking for anatomical anything what is the you know microbiological diagnosis 
yes louder please okay even slp all are uh, sensitive so what is the diagnosis yes h mono resistant so on, see either cat g or inha it is h uh, we will consider it as uh, inh mono resistant only okay we will subsequently do second line lpa also in those samples so what is the regimen it is 6 or 9 months of Levofloxacin, rifampicin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide. In case nowadays, you know, in the programmatic part, we have drug shortage or, you know, expiry or something of that issue. We can give this 4 FDC along with the levofloxacin in this uh, regimen uh, that is also acceptable in the guideline. Now, where do you give 9 months? When it is an extensive pulmonary disease, when it is an extensive extra pulmonary disease, or you when uh, subsequent when you do a second line uh, uh, LPA and DST. When you get an additional resistance, you give for 9 months. So, simple is this INH mono resistant regimen. Once after you start the regimen and every third from third month, if you are doing smears and if you find fifth month smear is positive in the field or in your hospital, please consider it as a failure of an INH mono resistant regimen. So, next example will be going to 4 year old female complaining of cough and fever, CBNAC showing MTB resistance. Uh, MTB detected in refresters, FLLPA, per is also resistant. Second line LPA, FQ is sensitive and the INH is also, I mean, injectables are sensitive. What type of case is this? Yes? Huh? MDR, multi drug resistant TB. So here we have resistance to only CAD G. Either INH or CAD G, not both, is, for, is eligible for. Shorter oral bedaclin regimen. So, what do we? What are the inclusion criteria? You should have rifampicin resistance detected. Inferred is there in the LPA result. So, inferred is also taken as resistance detector only. Suppose in INHA is detected or inferred, but not both. We will take it as uh, we will can go for a shorter oral bedaclin, and the FQ resistances should not be detected. FQ should be always be sensitive. Other the criteria child children we can give 5 years of age minimum weight should be 15 kgs and no his previous history of exposure like bedaquiline or levofloxacin or clofazamine no extensive disease no severe extra pulmonary disease pregnancy lactation there is a little discussion on that now what are the regimen and what are the drugs we have 4 to 6 months of bedaquiline levofloxacin clofazamine pyrazinamide ethambutol hydrozyne and ethionamide and 5 months of levofloxacin clofazamine, pyrazinamide and ethambutol. So, this the, this is a all or none regimen. If you give this regimen, it cannot be modified because of the adverse reactions. You give this regimen as a whole or if you are making modifications, you will switch to the all oral longer regimen, but you will not make any modifications in the shorter oral bedaclin regimen. Right? Now, another case. 56 year old male complaining of fever, CB net MTB reflux strength, INH and CAG both are resistant. Second LP also showed FQ resistant. Diagnosis? Very good. Pre XDR. What is the regimen we can give? All or longer. How many duration? What is the maximum duration? 20 months. Yeah, absolutely. So, what are, so we already lost fluoroquinone there. Yes? Because if you see, we lost fluoroquinone. But the basic regimen is from group A drugs and group B drugs. Uh, all the three drugs in group A and all the two drugs in group B should be included to make a regimen. So, we already lost fluoroquinone. We will be adding, the replacing the drug or modify the regimen only in all oral longer regimen. So, how, what does it contain? 18 to 20 months of levofloxacin, bedaclin, lenozole, clofazamine and cyclosarine and duration is up to 18 to 20 months. There is no separate uh, IPNCP in all oral longer regimen as you see in H mono regimens. So, baraclin will be given for 6 months and will be extended beyond 6 months only in case when you cannot make a regimen with group A and group B drugs. So, delamidate will be considered as a all in a all or a longer regimen only that too in the initial 6 months not in the latter 6 months and uh, we will see one more case and then we will go to the next part of the discussion on of the all or a longer. So, 38 year old female complaining of fever, MDB detected, refrescence detected, both INH and CAG detected, SLLP FQ detected, NCDST showing resistance to linozolid. What is the diagnosis? 
next year so here also all are in long management but what are the drugs we launched fk is launched linozolid is lost so from group a we have only bedaquiline and from group b cyclosporine and clofazamine so we have to take group c drugs so that also we have to take in a sequence so this is the sequence okay you can remember as dapep d a p e p e p okay belaminate amic acid pyrazinamide ethionamide pas etamutol and imipenems or meropenems so uh, previously you were asking some questions now there are some iv anti bite anti tb drugs imipenems can be used is a last resort okay last question 38 year old female patient complaining of cough and fever mtb detected refractance is not detected nih and kg resistance not detected second line npa showed ref fq resistance is detected what is the diagnosis yes yes Uh, which mono resistance? FQ mono resistance. Okay. So we actually in the programmatic part we will deal in this as a uh, drug sense to TB and we'll treat him with a drug sense to regimen of four FDC only because we do not have any fluoroquinolone in our drug sense to regimens, right? So uh, it will be a drug sense to treatment only. so these are the few things which we need to understand now there is something additional which came up in the program is treating the contacts of the drug resistant tb anyway uh, that will the that part will be covered by dr subhaka sir also but uh, there is a small nugget which i wanted to mention here is all the index cases of that means all the patients where the contact investigation is surrounded uh, that you so for that if you, uh, you you should be an mdr Plus FQ sense too, so you should have your FLLP and SLLP report with you with you in your hand to treat the contacts of that particular patient. And in INH mono resistant also, you should have FLLP report so that you can treat the contacts. So once you see, once you have contacts from that index case, you have to uh, rule out active TB initially. So uh, counsel and screen the contacts. You should rule out TB if you have any symptoms of TB. go for tb investigation if you do not have any symptoms of tb if it is less than 5 years go for directly for tb tb preventive treatment as per the regimen of the index case if there are uh, more than 5 years go for tst and igra which we are doing in uh, right now in kammam where uh, we are trying to get all the drtb contacts uh, uh, igra test done so accordingly we will make the regimen suppose if it is igra negative we can go follow up him if it is igra positive we can rule out with x ray to still to rule out the active tb infection so here this is an another step towards going uh, you know to prevent uh, tb uh, infection becoming disease uh, we are taking these steps okay so what are the regimens we have we have 6 months of daily levofloxacin for all mdr or rrtb contacts whose fq is sensitive in the index case so all those who are aged above 14 years will be given 750 mg if their weight is 45 kg and less and uh, if they will be given more than 40 uh, 1 g if they are more than or equal to uh, 45 kg so another uh, dispersed uh, less than 15 years of age you have uh, uh, combinations and according to their weight bands and four months of rifampicin for all inh mono contacts age 10 years or older 10 mg per kg body weight age uh, age less than 10 years 15 mg per kg body weight suppose you know that mdr case your rif is resistant h is sensitive and fq is sensitive you can still use 6 months of isoniazid after ruling active tb infection in those contacts so these are the few important points in the pmdt 2021 uh, thank you all for uh, having an interactive this discussion thank you any questions i'll be happy to take that was a very nice presentation dr sumalata and uh, yeah uh, what is to be appreciated is you took less time <laughs> any yeah, any question you. yeah excellent talk ma'am um, 
So what is the role of expert XDR? Now it's available. Has it been included in the algorithm now? And uh, do you have any recent updates in the algorithm? Yes. Uh, so expert XDR is still under you know trial for us. So we already trialed around 20 samples in Kamam right now. Where we got, what, what, uh, what they're planning to do is, once we know the rift resistance status, then we will do subsequent investigations on the expert. So that is still in pipeline. Hope so, 2023, we might get expert cartridges also. So, all our machines, we are trying to color code with uh, those uh, expert uh, software also. So, we are still in pipeline set. But right now, uh, on expert uh, diagnosis, WHO has recommended from Government of India, we did not get the receive the guidelines. Because now, the cost is also not uh, prohibitive. Yes. Most of the hospitals and labs do it somewhere between uh, four to five thousand. Yes, and we get the report so fast actually compared yes. to line probe assay, yes. which we have to outsource it, and they don't do it immediately. Yes, they'll uh, allow for the samples to be accumulated before they actually do the line probe assay, yes. which yes. takes a longer period of time. Yes, sir. So we are very happy with the expert XDR. We are getting the sensitive to other things as well. That's yes. the reason why I pointed. Yes, Thank sir. You. Yes, sir. We we are we hope so. We'll get sooner. Actually, there are newer guidelines which are coming up. Is like uh, for PMDTs, uh, BPAL regimen, BPAL uh, M uh, regimen. Uh, that is, beraquiline, predominant linozolid, beraquiline, predominant linozolid, and moxifloxacin, which has very short duration. When you cannot give any of these regimens like oral, all oral, or shorter beraquiline, we can go for a BPAL regimen. That is still, uh, you know that is yet to come we have already started in mumbai and delhi probably we will we have only one case right of right now in telangana probably in 2023 we'll scale up these guidelines so it's, it's the third time i joined into the ntp program pmtd guidelines are revised probably next year before after you finish your exams you will have another guidelines coming up yeah i have a question yes ma'am bidocalin is not uh, available to all of us yes so we have to refer to your center uh, uh, thanks, ma'am, for bringing out that uh, discussion. So, if any private doctor wishes to uh, prescribe bedaclin for their particular patient, it, is, it can be given through program to that particular provider. We have uh, in this AIG hospital only, we have uh, DRTB care uh, in the OP setups and also in patient window shortly. So, what we do is when, whenever a DRTB case is diagnosed in a private sector and they do not wish to come to a public sector, they can also avail in the same private sector provided the medicines will be inundated from the government to the private sector. Even the diagnosis of uh, drug uh, resistant to TB, we don't have all the setups in all hospitals. Yes, yes. So, again, that is Again, the turnaround time and all. Uh, that's what, ma'am. Now, uh, there was a uh, you know, very good collaboration with the joint efforts for elimination of TB. JEET team was there for some time. Now, again, they, uh, they have come back with the PPSA team. Uh, they will they'll be again in the field. They will actually transport your second samples to IRL and you know, make them get their test done. We are actually have cut down our uh, turnaround times of all our uh, line probe essays and cultures also very shortly, um, not more than uh, 15 days as per the guidelines. So, we are working on that. Yeah, we will give ma'am. No, that is not a problem. So, all facilities, all the laboratory investigations which are there in the public sector can be available by both private sector patients and also public sector patients. So it is free and uh, available, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions? Thank you, ma'am. So our next speaker is Dr. Subhakar Kandi, who doesn't require any introduction, and he'll be speaking on uh, latent tuberculosis to treat or not to treat. Uh, now, like what Dr. Sumalata said, we do have prevention of uh, tuberculosis and household contacts who have been exposed to TB. So, Dr. Subhakar, I invite you now. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. At the outset, uh, I thank uh, the AIG hospitals for inviting me to the uh, PGCME. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Sun Pharma who are religiously conducting these PGCMEs for the last 10 years, uh, creating awareness uh, on various issues to the postgraduates and helping them for the preparation of their exams. So, we have seen the previous talks that 
all the talks are aimed at the disease. Now I am, my talk is aiming at the infection. So, in the 25 minutes allotted to me, I am going to discuss uh, what is uh, latent TB, what is the definition of latent TB, and what is the difference between pulmonary TB and latent TB, and what are the tests available for the detection of latent tuberculosis, and of course, uh, Vishwanath has given the title, should we treat it or not. And uh, if you want to treat, what is the evidence on the TPT, that is the tuberculosis preventive treatment, and uh, what are the various regimes available to us and with the dosages? Are there any contraindications for tuberculosis preventive treatment? And of course, uh, there is some concern of drug resistance if you give a, a monotherapy. All these issues I will address. So, the latent tuberculosis uh, is defined as a state of persistent immune response to stimulation by mycobacterial tuberculosis antigens with no evidence of clinically manifest active TB. So, it is only an immune response to an antigen. So, if you see the differences between uh, latent TB and uh, uh, pulmonary TB, so, latent TB is only diagnosed by a positive TST or IGRA result, whereas pulmonary TB, even though TST and IGRA is positive, but uh, it is diagnosed microbiologically and the chest X-ray is an important tool, sensitive tool, whereas in latent TB, the chest X-ray is normal. And one good thing is uh, this infection, uh, latent TB is non-contagious, whereas the pulmonary TB is uh, contagious and there will not be any symptoms in latent TB. In uh, pulmonary TB, we have the symptoms of uh, fever, cough, night sweat, and all those things. And if you do a, a testing on respiratory specimens, they are smear negative and culture negative, whereas in pulmonary TB, either they may be smear positive or culture positive, or of course, now the molecular tests are available, they can do. So, why should you bother about latent TB? Suppose if I have a latent TB, my chance of getting TB in my lifetime is 10%. So, there is always 90% of chance me having a not a disease, only 10% of risk of me having a disease, provided if I have no risk factors. Suppose if there are risk factors are there, like diabetes, you know the India is a, the capital, world capital for diabetes and also CKD, chronic risk, uh, kidney failure and of course intravenous drug use in northeastern states. If these risk factors are there, the relative risk is increased from 1.3 to 3. And if you see high risk groups like children below 5 years, HIV infection, again one tenth of the global uh, HIV problem is in India and uh, uh, the immunosuppressive therapy, we have a lot of people taking immunosuppressive therapy, the odds ratio and the relative risk of he getting a active TB from latent TB is 3 to 10. So that is why there is a need for a country like India where there is a high risk groups because in the light of ending TB by 2025, because you have seen all these years revised national TB control program. Now it is anti-EP, national TB elimination program. So you can't eliminate TB without addressing the latent TB because we have a big chunk of 140 percent of the people having a latent TB. So what are the tests available with us? There are testing methods that are available for the detection. This is mainly the testing principle is I told you the latent TB is an immune reaction to a TB antigen. So, we are using two antigens to detect the latent TB, that is ESAT6, that is early secretory antigen target, or CFP10, that is culture filtrate protein. So, the principle is one of these tests, they use either ESAT6 or CFP10. So, we have the, right now, I think you the MANTU test, which is a, a JOL test, 
एंड इंटरफ्रैन गामा रिलीज एसे टी स्पॉट टेस्ट टी बी प्लेटिनम टेस्ट दे आर सम ऑफ द टेस्ट व्हिच आर अवेलेबल द प्रिंसिपल दे यूज इज दे यूज द एंटीजन आइदर ई सैट 6 और सी एफ पी 10 इन सम ऑफ द टेस्ट दे यूज बोथ ई सैट 6 एंड सी एफ पी 10 पर दे सो माइंड यू दीज आर द टेस्ट दे कैन डिफरेंशिएट लेटेंट टी बी फ्रॉम एक्टिव टी बी सो आई हैव सीन सेवरल क्लिनिशियंस doing a late man to test particularly with due regards to my gynecologist colleagues they do a, a any case of primary infertility they do a man to test immediately if the man to is positive they are starting att so they always blame the tb bacillus for the infertility rather than their husbands <clears throat> so then the recent advance is the ctb test this is i think uh, soon they are going to introduce in the program the serum institute of india in collaboration with copenhagen denmark has come out with a, this ctb antigen this contains i told you there are two antigens are there for the detection of the immune response that is esat 6 and cfp 10 based test the advantage of this test is uh, there are a lot of cross reactivity with man to test and uh, all the drawbacks with the either man to test or with the igras these is this test will address and one more thing is particularly in immunocompromise the uh, the man to may not be positive here they have even the 5 mm positive can be taken as a soon the program is going to use this test for the detection of the latent tb so then the the major uh, title whether the uh, given to me whether to treat or not to treat uh, uh, latent tb so you know the hypertension will they have symptoms most of the hypertension will have symptoms they don't have any symptoms so why you are treating hypertension then why can't you latent tb why there is a debate whether to treat uh, latent tb or not when there is no debate for hypertension treatment both uh, can produce serious complications in death major disability and moreover hypertension is not transmissible latent tb if it progress to tb it will transmit this and treatment is for years as long as you live you have to take treatment for hypertension whereas uh, we have regimes of 6 to 9 months of course i will going to uh, the shorter regimes also so why there is a debate on treating i am leaving it to the answer whether to treat it or not after reading this slide <clears throat> this was a excellent article uh, published by meninger et al in the indian journal of medical research long back when there is a debate whether to treat latent tb or not so we have regimes whether really there is an evidence is there whether the, if you treat uh, latent tb with this uh, uh, drugs whether it can prevent active tb so there was a recent systematic review of randomized co controlled trials were done and they have proved that the 6 months regime with inh they have compared with the placebo it was uh, the there was a uh, uh, overall risk of tb has reduced by 33% so there is a strong robust data that treatment of latent tb has definitely prevents the active tb disease by 33% so the review also there was a debate whether to give 6 months 9 months 12 months if you give 9 months will there be any advantage will give 12 months inh will there be any so now the lot of data is available 6 months of inh is almost equal to a 9 months or 12 months there is no need for extending the the latent tb treatment with inh so 6 months will give the same result as 9 months and 12 months then coming to the new regime which was a, when somebody is asking that rifapentin they want to start for active tb please leave rifapentin to my cases of latent tb don't use that rifapentin for this in fact uh, i i was there in the drug committee of the government of india we have imported this drug to india uh, uh, for management of uh, 
latent TB. So this is a regime of three months of weekly rifapentin regime. So that means total 12 doses we have to use. This is a combination of INH and rifapentin and uh, they have come because some time back uh, we have published our data with INH monotherapy in when the latent TB treatment was there in the program below six years. We have presented uh, our data that only 30% of the eligible children who need INH preventive treatment were started on INH. Out of those, only 30% completed the INH treatment. So, why then do we have analyzed why this happened? So, because when there is a disease, you have seen a lot of treatment interruptions. If you have no disease, if you ask me to take for six months meticulously for uh, without having any symptoms, any disease, so naturally there will be a resistance from the people to take this. That is why the government of India has come out with a shorter regime of uh, INH rifapentin and they have compared with the INH six months daily with uh, this uh, weekly regime of INH rifapentin and the treatment completion rates were very high and they also saw because one of the problem with the INH is I think I am speaking in a AC Institute of Gastroenterology, the hepatotoxicity. So, for without having any symptoms and disease, if you give a INH, there may be hepatotoxicity. So, they also compared with the INH single uh, therapy for six months with the INH rifapentin weekly for 12 weeks. So, the hepatotoxicity was significantly lower in these regimes. And also, they have seen the, uh, the other adverse reactions are also low with this three months of uh, INH rifapentin regime, weekly ones. And uh, they have also studied whether this uh, regime can be used in pregnancy. Of course, uh, mind you, the program has not approved it for pregnancy, but the data is showing that the, the spontaneous abortions and birth defects are on par with a non, uh, no, people who are not on uh, this regime. So, it can be given safely in pregnancy also, but as on today, the program has not adopted this, approved this for the pregnancy. So, the clear advantage of these regimes are better adherence due to the shorter duration and fewer adverse events, the use of shorter refurbished based regimes is associated with a greater treatment completion rate. I told when uh, INH alone was given only 30 percent completed treatment even though this data is uh, 61 percent is not correct. It is only 30 percent completed the treatment. Whereas we have introduced this weekly INH rifapentin regime, the completion rate was 81 percent. Already I think so, similar to in some of the uh, districts in uh, uh, Telangana, they, have, they are giving this regime, particularly in Karim Nagar, they are giving these regimes. And uh, see, uh, who are the people who have to give? The, the older guidelines says children below 6 years, we have to give the TB preventive treatment. But uh, the new guidelines have extended the scope to all the adults and children over 12 months with HIV and non-HIV and infants less than 12 months with HIV in contact with active TB and household contacts of below 5 years of pulmonary TB patients, household contacts of 5 years and above pulmonary TB patients and children and adults on immunosuppressive therapy, silicosis when uh, uh, anti-TNF treatment is given when dialysis, transplants, all these patients you can do after excluding the active TB. The regimes available are 6 months daily isoinjet, 3 months weekly isoinjet and rifapentin and uh, of course this regime is uh, only approved for children more than 2 years. INH rifapentin is approved for more than 2 years. So, in HIV, I told irrespective of you have to give for 
the INH preventive treatment or INH rifapentin uh, weekly 12 doses regime. So, we have to exclude active TB. That is one of the major uh, thing we have to see. Otherwise, you are doing more harm. So, in a peripheral health settings, you do not have all the investigation to rule out active TB in HIV patients. That is why they have come out with this four symptom complex screening. Suppose if there is current cough, fever, weight loss, night sweats are there in adult, no need of any investigation, this patient is not a case for preventive treatment. In children, similarly, if there is a current cough, fever, poor weight gain, contact with TB case, if this is there, for all practical purposes, without investigating further, this can be considered as an active TB infection, do not give INH preventive treatment or INH rifapentin treatment. And uh, they have proved, the data also proved if the importance of four symptom screening, if there are four symptoms are pre present, the sensitivity is uh, 85 percent and of course, the four symptoms present means that does not mean they have TB, so the sensitivity is 53 percent. So, for programmatic purposes, in HIV patients, when in PLHIVs, to initiate uh, INH preventive treatment or INH rifapentin preventive treatment, you do this four symptom screening. If these four symptoms are present, you do not consider that case for INH preventive treatment. So, this is a algorithm what you follow under program conditions. Adults and adolescents living with HIV, if they have these four symptoms, if they are yes, investigate for active TB and if his active TB is there, start treatment. If they are, there is no TB, it is a non-tuberculous condition, treat accordingly and consider for tuberculous uh, INS preventive treatment. If there are no symptoms of these four symptoms like cough, fever, weight loss, night sweat, he is a candidate for this preventive treatment and give uh, the treatment. Let us see the dosages. So, INH, the important, I think you have the postgraduates are there. So, if the age is 10 years and older, the a dose of INH is 5 milligrams per kg body weight. If the age is less than, I think, 4, 4, 50, 4 minutes 56 seconds is there for me. <coughs> age is less than 10 years, <coughs> there is, it is 10 milligrams per kg body weight. So, this, uh, I am not going to this busy slide of dosage schedules. You can't remember these things. You can have this... Uh, uh, ready reference. Uh, so, let us see the difference between we have two regimes with us INH single drug and INH rifapentin weekly. So, let us see the difference between when which to choose. Of course, given a chance, always everybody chooses INH isogenic rifapentin. So, here the duration of treatment for isogenic single treatment is uh, six months, whereas duration is uh, uh, three months, of course, three months that too, weekly once, here is daily, whereas uh, INH single drug, you have to take 182 doses, whereas INH rifapentin only 12 doses and uh, if you want to uh, measure in the pill button, it is 182 pills if his INH uh, uh, monotherapy is given as a preventive treatment, whereas if it is a uh, uh, HP, if it is a FDC, the total is 36 pills. And uh, the toxicity, if you see, I have already told you the heptotoxicity is less with the INH rifapentin, but of course, we are using rifapentin, you can have symptoms like flu like syndrome. And the absorption uh, also is very good, oral absorption is also good. And uh, then we have cases who are HIV positive who are already treated with anti tuberculous treatment. If they come for follow-up, even though they took complete treatment with the uh, uh, anti tuberculous treatment, they have should be also be considered for this, the preventive treatment, because the chance of relapses and reinfections are very high, almost 5 to 7 times higher risk of recurrence. So, those patients with HIV who had already completed 
tubercle treatment should also be considered for this. Let us see what are the contraindications for uh, the INH preventive treatment. So, active TB, active hepatitis, signs and symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, poor adherence to cotrimoxyl therapy when the patient is TBHIV infected, he is not taking cotrimoxyl prophylaxis, we do not think that he will take this uh, uh, INH preventive treatment. Poor understanding of the uh, IPT by guardians, contacts of MDRTB, the, this is a, uh, already Sumalata has enlightened what are the uh, regimes you have to give for contacts of MDRTB. PLHAs who have completed DRTB treatment and are not eligible for IPT. So, the vitamin B6 supplementation should be always in every case of uh, when there is a malnutrition, uremia, alcoholism, diabetes, seizure disorder, HIV infection, pregnancy, you have to give this. And uh, the, the last point uh, is emergence of drug resistance following TPT. There is no evidence of significant association between development of resistance to INH or rifampicin with the use of these drugs for uh, TPT. TPT disease must always be ruled out before uh, TPT is initiated. So, regular follow-up to rule out development of active TB disease and you have to follow up them with when they develop symptoms to do the molecular test. So, why there is no chance of INH resistance when you give alone? Because when you give, when they are active multiplying bacilli, the chance of mutations are very high. In latent TB, there are bacilli, no bacilli at all. So, there is no evidence of uh, the INH resistance when you give this one. So, to conclude the the, the uh, INH to shorter reformation regime both in HIV positive and HIV negative. Isoinage based regimes will continue to have a role when reformations are not available and when the ch child is age is less than 2 years. Treatment options recommended for TPT once active TB has been excluded and uh, in children who have successfully completed P uh, uh, HIV P who have completed treatment also should be given a course of uh, tuberculosis preventive treatment. The standard dose of peridoxine for uh, when you are giving TPT is uh, 10 milligram per day in children and 25 in adults and 15 in HIV co-infected patients and TPT should not be withheld if there is no evidence of resistance to INH when there is. So, with this I thank you for your patient hearing and I take this opportunity to invite uh, those people who have come from other states, uh, Andhra and we are hosting the NAPCON 2023 Silver Jubilee. We all request to attend this NACPAN and make it a grand success. Thank you, sir. Any questions, please? <coughs> sir, I have one question. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, for most of the practicing pulmonologists, young and old, uh, we all we have been exposed to tuberculosis and our MONTU and our IGRA, everything comes positive. So, would you still recommend uh, TPT for us? This is a newer concept. When we had passed out and we have been practicing pulmonology, okay. we never took uh, Isonex prophylaxis. So, I think if you do a man to, I think some time back, uh, only for just to <laughs> experience, I did a man to on me when it was 32 millimeters positive mm -hmm. because having working for 30 so, years, more than 35 years in tuberculosis uh, hospitals, we will be positive, invariable. If you do in this uh, uh, gathering, 40 percent if you do that TPT will be positive that does not mean that uh, everybody has to be. So, if you are a contact of TB positive case, uh, healthcare workers are already their contacts. So, you should not uh, hold the general statement for the healthcare workers. For if he is a general adult pop, uh, the normal population who are not exposed to this, if they are a positive contacts then you have to consider like you said you were positive i'll mm. be positive mm. so should we take at this stage i don't think that's it not test i think you have to go today we have prepared a manual uh, of management of uh, 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 the tb and latent tb in healthcare workers so beautiful draft was written this how to but you should be under regular follow-up this you are, we are because we are exposed to this 
and uh, we should take all precautions also i see my postgraduate is doing a reg with the enthusiasm doing a bronchoscopy in all presumptive tb cases without n95 mask when you are doing a, 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 the bronchoscopy are directly in the root and you are particularly smear negative presumptive tb you are doing a bronchoscopy but you just use the n95 mask i think that's a real point which uh, all the students have to follow yeah. Yeah. One question. update, ma'am. Actually, so right now we are we are all we have started latent TB treatment in uh, Telangana, and we are doing IGRA test in government setup also in the Indian Institute of Preventive Medicine in Hyderabad. And every district they have their uh, district facilities where T hubs are there, where ELISA uh, machines are there. They are uh, doing IGRA tests are available in all the entire state now so treating and uh, treating tb infection is also part of the program and it is going very rigorously so that i just wanted to update no ma'am like we very often get cases like they are asymptomatic they just like sir said the gynecologist will do a igra or a montu and then they say that the patient has tb yes so such i had an asymptomatic young girl from uttarakhand or jharkhand some place and she was told you have tuberculosis and unmarried girl absolutely healthy with igra positive so i didn't have anything to offer to her no so, you igra positive why should you offer anything to her no i mean that is what she no, you are offering something to the all, all this audience 40 percent of this audience that's hmm. what i'm saying but hmm. they they are told that uh, you should be treated for tuberculosis and what is that the why you, the, is, is it only in the contacts of tuberculosis patients? So and only I, contacts of mere positive, no need for it. Only if he is a contact of positive case. That is the point. So the prioritization. So is the, we can't. We are not in a position to treat the positive TB. Uh, I already million cases are missing. I think the number has come down. So the, you, then if you want for a discussion, the, the discussion doesn't end. Are you ready for treating latent TB? You are not in position to treat active TB 100%. So whether you are, this discussion doesn't end. So. Right. Okay. Thank you. I think, uh, and no, no further questions. Somebody has a question. I think there are no other questions yeah. and uh, thank you. I, we come to the end of this session. So thank you very much. So now we come to the end of the first session. Now uh, I'd like to invite our chairpersons to hand over the token of gratitude to our uh, speakers. I would like to call Dr. Praveen Kumar Tidlangi. Dr. Haripriya, Dr. Sumalata ma'am, yes. Dr. Subhakar sir, Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Param Jyoti, sir, HOD Department of uh, Pulmonology, NIMS, uh, to hand over the mementos to the chairpersons.
डॉक्टर रामकृष्ण सर डॉक्टर साधना मैम डॉक्टर शैलजा मैम नाउ वील मूव ऑन टू द सेकंड सेशन Thank you, Dr. Gautam. I am Dr. Deepika, consultant pulmonologist here at AG Hospitals. I welcome you all once again. So, uh, moving on to the second session, we have two interesting talks. So, first, I would like to call upon our chain chairpersons. I request them to come on to the dais. Dr. Raghukant sir, Dr. Shrikar sir, and Dr. Sumulatham. So, Dr. Raghukant sir is a senior consultant interventional pulmonologist at Kim's Hospitals, Kachipoli. Dr. Shrikar. senior consultant interventional pulmonologist at uh, apollo hospitals jubilee health hyderabad and dr sumla tamam i don't think she doesn't need any more introduction she is now currently affiliated with ntep program thank you yeah now this very interesting topic that is phenotyping severe asthma and uh, because this will uh, change the line of management and what is the role of pheno uh, which is give the inflammation airway inflammation all which guide you the treatment in asthma which proper way so that uh, because many of the time the allergy itself is a very uh, challengeable like uh, keep on if there is no response then obviously they change the uh, line of treatment or doctor so this is more important this can be highlighted by uh, our uh, chief uh, dr paranjyoti sir uh, well known uh, hod of nims uh, will highlight and report this what is the role of fno and what is the type of phenotyping in severe asthma sir hand over to you oh good morning everyone thank you chairpersons for the invitation and uh, at the outset i would like to congratulate dr vishwanath and the team aig for uh, organizing this wonderful uh, cme and also thank uh, sun pharma for uh, their uh, sponsorship in the next few minutes i will be talking to you on uh, severe asthma phenotype but before we go to severe asthma few slides quite a few slides in fact on asthma so we'll go to the definition of asthma asthma is we know it's a chronic inflammatory airway disease and there is significant airway remodeling that happens in the airways of an asthmatic patients earlier it, we thought that it was just a single disease but with the concept of asthma syndrome you know that there are various key clinical characteristics uh, which are confined under the umbrella of term asthma so asthma is now an umbrella term under which there are many many key clinical characteristics and these clinical characteristics includes the domain of lung functions the domain of symptoms and the domain of exacerbations of an asthma and the newer inflammatory concepts of t2 asthma t2 high and t2 low asthma thus there is a paradigm shift in defining asthma from a single disease to a disease which is very complex and heterogeneous this is a schematic representation of what i have already said asthma is an umbrella term under which there are so many key clinical characteristics the main domains of asthma management include the symptomatology the exacerbations and lung functions and the 
key to understanding and managing severe asthma is to understand the inflammatory phenotype that is T2 high and T2 low asthma and that's how you have very many phenotypes. A combination of these things will result in very many phenotypes of asthma. So what is a phenotype? Phenotype is an observable property of an organism that are produced by interactions of the genotype and environment. So it's a complex interaction between the genes and the environment that will result in certain physical characteristics that is called a phenotype. Endotype is a specific biological pathway that explains the observable properties of a phenotype. So the pathogen biologic mechanisms underlying the phenotype is the endotype. And what is a biomark? Biomarker is a characteristic that is measured as an indicator of it's an indicator of either a normal biologic process or a pathogenic processes or response to an exposure or intervention including therapeutic intervention. So these are the three terms that we keep using when we are talking about severe asthma, phenotype, endotype and biomarkers. Now the asthma is not a single disease but has various inflammatory phenotypes starts with this paper published in Respirology in 2006 by Simpson, where they have studied the sputum of asthmatic patients and they have come to a conclusion that asthma has various inflammatory subtypes that includes neutrophilic asthma, eosinophilic asthma, mixed granulocytic and positive granulocytic. So that's how they have divided asthma patients into four different inflammatory subtypes. Sorry. Next came this Cluster analysis involving 726 patients from the SARP cohort. There, they have divided asthmatic patients into five different groups depending on the age of onset of asthma, the number of drugs required to control the asthma symptoms and the lung functions. So they have divided them into five different groups and they have also studied the sputum eosinophils of asthmatic patients and they have emphasize the importance of inflammatory phenotypes depending on whether it is asthma or eosinophilic asthma or neutrophilic asthma. Then came this paper in 2016 where they have studied the endotypes of asthma that is the type of inflammation that happens in asthmatic patients as we understand today. This is the first publication T2 high and T2 low. Actually, they said TH, those days it was TH, now we understand it is T only. Why it is T, we will come to it later, but it was TH2 and TH uh, high and TH2 low asthma. TH2 high manifested by increased eosinophils in sputum and airways of the patients and T, TH2 low is increased neutrophils or positive granulocytic. And this classification of uh, TH2 high, TH2 low and along with biomarker identification led to the uh, personalized prior precision medicine in treatment of severe asthma. Now where do this uh, T2, uh, TH2 cells come from? When the airways of an asthmatic patients are exposed to allergens, the, allerg the antigens are taken by the dendritic cells and these dendritic cells they present these antigens to the naive T cells and, and then the different T cells come into play and uh, SAT6, SAT6 is one which is uh, mediated by IL-4, 5 and 6, that's how you have eosinophilic asthma. So TH2, that's how you get, so it's not TH2 anymore, it's true T2 because it's not TH2 cells alone that come into play because we have innate lymphoid cells also. TH Two cells are the adaptive immunity, whereas uh, innate lymphoid cells are from the innate uh, immune system. So the immune ILC2 and TH2 together will cause T2 high or T2 low inflammation of the airways. So the innate lymphoid uh, system, that is innate immune system, uh, is relatively steroid resistant, contributes to IL-5 production and thus contribute to airway hyper-responsiveness and remodeling of the asthmatic airway patients. So finally, we have come to T2 high and T2 low asthma. T2 high asthma is 
most of the severe asthmatic patients have this T2 uh, inflammatory phenotype, T2 high phenotype, and most of them are steroid responsive. Majority are eosinophilic, or it could be atopic, a combination of atopy and eosinophilic, and they respond to T2 inhibition. On the contrary, T2 low asthma is they are less severe. They are poorly they poorly respond to steroids. There is absence of eosinophilia, and they are usually linked to obesity or neutrophilia, and there is poor response to T2 inhibition. Now biomarkers. Now we have a uh, close to five biomarkers, but two of them are uh, not yet, uh, at least one is not yet ready for prime time, that is serum periostin. It is still in the research domain. It's not, it has not come to the bedside. Sputum eosinophils, again, even though it is very easily done or, I mean, non-invasive method, it reflects uh, upper airways, that's the problem. But the issue with uh, sputum eosinophils is it's difficult to collect and not all patients can provide adequate samples, not universally available and require specialized training equipment and laboratory. So these are not yet uh, uh, routinely used, but what we routinely use is the biomarker is blood eosinophils. Because the advantages of blood eosinophils are they are minimally invasive and minimal patient effort is required and easy to measure and collect in clinical settings and it correlates well with sputum eosinophilia. It, the utility is it defines the inflammatory phenotype and uh, predicts exacerbations, poor asthma control and greater airway obstruction and predicts therapeutic response to corticosteroids and biotherapies. Serum IgE, again, very useful biomarker because it's very easy to measure and identify patients who are candidates for anti-IgE therapy. And it is, again, a reflector of uh, severe asthma severity and airway remodeling. We know, we'll come to it uh, later, it's again a, the advantage being it's non-invasive and uh, there is minimal patient effort required and easy to collect in the clinical setting. It identifies airways inflammation, predicts exacerbations and uh, airways hyperreactivity, predicts response to steroids and several therapies. But there are multiple uh, co-founders that request attention by interpreting pheno. Now, what are the asthma phenotypes? Uh, Phenotypes, we have very many phenotypes of asthma and according to etiology, you can classify have allergic and non-allergic, uh, aspirin exacerbated exercise and occupation. So you have, uh, depending on the etiology, you have phenotypes and depending on the clinical characteristics, you can have various uh, phenotypes of asthma. Depending on the underlying diseases, asthma plus, you have asthma plus other conditions you, and asthma phenotypes according to pulmonary function test. You can have uh, asthma with reversible airways or not reversible fixed airways, airway hyperresponsiveness or restrictive disorders with asthma, a combination of things depending on the lung function interpretation. And depending on the cellular composition, you can have eosinophilic asthma, neutrophilic and all those stuff. So you can have, again, based on the control of asthma, you have severe asthma, difficult to treat asthma, refractory asthma, and based on uh, the type of uh, uh, the phenotype of inflammation, T2, high or T2 low asthma. So that's how you have very many phenotypes of asthma and uh, some of these can go on to develop severe asthma. So finally, we have this T2 high asthma phenotype. You can, you can have aspirin exacerbated or ABPA or early onset, adult onset, late onset, severe and hyper asthma. Occupational asthma, which is, if it is IgE mediated, it comes under T2 high asthma and there are quite a few biomarkers that which I have already described. These are used for T2 high asthma. Unlike uh, T2 high asthma, T2 low asthma, we, low, we know very little about this and there are hardly any biomarkers to detect uh, T2 low asthma as things stand today. Interleukin-17 seems to be the cytokine predominantly involved and uh, there are hardly any uh, biologics uh, for T2 low asthma, but the tezipilumab is now approved for a T2 low asthma also. But all other biologics that are there are predominantly for T2 high asthma. So having uh, completed the, the list of phenotypes of uh, asthma, now we are slowly going to what is severe asthma and this phenotypes of severe asthma. The 
before going to the actual definition of severe asthma, it's important for us to know what are high dose ICS because in the definition of uh, severe asthma, we have this definition of high dose ICS. So high dose ICS is the commonly used uh, ICS is bedicinide. If the patient is receiving more than 800 micrograms of bedicinide in a day, it is a high dose. If the patient is on a fluticosone propion, the uh, dose is more than 500 micrograms in a day, it is high dose. So comes what is how do we quantify asthma control? The domain of asthma is asthma control. The asthma control we have a question asthma control assessment. This is the symptom domain assessment of asthma. The asthma control test has about five questions. The questions are given to the patient, and uh, if the score is more, the asthma is well controlled. And this gives us the symptom control of asthma for the last four weeks. Next is asthma control questionnaire. Again, questions are given to the patients. If the score is more than 1.5, it's a poorly controlled asthma. And uh, the asthma control is for the last one week. So asthma control questionnaire is symptom control of asthma in the last one week based on the score that they get. So putting all of them together, Asthma control questionnaire, uh, there are of course abbreviated uh, questionnaires are also there, five questions, six questions, uh, seventh one is uh, PFT. Yeah. So the age range for AQ is more than 11 years, you can apply it and uh, the domains that are tested in this uh, asthma control questionnaire are the nocturnal awakenings and limitations of uh, activity, morning symptoms, shortness of breathing, wheezing, reliever use and spirometry. So these are the domains that are tested in asthma control questionnaire. And uh, the asthma control in the last one week is what we uh, understand from this questionnaire. And uh, as I told you, if the score is more than 1.5, it is poorly controlled asthma. And the minimal uh, important uh, clinical important difference is 0.5. If any 0.5 change is clinically very important. Com coming to asthma control test, can be applied for more than 12 years. There are five questions and the domains that are tested are activity limitation, shortness of breath, awakening, delivery use and self-assessment. This gives us the asthma control in the last four weeks and if the score is more than 19, it is a well-controlled asthma. And we have another question from the GINA also. So you, you have these various questionnaires by which you can assess the symptom domain of asthma control. Of course, the quality of life questionnaire also is there. You can add uh, quality of life questionnaire also. Now we have to know what is an uncontrolled asthma. Uncontrolled asthma is at least if you have one of the following. One from the symptom domain, one from the exacerbation domain and, and from, from the function domain. If any one of them is there, then it is an uncontrolled asthma. Say if the ACQ is more than 1.5 or uh, asthma control test is less than 20, it is uh, poorly controlled asthma. If you have a frequent exacerbator requiring steroids for at least three days, then in the previous one year, it is an uncontrolled asthma. If there is a serious exacerbation requiring ICU admission and hospitalization, then it is an uncontrolled asthma. If you have a poor lung function, it is an uncontrolled asthma. So having known what is an uncontrolled uh, what is uncontrolled asthma, having known what, how to assess the uh, asthma control symptom, having known what is high dose ICS, then we come to the definition of severe asthma. So severe asthma is asthma that is uncontrolled despite adherence, adherence is very very important, despite adherence, despite maximal optimized high dose ICS lava treatment and management of contributory factors. Each one of them is very, very important. We have to make sure that patient has adhered to the treatment, patient has been on high dose ICS and other control, LABA plus other control medications, and we have taken care of the contributory factors. That's very important. Because severe asthma is subtype of difficult to treat asthma. In difficult to treat asthma, you have to tick all the boxes that cause asthma and then come to a defini uh, definition of severe asthma. So severe asthma requires treatment with high dose ICS and a second controller for the previous year or systemic steroid requirement for 50% of previous year to become 
for becoming uncontrolled. So this is the definition of severe asthma. Why is it important to know about severe asthma? Because uh, even though only 10%, uh, even 10%, I think, to me, it's very big number. I think it should be around 5%. 5% of asthmatic patients have severe asthma, even though they are few in number, but they use a lot of resources in the asthma treatment, and they have more frequent emergency visits and more hospital admissions once patient has severe asthma. And these patients, they have increased prevalence of anxiety and depression, increased risk of exacerbations, emergency admissions, frequent reliance on oral corticosteroids and secondary complications related to steroids, increased health cord utilization and costs and sleep disturbances, activity limitations and reduced fitness. So overall, the quality of life of a severe asthma is very, very poor. So the management of severe asthma requires that we need to understand the phenotype, inflammatory phenotypes of asthma. So broadly we have T2 high asthma and uh, T2 low asthma. The T2 high asthma has uh, two uh, in phenotypes, allergic asthma and uh, non-allergic eosinophilic asthma. The other uh, inflammatory phenotype is T2 low asthma or non-T2 asthma and the uh, inflammatory cells that are involved are predominantly neutrophytic asthma or it could be a granulocytic asthma in uh, non-T2 asthma. So putting everything together in severe asthma, the phenotypes, endotypes and the biologics, severe asthma is divided into T2 high and T2 low asthma. T2 high asthma is very well studied because it's a very common severe uh, asthma. And the biomarkers in the severe asthma are pheno IgE and allergen specific IgE, blood eosinophils, sputum eosinophils, skin prick test, urinary leukotrienes for aspirin exacerbated asthma and uh, serum periostin, it's not yet ready. So the uh, biomarker for uh, if the biomarker in severe asthma is IgE-mediated asthma, then the biologic that we use is omalizumab. If the uh, eosinophil-mediated T2 high asthma, then we have biologics like mepolizumab, restlizumab, bendalizumab, or dupilumab. If the uh, TSLP is there in T2, TSLP is what we have there in T2 T2 low or T2 high asthma and tezipilumab is one approved biologic that is there for T2 high or T2 low asthma and uh, when it comes to T2 low asthma it's not very well studied and uh, we don't have good biomarkers and there are uh, except for uh, tezipilumab there are no other uh, bi uh, biologics that are available uh, so the biologics that uh, are available as on today for us is omalizumab for anti-IgE and uh, mepolizumab and bendalizumab for uh, anti il fire eosinophilic asthma. Now, coming to pheno, nitric oxide and airway inflammation. Nitric oxide is a key modulator of immune inflammatory response in the respiratory tract and measured as fraction of excel nitric oxide in breath. It is produced by a number of cell types, including epithelial cells of the bronchial wall in response to IL-4, IL-13, that is the STAT-6 pathway. Nitric oxide has a multiple roles in the airways. At physiological levels, it acts as a vasodilator, bronchodilator and a neurotransmitter, but at supraphysiological levels, it promotes inflammation. It is implicated in the pathophysiology of lung disease including asthma and pheno is a marker of T2 high asthma, T2 inflammation. It is very important to know that the pheno levels are impacted by multiple confining factors. Age, exercise, circadian rhythm, technical factors, the device and technique all impact the levels of pheno interpretation. There are some very well known uh, factors that either increase pheno or reduce pheno. The clinical implications of applications of pheno asthma is in the diagnosis, it's very important to know that it only supports the diagnosis, but it should not be used alone to make a diagnosis of asthma. That's very important. In treatment, it, if pheno is elevated, it tells us that the patients are inhaled ICS responsive 
and uh, you can on also tell whether patient is adherent to ICS or not. Pheno helps us in asthma phenotyping. It is a marker of IL-4 and IL-13 driven inflammation. It's important to know that uh, pheno is IL-13 driven inflammation. And in monitoring, pheno should not be used alone to assess asthma control or manage asthma treatment. So these are the things that we have to keep in mind when we are doing uh, pheno and uh, interpretation, interpreting pheno. A word on uh, pheno suppression tests because we are using biologics. Biologics are used in severe asthma and non-adherence to prescribed therapy is common in severe asthma. Excuse. Ex yeah. So you already time. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. sorry. I was not getting it right. Anyway, so if there is, if the patient uh, is uh, uh, given inhaled steroids, the pheno level should come down and if uh, there is a pheno suppression test for that, then thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll take. I'm sorry, I exited time. It's excellent talk, sir, and uh, uh, illustrated exa uh, exactly what is the TH2 and low and high. It's very practically important because uh, nowadays the new biologicals are there that can be misused for any all cases of asthma. So that is most important and we'll go for the next talk. At the end of the session, we'll go for the question. So I'd like to call upon uh, Dr. Krishnamuthi sir for the next topic. He is the professor and HOD of uh, respiratory medicine at Gandhi Medical College. He will be briefing us on uh, spirometry, the basics of spirometry. Over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I thank uh, the organizers and especially Dr. Vishwanath sir uh, and his team for uh, waiting me for uh, this program and giving me this opportunity. And uh, so I will be dealing with the uh, spirometry. As you know, this is a uh, very basic investigation for pulmonologists and at the same time it has uh, a role uh, in vast diagnosis and monitoring of uh, the respiratory diseases and uh, this topic will be covered under uh, the definitions uh, following headings indications contraindications complications methods of performing spirometry interpretation and criteria for acceptability and repeatability and common errors with performing the test and some of the patterns common disorders grading of severity and uh, bronchodilator reversibility testing and uh, the new ERS ATS standards on uh, lung function test interpretation, some extent limitation. So, because it's a vast uh, so, uh, this one, uh, I will be going through quickly. And uh, definition the spirometry is a physiological test that measures how uh, an individual inhales or exhales volume of air as a function of time. And spirometry assesses the integrated mechanical function of the lung, chest wall, and respiratory muscles by measuring the total volume of air exhaled from full lung, that is total lung capacity to, to the residual volume. And if you see the basic, uh, as you know, uh, the basic terminology is important, that is uh, the tidal volume. Uh, it is a volume of air inhaled or exhaled with each normal breath and it is usually about 500 ml. And the inspiratory reserve volume, uh, it is a maximum volume of air that can be inhaled after normal inspiration. 3003 liters and expiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of air that can be exhaled after normal expiration is 1100 uh, ml which is 1100 ml and uh, residual volume is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after maximum uh, expiration it is about uh, 1200 ml and the other the capacities which, which are nothing but a combination of uh, two or three volumes where the inspiratory capacity is the maximum volume of air inhaled after normal expiration that is tidal volume plus IRV which is about 3500 ml and functional residual capacity is about 2300 ml and the vital capacity this is most important the maximum volume of air that can be exhaled after deep in, uh, inhalation 
and if you do it with a force that is called force vital capacity and uh, vc is irv plus tidal volume plus expiratory result volume and total lung capacity the, the total lung capacity is the volume of air in the lungs at the end of maximal inspiration so these are the, all the volumes depicted in the chart as we have seen so as far as uh, the inspirometry is concerned the force vital capacity this is one the total volume of air that can be exhaled during a maximal forced expiratory effort and forced expiratory volume in one second so in the first second the volume of air exhaled in the first second under the uh, force after a maximal inhalation so that is important so in the first second and fe1 by fec ratio the percentage of fec expired in one second is the fe1 by fec ratio and if uh, feb6 is the forced expiratory volume in 6 seconds the forced expiratory volume flow which is uh, between it can be measured 25 50 and 75 and uh, whereas the fef 25 75 is the mid expiratory flows and the average flow from the point of 25 percent of fc has been exhaled to the point where 75 percent of fc has been exhaled so these are the most important uh, parameters you usually see apart from that peak expiratory flow uh, is usually effort dependent what are the indications so it has uh, diagnostic indications as well as uh, monitoring uh, is also useful for monitoring the patient uh, so see the diagnostic indication to establish a baseline lung function to evaluate the symptoms like dyspnea, signs or uh, dyspnea or sometimes uh, cough also and signs, other signs or abnormal laboratory tests if you have for evaluating them and to detect the screen, uh, detect or screen the individual at risk of pulmonary disease to measure the effect of disease on the pulmonary function and to assess the perioperative, uh, the preoperative risk and to assess the prognosis uh, in a patient, uh, respiratory patient. And in case of monitoring, to assess the therapeutic interventions, uh, wherever, whenever you are giving, as like uh, the uh, already told, uh, in asthma, wherever you are giving the treatment, the patient is giving the uh, on treatment. So you can uh, give the, you can know the whether the uh, uh, treatment is working or not. And to describe the course of the disease which affects the lung function. So again, over a period of time, you can monitor the course of the disease. And to monitor the people, uh, monitor the people exposed to injurious agents uh, uh, with the disease and surveillance of occupation, especially occupational lung disease. If they are exposed to dust, various dust, uh, the lung function will be altering over a period of time. And we can uh, monitor them. Then uh, to monitor for adverse reactions to drugs with the known pulmonary toxicity in some cases, and to assess patients with part of rehabilitation program, whether the, uh, the program is working well or not for the patient that also you can monitor and if you see the contraindications the active pulmonary tuberculosis uh, we, important uh, we, we should not do this uh, PFT in uh, these conditions like active pulmonary tuberculosis or myocardial infarction a brain surgery within four weeks or eye surgery sinus or middle ear surgery or infection a thoracic surgery uh, <coughs> abdominal surgeries uh, recent recent uh, history of uh, abdominal thoracic surgeries, uncooperative patients, acute disorders affecting test performance like nausea, vomitings, and vertigo. So, in all these conditions, either they may um, the disease underlying disease may exacerbate or they may develop complications. So, uh, pneumothorax and uh, thoracic aneurysms also. And what are the complications? You see the commonest complications, even though they are very rare, but still we can see uh, that is pneumothorax, developing a pneumothorax, increased intracranial pressure, a syncopal, a giddiness, a lightheadedness, a chest pain, paroxysmal cough, and uh, contraction of nosocomial infections. And if in a borderline uh, saturation, if it is maintaining, it may desaturate, the patient may desaturate of the procedure. And uh, bronchospasm, it may develop an acute spasm. So how do you perform the test? <coughs> so the important uh, aspect is we have to make the patient understand the procedure prior to the uh, going for this uh, test. So we have to take it into con uh, contents of the patient. 
So that is the most crux of it because uh, as I have told, it's a forced expiratory wall, uh, flow, uh, forced expiratory procedures, they are effort dependent. So the patient has to give his complete effort. He has to take to the complete exhale inhalation and he has to exhale complete to the uh, complete exhalation, full exhalation should be done. So all these things are possible only the patient understand the procedure properly. If that is not, uh, if that doesn't happen, then uh, naturally our, our uh, the test report will be uh, of not of much value. So here the pre-test examination, no smoking with at least one hour before testing, no consumption of alcohol within eight hours before testing, do not exercise within one hour before testing because all this they will affect the pulmonary function and avoid large meal within two hours and continue medications for hypertension, diabetes, IHD or other illnesses and avoid wearing clothing that substantially restrict full chest and abdominal expansion and if already an inhaler therapy for obstructive airway disease, drugs to be withheld before test like Saba's short acting bronca uh, 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 beta 2 agonists are 4 to 6 hours, SMAS are 12 hours, LABAS 24 hours, ultra LABAS 36 hours and LAMAS 36 to 40 hours. So these drugs should be avoided before the, performing the test if the patient is already on these medications to wean off their effect. And coming to the test preparation, the equipment should be calibrated. So this uh, calibration of the uh, equipment is very essential because uh, uh, there will be uh, always it should be done uh, with a uh, usually it will be a 4 liter uh, syringe will be available uh, supplied by the uh, person and that uh, that should be done as as and when required to get a correct values of the spirometry and uh, dentures usually left in place unless they are loose and usually performed in sitting position to avoid syncope which may occur in standing position uh, if, if it is done in standing position and patient's age, height, weight and gender are recorded. Priming of the face, uh, after priming the patient then we have to wash hands and use uh, hand sanitizer, explain the process of spirometry and emphasize the procedure is non-invasive and, and the importance of its and inform that the procedure must be repeated several times to obtain good quality of the test. So again, the, uh, because we have to take uh, the best performance, uh, best of the three or depending upon that, at least we should get uh, three uh, tests should be done, pre and post uh, procedure, uh, bronchodilator and uh, out of them the best performance should perform uh, uh, value should be taken. And about the technique. A patient should be instructed about the technique, what, how he has to do the procedure and uh, the patient is in upright position with nose clips on and elevated chin and the neck slightly extended and lips must be sealed on the mouthpiece tightly and uh, uh, mouthpiece to be placed over the tongue to avoid it obstructing the mouthpiece. So that is again to prevent the flow of obstruction, uh, uh, obstruct, uh, flow of the air and inhale rapidly until completely full. So the patient has to take a deep inhalation to the total lung capacity and exhale with maximal effort until completely empty that is to, uh, to the residual volume to the then inhale with maximal effort until completely full again. So the process of exhalation followed by inhalation uh, uh, first he has to inhale completely then followed by a forceful exhalation then followed by inhalation and give one or two trials with mouthpiece before testing on spirometry. So that gives a comfort to the patient and he understands with that. Then <coughs> coming to the interpretation, uh, volume time curve or a spirogram, it shows the amount. So this is a basic uh, curve which, uh, which one should uh, have an idea and it shows the amount of air expired from the lungs as a function of time where we see the on x axis we have uh, uh, time in seconds and uh, y axis we have volume. And uh, normally it has a rapid slope and approaches a plateau. So it has a rapid slope will be there and approaches a plateau as soon as exhalation. Then it provides post vital capacity, a maximum volume attained here, the post vital capacity and FEV1, the volume attained after one second. And post expiratory time 
which needs to be at least 6 seconds. So, the important is it is 6 seconds and better if we can go more than that also 10 seconds. And in children, it will be, it can be uh, even 3 seconds is sufficient. <coughs> and uh, mid expiratory flows like FE of 25, 50, 50 and 75 also can be obtained from this graph. The other one is flow volume loops. So, flow volume loop is plotted against volume to display a continuous loop from inspiration to expression. Inspiratory portion of the loop is a deep curve plotted on the negative portion of the flow axis and is effort dependent over the entire range. Whereas the expiratory flow volume curve starts at full inspiration. So, this is the uh, uh, expiratory flow curve. So, expiratory flow volume comes starts from full inspiration uh, to zero flow and uh, flow of expired, uh, exhaled air increases exponentially and rapidly reaches its maximum that is peak expiratory flow. So, it, it uh, reaches uh, the peak expiratory flow reaches within uh, uh, rapidly in the first uh, almost first one second only it will uh, most of the times and from there it uh, drops down. The curve then slopes down in a near linear manner until just before reaching the volume axis. So, so it reaches the volume axis to the zero uh, gradually and slightly concavity upwards and ends by touching the volume axis zero where no more air can be exited. So, usually it may be slightly curved. And uh, what are the information we get? Flow volume loops, of course, the total lung capacity and residual capacity cannot be measured by spirometry, but the values we get usually is a forced vital capacity. The forced vital capacity is the total uh, volume exhaled. Then uh, the peak expiratory flow, FEV1, FEF25, FEF50 and FEF75. And uh, the most important is FE of 25 to 75, the mid expiratory uh, flows, the, they are also important. And the other one is peak inspiratory flow. This is a peak inspiratory, uh, uh, peak inspiratory flow. This is a peak inspiratory flow. So, these three, uh, these uh, parameters are uh, recorded. The overall shape of the flow volume is important in interpreting the spirometric results, mainly the site of the airway obstruction. So, if the airway obstruction is a uh, Airway obstruction is uh, severe and uh, the major airways are involved, then you have uh, the early obstruction will be there, the peak uh, expiratory flow will be limited, whereas uh, the small airways are affected, then uh, mid, mid flows will be affected. The criteria for acceptability and repeatability, uh, acceptability criteria, a good start of the test should be there, back extrapolated and volume should not exceed 5 percent of the FPC or 150 ml, whichever is larger. And rapid rise of flow to PEF in flow volume loop with a PEF being sharp and rounded. So, that is very important. And smooth FP loop free of artifacts. And a good end of the test in uh, VT curve. A play to of VT curve of the at least one second should be there. The play to should be for at least one second. And the reasonable duration of effort should be six seconds, about 10 seconds optimal. And then three seconds for children. What is the repeatability criteria? After obtaining the three acceptable uh, maneuvers, the repeatability criteria to be applied that is two largest values of FPC must be within 150 ml of each other and two largest values of FEV1 must be within 150 ml of each other. Uh, common disorders what we see the obstructive disorders and where like uh, the disease like asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, bronchiolitis and uh, the diagnostic criteria are the FEV1 will be decreased. FEV1 by FEC ratio will be decreased, then followed by the other features like decreased FEV1 and uh, FEFs and PEFs also may be decreased and decreased are normal FEC and FET. A possible significant bronchodilator response is there and, uh, and the, the, here there will be a scooping of the descending level of the flow volume curve. It may take a uh, dog-like appearance uh, in the flow volume curve. The other pattern is restrictive disorders. Again, here the, para and the causes are the parenchymal disease, pleural disease, chest wall uh, disease like musculoskeletal, kyphoscoliosis, neuromuscular disease, diaphragmatic uh, distension due to pregnancy, ascites or uh, obesity. So, all these conditions they may produce restrictive disorders. And what are the important features of the restrictive disorders? The, uh, like uh, decreased FPC and a normal or increased FPC, FEV1 by FPC ratio. 
So this is most uh, important criteria and other features are a decreased FE1 proportion to FEC but it can be normal and PEF normal or increased or decreased and there should be a, a descending limb is uh, uh, steep uh, is called which at uh, uh, appearance uh, uh, steep curve will be there so the curve drops down steeply then <coughs> if you see the all the ventilatory impairments defined by the spirometry uh, in the uh, de, uh, uh, spirometry so I have already told obstructive impairment with FEV1 by FEC uh, decreased and FEV1 normal or decreased FEC is normal a restrictive impairment where uh, FEV1 and FEC are decreased but with a normal or increased FEV1 by FEC and a non-specific pattern where there will be here again all the uh, if you see the uh, restrictive impairment non-specific pattern muscle weakness suboptimal effort all these conditions the FEV1 by FEC will be decreased but there are little differences which we have we can make out only by uh, additional studies like volume studies uh, uh, volume studies should be done uh, with the help of uh, uh, <coughs> graphy. so here uh, the total lung capacity is reduced in case of restrictive defect whereas uh, TLC normal the pattern seen in the population studies were current and former soaker, smokers here and muscle weakness if there is a muscle weakness or suboptimal effort the sharp PEF will be uh, uh, noted lack of sharp PEF will be noted and the mixed disorders we have both uh, all the three factors will be decreased and uh, Sometimes uh, FEV1 and FEC will be normal, but there will be FEV1 by FEC is uh, decreased, maybe a normal variant. So, approach to the interpretation. So, first we have to see the FEV1 by FEC. If it is uh, uh, less than 50 percentile, then you have to, uh, <coughs> then uh, if it is normal, FE, FEC should be looked, looked into, and if it is uh, normal, it is normal spirometry if it is normal it is normal spirometry and if it is uh, 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 decreased then it is a possible restriction will be there possible rest restriction will be there and the other side also it is uh, uh, the airflow obstruction if it is more than uh, uh, increased FEC is increased then airflow obstruction will be there and uh, possible mixed disorder if both components are there FEV1 by FEC is decreased and FEC is also decreased and there is the help of uh, lung volume should be needed and apart from that we have upper airway obstruction there the flows will be uh, variable extrathoracic obstruction uh, variable intrathoracic obstruction and fixed upper airway obstruction can be noted by different uh, uh, patterns of the flow volume loops and uh, CVRT as you see the CVRT of the uh, uh, obstruction can be seen by in case of uh, uh, ATS guidelines. So, mild will be more than 70, moderate 60 to 69, moderately severe 50 to 59 and grading of the severity of obstruction and restrictive disorders again the values as you know previously and in the gold guidelines it is taken as 0 0.07 less than 0 0.07 as a single factor. In the restrictive disorders again it is uh, uh, different gradings as you know all these things. Uh, and it is also useful in bronchodilator reversibility testing is very essential to uh, make out uh, asthma diagnosis and uh, often used as a dose of inhaled beta 2 agonist as a, like salbutamol 400 micrograms MDI and uh, the initial test and the spirometry is repeated of 15 to 30 minutes. An increase in FE1 that is both greater than 200 ml and 12 percent above the pre bronchodilator FE1 is considered significant. And, uh, and the the new RS ATS standards, uh, they have given uh, few points I want to uh, highlight. The FEV1 by FEC uh, lower than lower limit normal is required to establish airflow obstruction, which is again uh, the important is the limitation is one of the three smokers, uh, one out of the three smokers will have FEV1 by FEC ratio more than lower limit of normal but less than 0.7. Uh, but several abnormal is relevant to COPD and the mid sorry. The mid-range uh, expiratory flow rates are redundant that was given by the uh, ERS guidelines but uh, they say that uh, they have a role is there we have to keep in, uh, in mind because it plays in, uh, in some patients especially uh, smokers and normal FEC and FEV1 by FEC are highly reliable in ruling out restriction again this uh, most of the care conditions uh, 
to know the restrictive defect, the lung volumes are essential. And 100 ml difference in slow vital capacity in FPC suggests early airway closure and forced maneuver. Again, 100 ml is too strict here. So, better to have 200 ml will, will, uh, is the cutoff point. So, then to, to, to take a home message, spirometry is a basic and preliminary test to assess the pulmonary function in terms of obstructive and restrictive impairment. And postgraduate should perform the test on patients with and without the help of technician in order to perceive the relation between the way a patient does the test and its expression as flow volume loose on the screen. So, this is very important. Only di just reading the uh, uh, report is not sufficient and correlate the spirometry always with the clinical background on the patient. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir, for summarizing such a vast topic in a limited period of time. As we are all aware, spirometry basically is the portal to the physiological or the pathological functioning of the airways and its course in some areas. It has its own importance, which are advanced radiological investigations are incapable of uh, conveying. So, thanks a lot once again, sir. Any questions from the audience? Also, mastering spirometry is the is of prime importance to mastering our ventilator graphics because most of us, whether in post graduation or the future, we all deal with ventilated patients. So, spirometry plays a very important role in assessing what's going wrong with the ventilated patient too. Any questions, sir? One, question with this, sir. Uh, because we need to make one standard uh, criteria or whatever, because many labs we are seeing, uh, report is ready with sign uh, with before the doing the test. So, because that will give you us a uh, wrong interpretation and it's always sometimes they will say, uh, this is our, why you want to do a PFT, because if you do, many of the time FET, FET will be less and they'll proper, they won't proper take uh, steps. So, I think it's better to make a standard criteria or whatever acceptable. I mean, everyone knows that's theory, but when you come yeah, into yeah. application, it's very become difficult. Yes. Now, the main problem is uh, at the generation of the report. So, the performing the test. The, at the level of performing the test, if you take the pre, uh, all the precautions, uh, the person who, has, who is doing the uh, test, he should take all the precautions and he should uh, be able to generate a, a good report, good uh, repeatable and acceptable report. So, then only we can interpret that. So, without that, it's very difficult and apart from that, I have told you that uh, it should be correlated well with the uh, clinical features. Otherwise, uh, per se, as such, uh, it will not have much effect. Any questions? Sir, Any, question? Any questions from the delegates? Just state that the effort should the patient puts on, we used to stop at 6 seconds. Now that is 15 seconds. 15 seconds. That is or the plateau has been achieved. The latest uh, equipment, PFT equipments are having the software that tells you that the plateau has been achieved. Now the patient can breathe in. The older versions don't have it. Why? Why this is? Because most of the COPDs have air trapped in their lungs. And most of the time we end up telling that it is a normal spiral. To overcome that, this is a new development that has occurred in ATS year. I have one question. So also, yeah. what is your take on FEF 2575? Should we be considering it when yeah. it comes to the treatment? So, FEF 75, especially uh, so in the treatment, in the sense they will be all affected uh, in obstructive diseases. Only thing is, uh, in uh, early small air, what latest ERS guidelines they have mentioned that uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, 2021 they have mentioned that uh, uh, they have no role much. But again, the extent limitations they have mentioned that uh, still there is uh, some scope is there for uh, uh, 
uh, early smokers where we can pick up the early airway small airway obstruction and uh, that is uh, meant for them because we can if we pick up the disease at that level then we can uh, give uh, we can take measures to prevent it. we see many symptomatic patients yeah. with the pft showing only I mean, normal spirometry, but when we see the FPF 25 cm graph, it is reduced. Yeah, so. well, it has to be correlated with the, the patient. If he's a smoker and if he has a symptom, then it should be considered. But if it comes out of the this one, then it will not have so Again, the correl clinical correlation is essential, and uh, so that is important. Thank you. I had one uh, point to add on here. The problem, like continuing with what uh, Dr. Deepika has asked, we do have limitations here is the main reason being most of the patients do take their puffs. Some of the patients are of the mindset that let us perform well in this PFT so that the doctor is not going to, I don't know, say criticize us or comment on us. So they may not really adhere to the guidelines which sir has mentioned in the first few slides, the time lag between the last bronchodilator course to the performance of the test. And some of them are not truly motivated. It's like, why are you making me puff so many, I mean, blow so many times and all that. So the effort of the patient is a major limiting factor here so we need a good technician who is going to instruct the patient well in advance make them do a couple of trials before going for the final graphical recording thanks sir with the permission of the chair i will just add two points uh, a long time back uh, maybe in 1980, uh, Professor Alistair Bruce, who has written a beautiful book, lecture notes on uh, respiratory medicine. He came to India, he came to Hyderabad, and he came to AP Chest Hospital. And one of the doctors asked him, Sir, what are the contraindications for spirometry? So he said, if the patient can sit, cross his legs on the bed, then he can do a spirometer. So don't take about the contraindications too seriously. Uh, it is very doable. And in my practice, I've been doing it for the last 40 years. There has never been a complication or a calamity. Point number one. And number two, I was given the task of taking Alistair Bruis to Charminar. And he came and he was with me and suddenly he disappeared. I saw him sitting on the footpath with his big drawing book and a pencil and he was drawing. He was drawing not the Charminar but a little beggar girl who was standing there. He was not even looking at the Charminar. So friends, you have to develop different interests. Don't just focus on one thing. That is how you can balance life and go ahead without getting old too quickly. Thank you. And one question to Vijay Kumar sir. Sir, how do you handle patients who are deaf or blind? How do you do spirometric? And how do you overcome this uh, limitation? Excellent question. In fact, this question can be extrapolated to how do you explain a meter dose inhaler or a dry powder inhaler to a deaf and dumb person or a blind person. So this happened many times in my practice. And for such people, I would explain the meter dose inhalers and DPI myself. Whereas for other people, I have a wonderful technician with 20 years of experience who does all the PFTs. So when these people are undergoing a spirometry, I stand next to him, whether he is doing the right way or not, wrong way. And surprisingly, they do better than people who are well endowed with a good vision and a good hearing. Thank you. We now have a brief inauguration ceremony. Uh, so I now I invite Dr. Vishnath, sir, to take over.
very good morning one and all on behalf of our aeg pulmonology department i welcome you all and extend a hearty welcome to you all and at the outset uh, i would like to thank our chairman and our aeg hospitals management for giving this uh, excellent platform for us to conduct these kind of uh, cma activities conferences and we are also fortunate to have uh, an uh, state of the art skill lab which has hosted a uh, lot of uh, training activities it is said that asatoma sadgamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaga that means education leads one from ignorance to truth and from darkness to light so these kind of uh, continuing medical education activities lead one to develop a lot of knowledge and improve their clinical skills and the technical skills actually and we have had this fortune at uh, aag because of the facilities we have had and uh, uh, and this is all because of the possibility because of our vision of our chairman and he has been very passionate about the excellence in clinical care academics and research as well and now i, I request him to briefly give a message to the audience who have come here from different parts of the country thank you very much sir thank you vishnu first of all on behalf of the ag hospitals administration i'd like to welcome you all i see so many close friends here uh, coming for this meeting and welcome you all to this uh, very important CME. Uh, I am a gastroenterologist, actually an interventional gastroenterologist. Uh, in 1982, when I started, I, mean, I did my DM at uh, PGI. At that time, pulmonology was still not a very developed field or it was evolving at that stage. And uh, we used to have, uh, I think, rigid bronchoscopy being done, flexible hadn't still come. But over the last few years, pulmonology has developed so dramatically uh, although I am biased towards uh, gastroenterology, I would say that if I had a choice now, probably I'd go to pulmonology and do my DM. Uh, because looking at the development that occurred in terms of interventions, in terms of uh, interstitial lung disease, uh, things that are happening with even the bronchial diseases, the chronic airway disease, I think so phenomenal uh, advance are occurring and uh, it's predicted that among the medical fields, pulmonology would be the one with the most dynamic upward territory in the next few years. I think the research in this area that's coming up, I think, for example, immunology and pulmonology itself is a separate topic with so much of work going on in this area. So I think it's a very interesting field. I'm very excited and especially I think the work that Vishnath and his team is doing in this and he has the blessings of all the leaders in our state also who are involved. Uh, with all this, I'm sure that uh, I can see pulmonology developing into a very major speciality, not only in our state, but also in the country. And I'm glad that the next national conference is being held in Hyderabad, and that will definitely add to that. Uh, I'm very excited. In fact, even now, sometimes when they do the bronchoscopies or EBUS, I peep in to see what's happening because it's such an exciting field. And I'm sure um, all the youngsters who come here, the postgraduates are very fortunate that they're in a field which is evolving so dynamically, so dramatically. And I'm sure over the next few years, you'll see so many new advances, new therapies coming in this area. I'd like to wish this conference all the success. And I'm sure with all the deliberations here, all of you, it will be a very productive conference. And again, uh, we'd like to extend a hospitality from AAG for this uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Vishnath. Thank you. Uh, we'll have an uh, lamp lighting ceremony and invocation to get the divine blessing so that we have a very smooth CMA and get all of us go out with a very good knowledge after the CMA. I invite our chairman, Dr. Nageshwari D, sir, and Dr. R. Vijay Kumar, sir, Dr. Shubhakar Kandi, sir, and Dr. Krishnamurti, sir, Dr. Paramjyoti, sir, and Dr. Sumulata, ma'am, and Dr. Rajadhar, sir, to come on to the dais for this uh, lamp lighting ceremony. I actually extend a... Uh, Sincere thanks to all these faculty. At such a short notice, this program was initiated 25 days ago. We have started planning this program. And then once we have started this program, I approached all the senior members of the faculty and they were so kind enough to accept the invita invitations at such a short notice. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Shubham Guru Thakkar Jnana, Arugyam Janatam Kajah, Shastru Buddhi Vinashaya, Shri Pachyote Namo Sute, Shri Pachyote Namo Sute, Shubham Guru Thakkar Jnana, Shri Pach
So Dr. R. Vijay Kumar sir has just said that we should develop a passion in one of the areas in pulmonology so that we do not age significantly as we progress in our clinical practice as well as we start uh, seeing the patients actually. So uh, here actually uh, this is where something which all the youngsters should concentrate upon. It can be either an interventional pulmonology procedures whether it could be a sleep. You choose one area, asthma, bronchiectasis, sarcoidosis, uh, any of these things actually. And uh, these are some uh, areas we were very fortunate to have uh, had the opportunity to train the young pulmonologists from different parts of the country and uh, conduct uh, different training programs. And this CME is one such uh, initiative from our side to give back uh, to the postgraduates. When we were postgraduates, somebody, our teachers have taught us so passionately. That is why we are here and then we are able to do some good clinical work as well as an academic work. So this is where uh, I... Uh, uh, extend a warm uh, invitation to all the postgraduates in most of the programs which we have conducted postgraduates were mainly the uh, participants and not the part consultants i feel that a postgraduate very very well trained when he's in his training will go on to become a very good doctor and then go on to improve the clinical care and the li saving lives of these patients actually and uh, with this uh, i would also request all the postgraduates uh, to Go, go into a little bit of clinical research or the transnational research. Uh, during the last uh, three years, during the pandemic, uh, we have had the unique opportunity of uh, working with our colleagues, internal medicine, ENT, ophthalmology, and had an opportunity to present uh, our papers in different uh, international and uh, Indian journals. You can start off with a simple case report, which could, uh, which will actually keep on stimulating you when you start writing. It, it need not be any kind of a big paper or a multi-center study. So this is what keeps you inspiring and which is what keeps you young and, uh, and stimulate you when you're doing clinical practice. And with these few words of uh, uh, introduction, I would uh, end my uh, inaugural uh, talk. And also, uh, we have an important announcement uh, from Dr. Uh, R. Vijay Kumar. Dr. R. Vijay Kumar needs no introduction. He has been at the forefront of academics in both the states, Telangana and uh, Andhra Pradesh. And uh, he's a beloved teacher for most of us. And uh, he's been a speaker and then faculty in different conferences. And now we have an upcoming conference which is going to come up in Hyderabad. And sir is going to make a very big announcement regarding this uh, program. I invite uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar sir to come onto the dais and then uh, make the announcement. Thank you very much for coming here, sir. Friends, good morning. 
uh, senior faculty sitting in the front row and all my good friends in the back uh, seats. A long time ago, uh, in Bombay, uh, one young person completed his DM Neurology. And by that time, the Bombay was crowded with neurologists. And there was a specialist in subarachnoid hemorrhage, there was a specialist in stroke. And uh, like that, you know, different specialities in neurology. So, he asked his professor, Sir, what do I do? There is no place everywhere, every all experts are there. So, he said, you go ahead and then start one clinic and uh, put a nice name. So, he went and started Headache Clinic. Headache Clinic. Surprisingly, a lot of cases who had headache also had some neurological issues. So, that is how he started his practice and improved his practice. So, don't get discouraged that the market is full of pulmonologists already. And if you have the merit, if you have the knowledge, if you have the patience, if you have the, uh, the communication skills, automatically your practice will flourish. So, I would like to say again, it is not the strongest species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. So, you have to change according to the circumstances because you have to adapt. Why is it so important to adapt? You have to adapt, be strong and get updated all the time. If you don't do that, what happens? You will be a dinosaur. We all know what happened to the dinosaurs. They became extinct. So, I agree. As everybody says, knowledge is important. But logic and common sense is even more important. I would like to tell you a little story. And before that, let me tell you that when, when we talk about knowledge, only one-fourth comes from the, your teachers and another one-fourth comes from the books and the CAB programs. And another one-fourth comes from discussion with your colleagues, you talk to them, discuss, etc. Then what about the last one-fourth? It comes from your experience over the years. All of us, myself, Dr. Dayanand, Dr. Rajadhar, Dr. Paramjyoti, everybody are still learning with every case. So, that is the last one-fourth and be alert to get that one-fourth of knowledge. A long time ago, there was a guru and he had three disciples, the shishyas. And out of several shishyas, these three were his favorites because one was doing a speciality in medicine in those days. Another was doing in the Mantra Shastra, there is magic. And the third guy was doing a speciality in logic. So, it was a one-year course. The course was over. On the last day, the Guru invites all the three of them for a dinner. And at the dinner, the Guru's wife is serving everyone. And suddenly, the Guruji says, Oh my God, I have swallowed a bright red insect the size of the peanut and then he becomes unconscious. So, the guy who is a magic uh, disciple, he starts chanting a lot of this and that magic uh, mantras. Then the second guy who was the medicine person, he runs into the backyard, gets uh, some leaves to put some juice into the mouth of the guru. The third is unmoved. He is continuing his food, his dinner. And after a while, the Guruji gets up and then says, see, these two shishyas have been very good because they were worried about my health. This fellow, the third guy, he didn't even get up. Then the third logic person says, Guruji, please, my apologies. When you said bright red, peanut size, insect, it means you have seen it. And if you have seen it, you would not have swallowed it. So that means you have not swallowed. So, that's the reason I am continuing. So, logic is very important and this comes when you put together all the information that is coming not only from the lab, not only from the radiology, but also which comes from the patient. So, listen to the patient carefully. 
get a lot of information from him about his lifestyle, what he does, etc. Like they say, history is nothing but his story. And make writing a habit. Always carry paper and a pen. Because good ideas come and pass. Great ideas are in this world. And you have to put them into practice. Only then the idea will become productive. They say the faintest ink is better than the strongest memory. So that's the reason why make writing a habit. Legally, again, for us, all of us, what is not written does not exist. You have to write. You cannot say, sir, I have actually advised him this and that. But when it becomes a case in the court, they are not going to believe you. If it is written in the case sheet that you have told the patient, then the judge will be in your favor. So document everything that you tell your patient and write your diagnosis. I see many prescriptions, no diagnosis, a long list of drugs, but no diagnosis. Write a diagnosis, at least write the name of the chapter if you don't know the diagnosis. And always be updated, read latest guidelines and develop communication skills. Very shortly you are going to listen to Dr. Rajadhar, see how he talks and see what you can observe and inculcate from such uh, established speakers. And those of you who want to be trained in the communication skills, we are here, we are going to have a workshop so that we are getting ready for the NAPCON in 2023 this year and we want many of you to be making oral presentations. And it is going to happen on 1st, 2nd and 3rd of December 2023 and a day before will be the workshops. There are about 15 or 16 workshops, of course, all over the country and many parts of the world. People will be here to talk to you and we are calling all of you, young pulmonologists, to make oral presentations. Get ready now. We have 12 months time. We will groom you to talk on stage in NAPCON. What is the topic? Any topic of your passion. It could be even your thesis. And present a difficult case. And this case would be presented in front of four top experts. And they will analyze the case step by step. And then let us see whether those experts come to a conclusion, which is a proved diagnosis. So look for a beautiful case right now and we will uh, take that into the conference. And of course, as usual, posters will be there, abstracts will be there and uh, some special streams in addition to the pulmonology, some uh, talks for respiratory therapists, PFT technicians will be there. And are you good in social media and graphics? Please help us to make this um, NAPCON a better one. And write a handbook because uh, people are looking for small, concise handbooks. So if you have that streak in you to write, uh, you can be a single author or there can be multiple authors and co-opt a few seniors as well and write a beautiful handbook because we are going to have a stall exclusively for books written by doctors. And we are publishing a few books like mechanical ventilation and things like that, difficult cases in pulmonology and drugs used in pulmonology, etc. So we need authors for that too. So let me know if there are anybody or if you are interested, you can even help in preparing the references. And are you good in managing people? Help to manage the speakers, the halls, maintain time and schedules and make announcements. And how to contact this is the email id and uh, you can send just send a mail of what you want to do how to participate etc we are here otherwise in person i am here as organizing chairman and dr subhakar is here as organizing secretary and then uh, vishwanath is in the scientific committee so any of the seniors uh, they are all in this uh, committee so share these messages thank you very much
Thank you, sir. Thank you for being a part of the program. So before we break for tea, I would request all the delegates to spare few more minutes. Uh, we would like to uh, present a small token of gratitude to the speakers. So now I uh, call upon Dr. Sumalata Ma'am, Dr. Raghukan sir and Dr. Shrikar sir to come on to the dais to present a token of gratitude to the speakers. And I now invite Dr. Paramjyoti sir and Dr. Krishnamurti sir to come on to the dais. Dr. Krishnamurti sir. Thank you, sir. And now I invite Dr. Shubhakar, sir, to come on to the dais to present a token of gratitude to our chairperson. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Shubhaka, sir. So, now we'll break for a short deep break of 10 minutes. I request you all to assemble as early as possible in the interest of time. We'll gather again at 10, 12, 40.
Thank you. 
Consultant Palmnajis from Citizens Hospital, Dr. Yugavir sir, Consultant Palmnajis from Omini Hospital and Dr. Dayanan sir, Consultant Palmnajis from uh, Basatarka Hospital. I would request the moderators to kindly uh, introduce the speaker and start of the session. Thank you. I think it's good afternoon now. As we, I welcome Dr. Chandana, madam, to deliver her talk on ARDS ventilation current strategies. She is a MD in internal medicine from Ames, New Delhi, and a DM in pulmonary and critical care from PGI-MER, Chandigarh. She is presently Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, Star Hospital. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank you, Vishnath and the team for inviting me for this lecture. So, yeah, this is actually a big topic, but I thought I'd concentrate more on the physiology and the pathophysiology and the basic respiratory mechanics because that's not what you get in books and all you'll be able for you to understand. Guidelines and what to do, what not to do, you'll be able to know. But how, why are we doing what we're doing is what I thought we'll I'll concentrate more on. So, first important is important to diagnose ARDS because if you don't diagnose, you won't treat it properly. Even 20% of all world or also 20% of your ARDS are not diagnosed. And what are the causes of, uh, and you need to assess the severity because only when you assess the severity, you'll be able to treat the patient appropriately and you assess the mortality. There can be direct causes or indirect causes, pulmonary, extra pulmonary, we all know that. And the basic pathophysiology is because of the alveolar capillary membrane damage leading to high permeability alveolar edema, dysregulated inflammation with the infiltration of neutroph neutrophils and uh, leukocytes into the uh, alveoli, damage of the alveolar capillary membrane leading to leakage of the uh, proteinaceous material into the alveoli, leading to flooding of the alveoli, and then proliferation of cells. The most of the time, this stops here. Otherwise, some patients can go on to the fibro fibrotic phase where they have fibrotic proliferation, extensive lung damage. So, what are the characteristics of uh, ARDS uh, lung? There is diffuse alveolar damage, that's number one. Second thing is, it mostly affects the dependent lung regions. Third, it is a heterogeneous involvement is there. So, because of these three reasons, the ARDS ventilation is a little uh, symptom problematic. And there's something called the sponge lung model where they say that because of the gravity and in a supine position because of gravity, the dorsal portions of the lung they have experienced the effect of gravity and they have become collapsed even normal lungs also. But in the presence of ARDS, the weight of the lung increases so dramatically because of the edema and the uh, fluid <coughs> filling that it, the pressure is very high and the dorsal pressure is very high leading to collapse of the alveoli. This is called compression uh, atelectasis. Another concept is what is called the baby lung concept. So, if you see in ARDS, if you see the, this is the collapsed lung, but only this of the lung is aerated, the upper lung is aerated, that's called the baby lung. So, baby lung is nothing but the volume of the aerated lung which is available for ventilation. And the size of the baby lung or the volume of the baby lung is dependent upon the severity of ARDS. The ARDS is very severe, the volume of the baby lung is going to be small. It may be even the, that of the size of a, a 5 or 6 year old child also. But what we should remember is, the volume of the baby lung is small, but the baby lung is not stiff. The entire lung may be stiff, but the, if you see the compliance of the baby lung, it is normal uh, compliance. So, it's very important when you ventilate a patient, if you think that the baby lung is low and you want to give high pressures, Tidal volumes to inflate the lung. So, you damage this baby lung because further, because you're going to, that is a normal lung with normal compliance. So you're going to over inflate it and hyper inflate it and cause damage. And one more thing important thing of baby lung is it's not an anatomical 
part of the lung. It is a functional uh, concept. So, for example, if in a supine position, the dependent areas are the collapsed areas and this is the baby lung which is actually well ventilated. But once you turn the patient prone, the baby lung is come now to the paravertebral area. So, it is not an anatomical part of the lung that is the baby lung. It is the well ventilated part of the lung which is the baby lung. It is not a fixed part that okay the low lobes or the posterior segments are going to be uh, affected. It is the part of the lung which is well ventilated is the baby lung. Okay. So, this is the concept you want to understand. So, because of the pathophysiology I told you, there are regional differences in the lung density, ventilation and blood flow. So, because of the pathophysiology, we have alveolar flooding, we have compression atelectasis because of superimposed pressure and we have resorption atelectasis because of surfactant deficiency. All these will lead to and we also have changes in the vasculature in the form of low perfusion areas and high perfusion areas because of microthrombi and all that we have low perfusion and because of loss of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, we have areas where in spite of there being no ventilation, the pulmonary vasculature will be still not constricted and there will be blood flow leading to increased perfusion and again VQ mismatch. So, all this will finally lead to VQ mismatch, all these regions will lead to VQ mismatch and VQ mismatch is the core of the hypox uh, mechanism of hypoxia in ARDS. So, the mechanism of hypoxia is different in different parts of the lung. So, if you see the well ventilated lung, that is the baby lung part of it, there the main mechanism of hypoxia is the increased dead space or increased high VQ because the ventilation is there but perfusion may not be there because of the compression of the vessels by the over distant alveoli. At the same time, because of microthrombi, the perfusion may also not be there. So, because these reasons, there will be high VQ areas or dead space in the baby lung. Whereas, in the collapsed lung, where there is totally collapsed or partially collapsed lung, there there will be mainly primary areas of low VQ or right to left chunk because the vasculature is okay, but there is no ventilation to these areas. So, these are the three main mechanisms for hypoxia. Once the patient has hypoxia and they have hypoxia, hypocapnia or hypercapnia, they have a very high respiratory drive and they have high minute ventilation and work of breathing. These things will contribute to what is called PCLE or patient self-induced lung injury. This is a very, very important concept of PCLE and ventilated lung injury. The primary insult which causes ARDS is important in causing ARDS and lung damage. Equally important is what we do to the patient by ventilating the patient in a wrong way. So, and the spontaneous efforts of the patient are also very, very important in causing further damage to the lung already which is damaged lung. So, this PCL and ventilated lung injury, they also contribute more to the pathogenesis of the ARDS and make the lungs worse. So, because if you have a very high spontaneous effects, you generate very high pressures in the lung, transpulmonary pressures, you generate very high volumes in the lung. All these together, when you ventilate the patient, they cause barotrauma, which is damage to the alveolar capillary membrane, a leaking of air from the alveoli into the surroundings, causing pneumomediastinum, pneumothorax, and, and also surgical emphysema. If the volumes increase, they lead to compression of the vessels, they lead to increased permeability of the capillaries, and they lead to pulmonary edema, that is called the uh, shear stress also and strain. And when the, because the alveolar flooded and collapsed, and because of repeated opening and closing of the alveoli, that also can lead to the uh, damage called shear stress and called electric trauma. And all these together will cause release of many cytokines, central leukine and all that, which will go into the circulation, go to multiple organs in the body and then that can lead to multi-organ failure. So, AI, it can start off with ARDS and the ventilation that you do and the spontaneous efforts of the patient themselves can cause a vicious cycle and then can lead to further worsening of the ARDS and also cause multi-organ failure and distant organ injury also. So, as I told you, in fact, the baby for the normal lung which is aerated lung is most prone to ventilation induced lung injury. That is the lung which is prone to hyperinflation and volume trauma and barotrauma. The collapsed lung is not prone to anything because the ventilation whatever you do you cannot open that lung. So, you will not cause much damage in that area. The area at the zone of these two, uh, the interface of these two normal and abnormal lung and the hyper or well inflated lung is the one which is most prone to ventilation induced lung injury. So, it is very very important for us to be able to take, keep all this in mind when you are ventilating. So, this is what is called the Willy cortex. So, we also see in the last wave of COVID when second wave, we had a lot of patients with the L phenotype where they had not much uh, lung damage, they had a very good lung compliance, they had normal lung, most of the lung was normal, but still over a period of time, they started having worsening lung condition, they went into the H type of ARDS and then they required ventilator and went into very bad state of affairs. This probably is explained by this, what is called the Willy vortex, where initially the patient to start with has a normal lung and not very much damage. But because of hypoxia, which is due to other vascular uh, occlusion and other causes, the hypoxia causes a very high respiratory drive. And then this leads to the uh, vigorous respiratory efforts, which lead to Willy and PCLE. That leads to vessel damage, more further capillary edema, capillary permeability, again edema. And all these remember, more affected by in the well aerated lung. 
So the normal lung will start getting affected by the you know, ventilated strategy and the spontaneous efforts. So that's why we saw people, a lot of them, when we managed with NIV and HFNC and all outside with spontaneous breathing. And then over a period of 4-5 days, the lung injury worsened. The primary insult was not the problem cause. The, the ventilation strategy and the, this specially was the cause and the worsened and then subsequently went out to the ventilator and had very poor uh, outcome. So it's very, very important for us to keep uh, this thing on the ventilation. So coming to the management, so basically, I'm here to talk about the ventilatory management. I thought I'll just tell you a brief update so that you'll understand why we are uh, we do low tidal volume, so why we uh, uh, keep all the measures. So among the ventilatory parameters, basically non-invasive uh, respiratory support, then lung protein ventilatory strategy, then prone position, though it is not a ventilatory strategy as such, but it is one of the safest way to ventilate the lung and with the minimal side effects out of all the ventilatory strategies, the prone position is the most safest way to recruit the lung and uh, improve the condition of the lung. So, uh, it's a very important thing and recruitment maneuvers are not uh, very much favoured right now. So, what is the goal of ventilation? When you ventilate your patient, we should do, we should not do more harm than what is already there. So, we should maintain adequate gas exchange. We should minimise the recruitment and atelectasis by using PEEP and prone position. We should avoid excessive dynamic lung stress and ventilated lung injury by, I'll tell you, I'll come to that later. And we should also simultaneously maintain the optimal inspiratory effort, not too much effort, but at least some inspiratory effort of the patient should be there. And it should be thinking with the patient's breathing. And the patient is on spontaneous breathing. So, based on severity, we have all these modalities. What we should remember is, in all stages of ARDS, we have to follow the lung protective ventilatory strategy with low tidal volume. That is the standard. There is no uh, two ways about that. And based on the severity, you can go for non-invasive modes or whether you go for invasive modes. So, what are the advantages of non-invasive modes? Definitely, all the problems we have with the ventilators and uh, intubating a patient and ventricular intubation, we can avoid. And patient's comfort is there and also you can avoid the atrophy and all of the diaphragm, diaphragm dysfunction you can avoid. But I told you, this PCL, which is a major problem with spontaneous efforts, where you don't uh, say the patient, the patient has a very good drive, they are very hypoxic, they want more oxygen, they want more ventilation, so they will be driving. So they have a very high in negative inspiratory pressures, very dry, high drive, so that causes high volumes and high pressures leading to varotrauma, volutrauma, because they actively expire also, the lungs collapse in the expiration. And so again, the atelic trauma and repeat open closing will happen in the atelic trauma. And because of excess negative pressure, the fluid pressure is so negative, it causes interstitial also will have negative pressure that leads to leakage of fluid from the capillaries into the interstitial and further worse in the pulmonary edema and the alveolar edema. So this is what is important. So this again leads to a vicious cycle of PCLE infected, uh, patient self-infected lung injury. Okay. So coming to non-visible modes, we have HFNC and uh, NIV. NIV can be used either with a mask or a helmet. We all know how to use it, what are the indications and all that. So, but I told you like we have to be careful with the this thing as of now with the patient self infant lung injury because we cannot monitor the tidal volumes. We have no control over the tidal volumes. We have no control over the work of breathing. We have no control over the expiration part of it. So, all this is people also make cause something aspiration. So, all this is important. Whenever we use any non invasive mode of ventilation for a patient, we have to be careful that we have to closely monitor the patient and we should use it only in mild to moderate, AR, mild to moderate ARDS. And we have scoring systems like the HACOR score or the ROCS index for HFNC and HACOR score for NIV, which give us some certain threshold, the indices which give us some certain threshold. So the patient is falling below the threshold. That means it is time for us to invasively ventilate the patient and put them on invasive ventilation. So we should be closely monitoring the patients. So regarding non-invasive ventilation, there is one trial which is the fluoride trial, which is they have studied compared uh, HFNC versus oxy oxygen in uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure. There they found that the PF ratio is below 200. They found that HFNC has slight advantage and the incidence of intubation is lesser compared to NIV or simple oxygen. Again, there is a concept of oxygen toxicity. So, we should be very careful about this also. So, a lot of studies are going on between conservative and uh, liberal oxygen therapy. Some have shown that conservative oxygen therapy has a higher mortality compared to liberal. Some have shown that there is no difference in the mortality. So, studies are going on. So, whenever we use non invasive support, whether it be HSMC or oxygen or whatever, we have to use only in mind to moderate. The PF ratio is less than or more than 150, sorry. And we should be careful and beware of the PCL. Confirm the respiratory drive, agitation, fever, restlessness of the patient. All should be controlled. Close monitoring and guidelines of now of late recommend that HFNO probably has a slight advantage over the other two modalities. And if a patient fails HFNO or NIV and then gets intubated, the mortality is going to be higher. So be very careful about that. So before going into invasive ventilation, so if a patient fails or if he's not suitable for invasive non-invasive ventilation, we we'll go for directly for invasive ventilation. But before going to that, I thought I'll just tell you. Uh, about the pressures if we monitor when a patient who is on invasive ventilation. So first is the peak pressures, plateau pressures and peep. So when a patient is ventilated, the air goes into the uh, patient and then that the peak pressure is the maximum pressure attained in the airways at the end of inspiration. Then if you 
put an endospheric pause. You pause the breathing for some time, you stop the circuit. Then what happens? The pressure equilibrates and the pressure which at the end of equilibrium is called the plateau pressure and it is a surrogate for the administratory alveolar pressure or the alveolar pressure. So, that time the pressures are equalized, the airway pressure and the alveolar pressure are equalized and that pressure is a good pressure or a good marker for us to follow to tell us about the distension of the alveoli. So, if the plateau pressures are going very high, that means the alveoli are getting lower distance. So, you should be very careful in your way you are ventilating the patient. Another pressure is the new concept is the driving pressure and of course, PEEP is the pressure at the end of expiration. What is the pressure in the alveoli at the end of expiration? So, the, if you, the, you have to have minimum pressure for that, you do not prevent the alveoli from collapsing and further causing atletotrauma. So, driving pressure is what is the pressure applied to the aerated part of the lungs to achieve a tidal volume. It is the difference between the plateau pressure minus PEEP. So, nowadays people are using this uh, parameter to guide the ventilation and decrease the lung injury. Another pressure, very important pressure is the transpulmonary pressure. Unlike plateau pressure which covers both the chest, chest it, uh, plateau pressure is what is required to open the lung and also to move the chest wall. Whereas, the transformative pressure is the pressure which is acting across the alveoli. So, it is much more uh, more precise or more uh, correct uh, method of uh, monitoring the uh, alveolar distending pressure. But problem is the transformative pressure, you need to know the plural pressures for which you have to do a esophageal balloon and put a catheter in this vagus and with that you measure the plural pressure and then you will get the transformative pressure. I will come to that later. So, coming once the patient is intubated, you always have to follow the ARTS network protocol which has been provided, is available everywhere. Most important thing is, you have to first calculate the predicted body weight of the patient. This is a formula for that in male and females. And then you tell the tidal volume of 6 to 8 hours per kg. You can start with 8 and slowly come down to 6 in the next 1 to 2 hours. And set a respiratory rate, which is appropriate to, for the minute ventilation you are having before he started off this invasive ventilation. Then you monitor the ABG and the saturation. PEEP, as per the net protocol, you have to set it according to either low PEEP table or the high PEEP tables. Tables are readily available. If the patient has mild to moderate ARDS, you can go for the low PEEP table. If the patient has moderate to severe ARDS, you can go for a high PEEP table because they may require higher PEEP. And you have oxygenation goals, so you maintain the PO2 between 55 to 80 and saturation of 88 to 92 to 93 percent. And you assess every fourth hourly and you can adjust the PEEP FIO2 tables. Another thing you monitor is the plateau pressure. I told you how to see the plateau pressure. You put an end respiratory pause in a ventilator. In the pressure time graph, you can see the plateau pressure, you will get it. Your target should be less than 30 centimeters of water. That way, you can prevent the volume trauma and barotrauma. If it goes more than 30, then you have to somehow do something. You decrease the tidal volume to as low as 4 ml. You can go down to 4 ml per kg to prevent the lung injury. If the plateau pressure is already below 25 and tidal volume is below 6, then you can try to increase the tidal volume slightly to reach up to 6 ml per kg. And what are the pH goals? You should always try to maintain the pH between 7.30 and 7.45. So, the patient pH falls below 7.30, then you can increase the tidal volume to wash out the PCO2. But we can accept the hypercapnia and you can accept the pH of above 7.2 and the PCO2 around 55 to 60. But pH falls below 7.15. Then you have to increase the respiratory rate to a maximum of 35. Second thing, if still there is metabolic acidosis, you can use some bicarb. And even then, if the pH is falling below 7.15, you are not able to ventilate, you can increase the tidal volumes and you can accept the plateau pressures more than 30 to 35 because the pH and acidosis is going to be more dangerous than the plateau pressure at that point of time. This tidal volume of 6 ml per kg came from this major study called the ARMA trial, which was done in 2000. And this changed the way we ventilated the patients in ARDS. They compared 6 ml versus 12 ml kg and they showed a different mortality benefit of using a 6 ml per kg compared to a per kg. So, mortality, ventilator, duration, everything was significantly better if you use a 6 ml per kg. Okay. So, and it is only one of the few interventions in uh, ARDS apart from pronium which has shown a mortality benefit in ventilation. But what is the problem in using it uh, uh, tidal volume to the predicted body weight? The problem is that if for example, you take two cases. One is this patient with ARDS who has this much of damage. Another is a patient who has this much of damage. Both of them, the predicted body weight comes out to be 70. 420 ml for this patient, you will give 420 ml for this patient. But what is going to happen to that? This patient is okay. 420 ml is okay because he has a good baby lung. But this patient has a very, very small baby lung. So, this 420 ml for him will definitely lead to hyperinflation of the baby lung, damage to the baby lung and further this thing, stain on the baby lung. So, what then now the new concept is that instead of titrating the tidal volume to the weighted body weight, why do not you titrate it to the baby lung, function of the baby lung or the function of the baby lung? That is the best known by the compliance. So, if the baby lung is big, the compliance will be very good. If the baby lung is small, the compliance will be low. So, you titrate your tidal volume to the compliance of the lung, that static compliance of the lung, that is also known as the driving pressure. So, nothing but the tidal volume uh, scale to the 
Com uh, static compliance is called the driving pressure. So nowadays people are uh, slowly moving towards that direction where you titrate the tidal volume to the best dri lowest driving pressure. That is so because driving pressure is found to indicate the functional size of the lung. It also reflects the severity of ARDS. It is a good prognostic marker. And if you find that your ventilation strategy is decreasing the dri driving pressure, that means you are going in the right direction. And it has been found that driving pressure is strongly associated with the survival even as compared to tidal volumes or PEEP. So now they recommend that probably if you follow the driving pressure, you can keep a driving pressure of less than 15 would be the good thing for uh, doing lung protective ventilation. What was the plateau pressure? I told you the plateau pressure is the pressure which is required to expand the lung. That's the transformer pressure plus they expand the chest wall. So as we already uh, saw before, high plateau pressure is associated with the uh, billy and mortality. So it should be kept below 28. But like I told you, it is not the exact uh, precise, uh, it's a rough estimate of the alveolar pressure. The transpulmonary pressure is much more useful to assess the exact alveolar descending pressure. So, what is transpulmonary pressure? Difference between the alveolar pressure and the pleural pressure, which is measured by the esophageal balloon or the esophageal pressure. So, that is measured by the esophageal balloon. And the difference between alveoli and the pleural space is called the transpulmonary pressure. It tells us about the actual alveolar descending pressure. It is especially more important because if you see these four scenarios, in this patient who is paralyzed, has an alveolar pressure or plateau pressure of 20 and a pleural pressure of around 5. The transpulmonary pressure is 20 minus 5, 50. Make sure that you don't hyperventilate the patient or hyperinflate the patient. At the same time, you will open the alveoli and the nerve expiration. You can also use the pressure volume curves and the stress index, which is the, you can see it on the ventilator graph in the pressure time graph. If it's a straight line like this, it is good recruitment or normal recruitment. If it's a dip upward or concave upward, that means you are over distending the lungs and it should come down on the peak. So, comparing high peep versus low peep, all the studies have not shown any difference in mortality. But if a meta analysis showed that if you when patients with PF ratio of less than 200, definitely higher peeps have lesser mortality. So, in only the patients with the less than 200 PF ratio, you probably can go for higher peeps. So, in peep in, in ARDS, you have to at least use 5 centimeters and you should have personalized peep titration based on all the parameters I already described. Higher peep and plateau may be allowed in patients who have a low chest compliance. Optimal peep is dynamic. So, you can't set one peep on one day in the morning and then come next day morning and set the peep again. It's a dynamic thing. It keeps changing. The requirement keeps changing. You have to keep on increasing and decreasing based on the lung mechanics. So, higher peep is used only in patients with moderate to severe ARDS and keep the plateau pressure below 30. Again, recruit maneuver is a maneuver to increase the airway pressure to recruit collapsed alveoli, increase alveoli participating in tidal ventilation. It has the same negative effects as uh, peep. There are different methods of doing recruit maneuvers. But what you should remember is that not, not all patients with ARDS are recruitable. So, for example, this patient has a high amount of recruitability. This patient has a very low, higher percentage of recruitability. This has no recruitability at all. So, you cannot assess that. It is very difficult to assess who is recruitable and is not recruitable. But usually, recruitability is better in patients who have severe ARDS, diffuse disease, and who have extra pulmonary forms of ARDS. This also has been uh, studied in many studies, but none of them showed any mortality benefit. Definitely, oxygenation improves the recruitment maneuver, but there are a lot of negative effects like hemodynamics and barotrauma. Our trial has shown increased mortality with the recruitment maneuvers and Farlap has not shown any benefit with the recruitment. So, it should not be used routinely in ARDS only if you are against the wall as a rescue therapy. If you do not have ECMO, you are not able to do anything else. As a rescue therapy, probably you can use it in a certain set of patients with very severe ARDS, if PF ratio is 100. And then you should use it followed by uh, transient uh, recruitment maneuvers and followed by PEEP uh, recruitment titration. So, coming to the most important recruitment maneuver which we have available for us is the prone ventilation. So, prone is improves the mortality, improves the oxygenation, decreases the lung injury. Very, very important is the only ventilation strategy probably which decreases the ventilation induced lung injury. That is why it probably improves the mortality. Another very intervention which increases the mortality, improves mortality in ARDS. The main mechanism of uh, prone ventilation is that it recruits the dorsal lung units which are collapsed and it homogenizes the ventilation and perfusion to make a VQ matching better. And it also homogenizes the transformer pressures. So, like I told you, in the dependent areas, the transformer pressures are very high. Whereas in the non-dependent areas, the transformer pressures are low. So, that homogenization is occurs with toning. So, you should remember one thing in the lung, ventral alveoli and dorsal alveoli, the amount of tissue is not same. Like ventral alveoli is only uh, 25%, the dorsal alveoli is nearly 70%. The amount of tissue in the dorsal alveoli is more, in the dorsal part of the lung is more compared to the ventral. So, when you prone a patient, all this will open up. So, when you prone a patient, the 75% of the lung opens up, whereas only 25% of the lung collapses. So, this way, that is how the ventral de-recruitment is more than the dorsal uh, recruitment. 
Uh, you're wrapping up, ma'am. Yeah, I'll finish. So, uh, so prone position improves the this thing. Second thing is ventilation. Second thing is what we think is that when the patient is normally dorsal, the blood flow is more because of gravity. When you prone, we expect that the blood flow should be more in the ventral part. But what happens is the blood flow continues to be high in the dorsal part. Because of this, the ventilation uh, perfusion matching is better. And of course, the effect of the heart on the lung also is reducing the prone position. All this will help in the proning. So, the post trial showed that by doing proning for more than 16 hours a day, early in the course of illness, especially the PF ratio less than 150, the mortality is much lesser compared to not proning the patient. So, we should be able to get it all in the net everywhere, the counter indication, indication of proning and how we should do it. And it is not a rescue therapy, you should be done in most patients with the PF ratio less than 150. Again, neuromuscular blockade, to decrease P silly, you should give neuromuscular blockers. The trials have shown that by giving neuromuscular blockers in patients with PF ratio less than 120, they have a mortality benefit. So, if a patient has mild ARDS, you can just go for sedation. If the patient has moderate to severe ARDS with PF ratio less than 120, you should go for a uh, neuromuscular blockers in such a curative infusion for at least 48 hours. So, lung protective, just two more slides. Lung protective ventilation involves preventing barotrauma, volume trauma by low tidal volumes, PEEP at less than 30, preventing attractive trauma by optimal PEEP, minimal PEEP, minimal PO2 targets, avoid recruitment maneuver, avoid high PEEP. Nowadays, people are accepting permissive hypoxia. If you cannot ventilate the patient with all these parameters in place, try and draw for extracorporeal circuits. Phone the patient early and for at least uh, 16 hours a day and minimize patient ventilator asynchrony. Nowadays, there is a new concept of what is called permissive attractasis. They are saying now that don't even try to open the lung which is already collapsed. Just ventilate the lung which is aerated properly and let the lung heal and rest and heal and then once it heals, you automatically the oxygenation will improve. So, these are the guidelines. So, finally, summarizing everything in one slide. Early diagnosis, assessing the severity of ARDS. Then if the patient is mild ARDS, try for non-invasive methods. Close monitoring for silly and willy. If uh, patient tolerating well, okay. If not tolerating well, go for intubation in moderate to severe ARDS. Follow the low tidal volume arch net protocol. Also follow driving pressure, mechanical power, transformer pressure. All this, all this can be used to drive, guide your ventilation. If the PF ratio still remains below 150, go for neuromuscular blocker and prone positioning. And if required, maybe sometimes you can try recruitment maneuver and high PEEP. That also is not helping PF ratio below 80 or below 50 for more than 3 hours. And then you can go for extra or for supports like ECMO. And of course, rescue therapies can be tried at this point of time. So you have to personalize the ventilation in ARDS based on the type of the pathology. Thank you. Sorry for taking a few minutes extra. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for the exhaustive coverage of uh, what happens in the ICU. We'll allow two questions from uh, postgraduates if they have any. Provided they have understood it. <laughs> you can understand mechanical ventilation only if you are playing with the ventilators, isn't it? Man? Yes. You need to constantly keep adjusting the yeah. pressures and this thing, see what happens to how I the patient respond. I couldn't understand the ventilator till I was beside the ventilator. My critical care uh, chief was helping me understand. I wanted to know all of uh, NIV versus HFNC man, and ARDS. Yeah, there is only one work. study which has shown that, which has been studied in a head to head comparison of uh, HFNC and NIV in uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure, where they have compared oxygen, this, all this. There they found that if the PF ratio is below 200, Probably HFNC has slight advantage because definitely the tidal volumes which are generated in NIV. We see 500, 600 ml tidal volumes being generated by patients. Even a small pressure support you put of 4 or 5 also. Patients, because of the very high respiratory drive and uh, very negative pressure pressures, they generate a lot of tidal volumes. So that way, HFNC will have a slight advantage because they will not generate so much of tidal volumes in uh, HFNC. And it has been shown also in the study where below 200, the uh, instance of intubation is much lesser in uh, HFNC compared to simple oxygen or uh, NIV. So basically because of the tidal volumes which it generates. But the problem with HFNC is you can't give adequate PEEP. The PEEP maximum you will get is 3 to 5. Whereas in NIV, you can, if the helmet especially, you can go up to even PEEPs of 10 also. 
So recruitment will not be very good. So whatever, whichever mode you use, NIV or non-invasive mode is only for mild ARDS, where you don't have very high PEEP requirements. So below 5 to 8 PEEP requirement is there, then you should go for a uh, non-invasive modes of uh, respiration for uh, ARDS. Once you require high PEEPs, you have to go for invasive ventilation. Okay. Um, what is your experience? I just wanted to close on a, one question and then move on to the next speaker. Uh, that is an exhaustive, almost like a one year, you know, fellowship experience being uh, wrapped up in, in about, you know, 20 to 30, 25 minutes. Uh, if the trainee gets to some point of learning. Um, with past couple of years of experience, what do you feel like, uh, you know, post-COVID fibrosis versus a regular, you know, ILD is what we see encounter when they go into the ARDS and that kind of, you know, ventilatory dependency. How do you see that more HFNC lean, uh, you know, dip, um, usage on what I have seen with the uh, post-COVID or post-viral infections versus when you see the regular uh, ILDs where you see more of a straight away going into the ventilator. So how is it different in your experience? So I think uh, basically HFNC, we are using it now because the different like language is going to be much lesser with HFNC compared to NIV we are using. And I think in COVID related uh, fibrosis or in ILD, I didn't see much difference actually in, in terms of uh, the HFNC but role. But the seem to be much higher of HFNC, what we have seen a couple of years when see a typically uh, critical care specialist who are practicing. No, earlier Is we used to what? either give them oxygen or just let them be at home with oxygen. We, didn't, we never used to use NIV also because patient is not tolerated very well. So it's not a one day or two a day thing in an ILD patient. They'll go on for a long time, unlike a COPD patient where they improve immediately. So. Nobody used to use any form of non invasive ventilation in ILD patients usually. But now in uh, with HFNC, it's very comfortable for the patient. And we're using it more often, probably that's the reason why. But I don't think in terms of uh, fibrosis or in the physiology or pathology, I don't think there's much difference in terms okay. of ILD or post-COVID fibrosis. Okay. All of them will have uh, low compliance and uh, the mechanism should be same. Okay, thanks. Thanks on that. Um, now, I think uh, brace yourself for a uh, next speaker. Yeah. Um, I think as much as Everybody knows. I don't. I don't think uh, Dr. Rajadhar needs uh, introduction. But briefly, I would just like to tell in few words. Like he's in uh, director and head of the department, uh, pulmonology CK group of hospitals, Calcutta. He's in a different positions as director to the research and education, uh, National Allergy, Asthma, Bronchitis, Bronchitis Institute, Calcutta. Uh, director of Hermes Exam uh, Asia, director of Asia Pacific Alliance, Joint Secretary Indian Academy Allergy. Founder member of the Southeast Asian. He has, uh, to his credit, uh, good 150 international national publications, indexed journals, abstracts, and 21 book chapters. Uh, lead author in Embark, Associate Editor of Respirology. And he's an editorial board. He also an, a national award is in Dronacharya and Indira Gandhi gold medal for outstanding individual artist achievement in medicine. All these things seems to be much less when he speaks. I'll definitely like, I love to listen to him. I am sure. You postgraduates would like, definitely would like to emulate and learn how 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 lucidly he speaks now. So, sir, without any delay, it's a delight to have uh, Rajadhar sir to Hyderabad physically, not virtual. So while we are waiting, uh, a big thank you to um, all of you, to all the respected chairpersons. Um, I have to thank Vishwanath and congratulate him. Um, great meeting, great session, lovely to see so many postgraduate trainees and very seniors, people from Hyderabad and outside coming and encouraging them, people asking questions. Um, Hyderabad almost feels like home to me now. I've been here so many times in the last one year or so. Um, and it's always been very warm and welcoming for me. So um, thank you very much for inviting me. And as soon as we get the slides up, we can uh, start speaking. Um, shall I just get my laptop? Is that easier? This will happen. PPTs. Okay. 
as they are hooking up and the next two talks would be a virtual i think both the talks will take after rajatha's talk will take questions after that uh, next two talks subsequently would be a virtual talks and then uh, after that both post talks we would be able to take a, a questions uh, later and there are no questions probably you can actually take virtual ones so probably um, just to note that okay yeah so i've um, done away with the introductory slide um, this is what i'm going to do over the next 22 minutes i promise i'll finish in 22 minutes um, i'm going to talk a little bit about defining severe asthma i know dr param jyoti has done that already but uh, in the context of what, what i'm going to speak about i'll talk a little bit about differentiating difficult asthma from severe asthma i'll talk about why biologics and a concept of remission which is actually novel to chronic respiratory disease and i'll show you how evidence of using the concept of remission in other chronic diseases can be extrapolated to chronic lung disease especially chronic asthma talk a little bit about what biologics have to offer i'll spend a little bit of time talking about how you would choose between agents and lastly i would talk about how you switch between different biological so that's what i'm going to do over the next 22 minutes so that's the definition and i'm sure you know the definition but just to put things in context asthma that requires treatment with high dose inhaled corticosteroids plus two controllers and or systemic corticosteroids to prevent it from becoming uncontrolled or you have controlled asthma but with that level of medication so two different scenarios one you either men maintaining control with maximal medication which means you cannot escalate therapy any further unless you go for phenotyping which dr paramjyoti spoke about or the, that disease is still uncontrolled with maximal medication when you're trying to define uncontrolled asthma you can have four different scenarios which will tell you in the clinical context that the patient has uncontrolled asthma so the first is poor symptom controls you talk to the patient you find out about uh, symptom control equally you have questionnaires in asthma like the acq questionnaire like the act questionnaire which tell you in a objective manner that the patient has poor control of asthma the second is frequent exacerbations so two or more courses of systemic corticosteroid in one year amounts to a frequent severe exacerbation one serious exacerbation requiring hospitalization and intensive care entails poor control uncontrolled asthma and air flow limitation where the airway has undergone remodeling and you go from reversible air flow obstruction to fixed air flow obstruction with an fev1 which is less than 80% also translates into severe asthma or into uncontrolled asthma so poor symptom control frequent exacerbation one serious exacerbation mandating hospitalization and fixed air flow limitation are the four areas where you define uncontrolled asthma why are we discussing this and maybe dr param jyoti has shown the same data this is a dutch population survey of about 8000 people the dutch have the best control of asthma around the world so the numbers here are probably lower than what you would estimate in our country so if you look at patients who are on gina step 4 and step 5 about one out of four patients are on gina step 4 and step 5 of management now in step 4 and step 5 you take out patients who have poor symptom control so then gina step 4 step 5 but still uncontrolled that would bring it down to about 1 in 5 so 17% would be difficult to treat asthma then you take out poor symptom control and these patients having good adherence still having uncontrolled symptoms the number is somewhere between 3 to 4% so that's how you go from 1 out of 4 to 1 out of 5 to 1 out of 25 that's the sort of ballpark figures you're looking at when you define asthma there's two studies in india which have looked at prevalence and burden of severe asthma one our study coming out of East eastern india and one one dr deepak talwar study coming out of the northern part of india and both ballpark talk about a prevalence of somewhere between 8 to 10% of estimate of as severe asthma in our country why are we talking about it because these are the patients who are most prone to getting severe exacerbations these are patients who are dependent on oral corticosteroids and it's not just the asthma it's also the adverse effect of the oral corticosteroids which result in uh, morbidity and mortality in this population increasing healthcare costs in this population this small population of patients and reduced quality of life the next thing we'll talk about briefly is the distinction between difficult asthma 
and severe refractory asthma. So difficult asthma is when your asthma remains uncontrolled, but you have not looked at factors which might promote poor control. So what are factors which might promote poor control? It might be related to poor adherence to the inhalers, poor technique. It could be related to psychosocial factors, dysfunctional breathing. It could be that the environmental trigger which is triggering the asthma has not been taken away or not been controlled and untreated comorbidities like rhinosinusitis, reflux disease, obstructive sleep apnea and other asthma mimics not being corrected are all within the broad umbrella of difficult asthma. When you have corrected these, so all the five factors that you see on there, when you've corrected for these factor, factors and you still have uncontrolled asthma, that's what is severe refractory asthma. So the distinction is between the five factors on there, which are broad-based factors. There's a lot within those factors which need correction. But once you've done that, if your patient is still uncontrolled and symptomatic, that's what you call severe refractory asthma. So this is why I'm sure what Dr. Paramjyoti spoke about. Why is phenotyping important? I've tried to simplify this by talking about three different factors which will signify that phenotyping for your patient should be indicated at that point of time. So if your patient is requiring multiple courses of oral corticosteroids, there's various definitions of what multiple translates into. So multiple could mean more than one, right? So there are some studies which have said three. There's some st studies which have said four courses of oral steroids or a low-dose maintenance oral steroid would come within the ambit of systemic corticosteroids to control treatment. Second is poor control of symptoms. So you heard about the ACT score, the ACQ score. It's your clinical acumen which tells you that the patient's symptom control is poor and the frequent exacerbations that we talked about. So these three factors, patient sat in front of you, you've corrected for the various factors we spoke about. These factors are still present in your patient. This patient requires phenotyping. So Gina in 2018, for the first time, defined five different phenotypes of asthma. These are not the only five, but these are the ones which have been outlined between 2018 and the 2022 GINA guidelines. So allergic, non-allergic, late onset asthma, asthma with fixed airflow obstruction and asthma with obesity are the five different phenotypes of asthma that, has been that, that have been defined by GINA. And in trying to define these phenotypes, there are certain investigations that you and I do in our clinics reasonably simple ones in trying to classify them into these various phenotypes. So the first is total and allergen specific IgE. So IgE is a marker for atopy. If you have a raised IgE beyond 30, some guidelines tell you above 100, that would classify as being atopic asthma. So number one, total and then allergen specific IgE. The second one, and we'll talk about this more as we go along, is exhaled nitric oxide. So again, exhaled nitric oxide helps in defining TH2 inflammation. Potentially, people, when you're measuring symptom frequency, higher the pheno, the greater seem to be the symptom frequency. And more importantly, greater seem to be the propensity for exacerbation in this population of patients. The third one, which is becoming increasing popular, is the blood eosinophil levels. This is a, a defining factor in eosinophilic asthma, TH2 driven asthma, but also importantly, it's important in as a marker of response to certain treatments. It's easy. All of us can do these three tests. So the IgE, the eosinophils, and in some cases, in most cases, pheno nowadays are tests that you can do. The ones after that are more research driven at the moment. There are certain drugs where you would require a periostin to define TH2 inflammation, but we haven't got a license for these drugs as yet. We'll come to sputum eosinophils in a bit. Again, it's a very lab-based, research-based service, but there are certain indications for sputum eosinophils, which we are understanding slowly, where blood eosinophil will not be a surrogate marker or a replacement. So there's a position of sputum eosinophil in a niche number of patients. So let's come to the next concept that I want to sort of establish, especially for the postgraduate trainees, which is clinical remission and asthma. So we know for a fact, so the four arrows that you see on the left tell you that the current pharmacological stepwise treatment that's driven by GINA in patients with asthma 
are focusing on symptom control and reducing exacerbation. So mark my words, it's based on symptom control. You try and make the patient as asymptomatic as possible and B, on reducing exacerbation. However, these patients still continue to exacerbate, still have significant symptom in that 5 to 10% of population that I spoke about. This is from the Tenor database, this large database is in asthma and I'll show you one in which we are participating in India just now. But Tenor is a large database of adult asthmatics and they looked at their patients with severe asthma who were on one, two or three controllers. So look at the graph on the left, the light blue bar is the one with one controller, the darker blue is two controller and the one at the bottom, the purple one is with three controllers. And you can see whether it is about intubation, whether it's about emergency room visits, whether it's about overnight hospitalization, short course oral corticosteroids or unscheduled uh, doctor visits. All of these factors happen in significant numbers in spite of you trying your best as a doctor in giving patients controller therapy and the patient adhering to that treatment in the select number of cases, the 5 to 10 percent of cases that we spoke about. So biologics in the right indication, and I'll keep harping on the right indication because I think, unfortunately, biologics are being prescribed willy-nilly in a lot of cases now. So in the right indication would actually warrant better outcomes, better outcomes for the healthcare professional, better outcome for the patients. So what is the concept of remission that I'm trying to establish here? So you see a lot of chronic disease, the rheumatoid arthritis, the ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, SLE. A lot of these patients with these disease conditions have gone into remission with treatment, which means the disease activity at that point of time is negligible or absent. That's the concept of remission. Take one particular example. Dr. Paramjyoti was talking about rheumatoid arthritis and ILD a little while ago when we were having a cup of tea outside. So this is looking at rheumatoid arthritis, use of biologicals and disease remission. So this is the last 40 years of discovery of biologicals in inducing remission in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Look at 2000, 2000 to 2010, where we talk about remission definition debated and then going on the ACR ULAR task force to treat rheumatoid arthritis with biologics resulting in complete remission. So today, when you're treating a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, you're not looking for control of symptoms. You're not trying to reduce flare-ups, the aim when you give them biologics and disease-modifying drugs is complete absence of symptoms in these individuals. That's what you're aiming for. So those are the three definitions just to get things clear in your head. So symptom relief and symptom control versus clinical remission. Clinical remission is a state where there's no disease activity in a patient who is on or off treatment. So no disease activity on or off treatment is what clinical remission is defined as. Disease modification, on the other hand, and again, you can draw an analogy with rheumatoid arthritis, is where the underlying pathophysiology of the disease is altered. You prevent structural and clinical progression in disease activity and beyond the temporal effects of other interventions. So if clinical remission is up there, disease modification is beneath it. And the ultimate aim, which we have not achieved in chronic diseases as a whole as yet, is cure with this complete reversal of the pathological process and the airways or other structures where this chronic disease has completely reversed. So that's not something we have achieved, but we have achieved clinical remission and we have certainly achieved disease modification in other chronic disease areas. So these are the biologics which are approved globally. The first three biologics are available in India. And again, I won't harp on this. I'm sure Dr. Paramjyoti has spoken about the various biologics available. Suffice to say, omalizumab is a drug which is for atopic individual which binds to IgE and reduces or decreases the expression of the FC receptor site on the cell. It's given as an IM injection as is the other drugs. Mepo binds to, mepolizumab binds to IL-5 and benralizumab binds to the IL-5 receptor antagonist. I want you to look at the common adverse effects on the end and you can see the common adverse effects are mild. None of them are threatening and this is one area of safety with biologics which has been mandated across the board in all the drugs that we use at least in patients with asthma. How would you select patients? And I'm giving you two random examples. One with omalizumab where this is advocated as an add-on therapy. We've had omalizumab in this country for the last 14 years. It 
a license for use in 2014. The license now is for six years and above. And these are the factors that you need to look at. Whether these patients have a positive skin test or a rash to perineal aeroallergen, they need to have a reduced lung function with an FEV1 of less than 80%. So this is the fixed airflow obstruction or the airway remodeling that I was talking about. It's about reduced uh, multiple daytime and nighttime symptoms, asthma exacerbations and receiving the highest dose of inhaled corticosteroid plus a LABA and for our country plus a LAMA. So maximal drug, frequent symptoms, reduced lung function as a positive skin test is what you're looking at. What about, I'm sorry these slides have come up this way, I'm not sure why that is. However, a briefly a minute about eosinophilic asthma. This looks at eosinophilic asthma. Eosinophils in blood in asthmatics in greater number means there's increased exacerbation risk and there's reduced lung function. So elevated eosinophils are correlated with increased asthma severity, worsening lung function, hence increased risk of exacerbation and hence increased risk of hospitalization and emergency room visits. This is uh, the Ronald Bull, a colleague working in the UK who has looked at severe eosinophilic asthma diagnosis and put in major and minor criteria. The major criteria must be present to call it severe eosinophilic asthma. So A, a diagnosis of severe asthma, B, high load of eosinophilic disease either in the blood or in the sputum for our purposes in this uh, sputum, frequent exacerbation, dependence on oral corticosteroids are a must in defining severe eosinophilic asthma. In the minor criteria, this is the phenotyping bit, uh, bit late onset disease, upper airway disease with chronic rhinosinusitis, markers, biomarkers like feed, uh, phenoperiostin DPP-4, so markers which indicate TH to inflammation, fixed airflow obstruction and air trapping and presence of mucus plugs on an expiratory CT scan are factors which tell you that these patients have severe eosinophilic asthma. So for the postgraduates, this is a chart which is worth remembering. So this is the care pathway which again does, has not come up. So I'll put this up. What all it says is that if you have a patient who's got severe asthma, you look at their IgE levels and you look at their blood eosinophil levels. In checking the IgE, if the IgE is raised and the other factors that we spoke about a little while ago for prescription of omalizumab in these individuals is met with, the first drug of choice for you would be omalizumab. If these patients have a low IgE and when we say a low IgE, we generally mean an IgE of below 100. If these patients um, don't have, uh, if they have an increased eosinophil count, you would give them an anti-eosinophil drug the way we described a little while ago. You reassess patients on omalizumab after four to six months. If they have not responded, you look at blood eosinophils. If the blood eosinophils are raised, you would alter therapy and go on to an anti-IL-5 or an anti-IL-5 receptor antagonist. Do these drugs work? So this is a large review paper which looked at 10 years of experience with omarizumab and all the endpoints that you want to look at, inflammation, exacerbation, hospitalization, etc., are improved if you are giving it for the right indication and to the right patient. So let me quickly go on. I've got about four minutes left if I'm counting 24. So let me quickly go on to the last bit, which looks at evaluation of lack of response or suboptimal response to biologics. So Gina has said across the board for all the biologics, not, not just with omalizumab, you should give them a four to six month trial and you should assess them for response to therapy. If a particular therapy fails, you should try a different therapy amongst the biologics which are available in that particular country. Lack of response is not the only indication for switching biologics, there are others. So occurrence of adverse events to the biologic, which is rare but still happens, necessity or desire for more convenient dosing scheme, patient preferences, possible changes in the commercial availability like has happened with omalizumab in our country, and then safety precautions like someone on biologics becomes pregnant, lactating, incidental opportunistic infections, all of these factors might make you change the biologic that you uh, wish to prescribe in these individuals. So I'm sorry, the slides have actually made me finish on time. This is, this is the registry that I was telling about and um, we've got lots of pulmonologists here. ISAR is the largest registry for asthma that's available worldwide just now. You will see India as one of the participants in the ISAR registry. 
Dr. Sandeep Salvi, who's probably going to do the next virtual talk, runs the ISA registry from India. We've got about 250 patients till date. It says 204 on there. It th things have moved on since then. We've got about 250 patients. But people who want to participate in the ISA registry, please let the Respiratory Research Network from Pune, Dr. Salvi's organization know. And I think we'll be very, very happy to increase the in recruitment of patients with severe asthma and develop knowledge about biologics that we have, we have spoken about just now. So the key take-home points for all of you today is that severe asthma is a heterogeneous disease. You have to recognize the heterogeneity, but before you go on to talking about severe asthma, make sure that there are no correctable factors, no comorbidities, no triggers, no mimics of asthma that you've missed out on because of which this asthma is severe asthma. Once you have made sure that it is severe asthma that you've, you're dealing with, you dissect the endotypes and then try and classify them into groups to decide which biologic, if biologic is the treatment of choice there, which biologic is it that you will treat your patient with. The current and future treatments will be around phenotyping, which you've heard about a little while ago. And again, I've told you a little bit about it. Type 2 asthma includes patients with overlapping treatable phenotypes. So you will have patients with a raised IgE and a raised eosinophil count, blood eosinophil count. And here in these overlapping population, you have to look at things like comorbidities, presence of chronic rhinosinusitis, presence of obesity, etc. in deciding which biologic you would start off with and then switch according to indication. And if you follow these patients up in the long term, what you're aiming for is remission rather than control of symptoms, which is the new concept in chronic asthma. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, sir, for an excellent presentation. Um, quickly, we can allow a couple of questions. The postgraduates. I was expecting volume of questions. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Okay. Uh, sir, I would like to ask, uh, when we are at looking at like using biologics and then switch over therapies and switch down and notch it down back to the normal therapy. What is your experience of seeing patients who are already been on trying, you know, in a heterogeneous population there? Yeah. So then, there's lots of connotations to your question. So let us take them one by one. So the first is switch therapy. And I think we spoke about switch therapy briefly. The next thing that you talked about is de-escalating care on biologics, right? So when you talk about de-escalating care, it could be about de-escalating the biologic or it could be about de-escalating the other drugs which you're giving for control of asthma aside from the biologic. So let's take the second scenario first, which is de-escalating other drugs, including the inhaled corticosteroid. So one thing that's established with all the biologics that's been used till date is that the oral steroids, both the rescue courses and the maintenance course of steroids are dramatically reduced if the biologics are used in the long term. What about inhaled steroids? A lot of the studies have shown that there's been more than 50% reduction in the dose of inhaled corticosteroids in patients who are on a biologic and have responded as an excellent responder. Would you want to stop the inhaled corticosteroid in these individuals if there's perfect control? And the answer for the postgraduates especially is a big no. So you would want your patients to remain on at least a small dose of inhaled corticosteroid even if the biologic mandates that your disease is well controlled on the inhaled corticosteroid, on the biologic that these patients are getting. Now the other aspect of your question, which is what happens to the biologic. So I've got a patient, a teacher, a principal of a school in Kolkata, who has now been on omalizumab since 2011. So that's 11 years running. So we don't get many patients like this. Patients would normally stop the biologic themselves, even if you don't tell them to, and then they would get an exacerbation. They would come back to you and restart again. This lady has been an exception and is, she's done remarkably well. So 2010-2011, she actually uh, spent about 40 days in hospital because of exacerbations. Now she's not got admitted to hospital for the last five years. So I think the first discussion when the patient comes and tells you, doctor, I have been fine. I have no symptoms. My quality of life has changed remarkably. I now want to come off the biology. I think the first message that all of us need to give them is that your symptoms, if you stop the biologic, the exacerbations are going to come back 
sooner rather than later. What time frame? So there was a trial called the IMPACT trial which looked at this for omalizumab and they found that the time period was somewhere between two to three years that you had worsening symptoms and the effect completely going away. Various people have various tried various things. Some people have halved the dose of the biologic and seen whether that maintains control or not. Some people have done alternate months. Some people have done it seasonally with varying success. There are no longitudinal big trials which have looked at reduction or modification of dose and maintenance of control. However, the follow-up study for uh, the biologics have shown that at some point of time, in one to three years' time, the symptoms and the exacerbations come with vengeance. So the message is control, uh, continue for as long as possible. If you cannot, then you have to adapt and try various techniques like we have spoken about in trying to control symptoms. So in a summary, I think a low dose inhaled cut, you know, inhale, inhale, inhaler also to be continued even if you are on a biologic, at least that is the advice we probably can give. Yeah, Dr. Rajendra, that's brilliant presentation as usual. Now, uh, de-escalation and disease remission and connecting these two in my mind are bronchial hyper-responsive. Sure. Your thoughts on bronchial hyper-responsiveness, asthma, disease remission, de-escalation, uh, is that a tool to measure? I don't know. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question, Dr. Param Jyoti. So I think um, bronchial hyper-responsiveness is a unique property of certain asthmatics. You remember when I trained in respiratory medicine about 20 years ago, we used to have a term which is called brittle asthmatics. You know, these people would suddenly have very severe airway spasm and for the remaining time, they would have normal lung function. So these are the now so-called exacerbation-prone asthmatics. Now, in these individuals, the inhaled corticosteroid would normally give you very good control. There are some a very small subgroup of patients which was looked at in this ISA registry that I spoke about a little while ago who have continued bronchial hyperresponsiveness on high dose inhaled corticosteroids but their blood eosinophils are low. So these patients have the so-called neutrophilic asthma but still have bronchial hyperresponsiveness and this, this is probably the very small segment of population of patients where you would still advocate bronchial thermoplasty. So, you know, I've had a bronchial thermoplasty machine for the last three years. I have done two cases till date with bronchial thermoplasty. I think with the discovery of more biologics, the cases will become even more rare. But that's one small segment. But I take your point, Dr. Paramjyoti. I think these patients who have a lot of bronchial hyperresponsiveness, if it's not controlled by inhaled corticosteroid, it's still going to be more about symptom control rather than aiming for remission in this population of patients. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If there are no more questions, we'll move on to the next two sessions. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. The next two sessions would be uh, uh, virtual sessions. And the next speaker for the day is Dr. Sandeep Salvi, sir, uh, who is a director of Almoke Research and Foundation, Pune. Uh, sir also does not require any introduction. He is one of the top one of the research scientists in the world uh, and he has more than 250 publication, published papers in peer review journals. So, we'll just start going with the topic with the time. Okay. So, uh, welcome back again. I'm Dr. Sandeep Salvi from Pune. I am sorry I have not been able to uh, meet you all in person. But it's a real pleasure to speak to the postgraduate students of respiratory medicine at the AIG hospital in Hyderabad. I wish I could be there. I could have come there in person, but hopefully next time. What I'm going to cover over the next 20 to 25 minutes is something which is very important for all the postgraduate students. And this is about lung oscillometry, which I believe is going to be the future of lung function testing. And therefore, every pulmonologist and most certainly every postgraduate student pursuing respiratory medicine must know about what is lung oscillometry. All these years, spirometry was the gold standard diagnostic tool that we were using in our clinical practice, either for diagnosis of obstructive airway disease or restrictive lung disease and so on. Uh, but the lung oscillometry is evolving as 
uh, a tool that we attend uh, some of our training programs, uh, one on the left logo that you see called as the Omega training program, uh, which we uh, conduct in most cities over India. So do attend that if, if at all you get a chance. Okay. So before I start, let's appreciate that the lung is a very important organ which nourishes the body with oxygen. On a daily basis, each one of us requires anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 liters of pure oxygen. And the lung <clears throat> delivers that oxygen to us. In addition, the lung also excretes an important waste product called carbon dioxide. 350 liters of carbon dioxide is, is excreted by the lung every day. And in order to perform these two very important functions, we breathe. We breathe 15 times a minute ever since we are born till the day we die. Our life starts with the first breath and then ends with the last breath. 20,000 times a day or 500 million times during a lifetime if you survive for up to 70 years. Uh, with each breath, we pull in half a liter of air, which we call as the tidal volume or tidal breathing, uh, half a liter of air. And uh, this nourishes our body with oxygen and gets rid of carbon dioxide. So this is the tidal breathing that I have shown you. You breathe about 15 times a minute. Each breath you take 500 milliliters. The point I'm trying to make over here is up and above the uh, tidal volume. So there is always a certain volume of air, a bag of volume of air that is always inside the lung on top of which you do your tidal breathing. That volume is called as a functional residual capacity or FRC. And from a physiology point of view, this is the most important lung volume that uh, delivers oxygen to the, uh, to the circulatory system and gets rid of carbon dioxide. So the functional residual capacity in, on an average human being is around three liters. And on top of the three liters, you, you breathe half a liter of air uh, every uh, with every breath. Now, what I have showed in this cartoon over here are two lines going in the opposite direction. The chest wall, depicted in the blue arrows, always wants to go outward. And the lung, which is depicted in red, red arrows, always wants to go inwards. So there are two opposite forces that are present in the thoracic system. So the chest wall wanting to go out, the lungs wanting to collapse and wanting to go inwards. Uh, and it is important to appreciate that when two opposite forces are equal in uh, nature, uh, they are extremely efficient. So here is uh, what I've shown a lift over here. We, all of us have used lifts, isn't it? So we sit in the lift, we enter inside, the door closes. And then if you have to go up, you press a button and then the lift goes up. The lift goes up because there is a, on the other side through the pulley, there is a weight that is attached and that weight is equal to the weight of the lift. So when you use the lift, the only energy that is required to move that lift upwards is a starting point. And then because of the weight itself, the lift goes up. Similarly, you want to go down, you press the button, there's a kick start, the, and the, the motor starts going down and then because of the weight itself, the lift comes down. So uh, efficiency is at its peak when the, there are two opposite forces. And the reason why I'm telling you all this is breathing is such an amazingly efficient process. The lung is an extremely elastic organ. When you take a breath in, your lung expands. It becomes, because it's elastic, it, it expands. And during exhalation, you don't need to waste any energy because the elastic lung that has expanded automatically comes back to its original position. And that is what causes the air to come out during exhalation. So the only energy that we spend during breathing is to pull the air in. Exhalation is a passive process. And as I said, it's one of the most efficient uh, systems of the body. Can you imagine, you know, you breathe so many 10,000 liters of air every day. And in order to do that, the amount of energy that you spend is only 1% to 2% of your total body's energy. That's how extremely efficient the lung is. And the reason why it is so extremely efficient is because of these two opposite forces. The chest wall wanting to go out and the lung wanting to go in. And this is what improves the efficiency to its maximum. Now, here is a very important uh, 
Ohm's law principle that was described by Professor Ohm many, many years ago. Very simple concept. Look at the relationship between pressure, flow, and resistance. What is resistance? Resistance is the change in pressure divided by flow. As simple as that is equal to resistance. Now, whether that resistance is in a in a in a in a tube where water is flowing, or whether it is in a tube where air is flowing, everything is the same. So, if you have to measure the resistance for the air to enter inside your lung, you just have to divide the change in the pressure divided by the flow of air that is happening inside your lung. That will tell you your respiratory resistance. Now, what do we do in lung oscillometry? In lung oscillometry, we force oscillating pressure waves of different frequencies into the lung. And I'm going to repeat this again. We force oscillating pressure waves into the lung when you do your normal tidal breathing. And these pressure waves, these oscillating pressure waves, are sent with different frequencies. So the the, the frequencies start from 5 hertz and end up to 20 hertz. So you can even go up to 30 to 35 hertz. So the range of frequencies is from 5 hertz to 25 to 30 hertz. Okay. So you push these pressure waves at different frequencies during your normal tidal breathing. And what this machine measures is a change in the pressure and the flow. So the change in the pressure divided by the flow is what will tell you the resistance of the airways. Now, uh, let me explain this a little more further. Now, these oscillating pressure waves can be generated by various techniques. You could use a loudspeaker. You know, the same loudspeaker that you use to listen to music. That loudspeaker can also push in oscillating pressure waves at different frequencies. Or you could have an oscillating pump. Or you could have a piezoelectric a thing that keeps on fluttering. So, different ways in which you can create these oscillating pressure waves and you force them into uh, entering inside the lung. And what you measure is the change in the pressure and the flow, which will tell you the resistance in your respiratory system. So oscillometry is all about measuring pressure and flow. But even within that pressure and flow, there are some very important components. As you can see over here, there are three different things that can happen. The pressure and the flow go exactly at the same time. Or the flow goes ahead of the pressure wave. Or the pressure wave goes ahead and then the flow comes behind that. Now, based on these three different, uh, these three different situations, you measure three different outcomes. So when the pressure and the flow go exactly at the same time, then you measure the resistance of the respiratory tract, pure resistance. Now, when the flow goes ahead of the pressure, then you're actually measuring the compliance or the elasticity of the lung. And when the pressure goes ahead of the flow, then you measure something called as inertance. And I will come to this in the subsequent slides, but these are the parameters that the oscillometry test measures. Resistance, compliance, inertance. Okay, just remember these three things. I will take you through this very slowly. Now, here I've depicted uh, uh, an image of a well, a cartoon of a lung. So all the airways are put in, into one airway, and all the alveoli I put them into as one common alveoli, just like a balloon, a straw and a balloon. The only the only difference is the straw is uh, you know is big to start with and then becomes very, very small as we go down. Now, the resistance <clears throat> uh, that is offered for the air to go inside your lungs is because of the narrowing of the airways. Now, the airways already are already narrow, as you can see here. But uh, if you look at the uh, components of the airways, you have airways, which we would call as the large airways. And then you can call the remaining portion as the peripheral airways. So you can measure the resistance in the large airways. You can measure the resistance in the peripheral or the small airways. Okay, so the resistance can be different in the large airways. The resistance can be different in the small airways. 
potential. Now the other, so that is the component of resistance that we are measuring. How narrow are the airways that is impeding the passage of air to go inside the lung? If you have narrow airways, it, it is going to be more difficult for the air to go inside the lung, right? Because it's causing resistance. The inner tube properties are, if you look at this functional resident capacity, which I told is about three liters, right? At any given point of time during a tidal breathing, there is three liters of air inside your lung. Now that air also has got some mass. So when you're pushing in a pressure wave, that mass of air will also produce some obstruction. And that obstruction that it produces is called inertance or inertive properties. Then you go, then you have something called as the compliance of the elastic properties of the lung. So when you take a, when the air is going inside, the alveoli are opening, the, like a balloon is opening up. And then during exhalation, they come back to the original position. Again, during inhalation, they go up, they come down. So this movement of the elastic alveolar wall is called compliance or elasticity. Now the resistance is the uh, is the is the obstruction offered by the airways, and the reactance is the energy that you spend in moving that air column, and the energy that you spend in opening the elastic fibers of the lung or the alveoli. So that is called impedance and compliance. Together, impedance and compliance are called reactance. So essentially, oscillometry measures only two things. What is the respiratory resistance? What is the respiratory reactance? Reactance is the inertance component and the compliance component. I will explain this to you in a little more simpler manner in the subsequent slides. So this is your branching pattern of the airway. It starts with the trachea, which is generation zero. Then you have the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. This is generation one. And then they keep on dividing generation two, generation three, generation four, generation five, until you reach generation 23. So there are 23 times that the airways keep on branching until you reach the uh, alveolar portion of the lung. Now, what I have shown over here is, see, zero is the, the trachea. Before the trachea, air passes through the nasal cavity, the nose, then the pharynx. So the resistance that is offered by the nose and the upper respiratory tract, that contributes to 66% of the total respiratory resistance. Then from uh, trachea, to the eighth generation are the large airways. So the contribution of resistance from the large airways is around 20%. Anything below the eighth generation, from the eighth generation to the 23rd generation, is all small airways. So the small airways, they contribute only to 7% of the total respiratory resistance. And the alveoli, the, the, the elastins and the compliance, that contributes to 7% of the total resistance. So to, together, you can see that the distal portion of the lung, which includes the small airways and the alveoli, they contribute very little to the total respiratory resistance. Okay, I think it's just important to remember that. So this 20% is the large airways, and this 7% is the small airways. Uh, that is about resistance. Now, very interestingly, you know, when you pass in these pressure waves, oscillating pressure waves of different frequencies, very interesting uh, property of oscillatory pressure waves or even sound waves. Sound waves are oscillatory pressure waves. Low frequency travels a longer distance. High frequency travels a shorter distance. Let me give you a simple example. I'm sure you all must have listened to the radio. You must have listened to AM. And then you must have listened, listened to FM. AM is amplitude modulation where we have low frequency radio waves now because they are low frequency you can transmit those radio waves to the entire country so am you can hear it across the entire country whatever is being played in delhi you can hear it here in hyderabad you can hear it hear it here you can hear it here in pune from delhi the radio waves reach hyderabad why because they are low frequency high frequency they travel shorter distances FM is high frequency, radio energy, 91.1 FM. They, because they're high frequency, they travel only for up to five or 10 kilometers. They cannot travel more than that. So this is a fundamental property of sound, fundamental property of oscillating pressure waves. Low frequency travels longer distances, high frequency travels shorter distances. So based on that, 
the frequencies that we use for oscillometry starting point is 5 hertz which is the lowest frequency so this lowest frequency this pressure wave reaches right up to the top right up to the bottom from the top to the bottom these pressure waves will reach right up to the alveoli on the other hand the 20 hertz which is higher frequency they will travel only up to a shorter distance they go only up to the large airways after that they they get dispersed they don't travel after that so high frequency travels shorter distances now that is interesting five hertz will tell you the resistance in the total respiratory tract 20 hertz will tell you the resistance in the large airways but what if i want to find the resistance in the small airways very simple i do something called as R5 minus R20 is the resistance in the small areas. As simple as that. So 5 hertz, total respiratory resistance. 20 hertz is large airways. And R5 minus R20, small airways resistance. Okay. So these are the parameters that we get in oscillometry. Then I talked about uh, the inertance, isn't it? So bag of air, FRC, 3 liters, 1.5 liters in one lung, 1.5 liters in the other lung. Uh, and then this bag of air has got some weight. You know how much is the weight of that air in the lung? It's about 3.7 grams. Is the weight of your pen drive, whatever you call it. Uh, and so, so, so that's the 3 liters of air. Now, if you take 3 liters of helium, the weight of helium, helium is a very light gas. See the weight of that, 0.5 grams. Whereas the weight of air, air is heavy because of oxygen. It's 3.7 grams. Does it make a difference? Yes, of course it does. You know, you should see these YouTube videos where people inhale helium gas into their lungs. And when they start talking after that, you see the change in the voice. It sounds very, very funny. Do listen to these uh, YouTube videos when people uh, inhale helium. That's because the helium has got no weight, very little weight. And therefore, the sound that is generated is also very of a very, very different quality. So inertance is because of the air column. Then compliance. Compliance is the ability to expand. You know, you take an elastic band. So the amount you can pull, the ability to pull is called compliance. And when after you have pulled, it comes back to its original position. That is called as elastance. Compliance is how much more you can stretch. Elastance is how much it does it come back to its original position. So here in a normal compliance, you know, the lung is an extremely compliant organ. Even for a very small pressure, one unit pressure, uh, you know, you have 200 mLs of air that goes inside, inside the lung. Uh, in emphysema or aging, the compliance increases. For the same change in the pressure, one unit change in the pressure, the alveolar balloon, big balloon they become. Because they, are, because they have more compliance, but the elasticity goes up. And therefore, they are unable to come back to their original position. In COPD and in the aged lung, big compliance, but poor elastics. In the interstitial lung disease patients, because there is fibrosis in the alveoli, there is loss of elasticity. And therefore, the compliance reduces. But the elasticity becomes very high in patients with interstitial lung disease. So compliance is a very important component of lung function that oscillometry test measures. Spirometry is unable to tell you about what is happening about lung compliance, whereas oscillometry is a test that tells you. Now, unlike spirometry, where you have the two volumes, FEV1 and FVC, and then you have the two flows, the PEFR and the FEF25 to 75, oscillometry has but other parameters. Now, here is the graph that you will get in an oscillometry test. From here is a zero line in the middle. Anything above that will tell you what is the resistance in the respiratory system. Okay, on the top portion is the resistance. The below portion is the reactance. So negative, it starts negative. Then the reactance is negative. And then after some time, it crosses the zero line and it becomes positive. So that is a green line. The green line is the line of reactance. The red line is the line of resistance. On the x-axis is the frequency from 5 hertz, which is the lowest frequency that we use, to 20 hertz. Sometimes you even go up to 30, 35 hertz. Okay, so this is the frequency. 5 hertz, 6 hertz, 7 hertz, 10 hertz, 15 hertz, 20 hertz. 
This is the resistance and the reactance. The unit for resistance and reactance is centimeters of water per liter per second, as you can see here. But it can also be uh, uh, presented as kilopascal units per liter per second. And I'll tell you how to convert that. So from a resistance perspective, in a normal healthy individual, the normal resistance is around 4 centimeters of water, up to 4 centimeters of water here. And at 5 hertz, it's 4. 10 hertz, it's 4. 20 hertz, it's 4. That means resistance is frequency independent. And no matter what the frequency is, the resistance still remains the same. Okay? R5 is resistance at 5 hertz. R20 is resistance at 20 hertz. Normal healthy individual, it's a straight line. Now, the reactance lines, which is the green, which is the yellow line over here, it starts with a negative value. Then the reactance crosses the zero line. This point where the reactance touches the zero line is called as the FRES or the resonant frequency. And then after that, it becomes a positive line, which is called as the inertance. So the inertance is the positive portion. And this negative green line becomes the compliance portion. Compliance, inertance, and this is the resonant frequency. The triangle that is formed from 5 hertz to the resonant frequency, this triangular portion is called as AX or area of reactance. Okay? What is X? X is reactance. Reactance at 5 hertz. Reactance at 20 hertz will be here. So this is how the graph of an oscillogram looks like. Now, as I told you about R5, R20, R5 minus R20, resonant frequency is uh, FRS. The other parameter that you get is X5, reactance at 5 hertz, which has to be little negative. And then this triangular portion is called as the area of reactance. Then even within the reactance, you have X5 reactance at 5, frequ 5 hertz frequency. You can measure it during inspiration. You can measure it during expiration. Uh, and the difference between the inspiratory and expiratory reactants at 5 hertz is called delta X5. And then these are the other parameters that can be, that are also measured in oscillometry, but we'll not go into the details of that. In the meantime, just keep, have a look at these parameters, which are important. Now, again, let me show you how the uh, graph looks, looks like in a healthy person, what happens in asthma, what happens uh, in civisiopin. So this is the zero line, frequency 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, resistance on the upper portion, reactance on the bottom portion, uh, all measured in centimeters water per liter per second or kilopascals per liter per second. Uh, you can convert centimeters of water per liter per second by multiplying the KPA value by 10.197. This is the conversion factor. So either most, uh, most oscillometry tests they measure it in centimeters of water, but some measure it in kPa. Now, the normal resistance from 5 hertz to 20 hertz, as I said, it's around 4 centimeters of water. And the reactance is a small negative over here uh, in, up to this portion. So this line over here is a no resistance line of a normal healthy individual at 5 hertz, 10 hertz, 15 hertz, 20 hertz, 25 hertz, straight line. Irrespective of what the frequency is, this, the resistance line remains straight. The reactance line starts from a negative portion. It touches the zero line over here. So this becomes a resonant frequency. The resonant frequency will be 10 hertz. And then after that, it becomes the inertance portion of the lung. So this is the line of a normal healthy individual. What happens in mild asthma or what, what happens in large airways obstruction? Large airways. R5 is also increased, R20 is also increased. So this is large airways obstruction, okay, higher than the normal, and it remains the same, straight line above the normal line. So this is obstruction in the large airways. Obstruction in the small airways, you can see that R5 value has gone up, R20 has come, is back to normal. So increase R5, and a normal R20 is mild obstructive airway disease. Moderate obstructive airway disease is R5 becomes even more higher. R20 is borderline normal. And as, as obstruction becomes even severe obstructive airway disease, R5 becomes much more higher. 
and R20 becomes closer to normal. So what is tend to get is R5 minus R20, that value becomes very big. And therefore, as the severity of obstructive airway disease increases, mild, moderate, severe, you keep on getting more and more of small airways obstruction. And this is the resistance line that you get in obstructive airway disease. Now the reactance line, how does it look like? So this is for a normal healthy individual. This is the reactance line. Mild obstructive airway disease, the line becomes more negative at 5 hertz. And then the resonant frequency also shifts to the right. So normal healthy individual has a resonant frequency of 10 hertz. Mild obstructive airway disease is between 10 to 15 hertz. And then you can see the inner trend lines goes up. Then moderate, uh, moderate and severe, you can see that X5 becomes more negative. Your, uh, react, uh, your, res your resonant frequency becomes more higher. And the triangle becomes very big, the AX that I told you before. AX becomes a huge triangle over here. So these are the lines that you get in obstructive airway disease. So here is what you see in asthma. So the blue dotted line is normal, healthy individual straight line. This is the green, the green dotted line is the reactance line, healthy individual, pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator. So the resistance reduces after giving a bronchodilator. Good is good drop in the resistance. Uh, and you can see the reactance line, pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator. The reactance becomes less negative, goes in the upward direction. Uh, what happens in COPD? You can see that the pre-bronchodilator R5 becomes very high. R20 is normal because COPD is a disease that mainly affects small airways. So normal R20, very high R5. R5 minus R20 will be huge over here. After giving a bronchodilator, there is improvement in R5, but R20 remains the same. Similarly, if you look at the uh, reactants, pre-bronchodilator and the post-bronchodilator, uh, there is good bronchodilator reversibility that you can see, but not as much as what we see in asthma. And look at the area of the reactant, the triangle. Pre-bronchodilator triangle is this one, and this is the post-bronchodilator triangle. So this is how you interpret oscillometry. Uh, I'm not going to show you this, but let me just show you a few graphs over here. This is the oscill iOS of a three-year-old uh, boy, 14 kg, who had three hospitalizations for asthma. Parents were not sure whether this is asthma. You can see this pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator. This is only for resistance, and this is for reactants. Pre-bronchodilator and post-bronchodilator. You can see that there's a big bronchodilator response in resistance parameters and reactance parameters. This is how you get the report. And based on that, you can make some interpretation. Another case of a 48-year-old professional singer, uh, you can see pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator, and then pre-bronchodilator reactants. So this is the resonant frequency over here. After giving a bronchodilator, this is the resonant frequency. And look at the area of reactants over here compared to the pre-bronchodilator. So this, these are the classical graphs that you get in uh, uh, in the oscillogram or uh, in oscillometry. Now, interesting to note that uh, with age, your resistance values at birth are very high. They keep on reducing up to the up to you up to the age of 13 to 15. After 15, they has the same value right until your adulthood. No change. Same thing for reactants. <coughs> So very low reactance at birth. As you grow, your reactance value becomes less negative. By 15 years, it reaches the highest point over here. And then after, after 15, it's a straight line. Interesting point is, in adulthood, you don't need predicted values. You need single cutoff values to say whether this is normal or abnormal. So that's one of the advantages of uh, reading oscillometry. So what are the advantages of oscillometry over spirometry? Well, very simple test to perform. You just do normal tidal breathing. Nothing like what you have to do in spirometry. Take a deep inhalation, blow out forcefully for as long as possible. It's a very tiring test, spirometry. Oscillometry is a very, very simple test to perform, easy to perform. More sensitive than spirometry in picking up small airways obstruction. It also tells you the, func the, the other additional mechanical properties of the lung, such as compliance and elastins and plus additional properties of the mechanical properties of the lung. So uh, this was just to sensitize you about oscillometry. 
uh, do start reading about it, understand what is resistance, what understand what is reactance, and then you will start understanding the value of lung oscillometry in your clinical practice. So I'm going to stop over here, and I hope that uh, you will you will start using this important tool in your uh, in your hospital wherever you're studying, and learn oscillometry because this is going to be the future of lung function testing. So thank you very much, and I uh, wish you all the very best in your in your in your careers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That is an uh, excellent spoon feeding uh, and a difficult topic like this by uh, none other than uh, Sandeep Salvi, sir. Uh, and then I think we are breaking for lunch because one session by Dr. Indrapal Singh Sagal approach to bronchitis is pushed to post lunch. So we would be breaking for lunch uh, now. So, yeah, since it is very late, we will break for lunch here. Uh, Dr. Indrapal sir's talk will be uh, postponed in the next session. Before going to the lunch, uh, I would like to request the chairpersons to kindly uh, give the moment of appreciation to Dr. Chandana, madam. And please come on the stage. I would like to request Krishnamurti sir to kindly come on the stage and give the mementos to uh, the moderators. Kind attention please, since we are running late, we will have a lunch break of 30 minutes and we will be assembling back after 30 minutes to start the next session. Thank you, moderators.
Good boy. I'm good. Good evening.
Shall we start the program? Hi, welcome to all. Uh, myself, Dr. Vinay, consultant pulmonologist in AIG Hospital. I accordingly invite the uh, chairperson, Dr. Srikar sir, Dr. Kudus sir, and Dr. Anand Gupta sir. Dr. Srikar sir is a consultant pulmonologist in Apollo Hospital. And Dr. Kudus sir is an associate professor in Medicity Medi Hospitals. Dr. Anand Gupta sir, he is a consultant critical care physician in at AJ Hospital. Kindly invite the speakers. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, welcome back after your lunch break. So, we'll call on uh, Dr. Deepak Talwar, sir, who doesn't really require a further introduction, but he is the director and chair of Metro Institute of uh, Respiratory Diseases, NOIDA, and a teacher par excellence with uh, numerous accolades, numerous publications in all reputed international journals. So, welcome, sir. Uh, on, on to Dr. Deepak Talwar, sir. He'll be speaking on the phenotypes of uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis. Good afternoon, everyone. And yeah, am I audible? Yeah, good. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, chairpersons. And uh, I'm very happy to see lots of postgraduates. Whenever I travel to Hyderabad, I see lots of them. So, uh, and they're all very energetic, very, very uh, enthusiastic, and all becoming international pulmonologists from this part of the world. So, uh, all the best. And I'm going to talk about sarcoidosis phenotypes and treatment. So, as we know that uh, we are slowly moving from a treatment strategy which is like one size fits all to something which is more personalized therapy, like for an individual patient, a specific kind of therapy. And this concept is based on what is called as phenotyping. In a simple words, the diseases by 80 to 90 percent can all be treated by whatever is the guideline based treatment given, which works in almost that number of people. But then there are always outliers, 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, depending upon disease to disease. And they would require not only much more aggressive efforts to treat them, but also it will require a lot of intuitive brains to improve their outcomes because these are the patients who suffer a lot and they have also chances of early mortality. So that's the concept of phenotyping which is very well established in severe asthma as well as in bronchiectasis, coming up in lung cancer and also coming up in various other diseases including sarcoidosis which I'm going to talk about today. So a quick word about what is phenotype. If I ask the postgraduates what is the phenotype, they, they, they come up with some fancy definitions. What it means is simply the extreme. So if you are given a basket of apples and there are red apple, yellow apple, green apple and a pink apple, they're all apples at the end of the day. But then they're all different. And that different color makes them different phenotypes. But what makes them into a different color and a taste is the genetics of that apple as well as the kind of environment it is given to them, the soil and the fertilizers. And that all goes into the ultimate color and the taste and the texture which comes out of it, which is the actually the pathogenesis part of it or rather the mechanisms by which it happens, which requires what is called as endotyping. So it's basically we are trying to find out what are the gross characteristics of those sarcoid patients which can be picked up and can help us in the outcome improvement and that is the therapeutics and targeted therapies which we talk about. So we do understand that sarcoidosis is a heterogeneous disease because it may involve each and every part of the body and it may not involve any other part of the body except the lungs or the glands. So highly variable. 
and most of it that is 70 to 80 percent of them will resolve within two to three years without treatment even so what it means is that we really need to phenotype them so that we do not need to treat 100% sarcoid patients and we only treat those which are not likely to resolve, which are likely to go on to develop progressive damage, which happens in about 20 to 30% or to go on to develop a chronic progressive disease, which is like around 10 to 15%. And of course, the ones which reach the other end, which is the mortality. We don't want a mortality. We know that sarcoid is a good disease. It does decrease your survival, but not to the extent which other diseases are doing at the moment. But even why that much of mortality should be accepted in sarcoidosis if we can help it. So this is a review in rheumatology. You can read that if you want. It gives all details about it. But the process of phenotyping in sarcoidosis is much more complex than in asthma because it requires only to identify this bad characteristics of sarcoidosis which is severe chronic progressive are uh, damaging and life-threatening so you need to identify only the ones which needs to be taken care of aggressively as well as perhaps with much more attention from the physicians so idea is to improve their survival because this type of sarcoidosis is associated with poor survival so what kind of things required for that? We require a lot of assessments. And these are physiological, like lung functions, radiological, imaging characteristics and CT scan, clinical, depending upon their findings and other things of various organ involvements, and ultimately, what impact they have overall on long term in the prognosis of sarcoidosis, assessing their activity, extent of involvement, and severity of disease. So you can see that diagnosing simple sarcoidosis is not the end of the day you need to do a lot other assessments in these patients to come to a conclusion where you need to thread out those patients who are likely to have poor outcome and you need to keep looking for it because one fourth patients of sarcoidosis diagnosed today in the next two to three years will develop a new organ involvement and every time they come up with a single organ involvement, to whichever specialist they go, there is an invariably delay in the diagnosis, which leads to more damage to their organs and sometimes irreparable damage. Like you have seen patients who have lost vision completely because eye sarcoid was missed in them. And cardiac sarcoidosis is another example where they land up with arrhythmias, where the uh, intraventricular assist devices are put in, but the diagnosis of sarcoidosis comes after everything has been done for these patients. So, it's a multi-organ disease, but peculiarly, as I told you, each organ is not involved in an individual patient. So these are called as cluster analysis. In cluster analysis, what you try to do is you pick up 400, 500 patients and try to see which organs are involved in which patients and try to see if they are clustering around. And you can clearly see that there are three clusters which are glaring at us. One is the abdominal one in which multiple abdominal organs are involved. Then we have oculocardic neurocutaneous. So along with skin, uh, neuro, uh, uh, neural cardiac involvement is there as well as they have eye involvement. And then we have pulmonary which is inv invariably associated with lymph nodules as well as musculoskeletal as well as uh, musculoskeletal and cutaneous involvement. So there are three or four clusters which are easily seen. The idea of why to know about the clusters is because when you look for one disease where you are diagnosing sarcoidosis at one particular organ, you should remember that what are the other clusters involved in it with it so that you can screen them and look at their involvement. The sad part of the story of multi-organ involvement of sarcoidosis is 90% of other organs which are involved are asymptomatic. So what you need to do is you need to screen them. And for that we have certain guidelines as to whom to screen and what to screen. So every patient who is diagnosed as pulmonary sarcoidosis, because you are all pulmonologists here, you diagnose as pulmonary sarcoidosis, do you need to screen them for kidney involvement? The answer is yes, the guidelines are there. Every patient must be screened for renal sarcoidosis and the test required is a serum creatinine. You must do it, abnormal creatinine may be present in 7% of patients. But the most important thing is 100% it is asymptomatic. When you pick it up, 
you can treat it and if you do not pick it up it leads to development of ckd and if you pick it up and treat it that's what we call it reversible renal failure and that's the hallmark of sarcoidosis so you pick them up early treat them and prevent organ damage so every patient must be screened for kidney what about eye eye involvement is more frequent one fourth patients will have eye involvement with pulmonary involvement but very importantly like 100% in renal asymptomatic almost 90% symptomatic in eye red eye they invariably go but where they go wrong is they the routine ophthalmologist are not trained to look after the sarcoid eye so there 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 should be a very uh, good association where an ophthalmologist also knows what to look for whether it is the anterior segment or a posterior segment because we know that anterior segment is most often involved but posterior segment also need to be looked into and this is also responsive to treatment and we also need to look for eye evolve involvement in all sarcoid patients on routine screenings as well as monitorings because if we give them drugs like steroids or hcqs you need to monitor their toxicities also so every patient who is diagnosed as pulmonary sarcoidosis should have a baseline eye examination from an ophthalmologist who is trained to look into sarcoid eyes i think the last part of my story is very clear a routine eye examination by any eye specialist is just not enough what about heart heart is the most life threatening sarcoid involvement because it can kill the patients and it carries the mortality on its head and it presents with abnormal ecg in about again 7% of patients and any abnormality picked on ecg of a sarcoid patient increases the risk for mortality many fold high so it is suggested that every patient of pulp sarcoidosis which is diagnosed pulmonary sarcoidosis should have a baseline ecg evaluation to screen for cardiac involvement even if they don't have symptoms but what if they have symptoms if they have symptoms of chest pain dyspnea palpitations or irregular heart beats then you need to go beyond that to look for cardiac involvement and what is the ideal investigation for cardiac involvement that is a cardiac mri so gadolinium enhancement with late phase follow up of cardiac mri is required for those patients who have symptoms to suggest that they might have cardiac involvement and this this is over what we talk about cardiac pat and we talk about uh, eco eco has no role here at all but we do get sometimes reversible cardiomyopathy which is uh, treated with oral corticosteroids and the patients improve with the heart failure which is secondary to sarcoidosis liver involvement now liver involvement is seen as abnormal liver function test in 12% of patients but again it is asymptomatic 100% so you need to do a liver function test to pick up the liver involvement and it is invariably if you do the biopsy you'll get the granuloma there 96% positivity for granulomas and uh, because it's not picked up most of the times it's not treated but when it is associated with other organ involvement steroids are given and of course one of the red signal will be that if it is involved avoid the hepatotoxic drugs so what tests you need sgot sgpt bilirubin no serum alkaline phosphatase and what is the threshold to start investigating for liver involvement any value which is above 1.5 times of the upper limit of normal dictates that you need to involve the hepatologist to look into the liver involvement of sarcoidosis calcium metabolism very frequently forgotten in the land of sun and shine which we have we get a lot of mishaps which happen because of calcium calcium metabolism again seen as hypercalcemia in 6% hypercalciuria in 10 to 20% but renal failure occurs in almost 40% of hypercalcemic patients and again it is reversible if picked up by time in our icu every month one patient of sarcoid arrives with a hypercalcemic acute kidney injury which is reversible the reason being for all aches and pains they are provided with calcium and vitamin d which leads to further worsening of their hypercalcemia and we do not actually look for serum calcium which needs to be screened for every newly diagnosed case of sarcoidosis what about vitamin d so we do uh, vitamin d3 sa it is low we start them on vitamin d 
and what it happens we know that sarcoid has got a macrophages granulomas which secretes 125 dihydroxycholical which is 125 d3 and that is in abundance in fact it is considered four times higher than the routine uh, d3 and in these situations if you supplement with d vitamin d orally to these patients they develop hypervitaminosis d and again develop a renal failure with hypercalcemia and this is very important because vitamin D is given routinely to every patient who is given oral steroids. So, it is recommended that if you are not giving vitamin D supplementation to a patient, you might not screen the patients for vitamin D. But if you anticipate that vitamin D needs to be given, then you need to screen them. But not with D3, but you need to do it for 125 dihydroxycholicalciferol D, vitamin D, not routine D3. And if you do both of them, then the ratio of more than uh, the uh, 1 is to 4 is actually one of the very good predictor of diagnosis of sarcoidosis even. But what it means is a granulomatous disease. So, any other granulomatous disease could be doing the similar thing. Pulmonary artery. So, sarcoid associated pulmonary hypertension is seen in 5 to 20 percent of patients and uh, ECO identifies in about only 30 percent. So, very poor test echocardiography to pick up pulmonary artery hypertension. Uh, so, the guideline is routine that if you pick up pulmonary hypertension, you have to confirm it with right heart catheterizations because anti-PH drugs have entered into the area where sarcoid associated pulmonary hypertension can be effectively treated with them. And this is one of the most important cause of persistent dyspnea in pulmonary sarcoidosis patients which we keep treating them with steroids and immunosuppressives and antifibrotics, forgetting that it is more treatable easily treatable only thing is you should be able to diagnose sarcoid associated pulmonary hypertension so when you suspect ph you can do tt transthoracic echocardiography but confirmation is from the right heart catheterization then we move on to severity of sarcoidosis how do we look into severity so we go by symptoms which is again a very very uh, non specific non sensitive of deciding whether the pulmonary sarcoidosis is causing dyspnea or something else. So, most important is lung functions and in the lung functions, the vital capacity and a diffusion capacity are the two most important parameters to be looked for in a patient of sarcoidosis because they are the ones which are determinants of overall survival and those who have good values, they do not need treatment and those who have bad values will require the treatment. I will tell you in a little while which ones and then we go on to imaging. You can see couple of images which are being shown classically, none of them require treatment. It is only basically you diagnose the stage and you remember up to the stage 3 spontaneous resolutions do occur. Only it is the stage 4 where it is 0. And decision to treat will depend upon more on physiological dysfunction rather than inflammation or symptoms. But inflammation is also seen and that can be targeted now effectively with the PET scans. And these are the typical images which you get and uh, we have even coined their norms, uh, names for them. Lungs are published. And we have some genetic markers. So, actually, uh, RP 1.03 is actually the one which protects with the better outcomes in patients with sarcoidosis rather than HLA DRB1 which is for the chronic sarcoidosis. So, on the basis of all the available data, we decide them on the limited or the persistent phenotypes. The limited ones are the ones which go on to spontaneous resolution or very well into remission after the short courses of steroids. But the persistent are the ones which continue to relapse and they may be fibrotic or non-fibrotic and of course, the fibrotic ones carry the worst prognosis. And then comes to the second part of presentation, how do we treat them? So, do we need to treat all of them? Simple answer is no. So, whom to treat is more difficult answer. Only in those two group of patients in whom, number one, there is a threat to life. So, those organ involvements which cause threat to life. So, threat to life is clearly cardiac and neuro, but also to eye. And then, second point to treat is to improve their quality of life. For threat to life, the, it is basically the steroid dose is determined to decrease that threat to life. For quality of life, there is always a kind of a mutual discussion with the patient because you want to improve the quality of life. steroid dose is to just improve that, not to target any kind of inflammation or therapies. So, what are the lung findings which tells us that this patient clearly needs treatment? 
So that is FVC less than 60%, DLCO less than 40% and KCO less than 60% because this is a clear red flags that these patients will deteriorate and they need to be treated with steroids. Also, if on CT imaging you find that the involvement of fibrosis in the lungs is more than 20%, it is a stage 4 disease or the, there is a pulmonary artery dilated, then also they need to be treated but safe zones, green zone. So any amount of the, you know, the nodules and things which you see on a CT scan does not mean treatment. If so long, FVC is above 70%, DLCO is above 60% and KCO is above 70%. So when you use steroids, you primarily use it to improve or preserve the functional vital capacity, the FVC or quality of life. So you start with the medium dose, 0.3 to 0.6. Nobody uses high dosages and the maximum dose is 30 to 40 milligrams. Preferably now everybody wants to keep them below 30 and these are en en enough to give it for 4 to 6 weeks and then start tapering them. If they relapse, then you need to work for further. But you are not able to decrease the dose of corticosteroids, you need to use these second line therapies. So 70% of pulmonary sarcoidosis which is diagnosed is at low risk and they don't need treatment. Only the 30% who are at high risk will require a glucocorticoids. Those in whom we are not able to taper the glucocorticoids or the disease activity is there on glucocorticoids or they relapse after stopping it. You need to use the alternative therapy line 2 or the treatment option number 2 which is immunosuppressive. So you have methotrexate, azathioprine, lefilomide and MMF. All of them have been tried, but by and large, the maximum data is on methotrexate. You start with methotrexate, and if the patient is unable to tolerate, then azathioprine MMF can be equally given. So these are the choices of the second-line therapies, but second-line therapies are given to those patients in whom glucocorticoids have been given, and the lowest possible dose is not achieved. They are on the risk of developing side effects of oral corticosteroids or they have a continued disease or a relapses. So to control that, you use the second line therapy. What about the third line therapies? Those patients who are on glucocorticoids and other immunosuppressives but still continue to deteriorate where again you want to preserve their lung functions and preserve their quality of life. So the third alternatives are biologics that is infleximab, adalimumab and rituximab. Rituximab is in fact considered as the fourth choice. So third choices are infleximab and adalimumab depending upon whether the patient wants it in the OP or he wants to go home uh, or he wants to get admitted in the hospital. Infleximab is the one which we most commonly use because, uh, because the patients are more happy in the hospital environment and taking the uh, injections completely. In fact, if I remember only uh, two patients have been on adalimumab while infleximab is on a lot more patients. And then finally, if that also does doesn't work, still these patients, if they have activity in the lungs, which you can only pick up by the PET scans, not by the routine CT scans, you might use even a rituximab. So these are the flow charts for the third and the fourth line therapies and even JAK inhibitors have come to the fourth line therapies for sarcoidosis. But of course, I am not touching upon the last part which is the antifibrotics in this because we know that when you have exhausted the fourth line, then only actually we are supposed to add the antifibrotics for sarcoidosis patients. So we must reach at least third line immunosuppressives before considering that the lungs which are seen as black and white on CT scans are actually so fibrotic that there will be no immunosuppression which will be effective. And at the moment, the only tool which can do this effectively is a PET scans. There is a clear trial antimycobacterial which used four drugs which, which was a lot talked about, levofloxacin, ethambutol. This is last slide, please. Uh, levofloxacin, ethambutol, azithromycin and rifabutene for 16 weeks. Considering that there is uh, some common antigens uh, between the mycobacterium and the what we see in sarcoidosis, thinking that it will improve the outcome of these patients who have chronic pulmonary sarcoidosis. So in these patients, this was given for 6 weeks because the Phase 1 trial was very good and encouraging, but phase 2 trial actually failed. It did not show any improvement in these patients, but did show that ESAT-6, which is the antigen which was tested in the blood at the beginning, did show significant decrease 
after giving this 16 weeks of uh, uh, clear trial uh, anyways this trial is no longer now recommending this regimen to be used in any patient at the moment so i'll conclude here that uh, sarcoid is a heterogeneous disease variable presentations variable course and variable outcomes however the biggest problem at the moment is on the day one very difficult to predict which patient's course is going to be bad and outcomes are going to be poor so we know few requires treatment and this will require a thorough assessments at baseline and a periodic monitoring for these patients and if we find a cluster we try to more um, um, i think we will work more aggressively to pick up the other organs involved in that cluster and uh, try to see that what all can be done by the treatment to decrease their um, uh, sorry to decrease their suffering by improving the quality of life as well as decrease their mortality or a long term mortality oral steroids are the first choice even today but immunosuppressives have come up to the fort any patient who's beyond 3 months of steroids because now oral steroids above the dose of 10 milligrams per day for more than 3 months is associated with steroid induced toxicity and and even when it looks that nothing will work in this patient these patients uh, we should remember that uh, there may be still fdg avid areas in the lung which are not amenable to first line and second line and hence a third line therapy may be offered to them with that i would like to thank you all for patiently listening to me okay Thank you, sir, for summarizing such an uh, elusive disease with cross uh, clinical radiological and clinical metabolic discordance. Any questions from the audience, please? Sir, just I want to know one thing, sir. In our center, we saw many patients with the psychodosis, with the extra involvement of the cardiac side also. And uh, they found with the lung and then cardiac also, mostly. Definitely, is a variable disease involving all the organs. And uh, is there any specific reason for that which is having? Hmm. I think this is a very good question. You know, see, the, the Japanese population by and large is the one which has suffered maximum cardiac involvement. And this is surprisingly because they get almost 20% of cardiac sarcoidosis in their, their kind of a setup. So, moving more eastwards is something which is pushing to more cardiac involvement. And now, as you said that, you know, Cardiac involvement is the way you look into it, actually. Most of the times it is ignored because either these patients are treated with the devices and other things and then sent home, actually. Never a CT scan is done. Now, these days, because CT scans are done, lymph nodes are picked up, the lung findings are picked up, the diagnosis of sarcoidosis is coming up. So, you are very right that uh, these days we are seeing more and more cardiac sarcoidosis and you are seeing pulmonary and cardiac sarcoidosis. But as far as all other organs are concerned, I think you dig a Deeper, you get much more and uh, how much you want to dig is ultimately dependent on you know how much test you are going to offer to the patient it's not going to be easy pet scan has come in a big way but still there is a lot of criticism about using pet scans in sarcoidosis so i am i am not into that criticism group at all but because i do feel that it picks up activity wherever it is in the body and it does help you to pick up from the occult sites which need treatment per se when especially you decide that it is only a lymph nodes in the mediastinum and do not require treatment and you can just leave them like that but then you find that if there is a vital organ involvement on a pet scan you need to do i think in sarcoidosis our workups are much less than what are required in each and every case i think that's the reason cardiac sarcoidosis are mostly picked up at cardiac centers where they are seeing these kind of patients they are taking cognition of that that this kind of abnormality could be a red flag, a red flag for sarcoidosis and ct scans are done otherwise most of the times you know in the last 10 years if you would have seen hardly any uh, pickup from cardiac sarcoidosis i think when aims or pgi reports one case everybody says wow you know you get it but this is everybody is seeing it actually everybody is getting it only thing is you need to dig more to pick up cardiac sarcoidosis so sir so they dig more and they found that they found that the most of the people somewhere they went through the dental ex procedures and what they found because of some dental procedures like root canal surgery or something like that some lymph node trigger and they, because they have a galvanic disease and this psychosis from there to the heart they they are finding in our center am i said right so i am i am i'll be very curious to know this yeah. but i know that root canal treatments as well as the uh, implants which are put in 
that creates all the atmosphere to have what is called a sarcoid like granulomas in the lung actually they develop not only granulomas but the mediastinal lymph nodes which just disappear in six months time without any treatment so we have to be very cautious because all this material which these dental surgeons are using is known to cause yeah. a disease which previously used to be called sarcoidosis but now called as sarcoid like reactions so, but then uh, it may be association that the cardiac involvement occurs. I have no idea about it, but uh, I would be more than happy to see because I, uh, by far I feel genetics is the most important thing to get cardiac surgery. I think also Vishwanath will tell more about yeah. that thing. <laughs> yes, so, sir. this similar thing was observed even in uh, IV drug abusers in the form of foreign body granulotosis, less so in the mediastinal lymph nodes, but more in the pulmonary parenchyma. And uh, yeah, these, these were some of the other conditions wherein uh, sarcoidosis has been mimicked basically. So thank you for coming and thank you for that lucid talk. So a couple of comments uh, as uh, Dr. Anand Gupta was pointing out, our center is a center for cardiac uh, sarcoidosis actually. Our electrophysiologist Dr. Narsiman is not here. Probably I would have uh, invited him here. So uh, he has a lot of this cardiac sarcoidosis coming with rhythm disturbances. And uh, recently this is one observation they have made actually. They were trying to look for the cause of sarcoidosis and then suddenly it happened so that uh, historically the patient had a uh, couple of years ago this dental implant placement and then uh, the patient developed a sarcoid sarcoidosis of the heart actually. So then they did some in vitro studies also and uh, they've shown that uh, in presence of this uh, titanium material which was used for the implant actually, there was a rapid proliferation of the lymphocytes actually. So they did some lympho lymphocyte proliferation test in our lab actually. Okay. So that's when they came to a conclusion that probably this is uh, causing uh, sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis is an elusive disease. We do not know what <laughs> causes it. So I think this may be one of the things which might come up with more clarity in future. So keep so digging into this part of it. So association at least. The yeah, so that's what I'm saying. It may be there is an association, but we have seen it. Lots of dentists as well as those who have undergone a dental treatment coming up with mediastinal lymphadenopathy. And uh, it just disappears because the lungs are generally not involved. But like you are telling, the lungs are also involved. So maybe it is related, which we, I, I do not know about it. But uh, yes, it is something which needs to be, you know, digged more and reported so that this part is also very important because so long as India is concerned, tuberculosis, when they talk about sarcoidosis, it's tuberculosis. They talk about tuberculosis in India. So if this also comes up, I think this is a peculiar thing in the region which would be there. So that's a very good idea. And it depends also, you very rightly said, uh, Vishwanath, that uh, how aggressive is your electrophysiology team, actually, you know, it's very important to have that on board, especially for looking for sarcoid. And last point is that even if on day one, you have ruled out cardiac sarcoidosis, as I told you, 25% of patients get um, another organ involvement in next two to three years, they may develop. And that's what happens to us. Because the patient comes back after one year and says that I had this uh, sudden heart rate dropped, it was 40, I was taken to, there was a permanent block, I have got this now, this thing pacemaker into it and uh, I told my doctor there and he said, oh yeah, this is sarcoid only, so made that, but other way around also it is, it's like both ways it is happening. But this is life threatening. I think that's the most important thing. And if you pick it up correctly at time, actually steroids does wonder for them. Just one additional comment. I think uh, the points are very well taken, especially from the cardiac point of view, because I represent a cardiac center and I, I see a lot of these cardiac sarcoids being referred by the electrophysiologist saying the rhythm disturbance was unexplained. There was a history of sudden cardiac death in the family which went unexplained and therefore can you screen the family member who currently has a rhythm disturbance. So I think it's all about looking for it. That's probably what is getting more and more awareness to it. Uh, another point is on the PET. Uh, there are times when we've done PETs and we found we usually do a complementary cardiac, uh, you know, PET scan as well as part of our routine PET scans. Combo. And we, we, Combo uh, PET. Yes. And, and we actually get to see a lot more uh, cardiac findings in such cases. Uh, interestingly, the PET in a couple of cases has helped us pick up skin lesions and we didn't have to do an EBUS for a biopsy. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm an interventional pulmonologist. We like to see lymph nodes. But when we found uh, the IG, an XIG of... Uh, you know, uh, Bangalore have a skin lesion in the scalp, which was biopsied for a sarcoid. I think, you know, PET scan can really uh, reduce the cost. 
help you, you decide on the even simple head to toe examination, examination will pick up the skin lesions in fact almost 20% of patients of our sarcoid do not undergo ebus or other things because skin lesions are there so in this case he was he was morbidly obese so couldn't be located uh, and, and we were very worried whether yeah. he will be able to go through the ebus uh, safe so i think so, uh, the point which you have made is again very good and for everybody must understand this point that pets can pick up those areas where you can easily sample the whole node rather than just doing an ebus because the closest differential which is missed and comes up later is actually a hodgkin's lymphoma because you will get a granuloma in hodgkin's lymphoma and if you've taken it from the periphery the ebus then you are very comfortable and two years down the line because these are slowly growing they finally pick it up them because steroids also suppress them that this is a hodgkin's lymphoma so if if you ask me yes 3% of ebus non caseating granulomas in our experience have come out to be a hodgkin's lymphoma so i am very very uh, clear about it if i can get the complete gland out i'll be most happy and fdg i would pet will tell you that this is a peripheral gland you can just remove it and you can get the whole gland out and get a biopsy done because pathology says she wants the capsule she wants the capsule to see so if the capsule is required you need the complete lymph node thank you sir thank you, thank you for a wonderful presentation and mostly clear the doubts sir thank you very much thank you so our next speaker is dr indrapal singh sagar sir he is assistant professor in department of pulmonary medicine in pgi chandigarh so he will be in uh, virtual so how we can proceed okay and he will uh, uh, topic is uh, approach to bronchi uh, test and all at the outset i would like to thank dr vishwanath for uh, having me here to speak on a topic uh, which uh, we at pj are very closely uh, following up and we are uh, collecting data on bronchial cases so uh, in the subsequent few minutes uh, i would be taking you through the approach to a case of bronchial cases and the the way that we follow each and every case of bronchial cases at pj chandigarh so bronchitis basically is a, a pathological term wherein uh, the bronchi uh, are dilated normally and permanently uh, especially distal to the subsegmental bronchi and generally are associated with chronic inflammation uh, as you all might be knowing bronchitis is, is a heterogeneous disorder and it's actually a end result of many underlying uh, causes and conditions and strictly speaking it is not a disease per se but rather it's a end stage of variety of disease processes um and it is now generally uh, diagnosed uh on ct scans uh, rather than the uh, histopathology although uh, sometimes patients might undergo uh, lobectomy or surgical resection and then you would find bronchial cases uh, during the histopathological examination but generally uh the diagnosis is made on radiology that being a ct scan broadly uh, bronchitis is uh, classified as a cystic fibrosis related bronchitis or non cystic fibrosis related bronchitis and if you ask it the the list is quite exhaustive so uh, uh as you can see on this slide there are not many causes these are the common causes that one generally comes across in one uh, in routine practice uh the common one uh, being primary ciliary dyskinesia immunodeficiency especially the uh, the common variable immunodeficiency disorders wherein you would have one or more uh, immunoglobulins uh, that are not there or there is deficiency of the immunoglobulin levels uh, one could also see bronchitis as a result of chronic in infections like ntm nocardia and others macleod syndrome uh, is another cause that one comes across in a routine practice and if you see the list is quite exhaustive and it goes on and unless uh, we follow a uh, uh, proper approach will not be able to reach a conclusive diagnosis one might ask why you want to investigate but well uh, if you investigate you are likely to find the cause of bronchitis is in Uh, if not all uh, at least in majority of your patients and 
some of uh, the causes of bronchitis may may have treatable uh, conditions for say for example abpa uh, as you all know can be treated with uh, oral uh, uh, systemic uh, glucocorticoids or antifungal azoles uh, on the other hand if you see uh, patients with immunodeficiencies can be treated uh, with uh, monthly replacement therapy with the uh, immunoglobulins and thus if you treat them uh, it's likely that they will not progress further importantly some of the patients might have a genetic cause of the disease and then uh, you might be able to give some genetic counseling to the patient and uh, you would help them decide what they want to do whether they want to have kids or not and if they want to have whether we would like to uh, have a close watch on the kids subsequently importantly it also gives us an opportunity to uh, to expose our patients to newer therapies that might come in future and thus perhaps could uh, uh, could make a lot of difference in their uh, treatment finally uh, you are able to give an answer to your patient that why the patient is having bronchitis what is the cause of bronchitis in one particular patient well, there is no uh, single panel of tests that uh, one could perform. Uh, importantly, you don't want to do all the investigations in all your patients because uh, not only it's going to add uh, to the cost of patients, but it is also going to have its impact on the healthcare system. So you don't really want to unnecessarily investigate your patients. Uh, you could uh, perform an initial panel of investigation and then subsequently you could decide uh, based on the clinical symptoms, what additional investigations you would want to see and, and and there are certain things that might help you deciding that. So, for example, if the age of onset of symptoms is uh, quite early since the uh, childhood or during uh, when it started during or immediately after the birth, you know that it's going to be a genetic cause of uh, the disease and you would uh, want to rule out those genetic causes. Uh, so that uh, in future uh, pregnancies, you are able to counsel your uh, uh, patient's parents. Uh, importantly, there are certain features uh, like uh, sputum production is scanty in uh, atypical mycobacterial infections and also with ABPA. Uh, there might be some history of childhood illness. Say, for example, a person might have acquired a very severe uh, viral pneumonia during childhood and that could have caused some uh, permanent damage and then uh, could subsequently go on to cause bronchitis. So these clues are there on history and one must always uh, look for those clues. If a person has GI symptoms, you know that uh, it could be because of cystic fibrosis related bronchitis or there could be an inflammatory bowel disease. Joint symptoms would suggest uh, either uh, connective tissue disease or rheumatoid arthritis. Patients who have uh, fertility problems would have celiopathies, although not all celiopathy patients have uh, uh, problems with the fertility. Uh, also, you would want to rule out uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, pan bronchiolitis, ABPA with AFRS, CVIDs. In patients who have uh, other uh, system involvement, like say, for example, sinus involvement, patient might be having features of chronic sinusitis so you would see you would really like to rule out uh, these causes uh, once your initial set of investigations uh, is uh, inconclusive importantly uh, like i initially said that hrct now is the imaging modality of choice and has now replaced bronchography and perhaps chest radiographs at least initially the chest radiographs have uh, have uh, taken a back seat now uh, in the diagnosis of uh, bronchitis, although one could use a chest radiograph uh, during follow-up to treatment. So uh, these are the basic initial panel of investigations that we must perform in all our patients. That being uh, ruling out the uh, sensitization to aspergillus fumigators by performing a specific IgE against that. One should also perform sputum cultures for uh, mycobacterial infections. Sputum cultures also give you a clue if patients are uh, colonized with uh, some bacteria.
which might uh, have some prognostic value. Uh, one should always uh, uh, perform sweat chloride levels because it's uh, although it's um, fairly common uh, in the Western population, uh, we are also seeing uh, patients who have cystic fibrosis, especially uh, patients who have extensive bronchitis and are uh, are young. Uh, one should also try and rule out uh, immunodeficiencies, perform immunoglobulin levels in your patients. A complete hemogram is also advised uh, by the PTS uh, Society of uh, for a workup of bronchitis. So these are the five initial investigations that we must perform in all our patients. Uh, what we also uh, suggest is that uh, uh, we must also perform uh, Spergillus fumigatus specific IgG for uh, patients uh, who, who have bronchitis, especially uh, in patients who have TB as an underlying cause of bronchitis because uh, in this study uh, that we have performed at our center, we found that patients who have TB as a cause of bronchitis behave differently uh, compared to other uh, patients with uh, bronchitis, non-cystic fibrosis related bronchitis. These patients are at uh, more risk of having chronic infection with aspergillus fumigators and, and tend to behave similar to patients of uh, chronic Bandari aspergillosis which can be treated with itraconazole. So, uh, we also suggest that uh, at least we should initially uh, do this investigation also in all our patients. What we also do at our center is that we perform tracheal, uh, uh, preferably tracheal mucosal biopsy or we could also uh, choose to perform uh, nasal mucosal biopsy, especially in patients who have a childhood onset of disease. Patients who are young but have very extensive bronchitis Patients, uh, young patients who have who present to you with uh, chronic respiratory failure, with poor pulp nail, and have extensive bronchitis. So these are the patients where you would like to go one step ahead and perhaps rule out uh, celiopathy or or genetic cause of uh, bronchitis. If uh, you find unilateral focal disease on CT scans, one would generally like to rule out if there is any endobronchial obstruction that is causing bronchitis, especially. A long-term foreign body might have been forgotten by the patients. Uh, also, bronchoscopy gives you an opportunity to perform bronchoscopic alveolar lavage and uh, thus help you to get cultures for mycobacteria um, based on the uh, other symptoms. So, if, if your patient is having features to suggest connective tissue disease, one should also try and rule out those diseases. But uh, these investigations, uh, if you really ask me, are not required in all your patients. Uh, genetic testing, uh, obviously, if, uh, if you're thinking of a genetic cause of problem cases, should be performed in all the patients. So, uh, this brings me to this uh, 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 registry that was uh, done by the Embark group. Uh, and this is the India registry of problem cases, as you see, has got uh, quite a lot of uh, patients, about more than 2,000 patients. Uh, uh, that were enrolled from 31 centers across India. Unfortunately, uh, in this registry, uh, the authors could only perform uh, the uh, the initial investigations that I have mentioned uh, that are recommended by the ARS PTS guidelines only in about three percent of their patients. And uh, and uh, I think that was the biggest, uh, uh, or you, you could say that was one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, limitation of the study but but this paper is very important if you really ask me because it tells us that uh, unlike uh, what we used to think that bronchitis is not that common bronchitis is very common uh, at least in India if you really ask me and most common cause of bronchitis if you see in this registry is also post TB so TB related bronchitis is seen in quite a few number of our patients uh, so this is the uh, published data from our center and if you see uh, most of the uh, and and uh, we follow all the uh, steps of evaluation of bronchitis and if you see 
uh, this uh, data is almost similar to uh, the Brocket Cases India registry in terms that we also found that uh, TB is the most common cause of Brocket Cases if you really ask. But if you rule out the ABPA and post TB as cause, you have other causes of Brocket Cases that are also seen in, uh, in practice. And the most important thing is, unlike the uh, the registry where you found that uh, the idiopathic uh, was quite a lot, you see it was almost 22% of their patients were categorized as having idiopathic bronchitis, wherein they could not find any cause. It was about 14% in our uh, uh, our experience because, because of the fact that patients were worked up uh, more extensively in this, uh, in this particular experience. So with this, I would just uh, introduce you to uh, uh, the approach that one should have uh, to a patients with bronchitis. So this young gentleman presented with wheezing, chest tightness of, of quite some years, if you see, and had a BMI of 25, had bilateral crackles, wrong guy on auscultation. And this was the CT that he came with. Uh, if you see, the left pulmonary artery was smaller than the right pulmonary artery and generally left pulmonary artery is bigger than the right pulmonary artery so that gave us a clue that this this patient had some abnormality uh, in the left pulmonary artery along with that there seemed to be volume loss on the left side there seemed to be focal bronchitis here and uh, uh, based on the radiological features uh, one could uh, you know uh, give a diagnosis of uh, McLeod syndrome to this patient so uh, and in fact, that that is what uh, uh, one would have done, and patient would have been labeled as McLeod syndrome uh, because we follow all our patients. So, so there was one thing that this patient also had some degree of pulmonary arterial hypertension and had some areas of mosaic perfusion. So, and the bronchitis is more uh, more extensive uh, rather. So uh, that is why we, uh, apart from the initial steps. Uh, we worked this patient for other uh, causes also, like sweat to ride was normal. So uh, we also did the CFTR gene mutation. A specific I fumigator specific IG also was negative. IgG was negative. Immunoglobulin profile, if you see, is normal. So this slide gives you a gist of what all investigations that one should generally perform in almost all the patients of bronchitis. Okay, at the lung function, if you see, patient had some obstruction which was moderate degree and we went ahead and did a electron microscope uh, reposal biopsy and uh, did electron microscopic examination if you see this patient had a uh, preserved 8 plus 2 microtubule however there was problem in the central uh, pair which was missing in this case uh, so this uh, 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 would suggest that patient had some features of celiopathy although this patient did not have uh, characteristic outer diagonal arm dysfunction but he did have missing central pair and we did immunofluorescence antibodies specifically to look for the proteins uh, and we found that uh, the proteins that are uh, coded by the RSPH gene were missing in this particular patient and we went ahead and we, uh, did a whole uh, the targeted exome sequencing for this particular patient and we found that he had a homozygous mutation so this patient uh, otherwise would have been labeled as uh, McLeod syndrome turned out to be a primary cilio, uh, ciliary dyskinesia. So we gave, we were able to give him a diagnosis of bilateral bronchitis with primary ciliary dyskinesia had homozygous mutation for this particular gene. And uh, and uh, actually he, he, he did ask uh, whether his kids would have similar problems. So Fortunately, his kids uh, uh, do not have any manifestation of the disease so far. On follow-up, he had an ex uh, exacerbation uh, at follow-up and his putum cultures grew H influenza for which he was given treatment. Uh, let me now introduce to a couple of more interesting cases that we saw a young male again with cough dyspnea since childhood. You see, this was the clue that this patient had some problem uh, uh, since childhood and would require more extensive workup rather than just a limited panel. And uh, uh, this is the CT that he had. If you see, he has got, uh, sorry for the poor quality of images, he has got extensive bronchitis throughout his uh, uh, lung fields. 
and uh, on the initial workup his workup was actually positive for abpa so uh, we could have stopped here uh, you see and uh, labeled him as abpa but the thing is that a patient who is of 15 years of age with so much extensive bronchitis symptoms since childhood uh, one really needs to uh, think of other causes of bronchitis so in this case abpa might not be primary but rather secondary uh complicating bronchitis and uh, if you see the sputum uh, cultures were sterile the sweat chloride also was normal so we thought that he might be having an underlying genetic abnormality for his, for his disease and we went ahead and uh, did the whole exome sequencing and to our surprise he had a homozygous mutation for CFTR gene on exome 8 uh, and uh, we were able to give him a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis now this has important implication as you know because cystic fibrosis there are certain treatments which work in cystic fibrosis uh, and uh, as the time evolves he might be uh, you know given proper uh, treatment specifically targeting the abnormality that he has unfortunately those therapies are not available in india but as and when they become available he would be a, a person who could be given those therapies another case in fact this was the this is the case that we published and in, uh, this was the first case that uh, uh, we worked up very extensively a young female came with uh, chronic symptoms and had this radiology if you see she had sinus involvement bilaterally and had got extensive bronchitis so uh, on the in especially in the lower zones and the middle lobe area and uh, the work up for uh, this patient uh, uh, mostly was negative except for the fact that the sweat chloride was elevated on two occasions and as a routine uh, we did cftr delta 508 mutation uh, in evaluation which in this case was negative so uh, uh, what we also uh, know now is that this delta 508 mutation is not commonly seen in indians uh, as frequently as it is seen in the western population so uh, just because this was absent doesn't rule out uh, uh, cystic fibrosis and one needs to evaluate further in fact uh we did a targeted the uh, uh, next genome sequencing for cftr gene so we evaluated the entire cftr gene and to our surprise uh, uh, we could not find any abnormality in this particular gene so uh, we were quite uh, uh, amazed why this patient has this problem and uh, then we went ahead with the whole exome sequencing thinking that uh, we may be able to pick up certain mutations in other genes that could cause presentation just like cf and uh, if you see here this patient had a mutation which was homozygous in the dna uh, i1 gene uh, although this has not been reported previously and has got uh, and was labeled as a, a variant of uncertain significance as per the criteria followed and this patient also had uh, this mutation in this gene which which could be responsible for uh, her elevated uh, sweat chloride levels uh, so we went ahead uh, and did an electron microscope uh, tracheal mucosal biopsy because we certainly wanted to see if her bronchitis was because of this dna mutation and and we found that this uh, the the patient had missing outer dynein arm so if you have a mit- missing outer dynein arm it is almost 100% diagnostic of uh cystic fibrosis and uh, this is a uh, quite characteristic of uh, celiopathy and we gave her a diagnosis of primary severe dyspnea with high sweat chloride levels which were probably because of mutation in, in this scnn1a gene on exome 12 uh further uh, we uh, we evaluated her uh, parents and brother also had similar kind of features he had similar mutation uh both the siblings had similar mutation parents were heterozygous for dna1 so each parent contributed to this particular gene in, in both the children and father was heterozygous for this uh, mutation which caused elevated sweat chloride in the index case uh, both parents did not uh, have any symptoms to suggest prognosis so uh, your evaluation does not end with the initial workup you also have to assess for the severity of bronchitis and you may choose either using bronchitis severity index or facet scoring whichever 
you may choose uh, because it gives you prognostic information how severe is the disease that your patient is having generally one should not prescribe inhaled glucocorticoids unless there is an underlying bronchial asthma especially in patients who have ABPA there you could give inhaled gluc glucocorticoids but generally in patients with bronchitis one should not be giving this uh, consider bronchodilator therapy when you have documented wheeze on auscultation and obstruction on spirometry because some of the symptoms might be because of uh, airway obstruction all patients should be prescribed chest physiotherapy and should be asked to use maneuvers to mobilize secretions vaccination should be done in all our patients we generally vaccinate all our patients for pneumococcus and yearly with the, the influenza vaccine we must always break the vicious cycle of chronic inflammation so if you are able to uh, isolate a bacterial bug chronically uh, colonizing the patients uh, what would generally like to uh, clear the airway especially if there is pseudomonas so to summarize uh, bronchitis is, is a heterogeneous disorder it is a chronic progressive disease it is an end result of many underlying diseases and that is why you need a systematic approach to evaluate the exact cause of bronchitis we must always perform at least an spirulous specific IgG IgG uh, in all our patients we must try and do sweat chloride levels uh, probably if you don't have the facility to do this sweat chloride you may tie up with somebody who's having this facility so if some if this facility is available in one of the centers in your particular vicinity uh, area you could always tie up with them send your patients across to have this level done serum immunoglobulin profiling should be done in all mycobacterial cultures sputum cultures should be done in all uh, one should assess further if you are suspecting a genetic cause of uh, bronchitis especially in younger patients uh, who present with uh, respiratory failure or extensive bronchitis or who have symptoms since childhood one would generally like to rule out the genetic cause of uh, bronchitis thank you very much So it was a very uh, precise and informative uh, informative talk on uh, approach to bronchitis by Dr. in the Paul Singh sir. So moving ahead with our next talk, uh, it is on non-basic ventilation by Dr. Arjun Srinivasan. Sir is consultant pulmonologist and uh, an uh, associate in associate uh, pulmonology at uh, pulmonologist at Royal Care Super Speciality Hospital. Sir has a huge number of presentations both nationally and internationally and he has got uh, rewarded uh, a lot of accolades for his international pulmonology work. So I'm moving ahead with our next talk on non-invasive ventilation. Sir is going to give a online talk. Uh, good afternoon one and all. Uh, are my slides visible and I'm, am I audible? Yes sir. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Vishwanath and team for this opportunity and uh, it's been a while since I've done a non-interventional sort of talk and uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, we'll uh, go through the basics of uh, non-invasive ventilation. And um, so, uh, the, the agenda being, uh, there'll be a brief intro to non-invasive ventilation, what are the mechanics associated with non-invasive ventilation? The indications, the math, uh, interface, and the machines, and a word of caution. So, if you look at non invasive ventilation, it is provision of mechanical ventilation without need for an invasive artificial airway. And this is something which has gone, uh, which has got a long history. And if you look at this person here, he's been on this iron lung, which was one of the first non invasive ventilation during the polio, polio epidemic. He's been on it, on it for uh, over 60 years now. And this is what is called as a pneumo belt. And then there were rocking beds, which used to increase the angle of the bed to about 27 degrees to help the diaphragm move better. And after all these things, then you know, uh, the way of non invasive ventilation in recent times is the, the thing that we all know. And uh, so, how does the NAV score over invasive mechanical ventilation? It avoids the complication of uh, airway invasion. Avoids the loss of airway defense and hence 
the uh, complications associated with uh, mechanical intubation like ventilator associated pneumonia and of course avoids the post extubation issues like chances of reintubation and uh, reduces icu and hospital stay decreases mortality that again depends on for what uh, disease it is being offered so what are the modes of non invasive ventilation we'll stick to the spontaneous uh, pressure mode which is the most commonly used so there are uh, two ways of giving non invasive ventilation which is basically cpap which is the single level uh, of support or a bi level of support when you use a bi level of support you have a basic uh, level of support which is uh, the expiratory support which is there through and through and there is a over and above that there is an inspiratory support so if you have a total support of say 16 by 8 cm of water 8 cm is what is there through and through and there is an additional eight level of support over and above the uh, eight uh, cpap so man how does nid help you know the the pressure that is provided by the inspiratory support it reduces work of breathing by increasing the transpulmonary pressure therefore it inflates the lung better thereby it augments the tidal volume it decreases the afterload and the preload on the heart it offloads the inspiratory muscles especially the diaphragm the the continuous pressure that you get the cpap it prevents the expiratory collapse of airway and it counteracts the autopsy so when does nid work so there are three scenarios in which we expect nid to do some work when it primarily impacts the disease process that is the cause and helps its recovery so here it intervenes and breaks the downward spiral of the disease when it impacts only the result that means that it prevents or delays the respiratory fatigue rather than the cause it is in the hope that the drugs or other intervention will reverse the cause quickly third is when invasive mechanical ventilation carries unacceptable risk of complication wherein it is better to go with non invasive ventilation so uh, let's get back to physiology for a while so here if you look at uh, the picture here so whenever the the pressure which is there outside the alveolus and the airway is less than the pressure which is there outside it then the airway will tend to collapse so if you take in normal lung the 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 pressure inside the alveolus is also related to the the alveolar recoil pressure which is used to overcome the airway resistance by the time the pressure equalizes it usually is at the area of cartilaginous support this is what is called as the equal pressure point in case of COPD. What happens is, since the alveolar recoil is less and the airway resistance is high, there is a distal migration of the equal pressure point, wherein the equal pressure point migrates more distally from the support. So during forced expiration, there is a dynamic collapse of the airway, which means that the air breathing this is in an attempt to try and get this critical pressure or you now this is their way of counteracting the autopsy and drive this critical pressure more proximally so what how the external peep helps is how it happens in a waterfall so when you look at the waterfall this is the external peep that is being applied here when you apply the peep then it helps in Uh, the proximal migration of the equal pressure point so in nid copd in type 2 respiratory failure the pressure supports reduces the work of breathing by offloading the inspiratory muscle especially the diaphragm it augments the tidal volume that by increasing the uh, you know elastic recoil the peep count prevents the expiratory air it counteracts the auto peep it helps in deflating the lung better once the lung deflate once the lung deflates better it leads to reduction in the dynamic hyperinflation reduction in the respiratory rate reduction in the sternocleidoid muscle mm-hmm. activity re- decrease sensation of dyspnea and overall reduce carbon dioxide so if you look at what is the evidence for use of nid in copd acute exacerbation this is uh, the cochrane meta analysis it reduces mortality by almost 50% and it reduces the need for uh, tracheal intubation by more than 2/3 so it 
So this was the Cochrane uh, analysis of all the studies that have been published till 2017. If you look at acute pulmonary edema, what are the mechanics in acute pulmonary edema? What happens is there is an increase in the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. This leads to a dilation of the left atrium, and this leads to pulmonary venous congestion, and of course leads to the pulmonary congestion, wherein there is an alveolar collapse and there is a fluid accumulation. Then you use BiPAP. On CPAP also, there is an increase in the intrathoracic pressure. When there is an increase in the intrathoracic pressure, it leads to a decrease in the preload. There is a decrease in the afterload. A combination of decrease in preload after as well as afterload reverses all the uh, factors which lead to an increase in pulmonary edema, which is uh, there is a decrease in the endoastolic left ventricular pressure. There is a decrease in the left atrial dilatation. There is a decrease in the pulmonary venous dilatation, and there was therefore also there is a decrease in the respiratory congestion. If you look at evidence, then use of NIV or CPAP in acute pulmonary edema reduces the risk of hospital mortality by a third, and it reduces the risk of intubation in these patients by fifty percent. So, if you look at the most common other indications where. That you have some evidence of using NIV in post-operative patients who are at high risk of uh, no uh, failing or re-intubation and in weaning of patients. So, what are the mechanics here? Whenever you have weaning or post-operative patients, they tend to have basal atelectasis. They also have respiratory muscle dysfunction. They also have difficulty in clearing secretion. Their mentation is also on the lower side. So, if you look at post-op. When you look at evidence of all surgeries, not only the upper, upper abdominal or thoracic surgeries, though there was not significant evidence to really go ahead and conclusively prove that NIV decreases the risk, but it was concluded that there is a role for NIV, both prophylactic and therapeutic tool in post-operative patients. If you look at it in terms of uh, weaning from invasive mechanical ventilation, it reduces hospital mortality. There is a uh, reduces the incidence of VAP and ICU stay, and of course, this was seen more commonly when the weaning strategy was used in COPD patients. So, if you look at the third subgroup of patients, which are the patients where invasive mechanical ventilation is going to cause a lot more of harm. So these are patients who are immunocompromised patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. So these may be patients of leukemia. They may be patients of aplastic anemia. They may be patients of um, HIV, where they have where an invasive mechanical ventilation usually carries a very high risk of morbidity as well as mortality. Here it is proven that use of non-invasive ventilation in these patients actually reduces mortality. If you look at chronic neuromuscular disorders without bulbar involvement, because when there is a bulbar involvement, NIV will not help as it will the patients will not be able to protect their airway and chest wall disorders. Though it is intuitive for us to use NIV in these patients, there is not a large volume of evidence, but there is always a tendency for us to use this because whatever is the precipitating cause, if you are able to reverse it, reverse it in time, then these patients might get away without. A long uh, course in the ICU with an invasive ventilator. COPD patients in stable type two respiratory failure who are revolving door patients. These are patients who got very severe COPD and they keep having recurrent admission. There is some evidence to suggest that these patients, if you give them NIV at home, you might be able to prevent uh, uh, repeated admission in obesity ventilation, hypoventilation. Again, there is an evidence to say that these pa patients might benefit with long term NIV therapy. End stage respiratory lung disease. Here, NIV may be used as an alternative to invasive mechanical ventilation because you invasive mechanical ventilation in the absence of lung transplant transplantation only as a bridge to lung lung transplantation will these patients benefit from invasive mechanical ventilation. If you look at hypoxic acute hypoxic respiratory failure, so these are patients of ARDS wherein because of the recent um, pandemic, a lot of these patients were put on NIV. Because they were, they had no access to invasive mechanical ventilation. But if you see, especially since this does not actually affect the course of the disease, you have a small window of opportunity. If the clinical course continues to deteriorate, what NAD buys you is only minimum amount of time. And if there is a 
rapid decline in the clinical course these patients will not do well unless and until there is a reversal of the uh, underlying clinical deterioration so this again was seen in the lung safe trial when 15% of the patients of ARDS irrespective of uh, cat severity where uh, NIV was offered NIV seemed to be associated with higher ICU mortality in patients with very severe form of ARDS means that if you give the patient we will put them on NIV the patients of ARDS on NIV and if you are not able to recognize that these people are not responding then they have a higher ICU mortality so now once you know the indications of NIV then what are the other the 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 machine and the math that you need to know of. so it basically is two types the delivery of NIV is dependent on the math and interface and the ventilators the things to consider when you're looking at math and interface is how expensive or inexpensive are the masks whether it is disposable or reusable type of mask and how comfortable it is for the mask because you are dealing with a conscious patient. So what are the different types of masks that you have? You have a nasal mask, you have or oronasal mask and then you have these masks which are basically the, the whole face mask. The ventilators are basically uh, the factors that you need to consider are the ease, ease to administer, what is the cost of the ventilator, what are the monitoring, monitoring capa capabilities of the ventilator and whether the ventilators are able to have oxygen blend or you need to give oxygen separately. So these ventilators are basically divided into critical care ventilators and portable ventilators. We look at the interface, this is the most crucial uh, aspect of non-invasive ventilation. These are devices that connect the ventilator tubing to the patient's face. And there is no clear-cut superiority of one interface over the other. The overall nasal or full face masks, these are best suited for acute conditions. Nasal masks are best suited for long term use. So when you look at the mask, especially the, the, the full face mask, the, 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 the overall nasal mask, they are basically two types, which is the vented mask. These are to be used with a dedicated NIV machine. They, have, they are used with a single circuit tubings. They need vent to prevent rebreathing. Whereas the non-vented masks are used with ICU ventilators. They have double circuit tubings and uh, it prevents leakage in the circuit. So they do not have any vent. If you look at the nasal mask, they're basically triangular in shape. They have a plastic dome and they have a soft silicon feeling surface. They are comfortable, but the main issue is with the leakage from the mouth and they are best suited for chronic use. They have been modified to uh, have nasal pillows and they have they, they also been there are modifications of this which is called a mini mask. If you look at the oro nasal mask, these are foam or air filled seals. They have chin support. They can cause nasal bridge ulcers, especially if they are used for a long period of time. And uh, they are quite comfortable when used for short period of time. They are best used for acute settings. They can be associated with claustrophobia in patients who are. So these masks can, when they are used with the T-connector, can also be used uh, to assist when you are doing fiber optic bronchoscopy in patients. The larger versions of this have the lesser chance of uh, nasal bridge ulcer. So if you look at this, these are certain variations, which are called the dream beaver mask, wherein the, the uh, you know, it doesn't extend all the way to the bridge of the nose. So therefore, it, it helps in preventing nasal bridge ulcers. These are full face masks, again, helps in preventing nasal bridge ulcers. These are helmet masks, wherein the entire um, head is enclosed in this helmet mask. And, uh, you know, but this helps, especially if the FIO2 requirement is high. But again, it carries the risk of claustrophobia. And as, as such, these masks can be not, uh, can be quite difficult to get and they can be expensive to buy. So when you look at uh, the patient-machine interaction, synchrony is the key because you're dealing with a conscious patient. Here, you have to be absolutely sure that the synchrony is good. So this can be monitored by the use of test wall movement, by monitoring the mouth leak, you look at the mass pressure. There are also other ways of monitoring like the esophageal uh, pressure and respiratory EMG activity. If you look at the mass leak, what are the most common reasons for mass leak is high inspiratory pressure, severe acute respiratory failure. When the respiratory rate is very high, then there can be associated mass leak, small jaw or the, if there is an overbite and when the patient is sleeping. The effect is it leads to a decrease in expiratory sense, triggering sensitivity of the device. 
asynchronity between the patient and the device, worsening gas exchange and sleep fragmentation. So usually a mask leak sets up a vicious cycle. There is a mouth leak which is associated with high unintentional leak, which leads to mucosal drying, which leads to a nasal congestion, flu-like syndrome, and a decreased sleep quality, increased nasal resistance, which leads to increased sleep. This also is also associated with the loss of synchrony, loss of therapy, and of course loss of com comfort, and the patient will not be able to comply with the NIV. So if you are using a nasal mask, try to switch to a full face mask. If already on full face mask, you'll have to try manipulating the control inspiratory time and cycling. So what are the machines? Basically, the machines you are looking at both volume as well as pressure control. You also have many advanced mode, which we will not touch into. So the most commonly used is the pressure, uh, uh, pressure support. Here you have dedicated NIV machines. These are portable machines. They are easier to use. They have lower cost, <laughs> excuse me, they have less weight and um, they lack monitoring capabilities. They lack oxygen blender, so you have to supply oxygen from outside. They use single limb circuits and there is a rebreathing of uh, carbon dioxide. So you have the prototype uh, bi-level ventilator and then you have the advanced uh, other types of uh, portable NIV machines also. The other way of uh, providing uh, bi-level support will be the critical care ventilator. These ventilators also will be able to provide other advanced mode of uh, non-invasive ventilation. They use pressure support ventilation mode. They add leak compensation, which is uh, especially when you are not able to uh, uh, you know, uh, tackle the leak. This helps in when they add leak compensation. They have an algorithm for facilitating triggering and cycling. They have elaborate monitoring and alarms. They are expensive. They often need to be used in the ICU setting. They are not suitable for use at home. So what are the accessories that you will need? Especially if the patient is on long term, then humidification is something that you would need. Heated humidifier, humidifiers are better than uh, heat exchange, heat and moisture exchange humidifier. Humidification leads to reduced uh, nasal resistance. It improves the compliance. It reduces the mouth dryness. Oxygen supplementation, if you are using the portable NIV machine, the oxygen can either be given as uh, through a nasal cannula inside or there is usually a port for attaching the uh, oxygen supply. Whereas in critical care ventilators, the oxygen blender will be able to deliver very high FiO2. So because the oxygen is attached outside, it will depend on the flow that the patient is generating. And the FAO2 supply uh, can be quite variable. Nebulization can be carried out with both uh, flow circuits. Power supply, if it is a critical care ventilator, usually will have a very limited backup. And most of the smaller ventilators will have a battery backup for emergency purpose. So what are the prerequisites for starting an NIV? You need a conscious and a cooperative patient. You need hemodynamic stability. You need absence of copious secretions. You need intact swallowing reflex and you need absence of upper GI bleeding and absence of orofacial trauma. So when do you start NIV? You have to identify patients with reversible cause of acute respiratory failure like COPD or an acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Symptoms and signs of uh, acute respiratory distress like moderate to severe dyspnea, increased over usual, rate which is more than 24 for COPD or more than 30 if it is hypoxemic uh, acute uh, respiratory failure. Accessory muscle use and paradoxical breathing, gas exchange abnormality wherein the carbon dioxide which is more than 45 and a pH which is less than 7.35 and a PO to FO2 ratio of less than 200. What are the initial settings with which you would start? You would start with the pressure support of about 4 to 6 uh, centimeters of water. water. Then, we, then you try and increase uh, 2 centimeters to achieve a response which is a maximum inspiratory support which we normally do is a maximum 20 centimeters of water. The CPAP or the PEEP will be 2 to 4 with an increment of 1, maximum of 10 centimeters of water. If the patient is actually in distress, especially COPD acute exacerbation, we might start with a slightly higher uh, uh, bi-level of support and we'll start titrating down once the patient settles down. You always need to have a, a gap of at least 3 centimeters of water between the inspiratory and the PEEP, uh, pressure and the PEEP. 
the fl2 you can give up to 5 to 6 liters of o2 during the portable machine if you are using critical care ventilators then fl2 up to 100% can be delivered what are the exclusion criteria contraindication cardiac or respiratory arrest hemodynamic instability comatose patients inability to protect their airway anatomic ab abnormality of the nasopharynx and recent myocardial infarction so monitoring what all you need to monitor you need to monitor the vital signs which is the respiratory rate heart rate blood pressure use of accessory muscle you need to look for alleviation of symptom which is you will look at both subjective and objective criteria so what is the alleviation of symptoms whether the patient is able to subjectively say that the dyspnea is better what is the level of consciousness how is the sleep of the patient so and uh, objectively you look at what is the saturation what is happening to the saturation what is happening to the arterial blood gas and you also look at the patient machine synchrony by looking at the chest wall movement mouth lick and if you have other invasive sort of uh, monitoring like esophageal monitoring or uh, respiratory muscle emg those can also be sort of uh, a monitor so what are the predictors of success a younger age a lower apache score able to cooperate with the patient because it's the you no know, the patient will need to understand what is required patient will will have to try and synchronize with the breath which is being delivered and have a low air leak and an intact dentition when you have a edentulous patient uh, then the opposition of the mask becomes difficult respiratory rate which is more than 24 but the patient is not very tachypneic as in the respiratory not uh, rate is not in 40s or 50s so it can be tried in these patients but the chances of success comes down as the respiratory rate becomes very high a carbon dioxide uh, um, which is uh, more than 45 but not very very high in, of course when you expect that the carbon dioxide levels are very very high then there will be an altered mentation also associated with that similar to do with the fact that the ph should be low but should not be very low and the most important predictor of success is improvement in the first 60 to 90 minutes so uh, unlike invasive mechanical ventilation uh, no non invasive ventilation requires a lot of input from the person administering administering the non invasive ventilation you have to be at the bedside of the patient especially for the first one or two hours and if there is a dramatic improvement in the first one or two hours these are the predictors both in copd as well as if you are using in cases of uh, ards this is the most important predictor of the patient being able to respond to na non invasive ventilation so conclusion nav has changed the way we manage acute exacerbations of uh, copd and acute pulmonary edema it's an excellent tool with gratifying results it is more labor intensive for the intensivists because you need to stay by the patient in the first couple of hours when you start non invasive ventilation you need to look at uh, whether the patient is able to synchronize if there is a lot of leak and how do you address the leak you should know your machines masks and the basic troubleshooting how do you adjust and uh, non invasive ventilation has been having expanding indications in recent times this is in an attempt to avoid invasive mechanical ventilation but it should be used with extreme caution and experience supervision when it is being used in ard in a critical care setting thank you thank you dr srinivasan what the beautifully explained over the niv indication contraindication and uses only as an intensivist i want to add one thing even that patient is hemodynamically unstable you can try not very much hemodynamic unstable yeah. because this unstability may be because of respiratory acidosis that is causing but you will see the difference now one hour your patient is responding avg is improving and then symptomatically better then it's okay if not then it may be not, not a candidate for the nib agree yeah. thank you dr sir i have one more question for you like uh, uh, what is your observation uh, about ventilator induced lung injury in comparison with nib and invasive mechanical ventilation sir like especially in icu ventilators so it, it becomes uh, you know in the sense that if they respond to niv and they don't end up on either always whenever you using ventilator uh, niv ard setting the hope that you are able to avoid invasive mechanical ventilation and in the cases that you avoid invasive mechanical ventilation they have they tend to have a lower uh, you know uh, uh, lesser icu stay lesser icu induced complication and the lower overall hospital stay but what happens in these patients who fail niv uh, these are the patients who tend to do probably worse than the patients who would have probably been intubated earlier so that is the uh, uh, no but 
it is very difficult to actually uh, you know but what we did see during uh, you know the covid pandemic i am sure you know I, most centers saw is that the lot of these patients were on niv for a lot longer than we would have liked because there are no ventilators which are available and we were seeing a lot of these patients having pneumomediastinum which we were not seeing uh, which we are not seeing so frequently before and that's something a lot of centers observe and probably these were related to the ventilator induced lung injury and these people being on niv for really long prolonged uh, period of time as yes, a similar same thing we have observed during covid pandemic like patients who were on prolonged niv uh, immediately after intubation they they did maintain the saturation they immediately succumb like uh, that was a query about uh, the yeah. ventilator induced lung injury sir no see it's not about the ventilator lung injury per se it is about our uh, when the patient goes on niv even in ards patients there is a transient improvement which is seen uh, that is the reason as to why if you have to put them on niv you will have to be careful and if there is no significant improvement in the first many uh, not first to one hour then probably these guys these people will have to get intubated here the issue is m- more than ventilator induced lung injury it is the delay of intubation in these patients probably these people patients are getting intubated too late and this has been seen from data also that these patients who fail niv are patients probably where the failure of niv was recognized late because there was a transient improvement or no no uh, rather than transient improvement there was a transient non worsening which was taken as an improvement and that led to a delay in intubation and when they fail niv and then they get intubated and a lot of times we find that it is almost impossible to in- ventilate these patients uh, on uh, invasive mechanical ventilation and these people generally tend to do poorly and they have a higher icu as well as hospital mortality so beautifully explained sir thank you thank you sir because most likely truly we lost the opportunity when the lung can ventilate during that period we niv we stressed with the niv Yes. And, and then after we yes, are yes. ventilating those kind of operation when the already lung is stiff and they are hypoxic that's why they most of the people died after that yeah thank you sir for the beautiful presentations now we have a next speaker is eminent speaker dr sandeep salvi sir he is a director in palmo care research and education from pune sir will tell about the update and management of the copd and what's new welcome sir i am dr sandeep salvi from the palmo care research and education foundation situated in the city of pune my apologies i uh, have not been able to attend this wonderful cme program in person but uh, i am at least happy that i can uh, share my knowledge with you uh, through this online platform uh, my very sincere thanks to dr vishwanath for inviting me to speak to all of you all and i hope that uh, Uh, at the end of this presentation uh, you will have had some new knowledge that you could potentially use in uh, treating your patients of uh, copd in uh, in your hospital so uh, uh, i bring to you greetings from the pure foundation in pune i was earlier associated with the uh, chest research foundation for almost 19 years and we still continue to do the work that we were doing in the field of asthma and copd at the pure foundation uh, what i'm going to cover over the next 20 22 minutes is to share with you what is the new uh, understanding what are the new things in the field of copd as per the new gold uh, 2023 strategy report we all know that uh, copd is one of the leading causes of suffering and death in our country there are an estimated 50 million people who suffer from copd in india and uh, close to around 1 lakh people die because of copd every year in india this burden is only going to keep on increasing over the forthcoming years so as pulmonologists you will be seeing a growing burden of copd in your clinical practice and it is therefore important to keep us thus abreast of the latest knowledge that is available in this field the global initiative for obstructive lung disease or called as the gold was an initiative that was started in 1997 and uh, since 2002 uh, they 
started the uh, recognition of the World COPD Day uh, in the in the month of November, which is the third Tuesday, third third Wednesday of the November every year. And so, since 2002, it's been almost 20 years. Uh, every year, we recognize World COPD Day, and, and on this day, they release the document called as the Strategy Report for a uh, gold for that particular for the for, for the following year. So many people like to call this as the gold guidelines. These are not guidelines. Uh, these are strategy reports that are uh, that have been made by an expert panel of uh, members. And uh, gold is very clear that it should not be called as gold guidelines. They should be called as a gold strategy report. So this year, the World COPD Day was celebrated on the 16th of November last sorry last year. And uh, so I'm going to share with you what are the latest new developments that have happened in this week. Before we go to the uh, the real development, I thought it's important to showcase the people who have been working behind the scene uh, to prepare this uh, bold strategy report every year. Dr. Alvar Agasti is the chairman of uh, Gold. He is from Barcelona in Spain. And along with him, there are all those other board of directors. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be one of the board of directors of Gold for the last five years. And then there is a scientific committee that uh, sit down and go through almost every single paper that has been published in the field of COPD. There's a lot of debate, discussion, and even fights that take place uh, as to whether that new knowledge that has been published in these articles published in the journal, whether they should be included in the gold strategy report. So it's a, it's a very a serious discussion that takes place. And it is only after a lot of debate uh, that the gold report is published. So, so a lot of effort that goes behind in preparing the gold uh, strategy report for every year. Uh, so what is new in COPD? If you look at the definition of COPD, it has changed considerably over a period of time. In fact, uh, since 1997, when the first uh, gold strategy report was published, if you see since then, there, there have at least been 10 different uh, versions of the definition of COPD. It keeps on changing. And that's because our knowledge of COPD keeps on evolving with time. And based on that, the definition also keeps on changing. So what is different in this uh, new uh, gold strategy report is the recognition that COPD is a heterogeneous lung condition. Heterogeneous. It's just not one single disease which was earlier believed to be caused by tobacco smoking. Now we know that, no, 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 tobacco smoking is only one of the causes that are associated with COPD. And therefore, there's a whole heterogeneity in our understanding of COPD. So that heterogeneous is an important word that was introduced. Then it talks about the respiratory symptoms, such as dyspnea, sputum production, and exacerbations, uh, which were not there in the previous definition. And they have also included bronchitis and bronchiolitis along with emphysema as the pathophysiological changes that occur in this disease. The rest of the wording remains the same. But nonetheless, I think they have given importance to uh, some of the key elements of uh, COPD. The words common, preventable, treatable, which were there in the previous definitions, have been removed this year. And uh, also, so has the usually caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases that has also been removed. And this is with the realization with the new knowledge that you don't need to be exposed to noxious particles or gases to develop COPD. As you'll see in the subsequent slides, uh, there are so many other risk factors associated with COPD, nothing to do with exposure to noxious particles. So these two, which were there in the previous definition have been removed. Then they talk about new opportunities where they do mention that COPD is a common, preventable, treatable disease. But they also have highlighted the fact that a lot of COPD patients remain undiagnosed, undiagnosed or wrongly diagnosed. And this is something that we as practicing pulmonologists uh, should change because uh, the suffering and the deaths that are associated with this are only growing. We need to do something about it. Then uh, the realization that uh, environmental factors are equally important 
as tobacco smoking, there are other non-exposure uh, risk factors which I'll be covering in the subsequent slides. But non-smoking causes of COPD is also given a lot of importance in this particular new report. Then they talk about two very important terms called pre-COPD and PRISM. These are completely new things. They were there in the last year's report, but they are not highlighted as much. This year they have given a lot of importance to pre-COPD and PRISM, which I will cover in the subsequent slides. Now, one of the things that they have really pushed forward is the importance of early diagnosis. And what you see over here is a very beautiful graph that depicts that. So the x-axis is the age starting from 20 till 80. And on the, on the top of that age, you see two lines. One is the, the red color or the orange color line that talks about uh, the lung function changes. And then the blue colored one that talks about uh, the symptoms that are associated with it. So what it tells you is that the decline in lung function starts much, much before the symptoms start appearing. And only when the lung function and the symptoms start occurring, by that time a significant amount of lung has already got damaged because of COPD. And you have not even diagnosed that case, that, that condition. So what they're saying is that you should shift the diagnosis earlier to the left-hand side so that rather than picking up the disease at the age of 50, you should try to pick it up at the age of 30, between 30 to 40 or even around that time. And uh, a lot of importance has been given to, even if you don't have symptoms, but if your lung function shows abnormalities, think of COPD as a message that has come. And then they also mention about COPD screening. They, they highlight some very important points that if a person has got no symptoms, has no exposure to any potential risk factor for COPD, don't spend your effort and time in doing screening programs for them. No symptoms, no exposures, don't screen. But if your patient has symptoms and is exposed to those risk factors or has one of those risk factors that are associated with COPD, by all means, start screening them for COPD. And uh, uh, spirometry is the ideal thing to start with because that is the diagnostic test for COPD. But if spirometry is not available, you should think of COPD screening question as the use of a peak flow meter. You know, peak flow meter has got a lot of importance in the screening of patients for COPD. Quite unusual, but that's the value that peak flow meter has been shown. So think about the question as and the use of a peak flow meter to screen patients for COPD is one of the important messages that has come. Then uh, what is pre-COPD? Just like we have pre-hypertension, pre-diabetes, pre-eclampsia, and so on, uh, the, it is important to realize that uh, many patients have underlying COPD, but they may not necessarily manifest with symptoms. And therefore, it's important to at least start picking them early. The three components of diagnosis, symptoms, structure, and function have all been discussed in the past. But what is pre-COPD? Patients have symptoms suggest your COPD, that could be shortness of breath and cough. They are exposed to risk factors, but the spirometry is normal. Uh, however, if you do a CT scan for whatever reason, a high resolution CT scan of the chest, and if that shows presence of underlying COPD in terms of small airways obstruction or in terms of emphysema, in the presence of a normal spirometry, then you would call this as pre-COPD. Or if you have done DLCO tests, where the DLCO values have gone down, which happens in COPD and emphysema, so then you can call these patients as pre-COPD. Now, they also have highlighted the fact that pre-COPD can occur at any age, not necessarily after the age of 40 or after the age of 50. They can occur at an early age as well. Uh, they may or even may not develop COPD over time. However, because they have symptoms, you should treat them. Uh, however, in the absence of any good randomized controlled trials to tell us which treat, which drug should we use them, uh, I think that component is still uh, kept on hold. Then the other component called PRISM. What is PRISM? Preserved Ratio Impaired Spirometry. That is what PRISM stands for. Same thing as pre-COPD. Preserved ratio is the FE1 upon FVC ratio is normal, but the FVC is less than 80% of predicted. 
and this is post bronchodilator FEC or even your FEV1 is less than 80% predicted. Now, earlier, this would fall under the category of restrictive lung disease. Normal ratio, but your FVC is less than 80%. That was labeled as restrictive lung disease. But now that term has been removed and is suggested that we should now call them as PRISM. Now, uh, PRISM is, uh, is a terminology that has been floating in various uh, journal articles for the last five years, or perhaps even more. But now it has come into the gold strategy report. Uh, the prevalence of PRISM is quite high. And these are the people who potentially have COPD or will develop COPD in the forthcoming years. So it's important to pick them up early and treat them. Uh, remember that 40 to 50 percent of patients uh, who or people who smoke may have normal spirometry, but the HRCT shows evidence of emphysema or small areas obstruction. Now, here we would certainly label them as prison. Uh, how do you make a diagnosis of uh, COPD? Read this line that I have underlined in brown. It says, but spirometry showing the presence of a post bronchodilator F1 upon FPC ratio less than 0.7 is mandatory to establish the diagnosis of COPD. What it means is, if you do not perform spirometry, you should not label the person to have COPD. It's just like, would you label a person to have diabetes without measuring blood sugar level? Would you label the person to have ischemic heart disease or hypertension without doing an ECG, without measuring the blood pressure, just because of clinical parameters suggestive of ischemic heart disease or diabetes, would you still call them diabetes? No, you need an objective diagnosis. So similarly, COPD, it is mandatory to do spirometry and that to post bronchodilator spirometry and that ratio, if you're not on FEC, should be less than 0.7 is the diagnostic criteria for COPD. Then uh, below that, they talk about the potential risk factors and what are these risk factors other than tobacco smoking? It is occupational exposures, it is genetic factors, development, ab uh, development, development abnormalities, low birth weight, uh, respiratory tract infections during childhood, and so. So in the subsequent portion, they have now proposed a etiotype taxonomy for COPD. Now, what does etiotype mean? These are the different types of COPD based on their etiology. So COPD G is what we would say COPD because of genetic reasons, like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. COPD D is because of abnormal lung development, and this is uh, premature birth and low birth weight and so on. COPD C is because of cigarette smoke. COPD P is because of pollution associated either with indoor air pollution or outdoor air pollution. COPD I, COPD that is associated with recurrent childhood respiratory tract infection. COPD A, that is asthmatics, poorly treated, now develop COPD, that's COPD A. And then COPD U, which is COPD of an unknown pass. So there are seven different etiotypes of COPD that have been described in the latest uh, gold report. And it would be important to make your diagnosis according to the seven subtypes that I've just mentioned. So the, obviously there's a lot of weightage for non-smoking COP. Now what is the other big change? If you look at the management protocol for patients of COPD, you had to do three things. One is you have to do spirometry and to assess the presence of uh, fixed airflow obstruction and also to determine the severity of the airflow obstruction. Then you do two things. You measure the uh, symptoms objective, either by using a CAT score, or it's called as a COPD assessment test score, or MMRC score, Modified Medical Research Council Questionnaire. That you, you have to administer either of the two. And based on that, you will quantify the symptoms, which is on the x-axis over here. And the y-axis is the number of exacerbations. How many exacerbations did the patient have in the past one year? And based on this, you categorize, we were categorizing our patients into A, B, C, D. So A means less symptoms, no exacerbations. B means more symptoms, less exacerbations. C means less symptoms, more exacerbation, less, uh, sorry, less symptoms, 
more exacerbations and D means uh, more symptoms and more exacerbation. This was the earlier ABCD classification. The 2023 report is changed. Now we have only A, B and E classification. The C and the D have been clubbed together and called as E. So you have A, B and E. E are the ones who have exacerbations. Anybody who has an exacerbation, whether the symptoms are mild or whether the symptoms are severe, they all fall under the same category. So this is one big change that has happened in the GOLD 2023 report. Now, should you use this in your practice? Yes, you must. All your patients of COPD must be categorized into are they COPD A or B or E. This is from a management perspective, not from the ETO type. Now, for the A and the B, as I said earlier, you need to use either the Modified Medical Research Council questionnaire or you need to use the COPD assessment test. Now, if a patient predominantly presents with symptoms of breathlessness, then you should administer the MMRC. And if your patient predominantly presents with symptoms of cough or otherwise, then you administer the CAT, the, the CAT assessment test, either of the two. And then based on the uh, cutoff values, you categorize them into A or B. For E, it is simple, no exacerbation, or one moderate exacerbation that is not requiring hospitalization, it comes under the category of no exacerbation. And anything more than that comes as uh, in the category of E. Uh, other than that, the pharmacotherapy has also been tweaked a little bit. You can see over here that uh, ICS plus lava has been removed as a potential pharmacotherapeutic option for patients of COPD who have A or B. So for A or B, ICS plus LABA is out. Even for E, ICS plus LABA is out. There is ICS plus LABA, but there is ICS plus LABA plus LAMA. There is no individual ICS plus LABA in any of the categories of COPD, be it A or B or E. So here is the pharmacotherapy. Patient has come to you with A, group A, just give a bronchodilator. Could be a short-acting bronchodilator, could be a long-acting bronchodilator. You have a choice between uh, beta agonists and you have a choice between muscarinic antagonists. Uh, the most widely used one is a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, such as triatropium or glycopalpin. You can use either of them. If the patient falls into group B or E, then you start with a dual bronchodilator, LABA plus LAMA. You don't start with ICS plus LABA. Is that, that is the new recommendation from the World 2023 report. And if the patient goes into the E category, either you use LABA plus LAMA only or you use triple drug combination, as simple as that. So the pharmacotherapy in a way has been simplified. And the main thing is absence of ICS plus LABA as an important component of uh, treatment of COPD. Now, the use of ICS in patients of COPD is curtailed quite a lot for various reasons and for good reasons, because patients of COPD, when you start them on ICS, they start developing pneumonias. And that risk is genuine. And because you may be very careless about, uh, you know, saying it doesn't make any difference whether it's asthma or COPD, I start all my patients on ICS plus LABA. I think you should stop doing that. Because if you give patient of COPD ICS plus LABA, you are putting that patient at an increased risk of developing pneumonias. And therefore, because of that, uh, there is a distinct categorization. Asthmatics don't deny them an ICS. COPDs don't give them an ICS only if they are to be given in a triple drug combination. Very, very loud and clear message that has come on based on the latest information, all the research studies that have been published so far. Which patient should you use inhaled corticosteroids? Well, those who have been hospitalized for exacerbations, you may consider giving them an ICS, but ICS in a triple drug combination. Or those who have more than two moderate exacerbations, those who have blood eosinophils more than 300, or if they have, 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 they have a history of concomitant acid, then you have to give them ICS. Uh, those who have one moderate exacerbation, or they have an eosinophil count between 100 to 300, you take your clinical judgment and then decide. But uh, if they have had a pneumonia in the past, they have had eosinophil count less than 100, 
or they have a history of mycobacterial infection, don't give them ICS. Very simple and clear message in the 2023 report. Uh, the risk of developing infections because of ICS is genuine. And, uh, you know, just look, just read that box in yellow. Incidence of community acquired pneumonia in patients with COPD is 18 times more as compared to those who do not have COPD. Uh, fluticasone particularly is more notorious than buleosonide in causing pneumonia. So I would certainly avoid using fluticasone. If I have to use a steroid in patients with COPD, I would rather use buleosone. Just like the GINA criteria, the, the GINA strategy report, uh, which always gives a lot of emphasis on the choice of inhaler device. For the first time, the Gold 2023 report talks about choose your inhaler device correctly for your COPD patient. Which patient should use a dry powder inhaler device? Which patient should use an MDI? Which patient should use a nebulizer? Is very clearly mentioned. And you can see some of those statements that are captured from this report. Uh, non pharmacological treatment, a lot of importance is given to vaccination. There are five vaccines that every patient of COPD must be given. Five. Which are these five? The influenza vaccine to be given every year. The pneumococcal vaccine to be given once in a lifetime. The COVID-19 vaccine to be given as and when the government brings out those rules and regulations. Then the pertussis vaccine, which contains the DPT vaccine that contains pertussis has to be given. You have to give a booster dose, one single booster dose. Uh, to the COPD patients. And then the last is the herpes simplex or the herpes, sorry, herpes zooster shingles uh, vaccine as a, as a booster. So five vaccines must be given to every patient of COPD. Other than that, uh, pulmonary rehabilitation is also been given a lot of importance. But this is the last slide that will perhaps tell you the uh, importance of surgical therapies and interventional therapies in patients who have COPD, especially those who have emphysema predominant. So uh, obviously if the patient has got uh, significant emphysema or a large bulla, then you should certainly think of uh, lung volume reduction surgery or even think of lung transplant. But there are a lot of these uh, other interventional pr procedures like so you can do bullectomy, uh, you can do uh, endoscopic lung volume reduction, you can put an endobronchial valve, can do endo lung volume coil reduction. You can do lung volume reduction surgery. So many things are now specifically mentioned as interventions that you can offer to patients of COPD. So these are exciting times for those who are into interventional pulmonology. There are lots of things that have been mentioned in the Gold 2023 report that you could potentially practice. Now these will all uh, come into reality once all these are available in India. But at least the guide. The, the 2023 strategy report, but otherwise people call as guidelines, now clearly talk about these interventional procedures. So I'm going to stop over here, and uh, uh, I hope this presentation was useful for you all, and uh, that uh, you know that will help you change your practice for the future. So thank you very much, and uh, if there are any questions, maybe we can probably cover them later. So Dr. Sandeep Salvi sir has uh, very nicely covered all the uh, updates in the management aspects of COPD. Now moving ahead with our next talk uh, on interpretation of polysomnogram. Uh, our speaker is uh, Dr. Vishweshwaran Balasubramaniam. He is a consultant uh, and interventional pulmonologist at Yashoda Hospital Samaji Goda. Not many of us, uh, many of you uh, might be knowing that uh, Dr. Vishweshwaran has done fellowship in sleep medicine and he is the right person for this topic. Thank you. Good evening, uh, seniors and friends, uh, and thanks to the chairpersons for the introduction. So, I think we are in the fag end of the day, so I will not take much of the time and will not make you sleep. We will try to make it a uh, little interesting as possible. I know it's a very, very dry topic because uh, when we used to do DM, like uh, our professor used to make us sit almost every day night, and uh, we used to do this uh, sleep epoch scoring. It is very, very, very tedious task and uh, it requires a lot of patience. But this is the one part of science in pulmonary medicine where you see the body as a whole. Unlike a pulmonologist where you are con concentrated only on the lungs, if you really move on to the sleep speciality, you need to understand the entire physiology, including the cardiovascular system and the lungs as well. 
So the outline of the talk will be like we'll see what is really the indication of a polysomnography. How are you going to hook up these patients and what are you going to do for the preparation of polysomnography? What are the types of sleep studies, diagnosis and of approach to reading the reports? So we all know that the polysomnography is the most important laboratory technique which is used in the diagnosis and the treatment of sleep disorders. We have lot of levels of sleep study we call it as level 1, level 2, level 3 and level 4. So the level 1 or the in lab attended polysomnography which contains at least 7 signals. So that is considered to be the gold standard. When you move to the level 2 it is again a 7 channel study but you don't have an in lab technician. Then we have something called as a level 3 study which are most of the portable studies that is being carried out which looks into your saturation which looks into your flow and uh, which, which will give some uh, report about your ap apnea hypopnea index. And we have a level 4 which is nothing but a nocturnal oximetry sort of studies. So in this what we are going to see today is if you do a proper sleep study in, as a level 1 how, how we are going to interpret it. And the primary indication for the sleep study is you can do it for patients who are suffering from excessive daytime sleepiness, who are suffering from obstructive sleep apnea, who is having breathing difficulties during sleep, behavioral disturbances during sleep and also a poor sleep quality or insomnia to exclude other sleep disorders. Which means that we as pulmonologists should not think that the sleep is just only OSC. There is something beyond OSC. So that is where the real uh, arena of the sleep medicine lies in. So whenever we see the monitors that are to be monitored in the polysomnography, we need to know we are looking at two major things. One is the sleep parameters, which is mainly the neurological parameters. The next one is the cardiopulmonary parameters. So in the neurological parameters, you look into the brain activity. So you need an EEG. You look into the eye. So you, you require an electrooculography. And you look into the muscles to look for any abnormal movement. So use the EMG or the electromyography. Then we have the cardiopulmonary parameters which we as pulmonologists are very much interested in. So we look into the ECG to look for any atrial fibrillation or any abnormal rhythm. We look into the airflow to see if there is any evidence of an apnea or a hypopnea. We look into the effort that is the thoracic effort and the abdominal effort to see if there is an obstructive sleep apnea or a central sleep apnea. And the most important thing that we look into is the SAO2 or the saturation to see if the patient is having a desaturation episodes or something is suggestive of a nocturnal hypoventilation. So whenever you hook up a patient in a sleep lab, this is how it is going to ideal sleep lab would look like. So you got a digital camera. So the advantage of the digital camera is that it will record all your abnormal parameters during sleep, whether you are having any sort of a REM behavioral disorder or you are having a bruxism or you are having an abnormal uh, movement disorder, everything can to certain extent can be found from your digital camera. Then you got an electrode input, which is a box where you fit all your electrodes and you got an EEG. This is mainly required for finding out the stage of the sleep and you will also look into the nocturnal, any seizure pattern or anything is there or not. Then you have got the thermistor. So the thermistor will sense the heat that is produced while you exhale the air. So this will help in saying whether the patient is breathing or not. You also have a nasal pressure cannula, which will also say whether the patient is breathing appropriately or his volume of breathing is changing with breath. Then you've got the EMG leads which can help in identifying the bruxism as well as in the REM to stage your REM sleep. Then you've got the thoracic and the abdominal belts which will clearly say whether the patient is having an obstructive sleep apnea or a central sleep apnea. In certain cases you can have a diaphragmatic EMG but that is not so commonly used. We just use a thoracic and an abdominal. Then you got a position sensor to see whether the patient is having high episodes of apnea in a supine position or in a prone position. And to record your hypoventilation, you got a transcutaneous CO2 monitor and you will also have an infrared light because in the night you are going to switch off the lights. So whenever we look into the sleep study, it is not only the saturation. We are going to take into consideration all these parameters. So this what you are seeing right now is, is a form of an epoch. So epoch means it is a part of a sleep study which contains a 30 second recording of sleep. So you have to let's say that you are doing a sleep study for 8 hours. You are going to split it up into each 30 seconds and you are going to mark what is the pattern of sleep. That is how you have to do an ideal sleep scoring. Unlike most of the in practice what people do is they get an automated report, they see the report, they sign it and send it. But actually if you go into the uh, algorithm of how to interpret a sleep, you need to 
interpret each epoch that means every 30 seconds you need to look into the sleep parameters and you need to look into the cardiopulmonary parameters so just a few words into the technical aspects for the eeg you got an input one electrode which is an exploring electrode and you got a reference electrode so whatever signals electrical signals that comes from our brain are then amplified through an amplifier and it is then calculated as cycles per second so whenever the electrical activity is recorded you are going to get a waveform and depending upon the frequency of this wave you are going to stage each of these epoch so what you have to remember in the eeg is you have got four waves in your brain one we refer to as an alpha wave which means that the cycles per second of the wave is going to be 8 to 13 hertz then you are going to have something called as a beta wave which is more than 13 hertz you are going to have a delta wave which is less than 4 hertz and you are going to have a theta wave which is between 4 to 7 hertz so what you are seeing here is nothing but an alpha wave that means if you take each cycles per second if you take each second this is an epoch for 30 seconds so if you are going to take each second if the number of the waves is going to be between 8 to 13 you are going to call it as an alpha wave and if you are going to have more than 13 you can see from here visually also you can see that the number of the waves are very high so it becomes a beta wave and when it becomes 4 to 7 in each of these uh, color coded region then it is theta waves then one of the most important thing which is used in staging of your sleep are the, these two parameters you need to remember always what is called as a sleep spindle and k complex so when you are going to have waves which are like 12 to 14 cycles per second and which last for a duration of at least 0.5 seconds then it is it means it is a spindle because this helps in scoring your sleep epoch as an n2 stage or not and you have something called as a k complex so in between your n2 sleep you will see something like this where there is a sharp negative deviation which is then followed by a positive component and the duration should be more than 0.5 seconds that means more than half of this color coded region if you see any of these two then you can be very confident in saying that you are dealing with an n2 stage of a sleep and when we move to the N3 stage of the sleep, that means you are going into the deeper aspects of sleep. So you are going to see what is referred to as a delta wave. The, in delta wave, what happens is the frequency decreases. You will see only 0.5 to 2 cycles per second. So maximum you are going to see two waves. And the amplitude is going to be quite high. It is like 75 micron volts. So depending upon how your EEG is going to be interpreted, whether you are going to have an alpha rhythm or a beta rhythm or a delta rhythm, you are going to stage your sleep. So you got stage W, which is nothing but the stage wake. Then you got a non-REM stage. In the non-REM stage, you got the stage N1, you got the stage N2, the stage N3, and what we refer to as the REM sleep. So to put it in a nutshell, you got three major stages of sleep. Either it is a wake stage or it is a non-REM stage or it is a REM stage. In the non-REM non stage, you are going to have three stages, which is N1, N2, and N3. So, how these waves are really going to help us? So, whenever you see a stage 1, that, that means if, let's start with an awake, that is a stage W, that means the patient is awake. He is going to have a random fast low voltage complexes in your EEG. And as the patient becomes drowsy, the frequency of the waves slightly tend to decrease that means he is going to have a frequency between 8 to 12 cycles per second which we refer to as the alpha waves so if you see an alpha wave then probably the patient is moving into n1 it's he is in the transition between awake and n1 so when you move to the stage one the again he is going into deeper sleep deeper portion so the frequency decreases so the frequency becomes three to seven cycles per second which is nothing but your theta waves and when he goes to the stage 2, as I said to you before, you need to remember two major things in N2, which is the sleep spindle, if you are where you are going to see an intense brain activity, or what you are going to see is nothing but the K complex. And when he goes into the deepest portion of the sleep, then we call it as a delta sleep. That is where you are going to see the high voltage, low frequency waves. So you are going to have higher amplitude and the frequency is going to be smaller. So when this is there, it is a delta sleep. And whenever you have a REM sleep, REM sleep will mimic your awake. REM sleep means your brain is going to be extremely active, but to prevent you from enacting all your dreams, your body goes into complete paralysis. So that is what is REM sleep. REM sleep means your brain is going to be almost in an awake state, 
but your body is going to be entirely paralyzed. So there you get what is referred to as these sawtooth waves. So this is how your whenever you see an epoch, this is how you are going to stage a wake stage. So when a patient is going to keep his eyes closed, as we have seen from the graph before, it is going to be more of an alpha wave pattern. And when the patient is going to keep his eyes open, you are going to have a low voltage mixed frequency. And how will you differentiate awake stage from your uh, REM sleep is that because both are going to have high activity of EEG, you need to look into your chin. Because if there is a movement in the chin, that means the patient is still awake. Because when a patient goes into the REM sleep, his entire body is going into a paralysis. So he will not have any EMG activity during the stage of a REM sleep. So your REM sleep will almost mimic like your wake stage, but the only way you can differentiate your REM sleep is total paralysis, including your non-activity in your EMG leads. Then you are moving into the stage N1. As I said to you before, it is going to be having more of these theta waves. So the frequency is going to drop and there is going to be a decrease in the tone of EMG because as we move into the sleep, we are not going to use our EMG muscles so that the EMG muscles are going into hypotonia. And it is associated with slow eye wave movements. If you see these eye wave movements, this is your left EOG and this is your right EOG. You can see that there is a slow movement of the eyeballs. So when you see a pattern like this where you are going to have a theta wave, where you are going to have a slow movement of your eyes and where your EMG in the tone is going to decrease, then probably the patient is going entering into the stage 1 of sleep. When we move into the stage 2 of sleep, as I said to you before, you need to remember two things. One is your sleep spindle. That means you can see intense brain activity which lasts for more than 0.5 seconds and what you are going to see is your K complex which are broad based complexes. So the presence of sleep spindle and or K complex in a background of low voltage mixed frequency waves suggest N2 pattern. And as we have seen before deep sleep it is going to be all of like high voltage and low frequency waves and this is going to constitute more than 20% of your epoch. And then comes what we discussed, which is the REM sleep. Again, it is going to have a low voltage mixed frequency activity. But as I said to you before, in REM sleep, you are not going to, you are going to almost have a total paralysis. So your chin EMG is going to be almost nearly flat. And since you are going to have a lot of dreams, so you can see from here the eye rolls are eyeballs are moving. So when you have an wake-like pattern with a complete paralysis of your EMG tone along with the rapid eye movements, that is what we refer to as the REM sleep. And whenever a patient suddenly wakes up, let's say you are going to have an OSA patient, he is waking up in between, you are going to have something, an erratic pattern like this. That means this patient has got aroused from your sleep. So this, can, this is not a stage of a sleep, this is probably an abrupt shift in your EEG. So when you calculate each and every epoch, like 30 seconds like this and keep doing it for entire thing, you will get a composite picture like this. This is what we refer to as a, a hypnogram. So in this, the utmost activity will be seen when a patient is going to be awake. Then comes the stage of a REM, which is almost mimicking an awake state, but your body is in paralysis. Then comes the stage of N1, the stage of N2 and stage of N3. So this entire pattern, graphical pattern, what you are going to see is the ultimate data of scoring individual epochs. This is what we refer to as a hypnogram. So why it is important? Because we need to know that how much portion of the sleep that the patient has spent in. For example, you can see if a patient is totally sleep deprived, as soon as he sleeps, he is going to have a lot of these deep wave sleep pattern. That means the N3 portion is going to be very high. If a patient is going to be on certain drugs, again the REM, uh, REM periods may be very high. So depending upon your hypnogram, you can it can give clue to your diagnosis what sort of sleep disorder the patient is dealing with. So moving on to the cardiorespiratory parameters, the one and the most important thing that all of us are as pulmonologists really are concerned about is apnea. So you will score a respiratory event as an apnea when both of these criteria are met. That means in your pulse oximeter value, like in the waves, there should be a de decrease in the signal excursion by at least 90% of the pre-event activity and the duration of the drop should be for at least 10 seconds. Only then you can call a particular respiratory event as an apnea. And depending upon how your muscles are going to act, you can classify the apnea into a central apnea, you can classify into an obstructive sleep apnea or you can classify it into a mixed sleep apnea. 
सेंट्रल स्लीप अपनी मीन योर ब्रेन इज गोइंग टू गिव यू द ट्रिगर बट योर बॉडी इज नॉट गोइंग टू एक्ट सो यू आर गोइंग टू हैव अ फ्लैट लाइन बोथ इन योर अपडम एज वेल एस इन योर थोरेक्स वेन एवर दर इज एन अब्सट्रक्टिव स्लीप अपनी द ब्रेन इज गोइंग टू गिव यू द कमेंड बट द बॉडी इज ऑल्सो गोइंग टू एक्ट बट दर इज गोइंग टू बी अ पैराडॉक्सिकल मूवमेंट दट मीन्स योर थोरेसिक एंड द अबडोमल मूवमेंट विल बी इन अ पैराडॉक्सिकल वे देन इट इज कॉल्ड एस एन अब्सट्रक्टिव स्लीप अपनी In a single epoch, you can see both central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea. Then it becomes what we refer to as a mixed apnea. So, if you see here, this is your chest belt, this is your thoracic belt, this is your abdominal belt. When there is an apnea, you can see that saturation is falling here. That the saturation is becoming eighty three, eighty five. That means there is a fall in the saturation. Along with that, you can see that the there is a paradoxical movement of the thoracic as well as the abdomen therefore it falls into the criteria of an obstructive sleep apnea whereas you can see here if you see the saturation it starts at 97 93 89 86 83 82 and but there is no movement either in the chest or in the abdomen that means the brain is producing the signals but your body is not moving so it is a it is a form of a central sleep apnea and in addition to this you can see that here there is an obstructive like for this is your abdomen and this is your thorax there is an paradoxical movement here and along with a central sleep apnea this is what we refer to as a mixed sleep apnea so in addition to this there is another term which we all should know which is nothing but a hypopnea in in this there is a decrease in the flow of the air but it drops only by 30% of the pre event baseline unlike more than 90 percentage and this drop in the 30% should last at least for 10 seconds and it should be associated with a desaturation of at least 3% this is as per 2020 aasm guideline but the hypopnea has also got multiple other definitions but for all practical purposes we take the first definition which is a fall in the percentage by 30% and which lasts for 10 seconds and it should be associated with a desaturation of greater than 3% so if you see here uh If you see the saturation, the saturation is falling from ninety-five to ninety-two. That means the fall in the saturation is more than three percentage. And if you see the flow, you can see that the flow is decreasing, but it is not becoming completely absent. That means it is decreasing by more than thirty percentage. And if you can um, see from uh, the thoracic belt, there there is some amount of reduction in the thoracic belt activity also. So it is a classical case of a hypopnea. in addition to this we have something called as an rara for all the post graduates what you need to know about rara is when nothing is fitting into either apnea or hypopnea and but you still feel that there is an abnormality which lasts for at least 10 seconds then this is what is referred to as a respiratory effort related arousal and we have something called as an hypoventilation that means in case if you are using a transcutaneous co2 monitor and your pco2 is increasing more than 55 mm of mercury for at least 10 minutes or your true value of uh, is more than 50 mm of mercury for 10 minutes then we refer to as a hypoventilation and one another thing which is of very much interest whenever a cardiologist is there in your domain is what we refer to as a chain strokes breathing so there is a crescendo and a decrescendo so whenever you are doing a sleep study and if you see something like this in your nasal pressure transducer it gives a very clear diagnosis that the patient is also having possibly an underlying heart failure the advantage of identifying the chain stroke is you know that the, the osa patient is also having an underlying uh, heart related uh, even maybe in a fluid overload or in pulmonary edema and if you treat that probably you can bring down the severity of your obstructive sleep apnea as well and when you do all these things and you get a final report so what are you going to see in your report the final report it is not only about apnea hypopnea index you need to see what is the time in the bed the patient has spent what is the total recording time the sleep study has been conducted in that recording time how many how many minutes has the patient slept and what is the efficiency of the sleep it should be at least more than 90 percentage and what is the sleep latency if it is normal it should be less than 20 minutes and what is the rem latency that is the first onset of the rem it should be between 90 to 120 minutes and wake after sleep onset which should be less than 20 minutes and sleep prior time because each of these parameters have a certain disorder associated with it for example if the sleep latency is going to be very less probably the patient is going to be a sleep deprived patient if the rem latency is going to be very less probably you are going to have a condition something like a narcolepsy so that is why you need to look into all these aspects when you are interpreting your hypnogram and you need to interpret the stage of the sleep also 
for that you need to know what is the normal stage of the sleep the n1 occupies 5 percentage of your sleep the n2 is the major one which occupies 50 percentage of your sleep and the n3 occupies 20 percentage and your rem occupies 25 percentage so any variation in the stages of sleep can also say what is the underlying disorder the patient is suffering from in addition to this we also look into the total arousal index we look into what is referred to as the respiratory arousal index we look into the periodic limb movement activity we also look into the RERA, which I mentioned to you earlier. And you also have to look into the periodic limb movement. That is why you are connecting an EMG to the limbs. You are connecting an EMG to the uh, chin to look for the presence of bruxism. And you will also connect an ECG to look for any atrial fibrillation or abnormal rhythms. And in respiratory indices, you have to look into the apnea hypopnea index, the RERA index, RDI, and even the oxygen saturation. And for the postgraduates here, the apnea hypopnea index is nothing but the apneas plus hypopneas, which is divided by the total sleep time. So anything between 0 to 5 per hour is normal, which if it is between 5 to 15, it is mild, 15 to 13, it is moderate, and it is more than 30, it is going to be severe. And if you are going to include RERAS along with apnea and hypopnea, that is when we refer to as a respiratory disturbance index, which is RDI. So if it is it, 5 to 15 it is mild, 16 to 30 is moderate and more than 30 is severe. So if you combine all these things, whatever we have learned, this is how you are going to interpret your sleep report. It is not only your AHI. You need to look into the, all these parameters from last slide. Sir. Total sleep time, stages of sleep, latency, arousal index, what is the obstructive event, apnea, hypopnea, AHI and everything you have to see in composite before you interpret your sleep study and not just one parameter which is your AHI. Thank you. So, sleep uh, is uh, day by day, it is an evolving science and uh, I think everybody will accept that now it has been established as a separate subspecialty in pulmonary medicine. So, now, now I will uh, open the session for uh, questions from audience. Only one question. As an intensive, I want to know the role of your this, uh, sleep study in the critical care patient, in the sick patients. Is there any role or some kind of hepatic and capillopathy or is there any benefit or something? Yeah, if the uh, we do do uh, in Western, we do uh, Western countries they do it almost um, routinely, sir. Like it is a part of the intensive care practice as well. Um, where they have found, they have done this uh, sleep studies to look for present. Let's say that a patient is in a um, drug effect, then probably you can get a generalized uh, uh, reduction in the amplitudes of your EEG pattern. So in that way, your e it is a part of an EEG monitoring. In addition to this, the Sleep in ICU has been extensively studied and what they have found out is uh, patients who are having abnormalities in the uh, sleep during ICU stay are found to have some sort of um, um, uh, disturbances in their cognitive levels also post discharge. So that is why now a lot of uh, things are happening even in ICUs to improve the sleep quality like using of um, music, keeping the, trying to keep the environment as natural as possible, creating a day and night difference. So all these things are happening because there is a lot of studies going into the uh, sleep aspect of the ICU as well. And chronic sleep deprivations in ICU, especially for prolonged ICU stays, are also found to have impaired effects on wound healing. It is also found to decrease their immune status, poor recoveries, and even uh, long-term cognitive disorders in these patients. Thank you. So I have one question for you, sir. Uh, I, I might be slightly deviating from the topic. You being a sleep specialist as well as a interventional pulmonologist so like whenever you come across a case of a, a, a intervention where you need to do a, a airway procedure it might be a prolonged procedure and patient is uh, a sleep uh, having sleep disorder which is not corrected so how we are going to approach sir? if it is an emergency there is no point in doing sleep study and also we will take up for the procedure um, the real utility of the sleep um, uh, comes is like especially when we de uh, deal uh, patients who goes for these bariatric surgeries and others where they get our consults. Uh, so there we optimize these patients prior before we put them on these, uh, we send them, we give the clearance for any of these surgeries. But for imminent airway procedures, uh, then we don't have enough time to optimize their sleep condition before we take up, take them up for procedures. Yeah, as not many PGs are asking this question. I'm just on, on their behalf, I'm going to ask this question. Sir, how long you are, uh, you will take the time to stabilize the patient before this procedure? Like, or is the optim optimi optimized no, time? stabilization is once you do a sleep study, you have a very strong AHI which is favoring a moderate to severe OSA. 
then the treatment is going to be just a uh, no. more of a pap device so when you will plan the procedure how long you will take for the no once it, it is a, once you put a patient on pap device even the next day or very next day they can take the patient for surgery so we don't say that you have to take the cpap for uh, one week after that only you go for a surgery we will say that you start the patient on cpap and you expect a post surgery complications related to osa also and the patient should be even post surgery he should be on cpap but osa is not a criteria for withholding any sort of um, uh, surgical intervention because it is a very the moment you put as pap device most of the apneas hypopneas are going to uh, get uh, result so thank you very much sir uh, for covering the basics of uh, uh, polysomnography thank you very much thank you Deep Salvisar is going to join us uh, yeah. for uh, question and answer questions. Uh, any queries from audience regarding his uh, talk on updates in management of CUPD? Uh, Salvisar, good evening. Am I audible to you? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, making such a complex topic into a simpler topic in 30 minutes, sir, actually. And we have completed two of your talks, actually, COPD guidelines. So one of the questions from our audience was about the reversibility criteria on the impulse oscillometry. As just as we have a uh, proper criteria for the bronchodilator reversibility on the spirometry, what are the criteria or whether, whether they've been validated or not? And the second was about the pediatric uh, values for uh, IOS, sir. Can you throw a little light? Very good question. <laughs> uh, bronchodilator reversibility uh, criteria is now well established for spirometry. So for adults, we use 12% and 200 ml improvement in FEV1. Although, if you look at the latest uh, publications, there is a slight change even in the spirometry cutoff value. They say that uh, your bronchodilator response uh, divided by your predicted uh, FEV1 value should be more than 10%. But let's not get into that. The existing ATS CRS norms for cutoff for FEV1 is 12% and 200. Now, unfortunately, there is no yet uh, such a similar cutoff value that is established for the oscillometry. So, by and large, your if your resistance at 5 hertz gets better than uh, after a bronchodilator improves by more than 40%. What do you mean by improves? So, your R5 value should now become less. Your resistance should become less by 40% compared to your pre-bronchodilator value. That is currently considered to be the uh, the cutoff value for a good bronchodilator reversibility. If you're using the area of reactance, which is the AX, if you remember the triangle that I showed you, so if that has to reduce by 50% to say that there is good bronchodilator reversibility. Now, having said that, these are very tentative cutoff uh, values. These are still evolving, and as more and more research happens, we will get more fixed cutoff values for this. Uh, the second question with regard to the uh, what are the normal oscillometry values for children? So, if you look at the R5 value, R5 is the resistance of the entire respiratory tract. For an adult, the uh, the normal R5 is less than 4 centimeters of water per liter per second or less than 0.4 kilopascal units per liter per second. And by and large, 0.3 to 0.4 is a cutoff value for KPA or three to four, four centimeters of water for adults. For children, it is different. A child who is three years old, the R5 value, the normal R5 value can be as high as 12 centimeters of water. And then as you, as the child increases, uh, you know, as the child grows from three years to 15 years, the R5 value reduces from 12 to 10 to eight to five to four. So by the time the, the child becomes 15 years old, it reaches the adult value. And then, uh, as I said, starting point for three years old is 12 centimeters of water per liter per second. So for children, it's a, it's a, the unit of predicted value. For adults, it's a straight line. Whether you are 30, 40, 50, 60, doesn't make any difference. It's a straight line. Unlike spirometry, where your values change with age. Yeah. Thank you, sir. 
uh, because we use a wire machine actually the wire machine the impulse oscillometry reversibility criteria are like uh, they have given a 20% uh, reverse like decrease in the resistance for r5 r20 and r5 minus r20 they give an absolute value of 0 0.07 i think pre and post right. value that was the reason why i put up the question so, uh, so unlike spirometry there is no standardization that has happened yet uh, I think there is a oscillometry. So, if you use the wire machine, then the predicted values are different. If you use the predicted values, hello. Any hello. I'm sorry. I think my connection is a little weak. Any question? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We are uh, the the. The values will change for each and every device that we are using for oscillometry. And as of now, there are no standardized values. I think it is only a matter of time when people will develop these values. Uh, thank you, sir. There is one more question for you from one of the students. Good evening, sir. With uh, I Good have evening. a question regarding the gold AB assessment score. Like, uh, for suppose the patient, he was not admitted priorly and he had no any exacerbations, but he was admitted right now for the first time. So, in what category will be grading, like, uh, will consider the present, current admission uh, into assessment or will consider only the past years of admissions into consideration? Like, so, for, you will consider only the past one year. The current admission will not be considered. So you would treat the current hospitalization for an acute exacerbation of COPD the way you treat an acute exacerbation of COPD. Then you follow up the patient. Now, because the patient has already been hospitalized, already been hospitalized, I would tend to go uh, to start the pharmacotherapy on the higher side. So either a dual bronchodilator, that is a lama plus lama, or I would be a lama when the patient is getting discharged. I will treat although the criteria is for the last one year, but because the patient has been hospitalized, I would treat it like an exacerbation. And therefore, the my my category would certainly go to E. Uh, are there any further questions to Dr. Salvi on IOS or the COPD? Hello. Any questions or comments? Any questions? I would like uh, PGs to take an active part in the discussion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not, so, it's, not easy to, it's not easy to teach about, to talk about optometry in 25 minutes. Uh, yeah. My only intention was to sensitize the post students so that at least they've heard something called oscillometry, something called resistance and reactance and R5 and R20. I think once you have this knowledge, let's start reading and then gain more knowledge in this because this is not. No. Sir, so, uh, I think the signal is unstable, but uh, they were able to cover the basics very well in the given 30 minutes, sir, actually. And uh, thank you very much. I think uh, there are no further questions from the audience. And thank you for uh, taking the time again and joining, even though you're out of your uh, own city. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I was there in person, Dr. Vishwanath, but all my very best to all the postgraduate students who are attending this program. Yeah. And thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. And thanks for thank Bye, sir. Uh, thank you. So, uh, can I request the uh, moderator to give the token of gratitude to the speakers of the session? Dr. Deepak Talwak, sir, please come on to the dais, sir. Dr. Vishweshwaran, sir.
I would request Paranjyoti sir to comment out to the chairpersons. Dr. Anand Gupta sir. Now we'll, we'll move on to the tea break for 15 minutes. That's all I need. It's over now. And I can, I can also... Uh, only thing is these slides are a little small. I can't see that. I'll be a little thumb, no? That's fine. Okay. How did you connect? Oh, this side you connected. Okay. Huh.
So moving on to the next session, I would like to invite the chairpersons for the uh, session 5. Dr. Kishan Srikant Juva is a consultant uh, pulmonologist in Kim's Hospital, Sikandrabad. Dr. Chetan Rao is a consultant inter interventional pulmonologist, Yashoda Hospitals, Hyderabad. Dr. Vishweshwaran, consultant interventional pulmonologist, Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. Uh, I will now introduce uh, Dr. Kedar Hebre, sir. Uh, he is a uh, consultant pulmonologist from Narayana Health City, Bangalore. And uh, he will be today talking on 
approach to uh, plural effusions sir please uh, uh thank you for the chair thank you chairpersons for the kind introduction and of course the aig team led by gela for inviting me uh normally i usually don't talk on plural effusions but gela has given me a very different difficult task and uh, probably like many of you here in the audience going back and reading the basics of pulmonology is what i really did myself too uh, being an interventional pulmonologist and it helped me revise a lot of my basic concepts uh, and i hope i'll try to keep it very basic very minimal and uh, you know give you some pointers on what you could do so uh, before i proceed to my presentation uh, there are no conflicts of interest i have to declare and i am going to be uh, sticking to the abc of plural effusion that is the hardcore basics uh, let me also tell you that i won't be talking anything on malignant plural effusions because my good colleague dr nagarjun mathro is going to be talking about it in a morning session tomorrow okay so what are we going to do today we are, i'm going to introduce the topic i'm going to talk about very basics of plural physiology we'll discuss exudates and transudates uh, what is predictable we'll look at the existing diagnostic algorithm for it and what do we do uh, in the evaluation of plural effusions when we are stuck and we look at the gradually shifting paradigms and when we are when we are stuck what are we going to do what are the myths and pearls many of you are post graduates i'll i'll i uh, put up my email address uh, there it's k.hibari@gmail.com there's no need to take any photographs i'm quite happy to email all the slides to you so don't don't bother about wasting your time taking photographs again i repeat it's kedarhibare at gmail.com so just write a mail to me for the presentation i'll share it don't don't worry about it okay so let me introduce the topic so what is pleural effusion it is nothing but an abnormal accumulation of fluid within the pleural cavity it forms because of an imbalance between the formation of the fluid and the absorption of fluid and of course there are local and systemic factors which affect which basically cause the pleural effusion to accumulate so where does pleural fluid really form it forms in the not in the visceral pleura but the parietal pleura and it gets absorbed in the parietal pleura but apart, apart from that of course the interstitium also can pl produce pleural fluid and so does the peritoneum so there are three areas where pleural fluid formation can happen but while absorption happens only with the lymphatics it's important to remember that uh, uh, the lymphatics in the pleura have the ability to absorb 20 times the amount of pleural fluid so if there is an excess formation there is a good enough mechanism to drain it and if despite that or when the system gets overwhelmed that's when pleural effusion really accumulates this is just basically the diagram showing it to you on the left you have parietal space in between you have the pleural space and then the visceral space so you can see that there's a lymphatic on the left side uh and and that's where the fluid gets drained from and basically what happens between this is that there is a balance of hydrostatic and oncotic uh, uh, you know oncotic pressures which promotes the formation of pleural fluid and the pressure gradient shows the net flow of fluid from the parietal pleura and that it remains in equilibrium in the visceral pleura which is really the reason why the pleural physiology goes on happening so various mechanisms of pleural fluid formation have been elucidated in different kinds of pleural effusion for example in heart failure there's an increased systemic hydrostatic pressure along with a decreased oncotic pressure a very similar mechanism happens when there is hypoalbuminemia or nephrotic syndrome uh, while in tuberculosis and pleural metastases where there is an increased protein there's increased capillary permeability which causes the pleural circulation in the pleural circulation the lymphatic drainage obstruction happens with mediastinal masses when there's a trapped lung you see increased negative pressure in the pleural space with chylothorax there's a rupture or compression of the thoracic duct and when there is a hemothorax there's basically a vascular rupture so these are different mechanisms but what is important to understand is all this just happens with the space with the parietal pleura with the visceral pleura and the peritoneum involved and that's really how the fluid accumulates so Uh, since this is a postgraduate uh, you know cme uh, i was told to keep it very basic so uh, the clinical examination as you all know shows a mediastinal shift to the opposite side there's decreased vf there's stony dull on it's stony dull on percussion and of course there are decreased breath sounds 
But the next step after this is basically that you do a chest imaging. So once you have a strong clinical suspicion of uh, pleural effusion, you go in for chest imaging. And what do you do in this chest imaging is you, you do the chest imaging, either you use uh, the ultrasound of the chest, which every single major guideline across the world now considers it to be the standard practice now. X-rays are no more standard practice in ultrasound, uh, you know, in, in pleural effusions or in pleural diseases. It's now the ultrasound of the chest. Uh, of course, a little lesser, more, uh, uh, but a better effective, uh, you know, imaging modality than a PA would actually be a lateral decubitus view. And that's because you can even image about 75 to 100 ml of pleural fluid. So that's the really something that I wanted to highlight. But once you've confirmed the uh, uh, fluid on imaging, the next step is basically to classify it either as an exudate or transudate. And all postgraduates here must be knowing the lights criteria off their hands. And once you've done that and classified the fluid, your next workup starts because that's just the beginning of your workup. And then you add additional investigations to get to the bottom of a cause. So that's basically the three steps. Now, I'm not going to go into a busy slide. All you need to know is there are many, many causes of transudates and there are many, many causes of exudates. But what is important here is the frequent causes and the less frequent causes. So this is basically what you try and suspect clinically when you see patients. The frequent transudates or the most common transudate that you see is heart failure, while uh, the most frequent exudates are malignant, paranemonic and tuberculosis in our settings. But when the diagnosis is elusive, you start thinking about the less frequent causes and then when the less frequent causes get ruled out, you try to go to the infrequent causes. Uh, I don't know how many of you can see this slide very clearly, but this is the current management algorithm for pleural effusion. So I'll take you through uh, this management algorithm a little slowly. So what you basically do is you do a medical history, a clinical examination and of course a chest x-ray which act as your first line. Then what you do is, does the clinical picture suggest a transudate? So what you're trying to do is just with the history and imaging studies, you ask yourself if this is a transudate. And if you think it is a transudate without having done any further investigation, you treat it. Okay, so I'm, I'm re-emphasizing the point. You haven't done thoracentesis yet, but your clinical suspicion of the fluid being a transudate is extremely strong. So you actually treat it and you see if it is resolved. And if it is resolved, that's great. But if it doesn't, that's when you actually proceed to ultrasound guided thoracentesis. So the newer guidelines actually suggest that you, your clinical suspicion is something that you rely on very strongly and you treat it first. And if it doesn't really come down, and if this clinical suspicion is that of a transudate from a heart failure, you treat it first and look if it is a transudate. If it comes down, you confirmed your diagnosis clinically. There's nothing much to do but to optimize his heart failure. But Let's assume the situation where it doesn't get resolved. And then what you do is you do an ultrasound guided thoracentesis and set, send the investigations for the first set of biochemical cytological tests and the culture sensitivities. And of course, you apply the lights criteria and ask yourself if this is, uh, you know, a transudate or an exudate. And let's assume that it's a transudate for now and move to the left side of the diagram. And here, the most common causes, heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome and trapped lung are ruled out. Else, what you do is you ask yourself, has the pleural fluid analysis given a diagnosis? And if it hasn't given you a diagnosis yet that it is a transudate, then you proceed to add more investigations to it, depending upon what your clinical suspicion is. If it's a malignancy, you add cytology, pleural fluid biopsy, or a CT, CT scan. If it's a uh, paranemonic effusion, you want to know if there's septations, if there's loculations, you ask them for a CT scan so that you can probably proceed to uh, do editorialysis via thoracoscopy or medical thoracoscopy or rigid thoracoscopy as the case may be. Uh, if the ADA is very high, the, if it's lymphocytic predominant, all you do is a biopsy with your medical thoracoscopy and then you come out. Heart failure, you may observe, is there both in transudate and exudate. And the reason why that happens is because if you have treated your heart failure initially with diuretics, uh, likely the picture is, will look like an exudate. And that's again why they have put heart failure as an exudate there and ask you to look for the NT pro BNP here. And then of course, you look for any pulmonary embolism and you rule that out with a CT pulmonary angio. You then go on to do additional investigations like CT scans and then consider radiological guided pleural biopsy as the case may be. So this is basically how you go about it. Again, I'm emphasizing here the two boxes up there, the one on the top is first when you suspect it, you treat it before you even do your analysis. And 
this is the reason that's because the most common uh, uh, you know uh, reason why you have a effusion is heart failure bacterial pneumonia embolism malignancy viral disease and post cardiac surgery in that order and on the top of the list is heart failure because pleural effusions come with heart failure so often that it's always important that you keep on going ahead with further workup and of course once you've done your uh, pleural fluid analysis there's a lot to gain from it okay and what are the things the color the smell the character of the fluid all of these things add a little more to your understanding of what you're dealing with so never ignore seeing your pleural fluid uh, you know the character of the fluid the smell of the pleural fluid you know before you proceed to other important investigations and i'm not going to go through the busy slide except that you know things like uh, you know if it's dark green it's probably biliothorax if it's if it's brown it's a long standing bloody effusion and so on so those are something which are very clear so what i want to leave you with after this particular uh, algorithmic analysis is treat first before tapping if clinical suspicion of the transudate is high especially if it's heart failure what is important is a thorough clinical history with systemic systemic examination and remember to go back to the fluid look at it uh, and the characteristics of the fluid tapped are extremely important apart from that of course your clinical examination should also look for other things distended neck veins hemoptysis hepatosplenomegaly lymphadenopathy orthopnea basically all i'm trying to tell you is get back to basics pleural effusion management is all about the abc's clinical examination clinical examination clinical examination uh, uh, you know history taking and so on and of course one of the things that we often tend to forget you know is taking a history of the drugs that patients take so if patients are on beta blockers uh, amiodarone tryptophan etc they are likely to uh, have an effusion secondary to that so never forget to take your drug history let's go a little little further now this is the next algorithm i'm coming to and i and this is about undiagnosed pleural effusion so you did your first set and you still don't find a diagnosis what happens next is you then move on to add more investigations to your bottom and then you try and get to the bottom of where you are headed so you uh, you reinterrogate and reexplore the patient review the pleural fluid analysis report and the imaging study and again ask yourself is that a transudate and then if it is a transudate are there any clinical data suggesting heart failure pericardial effusions or uh, hepatic or renal disease or a trapped lung and you again proceed uh, you know uh, accordingly but if it is not so consider the rarer causes and what these rare, rarer causes are a dura pleural fistula where you look for a beta 2 transferrin a urinothorax where you look for the creatinine protein and serum levels and look at the ratio you ask you look for peritoneal dialysis uh, as one of the causes uh, then you look for the uh, displacement of central venous catheter and of course malignant pleural effusions okay and if you uh, think that that it's not a transudate and it's an ex exudate of course you move on to ultrasonography and these days the area below ultrasonography is moving more and more towards interventions so what you basically do is you add in more investigations and you try to get a biopsy and now as you know with the amount of interventions that's happening in the pleural disease this has become fairly much more easier you get a histopathological examination but yes that may or may not end your dilemma so always go back ask for more investigations suspect things more clinically before you do things so what's the absolute truth the absolute truth is this assumptions in diagnostic algorithms are that lights criteria will sort out exudate versus transudate right we always think that you just apply the lights criteria and your job is done often enough that is not the case clinical judgment is superior while clinical judgment may not necessarily be superior and you require investigations to support you always remember that your history and your clinical examination and your judgment is important may not always be right we always also assume uh, you know when we are growing up that patients have only one illness and no confounding factors so these are our basic assumptions and algorithms and what we go about when we analyze pleural effusions but the reality is far from above and the defined uh, and uh, you know the role of advanced diagnostics is extremely important uh, i've tried to make my presentation interesting by adding in something called myths and pearls and this is related to the lights criteria so one of the myths that we have is lights criteria remain the best method for separating transudate from exudate actually it's a myth it's not necessarily there's a huge scope for misclassification especially in a patient whom you have already tapped a transudate can look like an exudate the sensitivity is 95% to identify exudate but 25 to 30% of them will get mis
justified and that's something very important to remember and when such a thing happens you add something called as the two test or the three test rule i'll come to it a little later another pearl here this lights criteria are superior to clinical judgment for discriminating trans rates from x rates this is something that we think that clinical e examination and history taking will help but sometimes application of lights criteria can just be simple and will tell you if it's a light it's, it's x rate or trans rate so in a study they found that clinical ju judgment actually mislabeled 44 percent of trans rates as x rates while the lights criteria mislabeled it only by 25 percent so don't always go by your gut go with your gut and also use the lights criteria for doing what best you can the next pearl is the measurement of nt pro bnp either in the blood or the pleural fluid it best identifies transudates misclassified by lights criteria so do we do nt pro bnps and if we have to do nt pro bnps would you want to do it in serum or do you want to do it in the pleural fluid so you all know that 25 percent of transudates are misclassified and therefore they have additional criteria which i refer to as the two test rule so you can look at the serum albumin and the plural fluid ratio uh, to be more than 1.2 grams per deciliter or serum protein uh, ratio which is serum protein minus the plural fluid protein in some studies the cutoff is at 3.1 grams per deciliter while in others it's 2.5 i would go by the 3.1 criteria and of course nt pro bnp has also been studied in plural fluid at different levels a significant being that of more than 1300 picograms or 1500 as the case may be all you have to understand is nt pro bnp can be done both in serum or plural fluid but it's not necessary that you have to do it always in the plural fluid so if you have a patient with a strong suspicion of a heart failure related effusion you have done the patient tapping you find that it's an exudate you can just do a nt pro bnp and then uh, if the nt pro bnp is high you can attribute the plural effusion to heart failure it's as simple as that so the next myth is about time interval between plural fluid and serum sample collection so many of us while working we we do the sampling of the plural fluid now but the sampling of the serum later so what is really the ideal time so there was a very interesting study which looked at two groups one group with a mean time interval of one hour and 12 minutes the other one almost 28 hours so after a day so the plural fluid sample was collected now and the serum fluid was collected 28 hours later so that's basically what the discordance is and then it this uh, despite there being such a huge gap the misclassification happens only in two cases okay so it's not really necessary that you you do the plural fluid tapping and immediately send the serum if you have done it within the last 24 hours or after the 20 after 24 hours of tapping it's still quite all right so how do we really go about uh, plural effusion management so basically there is a three uh, you know step approach or a three circle approach as i would call it first do your plural fluid analysis okay and there are loads of investigations depending upon your clinical suspicion depending upon what you found positive go ahead and look at the characteristic in terms of color and odor so uh, you know and then you get an additional amount of information and then you can boil down to a most likely diagnosis so that's really what you can uh, you know should be your approach a three tire approach to plural effusion let's go to more myths and facts okay and this is about plural fluid characteristics so one of the myth that we think that all exudates have clear appearances in a very interesting study of 766 plural effusions only 13 percent were clear so don't assume that all plural effusions which are transudates have clear appearance majority of them had were straw colored and they can be bloody in 11 percent as well or turbid in 9 percent malignancy is the most common cause of bloody effusions that's really what we think you know as a postgraduate i always grew with it until i really read this slide 47 percent of the bloody effusions are malignant so there is another 53 percent which are not trauma pneumonia post cardiac injury syndrome and pulmonary embolism are of course other causes of malignant plural uh, of bloody effusions and but only 11 percent of malignant plural effusions are bloody i'm again repeating it we all probably think that malignant plural effusion is equal to a bloody effusion it is not only 11 percent of them are bloody let's go to another interesting area chylothorax we all think that chylothorax has milky appearance and we've all learnt i i learnt chylothorax is equal to milky fluid but in a study of 60 uh, 61 patients non milky chylothoraces were more you know were almost 50% especially when the patients are fasting so your chylothorax really depends upon your 
amount of food intake or your fasting state. It can be serous or serous sanguinous in 26% and even hemorrhagic in 3, right? So don't always assume that a chylothorax is equal to milky appearance. The other thing that we also learn uh, during our postgraduate days is the pleural fluid uh, triglyceride levels less than 110 rules out a chylothorax. That's not necessarily so. While defining the chylothorax, uh, triglyceride level of more than 110 was used as a criteria. But in a study, when all the chylothoraces were looked at, 14% had lower values. In fact, two of them had values less than 50. So what is important is lipid content of effusion varies depending upon nutrition. So if you're fasting, your nutritional status all matter when you're diagnosing chylothorax. I've just put two management algorithms from a very recent paper in chest on how to manage chylothorax. And I won't go too much into the details except for you to understand that chylothorax is recurrent non-traumatic chylothorax. That's one algorithm. The other one is a recurrent traumatic chylothorax. So all you need to understand is that there is a duct which can get severed at uh, one of the areas. And whenever it happens, it's either traumatic or non-traumatic. And that's where the problem occurs. And the management of chylothorax really depends upon the output. So how you go about managing chylothorax is, is the output. Okay, just a couple of minutes. So the next myth is delay in performing biochemical or cytological pleural fluid analysis critically affects the results. So how late is considered too late? So you do the pleural fluid tapping, how much can you delay the analysis? The ideal time is to do it within four hours, but you can delay it. If you store uh, your pleural fluid with adequate care, uh, either in a EDTA or a heparin uh, vial uh, for 4 degrees for a day, ADA does not change for up to 4 weeks and cytology doesn't for 2 weeks. Pleural fluid should always be sent for gram state and culture. It should not always be sent for gra gram state and culture unless and until you are suspecting infection. Right? Let's get to cytology. Among exudates, pleural fluid differential provides a clue to the origin of the pleural effusion and that's really a pearl. So when you analyze your fluid, ask them for the breakdown of the cells. If it's neutrophilic, it indicates some diseases. If it's lymphocytic, it indicates something. And if it's eosinophilic, it does indicate something else. Cytological analysis of malignant pleural effusion requires a large volume of pleural fluid. So in my days, when we tapped supposedly malignant pleural effusions, the entire one and a half liter of fluid drained would be sent to the lab with heparin added. And there were three studies which looked at this answer to this question. The sensitivity didn't depend upon the quality of the fluid. There was another study which looked at an incremental yield with increasing volumes and that was positive. And there was another study where 50 ml didn't increase the diagnostic yield. So what's the truth? So even a small amount is as diagnostically valuable as large amount when you're diagnosing malignant pleural effusion. So don't be under the impression that all the fluid that you tap for malignant pleural effusion requires to be sent for analysis. Pleural effusion secondary to pulmonary embolism may be transudative. The embolisms related to effusions are exudative. I won't go into that exhaustive list, but that's really what something that you need to know. And the same thing is with hepatic hydrothorax, where it's actually a transudate and not an exudate, as some may say. So these are the causes for exudates. Cell blocks can be used as an adjunct to increase the yield of smear preparations. And we always wait for the, uh, you know, bottom uh, clot formation for analysis. Of course, it is important. It increases the accuracy, but does not increase the yield. Okay. Another thing that we also do is repeated thoracentesis and effusions, and that causes eosinophilic effusions. Uh, this is something that we found in some studies, but the evidence does not support this conclusion. A chest drain insertion is unnecessary in patients with non pulmonary paranemonic effusions and normal pleural fluid pH levels. Uh, we all know that the indication for insertion of pleural uh, uh, a drain is pH less than 7.2 and glucose of less than 60. But what's important is there are additional criteria. If you have positive cultures, it's an indication to insert a tube. If there are loculations or large effusions, all this warrant that you insert tubes. Uh, this is the last part where we're talking about ADA and there's a lot of stuff that's happening about ADA. I've heard people tell ADA is completely unreliable and they now rely on biopsy. But what I'm going to show you is this infographic, which is very important. On the x-axis, you have prevalence and on the y-axis, you have the percentage. So the positive predictive value, when the prevalence is low, the, the positive predictive value uh, is on the lower side. What is important is the negative predictive value is very, very high. And you go to the opposite end of the extreme, where the prevalence is extremely high, 
okay the negative predictive value tends to fall down and this is a infographic that you need to remember when inter interpreting ada so it's important to rule out rather than rule it in depending upon the prevalence of tuberculosis in your population okay an extremely high ada in pleural fluid should raise the suspicion of a non tubercular pleural effusion and this is an important pearl because we always assume ada is equivalent to a tb effusion it can happen especially when it's very high in empyema and in lymphoid malignancies testing for pleural fluid ada is easy and inexpensive method and of course it's also useful in hiv patients and on, on another point uh, what I would insist on most of you is we, we completely fail to inoculate the pleural fluid in, uh, uh, you know, bedside. And this is something that's very important. So if you are suspecting uh, you, or you want cultures, always get your blood culture bottles bedside and inoculate them immediately because they are likely to provide you with good result and probably even early result as in this study where, uh, you know, you were able to get pleural fluid diagnosis or cultures at 3.5 weeks when inoculated bedside rather than when in the lab when it was 4.7. Mesothelin measurements are also known to uh, help us in the diagnosis of mesothelioma and that's an important biomarker which is coming up in mesothelial diseases. Uh, the last couple of slides, negative pleural fluid cytological examination does not rule out malignancy. Now, we always think that it's negative, there's no malignancy, it's not necessarily so because it all depends on tumor type. If you're, le if you're dealing with ovarian breast cancer, you're more likely to get pleural fluid malignant cytology positivity than when it is lymphoma. And of course, remember that there's a sarcomatoid variety of mesothelioma where, uh, which has the poorest yield. Okay. Uh, I'll skip a couple of these slides. Uh, again, this is another important myth, a pearl, sorry. A pleural fluid amylase should be requested only if pancreatic disease or esophageal rupture is suspected. Remember that pleural fluid amylase is elevated even in neoplasms and TB. So, send this investigation only and only if you're suspecting a pancreatic uh, or an esophageal rupture. Okay. Uh, ANA, I'm going to skip it. Uh, yeah. The last couple of slides, formation of pleural fluid can sometimes be due to two or more concomitant disease in a given patient. This is something that you must not forget. And when there is a bilateral pleural effusion, each with a different cause, the syndrome is known as a Quattrani syndrome, right? And despite extensive workup of the pleural effusions, about 5 to 20 percent of them will remain elusive, okay? And leaving you with this take-home slide where uh, you know, uh, you have to try and get to a diagnosis with a three-tier approach. And as a take-home, I will say stick to basics always. Myths and plural diseases are basically because of misinterpreted fluid analysis. And an astute clinical approach supplemented with good amount of investigations and thought will help you aid in the diagnosis of plural effusion. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the patient hearing. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, sir. That was a wonderful, crisp and uh, evidence-based presentation. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, just quick question, sir. Yes. Uh, which is most common for the benefit of post graduates. So, after a diagnostic thoracentesis, what is the ideal time that it should, it should reach the lab? Or is there any special storage conditions for that? So, I, I have de dealt with that uh, question's answer saying that okay. the ideal time should be less than 4 hours. So, try and send all your analysis within 4 hours. But just in case that you're not able to send it, please collect your pleural fluid in EDTA or EDTA vials and say, put it in your refrigerator and for up to four weeks, you can do your cytological analysis for two weeks, your ADA analysis without any problems and with reliable results. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next talk is on pulmonary rehabilitation, for which I invite the speaker, Dr. Chandrakan uh, Thakke, sir, who is a senior consultant, international pulmonologist from Apollo number? Hospitals. At the uh, first of all, I thank uh, Dr. Vishwanath and team for uh, inviting me over here. And uh, my talk is uh, a little neglected variety of topic uh, by the pulmonologist. It is the most important to know regarding the pulmonary rehabilitation because uh, most of the options of the medication, other things fails and uh, we need to go ahead with these options. No, this different.
my contents of the topic uh, presentation of the introduction pathophysiology of the exercise limitation uh, pulmonary rehabilitation what the in, what does it includes and take home messages coming to the it is we have the copd asthma ild tb lung cancer a variety of the lung diseases and common pathophysiology will be the ventilation position mismatch and reduce the lung compliance elastic uh, increase elastic recoil diffusion impairment and ultimately leading to the malnutrition cachexia of the chronic respiratory diseases as you know the copd common uh, comorbidity is uh, muscle muscular dysfunction and uh, person the uh, patients will have the skeletal and vent uh, ventilatory muscle weakness and coming to this important slide uh, whenever there is a respiratory impairment there will be a dyspnea on exertion and abstinence from the exercise and further abstinence will lead to the further dyspnea on exertion and physical deconditioning and further deconditioning leading to the dyspnea on the activities of the daily living I mean, from starting from the dyspnea on exertion uh, patient will have the dyspnea on activities of the daily living and uh, they can present with the various symptoms like uh, dyspnea on exertion fatigue exercise intolerance disabilities in the activities of daily living peripheral muscle weakness anxiety depression poor quality of lying increased healthcare utilization now uh, uh, these are the factors which contributes to the exercise intolerance and pulmonary rehab, rehab will focus basically mainly on the peripheral muscle weakness uh, we can't change the gas exchange abnormalities we can't uh, correct the reduced lung compliance we can't correct the cardiac dysfunction but uh, we can treat the lung by treating the muscles now uh, coming to the skeletal muscle dysfunction what exactly happens in the chronic respiratory diseases including copd there is a decreased skeletal muscle mass in decrease uh, aerobic enzyme activities and decrease number of density of mitochondria decrease muscle capillarization and there is a shift of fibers from type 1 to type 2x and poor oxidative capacity which leads to decrease uh, muscle strength and decrease endurance and increase muscle fatigue now if you see this uh, patient with copd they will have the decrease muscle strength and uh, endurance will be less and uh, this uh, second uh, graph you can see here the persons with the copd they will have the easy fatigability as compared to the normal patients now coming to this uh, mid thigh section uh, this is the thigh area of the ct scan of the thigh the muscle mass will be less in the copd patient as compared to the normal patient and capillary density will be less and uh, there will be more type 2 fibers as compared to the normal patients now coming to this uh, why the peripheral muscle dysfunction occurs in the copd one is uh, psychosocial because of chronic inactivity uh, because of systemic inflammation recurrent infection hypoxia multiple hospitalization bedridden status acidosis all these factors lead to the myopathy and in addition to that the drugs corticosteroids bronchodilators and certain antibiotics which can lead to the myopathy and muscle weakness in addition to uh, that smoking also leads to the myopathy which leads to muscle dysfunction and uh, now coming to the definition what is the pulmonary rehabilitation pulmonary rehabilitation is a comprehensive intervention based on a thorough patient assessment we need to do the assessment and uh, we need to the patient tailored therapies which include but not limited to the exercise training education and the behavioral changes which designed to improve the physical and psychosocial condition of the people with the chronic respiratory diseases to promote the long term uh, promote the uh long term adherence to the health and nursing behavior this is the definition of the pulmonary rehab now whom to refer the persons having the dyspnea fatigue patient having impaired health quality of life decreased functional status decreased occupational performance and uh, difficulty in the performing the activities of living these are the different uh, uh, scenario uh, we come across in the respiratory patient we should send this patient to the pulmonary rehab and what goals we should achieve with the pulmonary rehab to elevate the symptom to restore the functional capabilities as much as possible to reduce reduce the handicapness and to improve the overall quality of life and uh, which patient can benefit any chronic respiratory disease like copd asthma osa ild post tb sequelae there are different studies on the different uh, patients like this and almost uh, all the varieties uh, there is a benefit of from the pulmonary rehab and in spite of having the optimal pharmacological management and treatment if the patient are suffering from the dyspnea at rest and they are not able to perform the activities of daily living and decrease exercise intolerance these patients they are benefit from the pulmonary rehab uh, there are different studies on the ilds bronchiectasis pulmonary rehab uh, hypertension that means that almost all the patients with all the diseases of the chronic respiratory disease will help from the pulmonary rehab program what are the contraindications uh, if there is a lack of motivation non adherence inadequate financial resources severe cognitive dysfunction 
mild psychiatric problem uh, definitely we should go ahead but uh, there is severe psychiatric illness unstable uh, comorbidities such as unstable angina untreated cardiac disease we should not treat and uh, obviously patients uh, if the oxygen levels are not correct to the oxygen uh, we should not send for the rehabilitation but persons with the hypoxia but it can be corrected to the oxygen we should send for the rehabilitation uh, what are the benefits of the rehabilitation uh, that this decreases uh, breathlessness and fatigue increases the functional respiratory capacity uh, exercise capacity improve the oxidative capacity of the muscle and has uh, neuromuscular coordination improve the quality of life and it improves anxiety and depression part and decreases healthcare utilization and there is a good level of uh, ben evidence also and level 1a evidence is there in reducing the dyspnea increase the exercise tolerance and improve the quality of life reduce the use of healthcare resources and uh, normally patients goal will be same only patient they don't want the more dyspnea they want to do the more activities they want to more tolerance uh, in their uh, while doing the activities they want the improved quality of life and they don't want to don't want to go to hospitals they want to don't want to get admitted all these benefits can be assured with the pulmonary rehabilitation uh and coming to the mortality uh miss no we know ki this uh, smoking cessation and long term oxygen therapy improves the mortality copd but uh, there are many studies which shows that pulmonary rehabilitation also will improve the mortality in copd as showed in this study published in 2005 this is the latest study which published in 2018 and uh, it is mentioned in the gold guidelines also current guidelines uh there is a decrease in the mortality after early supervised pulmonary rehabilitation program in copd exacerbation after the discharge and uh, they included almost uh, 13 studies in this uh, systemic analysis and showed that uh, there is a moderate quality of evidence uh, in reduction in the mortality and apart from that the health related quality of life will be improved and uh, the increase exercise tolerance now coming to the main part of this thing uh, what is the program it is a multidisciplinary rehabilitation program which consists of the team one is a pulmonologist that is a respirologist physical therapist occupational therapist and support team respiratory therapist nurse rehab assistant psychologist and dietitian basically it's a team work so that uh, we can uh, manage the patient well with the rehabilitation now, what are the components of pulmonary rehabilitation most important part is a uh, pre rehabilitation assessment we should do the baseline assessment so that we can monitor post rehabilitation uh, what we can are going to achieve and uh, rehabilitation program includes a breathing training exercise training oxygen supplementation patient education and we need to when to discharge and when to take the follow up and management of comorbidities now first coming to the first part how do we do assessment now assessment done by the medical history comorbidities we should do the assessment of the breathlessness uh, nutrition status disability oxygen status by the oximetry functional exercise capacity and what tool we have uh, coming to this breathlessness we can assess by the mmrc score everybody knows it and another one is a borg dyspnea scale borg dyspnea scale can be used for the breathlessness and leg fatigue we have to uh, categorize from uh, 0 to 10 if no dyspnea at all or no leg fatigue at all it's a 0 and if it is maximum fatigue or dyspnea it's greater than we uh, we can tell the patient in this uh, format uh, how much dyspnea they are feeling and uh, nutritional level can be hemoglobin we can measure the blood levels albumin also can measure body mass index bone mineral density body composition by the by impedance uh, this commonly people use in the gym also uh, how much is the body fat how much is the body muscle uh, and how much is the body water this chart you can show this uh, figure shows a, a caliper which can measure the skin thickness and uh, uh, we can uh, with this is a by impedance mesh machine we can measure the fat and the muscle mass and uh, measurement of the activities of daily living uh, there are different uh, questionnaires and this thing Uh, coming to the oxy oximetry uh, these two things we should know as a pg what is oximetry and what is 6 minute walk test there is a difference in that in the oximetry uh, miss procedure uh, there is a 5 minute rest without activity will be there and we need to ask the patient to walk and we need to record the distance time to desaturation and uh, on oximetry can be done in the sleep also uh, this is a normal thing uh, miss oximetry can be done uh, the doctor can walk with the patient but uh, nowadays this portable machines have come the we can attach to the patient and uh, patient can walk and we can see the oximetry levels there are uh, different other uh, uh, tests also uh, apart from this uh, thing 6 minute walk test incremental shuttle test inverse walk test stair climbing up, upper extremity test and cpat 6 uh, minute walk test uh, is easy to administer safe 
and uh, we can monitor the pre and post rehabilitation and even for the normal mon uh, monitoring of the COPD and ILD patient this test is useful. Uh, now coming to the main difference, what is the difference between oximetry and 6 meter walk test? The parameters that we study in the oximetry are the SpO2 pulse uh, and the shortness of breath and leg fatigue. The similar parameters are there in the 6 meter walk test also. Uh, but in this uh, vision, we will measure the in the oximetry, we will measure the time for to desaturation and distance to desaturation. And we need to mention in that. And in the oximetry, person will walk at the normal pace. And uh, in the oximetry, we should ask the patient to walk as uh, faster as possible, but patient should not run. And uh, in this, we should measure the distance, how much the patient has walked and uh, whether the desaturation or not. There are some additional tests. I will not go into this detail. CPT is also a gold standard. Uh, CPT talk already tomorrow, Dr. Uh, uh, Matthew Dissar is going to take. I will not go into much details into that. Basically, CPT will measure the peak heart rate, oxygen pulse saturation, ventilatory threshold, uh, anaerobic threshold, PAO2, and uh, aerobic capacity. And there are different questionnaires. Uh, chronic respiratory disease questionnaire, St. George respiratory question is short form 13. We can assess the patient initially and before and after rehab. And uh, most important parameter of the permanent rehabilitation, we should attend the patient's cry. That means what is the patient's uh, basically requirement? Means the patient is at home, is want to play with his grandchildren. And uh, that means we should make the patient able to do that activities. Means uh, if the patient is there, he want to go to job. So means we should attend the patient's cry and we should uh, enroll accordingly and uh, we should make him fit to do that job. Uh, coming to the second part of this is a breathing training. What breathing training is, we should reinforce the proper breathing patterns uh, to help the, this will help to remove the secretions. Now, passive breathing is most important in COPD. COPD patient will have the alveolar collapse while expiration. If they do the personal breathing, if they exhale slowly, the alveolar collapse will not happen and they will have the less uh, dyspnea uh, on exertion. Postural techniques are important in the COPD patient. If they lean forward, uh, they, it will elevate the diaphragm because in COPD patient, there will be flat diaphragm and lower diaphragm. If, the, if they lean forward, the diaphragm will come for, uh, slightly upward and the dyspnea will be less. Diaphragmatic breathing. In diaphragmatic breathing, uh, we have to place one hand on the chest, one hand on the abdomen and we need to um, breathe miss, uh, while inhaling. The abdomen should come outwards and the diaphragm should go down and uh, miss, the chest movement should be less and uh, if, the, if the patient follows this breathing pattern, the, they can have the less dyspnea. Postural drainage, especially in the patient with bronchitis, if they are having a sputum production of more than 30 cc in the last 24 hours, that means they are having a copious sputum production, they will benefit from the postural draining. And yoga is also um, uh, time test tested in the Indian medicine. It has also great benefits. Uh, the study was done by in the AIMS. Uh, they studied the pulmonary rehabilitation with the AIMS. Group 1 yoga exercises they have given, the different asanas and pranayamas. pranayamas. And in group 2 uh, patients, they underwent the rehab. This was done by the Dr. Randeep Gulera sir. And uh, they showed that yoga and uh, rehabilitation exercises, um, they have the equal effect, similar improvement in the 6 minute walk test and the Borg cell and C to this near. That means uh, we can do, if the patient is not accessible uh, for this uh, rehabilitation centers, they can do the yogas also. Bronchial hygiene is important in the patient with COPD. You can see the patient is having some bronchitis on the right side. We can ask the patient to lie down the left lateral decubitus. If the patient is having the upper lobes, misposure, then there are different pressures which are recommended for different lobe diseases. So that uh, if there is a proper drainage, so they will not get the recurrent infection and they will have the less dyspnea. Now coming to the another component of the important component is the exercise training. Now we need to treat the muscles to the treat the lungs. That is the basic mantra of the rehabilitation. Uh, this already have explained. Uh, coming to this slide, when the patient uh, do the exercises and rehabilitation, the minute ventilation will come down. That means breathing uh, difficulty will come down. Lactate levels will be less. Lactate threshold will increase. That means patient will have will have less fatigue and can breathe more, miss less breathless. And uh, coming to the prescription, how should we prescribe the primary rehab, uh, rehabilitation exercises? Most important, uh, these uh, factors are most important. One is the mode. Which mode we should give? Walking, either cycling or arm exercises or leg exercises. Intensity, speed and grade, duration in the minutes, frequency, uh, weekly, how many times we should call the patient, type, interval or it's continuous, uh, we should um, do the exercises and training with, with or without oxygen supplementation. 
and uh, these are the different trainings one is the endurance training basically these are the cardio exercises walking cycling stair climbing interval training is a cycling and uh, ground walking uh, resistance training is for just like weight lifting and uh, uh, light loads and coming to the endurance training endurance training basically cardio exercises that improves the condition of the muscles for the ambulation and improves the cardio respiratory fitness in this you will have the hand ergometer and the leg ergometer and uh, this was a study they studied the ground walk training also patient who are not having the access to the rehabilitation center even normal ground walking training also uh, there was an improvement in the uh, this thing uh, uh, respiratory parameters and functional exercise capacity uh, as compared to the rehabilitation there was no statistical difference also alternative few slides i will skip uh, now coming to the upper limb training upper limb training you can see this photo this patient uh, is doing the hand ergometer this also another uh, similarly patient is doing hand ergometer simultaneously patient is having this leg ergometer also this is called as a cycle ergometry coming to the lower extremity this is a similar one uh, like lower extremity ergometry we can have the bicycle and uh, stair climbing also we can put the artificial stairs in the room patient can walk uh, up and down so that you can have the leg exercises now coming to the resistant and strength training resistant training means local group of muscles are trained by the repetitive lifting of the relatively he heavy loads and skeletal muscle dysfunction influences the clinical outcomes of COPD and is like that uh, this resistant training plays an important role in the prevention and the treatment of this comorbid condition and which results in less dyspnea during the exercise period and uh, strength training can be given by the light dumbbells and uh, some uh, devices for these exercises and uh, we can have the hand and ankle weights, free weights, machine weights, elastic resistance, some elastic bands also we can use and uh, stair climbing also one of the example of the strength training uh, now coming to the flexibility training flexibility training means the, to improve the posture in COPD there will be kyphos uh, sorry uh, elevated shoulders and uh, in kyphosis patient there will be uh, chest wall deformity there is increase anterior posterior diameter in the COPD patient such patient if you give this proper posture training they will have the improvement in the lung functions uh, now this is a now some patient uh, there is a myth will be that ki patient or oxygen we should not send for the exercises but it's a myth actual truth is that we can give the supplemental oxygen during the test also you can see here this person is doing the ergometer while using oxygen nasal prongs are there this lady is also using the oxygen you can see over here and if you see here these are the artificial steps we can keep the create the artificial steps in the room and we can keep the oxygen nearby and we can supplement the oxygen and patient can go up and down over the stairs and they can have the good exercise uh, in the lower limbs and similarly with this treadmill also this uh, patient can we can give the supplemental oxygen uh, coming to the protocol means if the person come to rehabilitation center what uh, the uh, exercises we should give this is a standard protocol lower limb training for the 10 minutes there should be a rest for 5 minutes the upper limb training for the 5 minutes then rest for 5 minutes then upper limb uh, cycle ergometry and uh, then again the upper and lower limb passive exercises and every uh, there will be 5 minutes gap should be there and uh, uh, lastly breathing exercises and what is the benefits of oxygen supplementation there will be dis uh, decreased dyspnea decreased leg fatigue and decreased dynamic hyperinflation and uh, it improves the 6 minute walk test parameters now coming to the patient education uh, apart from the education uh, apart from the exercises education is the most important part Patient should know the, what is the basic physiology of the disease, either the ILD or COPD, we should explain them what happens in the disease and how should we the, handle the disease whenever there is an exacerbation. And we should review the medication, we should review the inherent technique because in the busy OPD uh, one cannot check sometimes but, uh, but as a pulmonary rehabilitation center we should check, check for it. Smoking suggestion we should uh, promote and uh, self-management strategy. Self-management strategy means a uh, patient should have some plan miss uh, if this thing happens what should i do which inner i should use what is the emergency plan they should uh, know everything and uh, this uh, study we showed that if there is a self management plan there is a decrease in the admission decrease in the ad uh, exacerbation and decrease the emergency visit and mobility is a key factor in the rehabilitation however the, even if the patient has the oxygen we should uh, supplement with the portable oxygen constructor and we can give the rollators like that and patient can walk and coming to the last few slides 
on the discharge and follow up uh, we and uh, coming to how uh, how much is the duration uh, there are different studies we showed uh, there will be a static response if you do the uh, this rehab for 12 weeks further benefits are not there that's so optimal uh, duration given is that minimum for 8 weeks we should do the rehab but if you do the longer period it is beneficial longer duration of pr have the more favorable benefits but minimum 8 weeks uh, pr we should do and uh, there are different um, uh, protocols are measured for we can do the primary rehabilitation as outpatient or inpatient for outpatient we call call the patient 2 to 3 days in a week for 6 to 8 weeks if for inpatient we can do for 5 days in a week like monday to friday like that for 12 to 7 uh, 17 weeks and um, in the discharge follow up we can do at a regular interval and we can check the different parameters and this parameter we should uh, check in the uh, in the follow up we can see the dyspnea scale we can see the how much exacerbation the patient can have how much uh, the quality of life improvement by the different respective questionnaires we can repeat the 6 minute walk test cpt we can check the body mass index and skin fold thickness and uh, uh, another parameter is if the patient re, uh, stop the rehabilitation what happens to that patient even if the patient stop the rehabilitation there may be some drop in the 6 uh, minute walk test distal but if they do the repeat uh, pr their parameters will improve that's why uh, this is the thing if the person is blue line is the person is not doing the preliminary rehabilitation this parameters will be like this uh, activities of daily living but if they do the rehab they will improve if they dis discard the rehabilitation but if they start it again again there will be improvement that's why permanent rehabilitation we should do it again and again and uh, this uh, the improve miss example about patient before and after rehab we can see the mid cross sectional thigh area the improvement in the muscle mass this with rehabilitation without rehabilitation there was no improvement the same thing is explained over mid thigh cross sectional area is improved with the rehabilitation even 6 minute walk distance also will improve now in the covid time this was uh, important parameter that's a tele rehabilitation many patient they are not able to go to the uh, this thing uh, rehabilitation center nowadays many persons they are arranging the ergometers uh, static cycle bicycle and uh, small weight dumbbells at the home also even the uh, stairs also we can arrange at home and they can do the tele rehabilitation there are studies also systemic analysis was there tele rehabilitation is safe and it has similar benefits uh, those of the center based uh, rehabilitation take home message uh, rehabilitation uh, especially the copd patient uh, we should offer getting uh, optimal benefit even up to the optical medical management and we should address the um, uh, unstable cardiac status and other psychiatric disturbances and exercise testing both endurance and strength exercise should do and uh, we should uh, monitor the 6 minute walk test and uh, rehabilit uh, this uh, cpat pre and post uh, preliminary rehabilitation and uh, last and uh, last and most important is that we should ask the patient to stop the smoking we should address the nutrition part and education how to monitor uh, monitor identify the exacerbation treat the exacerbation and psychosocial support that's why uh, uh, miss i will not call preliminary rehabilitation just as exercise and education it's actually it's a treatment because it's improving the survival also especially in the copd patient and it's a treatment to reduce the dyspnea to improve the exercise intolerance and uh, with that patient can walk patient can bath patient can dress undress patient can reduce the uh, hospital visits it can socialize and can have the better quality actually what is this this is the patient wants and we can achieve this goals with the primary rehabilitation thank you thank you very much for your valuable input sir as you rightly said it has always been a, a very neglected aspect of pulmonology but i'm glad now it is gaining some focus and obviously it's showing some improvements especially when i see patients in the pre transplant clinic involved in pulmonary rehabilitation the window from uh, registering to transplant is obviously increasing so it is definitely very promising and shows very promising results any questions from audience in the interest of time one question we can accept if there are no questions we'll move on to the next topic of the Thank session now uh, our next speaker will be uh, dr rakesh koda kodati uh, he is a consultant pulmonologist from uh, star hospital hyderabad sir please good evening everyone uh, i'm not going to take much time 
I will finish it off first. Uh, regarding the my today's topic is DLCO, that is transfer factor. And the outline of today's uh, topic is uh, terminology, physiology and principles, methods and manual, and indications and interpretation. So, for what is uh, DLCO? It is a non-invasive pulmonary function test, which is most commonly performed. Uh, after spirometry in our lab uh, it is the ability of the lungs to transfer the gas from inhaled air to the red blood cells in the pulmonary capillaries it gives us an integrated picture of gas exchange efficiency of the lungs it was first described in 1909 by mary Krog. so there are there is other name for it is uh, diffusing capacity diffusing capacity is the earlier name uh, but uh, it is a misnomer actually because of because it is not a capacity measurement because we measure the DLCO at rest and uh, not it is not the maximal amount of diffusion that takes place during the maneuver so it is not a capacity measurement and uh, there are also several processes involved uh, apart from diffusion in the transfer of gas from alveoli to pulmonary capillaries like hemoglobin content and amount of pulmonary capillary blood volume so transfer usage of transfer factor is a uh, appropriate term uh, DLC is calculated by multiplication of uh, two factors we measure that is KCO and VA. KCO is the coefficient that is the ability of the alveolar capillary membrane to transfer the gas from alveolar to capillary blood that is uh, it is a transfer coefficient and the other one is a VA that is accessible alveolar volume that is when we test with a carbon monoxide uh, the amount of alveoli which are accessible to the our uh, whatever the gas we are giving the carbon monoxide that is VA. So, the measured DLCO value is uh, dependent on these two factors that is transfer coefficient and the accessible alveolar volume. In the pre whenever you see previous reports of diffusion, uh, the, K the word KCO is replaced by uh, used as DLCO by VA. So, it is actually a, a false, it gives us a false interpretation that uh, it is uh, DLCO is corrected to the alveolar volume. but we have to know that KCO is an independent factor which determines the DLCO and DLCO uh, measurement is dependent upon the KCO not uh, that is KCO is not calculated by dividing DLCO by VA it is an independent factor it is usually calculated by the amount of decay constant uh, that is small KCO by uh, difference in barometric pressure uh, effective we coming to VA this is effective alveolar volume this is the second uh, component of uh, diffusion which we measure it is usually measured by the use of a tracer gas along with the carbon monoxide. Uh, it is a fraction of total lung capacity which is accessed by the whatever the inhaled gas mixture test that is carbon monoxide what we are giving. It depends on the connection between the larger and the peripheral airways. As we all know when there is a small airway disease there is really a lot of ventilatory inhomogeneity because of air trapping. Then uh, in such cases when we do the test uh, the VA may be low despite a good TLC that is uh, VA by TLC will be less than 0.8 it indicates the presence of an airway disease and ventilatory inhomogeneity uh, the units of uh, inter uh, DLCO is uh, usually millimoles per minute per kilopascals this is a standard international units but ATS traditional units is ml per minute per mm of mercury there is also a conversion factor which is used to convert the measured value from SI units to traditional units so what uh, we want to know here is DLC or what the value we see in the report is the amount of uh, carbon monoxide which is transferred from the lungs uh, across the alveolar capillary membrane into the pulmonary capillaries. Coming, coming to physiology and principles of uh, DLCO testing. Uh, what we this is a simple uh, diagram which shows the basic physiology and principles involved in this test. We give a fixed concentration of carbon monoxide and ask the patient to inhale and ask to hold his breath uh, to allow for the exchange of carbon monoxide at the alveolar capillary level and uh, ask it, he, uh, we will ask him to exhale and we collect the exhaled sample after dead space washout and we measure the carbon monoxide in the alveolar exhaled sample and by the difference in carbon monoxide fraction what we give and what we get after breath holding will determine the amount of carbon monoxide which gets diffused into the uh, blood. So why, why are we using carbon monoxide not any other gas mixture because it has a high affinity for hemoglobin around 200 to 250 times more uh, affinity than oxygen. So the reverse reaction being extremely slow and there will be no increase in plasma tension, plasma concentration. So there is no back pressure or tension. So whatever the carbon monoxide we give it uh, directly diffuses and binds to hemoglobin more faster than oxygen. So it will give a good exact uh, measure of uh, transfer factor that is a uh, diffusion capacity of the lung.
So we also require another gas apart from the test gas that is carbon monoxide that is known as tracer gas. Uh, the common use of tracer gases are helium, uh, methane and neon. Uh, whatever we use is generally you, helium is used in many of the diffusion instruments. Uh, why tracer gas is required is that it does not diffuse basically. Whatever the gas we give inhale it gets inhaled and it will be diluted by the alveolar sample. So this tracer gas is used to measure the alveolar volume and the concentration of the test gas that is carbon monoxide at the alveolar level. So we give the inhaled, uh, we test the in fraction of inhaled helium and exhaled helium and by using these fractions we calculate the changes of carbon monoxide at the alveolar level. So what are the factors uh, involved in the transfer of, uh, transfer of gas in the lungs? Uh, this is the diagram which shows the uh, transfer of gas from the alveoli to the blood. Uh, the, the first factor is the contributing amount of alveolar units that is the alveolar volume which decides the transfer. Second is the, the capillary membrane that is alveolar capillary membrane and third is the amount of uh, capillary blood uh, volume in the pulmonary capillaries and the amount of hemoglobin. So we have to remember the uh, these three factors determine the carbon monoxide uh, transfer across the lung. So we can divide it into two parts, the physiology, the basic, uh, physiology of transfer of carbon monoxide into membrane component and blood component. So even there is a, even there is an alteration in the even the pulmonary capillary volume or amount of hemoglobin in the pulmonary capillaries also uh, will alter the carbon monoxide transfer. Not only the alveolar capillary membrane or the lung disease which alters the DLC. So we have to know the, this basic diagram to know the physiology of transfer. Uh, this is a um, formula which shows the uh, when resistances are added on and like resistances we add in physics in parallel this thing this is a TLCO the other factors which determine that we, as we said earlier it is a membrane conductance and the effect to this capillary uh, blood component so DM represents the membrane conductance that is uh, it depends on the thickness of the alveolar capillary membrane and the surface area of alveolar capillary membrane the theta is the reaction of uh, or transfer gas with the hemoglobin, capillary blood volume and the amount of hemoglobin. So first we have to know the factors which affect the DLCO. So first we see the uh, KCO that is the coefficient, transfer coefficient of carbon monoxide. It, it is uh, decreased in both parenchymal and pulmonary vascular diseases. Uh, these are the common diseases which damage the pulmonary parenchyma like ILD, pneumoconiosis and emphysema where there is alteration in the alveolar capillary membrane like decreased surface area of uh, for gas exchange and the other thing is uh, reduced uh, capillary blood volume that is a pulmonary vascular disease like pulmonary hypertension pulmonary embolism and some intrapulmonary shunts so in both these diseases not only parenchymal disease but also pulmonary vascular disease will affect the dlco that is kco and factors affecting the transfer coefficient that is kco it is incomplete lung expansion, discrete loss of lung units and extra uh, hemoglobin. These, uh, these factors usually elevate the amount uh, uh, transfer of uh, carbon monoxide into the blood. That is, is a lung size decreases in pleural neuromuscular weakness and chest wall disease where there is incomplete lung expansion. The amount of the lungs, the membrane capacity to transfer the carbon monoxide usually will increase due to increased area and volume ratio. And even pneumonectomy and local destruction also. Uh, there is diversion of blood flow to the normal lung so there will be increase in transfer coefficient and in cases of alveolar hemorrhage where there is extra hemoglobin asthma obesity and left to right shunts also where there is increased capillary blood volume there is increase of kco so we have to know the relationship between kco and uh, dlco uh, as i said earlier it is not a correction factor and they are independent and they do not have any linear non-linear relationship uh, so this is a normal lung at FRC, usually that uh, membrane will be uh, thin and the capillary, there is increased thickness of uh, capillary membrane, so the membrane conductance will decrease, but there is also simultaneous increase in capillary blood volume, so volume of the capillaries will increase, so ultimately KCO will increase, that is a lung to transfer carbon monoxide, the capacity will increase at FRC, while the total lung alveolar volume will be reduced, so DLCO finally decreases primarily dependent on the alveolar volume. When we inhale to the TLC, uh, the, the membrane will become thinner, so membrane conductance increases, but the alveolar capillary volume decreases. So KCO, the transfer capacity decreases, but ultimately DLCO is determined by the primarily by the alveolar volume apart from KCO. 
so we have to when we analyze the diffusion report we have to see the, uh, these three factors to for better understanding of a lung physiology there are uh, many methods of testing the standard method followed is breath holding method or single breath method which, which is gold standard and, uh, and there are standard reference equations available even for indian population for breath holding techniques and there are other methods are intra breath method or multiple breath methods there are certain prerequisites to follow before the going for a test there is comfortable lamp temperature seated posture no smoking on the day of test because carboxyhemoglobin will affect the dlco level and no oxygen supplementation for at least 15 minutes mm, you can use bronchodilators also so we give a inspired gas mixture of 0.3% carbon monoxide oxygen and tracer gas and rest nitrogen first we ask the, we ask the patient to to to, to do a normal tri tidal breathing then we ask him to exhale to the rv and from the rv we open the we give the in gas mixture what we are giving that is consisting of carbon monoxide and a tracer gas and ask them to inhale the tlc that is total lung capacity so this total vital capacity that is and we ask the patient to hold the breath for 10 seconds 10 plus 2 seconds and after breath holding uh, we are uh, the, we collect the exhaled volume this is the previous uh, systems of diffusion where they discard uh, first 0.75 to 1 liter of oxygen uh, attributing to the dead space and analyze the later sample but now we have rapid gas analyzers which show the concentration of tracer gas and carbon monoxide continuously so that it is automatically the after change in the concentrations uh, the volume of uh, carbon monoxide exchange is calculated there are certain quality of test parameters also whatever the volume we are give inspired volume should be greater than 85% of the largest vital capacity and the inspiratory time should be short within 2 to 4 seconds and one should avoid mullers and valsalva manner during the breath holding because it alters the capillary blood volume during the breath hold and the exhalation must be smooth unforced without any hesitation or interruption and usually only we allow only not more than 5 tests per person in during a single session because it will alter the carbon monoxide level and reduce the results of uh, reduce the value of dlco and at least two acceptable tests within a range of 2 ml per minute should be uh, taken and the average of two values should be uh, reported and between the two trials there will be four minute gaps for the carbon monoxide to exhale this is a uh, formula which which calculates tlco this is based on the change in the alveolar concentration of carbon monoxide along with the uh, calculated alveolar volume uh, uh, we have corrections for that also uh, because anemia it is adjustment for hemoglobin is not mandatory but desirable there are prediction equations which correct for the um, uh, change in hemoglobin and even if, the, if there is car more carboxy hemoglobin in the blood it will cause decrease in dc dlco due to back pressure and decreased binding sites of hemoglobin uh, so there is also a uh, prediction formula which cut to correct the dlco for the carboxy hemoglobin even at high altitude also there will be um, increased dlco due to because in the normal mixture the partial pressure of oxygen will come down at high altitude so there is less competition for uh, carbon monoxide to bind to hemoglobin so increase this will increase the dlco so there are even reference equations uh, for the high altitude settings also which should be used when interpreting uh, dlco at high altitude levels uh, there is also if you give bronchodilators there will be no change in dlco so bronchodilators can be safely continued uh, during the testing and in many um, pft labs between pre and post spirometry dlco is measured coming to indications these are the uh, indications of measurement of dlco that is evaluation of undiagnosed dyspnea based on the interpretation of spirometry and uh, diffusion measurement we can get a clue to the whatever the cause of dyspnea can be it will suggest us to one of the uh, distinct causes of dyspnea it is primarily we use it in a restrictive lung disease to differentiate between parenchymal versus extra parenchymal restriction and uh, disease progression or response in ilds and early detection of lung toxicity in uh, um, in cases when we use chemotherapy drugs like bleomycin or amiodarone which are prone to develop lung toxicity in obstructive lung disease uh, there is not much use of diffusion but it can differentiate between asthma and copd when there is extensive emphysema dlco is decreased while in asthma dlco will be normal or even increase when there is hyperinflation so it is also helpful in disability evaluation and post operative risk assessment in lung resection surgeries 
Yeah, so this is a uh, how DLCO will differentiate between parenchymal and extra parenchymal restriction. In extra parenchymal restriction, that is chest wall, neuromuscular, or a pleural disease, uh, the lung will not expand after the uh, inspiration. That is when the lung when the test is done at TLC. So the alveolar volume will be low, but the KCO will be increased. That is the alveolar capacity to transfer carbon monoxide is increased because the lung is normal and the lung has not expanded. So ultimately, our DLC will be normal or slightly decreased. While in case of parenchymal restrictions like ILD, the alveolar volume will be reduced anyway, and KCO that is due to membrane damage, KCO is decreased, and the DLC is more decreased. So when the DLC is normal or slightly decreased, it is extra parenchymal restriction. When it is more decreased, it is parenchymal restriction. And we can uh, differentiate between two based on the KCO values. Because KCA is normal or supranormal in case of extra parenchymal restrictions. Because as I said earlier, at low lung volumes, the KCO is more in a normal lung. So this based on severity of impairment, this is based on the PFT uh, standard uh, ERS ATS standards, uh, the degree of impairment of DLCO more than 60% and less than lower limit of normal, it is mild. 40 to 60 it is moderate and less than 40 it is severe disease. There is even uh, some cases where the DLCO value will be high. There is, these are the conditions where the DLCO is high like obesity, asthma, you know, where the yeah, lung volumes will be high due to hyperinflation and large and obese patients. Polycythemia and pulmonary hemorrhage where uh, the amount of hemoglobin in the alveolar pulmonary capillaries will be more and intracardiac shunts, exercise, Muller's manner and supine position. So these are the DLC values in different uh, disease states. These I have said earlier. KCO value will differentiate between uh, parenchymal and extra parenchymal restrictions. Uh, in case of pulmonary vascular disease, uh, the alveolar volumes will be normal, but KCO is decreased and DLC is decreased. When there is alveolar hemorrhage, the volume alveolar volume will be low, but the KCO is high due to extra amount of hemoglobin in the alveoli. So DLC will be high in case of uh, DH. So this is a simpler algorithm. When you find a low DLCO, you check for the effective alveolar volume. When the alveolar volume is normal, it is more likely a pulmonary vascular disease and or an early emphysema or ILD. When the alveolar volume is low, check VA by TLC ratio if the lung volumes are available in that report. If the VA by TLC ratio is preserved, uh, check for KCO. That is low KCO, it is parenchymal restriction. High KCO, it is extra parenchymal restriction. When the VA by TLC ratio is less than 0.8, as I said earlier, it is it integrates, it uh, it tells us that it uh, has emphysema with ventilatory maldistribution. So this is simpler algorithm where we can uh, analyze the algorithm approach of low DLCO. So this is a uh, table taken from a paper where uh, the DLC is normal in all these uh, DLC is low in all these diseases, but uh, interpreting only DLCO will not give us any clue to the cause of uh, low diffusion uh, because in different diseases the contribution of KCO and VA are different. For example, in case of uh, this inspiratory muscle weakness, that is extra parenchymal restriction, KCO is high and VA is low. So interpreting only DLCO report will not give us a clue to the physiology or pathology which is happening. We have to see both KCO values and VA values and interpret them separately to exactly to know the what are the pathology happening in the lung. Let's take few case scenarios. This, there is a 47 year old woman, dyspnea and exertion with chest heaviness. These are the spirometry and DLCO values. Here you can see the spirometry values are very good. But there is isolated decrease in DLCO and KCO values. So according to our algorithm, the alveolar volume and total lung capacity are preserved. So it is more likely a pulmonary vascular disease or early emphysema or ILD. But we have to interpret them clinically. So it is more likely a pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary hypertension because there is isolated reduction in DLCO. This is the second case where we have a 15 male with grade 2 dyspnea with normal chest X-ray and moderate restriction in spirometry. Here we see first the DLC is low, then we go for the alveolar volume. The alveolar volume is also low, so but the KCO is very high, the supranormal KCO. That indicates that lung is normal, but uh, it is due to poor expansion, the KCO is very high. So it's more likely extra parenchymal restriction due to neuromuscular disease. This is this third case scenario where 84-year-old man with progressive dyspnea and bilateral infiltrates. 
and spirometry suggesting restrict to defect. Here, as we go by algorithm, DLC is low, VA is low, and KCA is also low. So it's more likely a parenchymal restriction. Uh, coming to take home message, it, uh, standardization of manure is must, and uh, KCA is not a correction for volume. Interpret not only DLC in your report, but also VA and KCO values independently. Uh, when you use isolated DLCO, it is poorly specific and it, it is decreased in multiple pathologies. So always interpret it with spirometric results and it has a key prognostic factor in monitoring and diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. That is a nice detailed uh, presentation on uh, diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. And it is very useful investigation in our OPDs uh, for the diagnosis of pulmonary vascular diseases and to differentiate parenchymal, extra parenchymal restrictions and other interstitial lung diseases. And uh, questions from the audience? The only thing I want to say is interpret uh, DLCO separately. That is DLCO, not only look at DLCO, but also see the values of alveolar volume and the carbon dioxide transfer coefficient KCO. Interpreting them, interpreting the three values separately will give a clue to the whatever the pathology happening in our lung. And as highlighted by Rakesh sir, it should be interpreted as a part of other PFT along with your clinical scenario and your basic spirometry and after that your DLCO. It should not be interpreted alone like only DLCO interpretation. Okay, one quick question sir, are there any absolute contraindications for uh, DLCO? There are no absolute contraindications for DLCO as so. The standard contraindications for spirometry will uh, extrapolate to this. It is actually a safer test and uh, it does not require any forced exhalation maneuver like our spirometry. It is a simple uh, single breath hold test which can be easily done uh, when, com when, when you compare with spirometry. It is easy. The technique is very easy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I request uh, the chairperson to uh, hand over the momento to Dr. Chandrakant Darke, sir. Dr. Rakesh, sir. Now, I request Dr. Rajiv Minan, sir. The director of uh, cardiology department of um, the, the AG to hand over the momento to the chairperson. Next. Now let us move on to the next session. I uh, would like to invite the uh, chairpersons for the next session, Dr. Rajiv Minan sir and Dr. Preeti ma'am to come out with the dais. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, it's indeed uh, my pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Murli Mohan, uh, who has uh, been kind enough to join us from Bangalore. Uh, he's presently a senior consultant uh, pulmonologist at uh, NH uh, in Bangalore. 
and uh, with a very distinguished uh, career uh, with chapters in uh, more than six books, multiple papers, and uh, he has been the chairman elect of API Karnataka chapter and uh, founding editor of uh, the journal of API Karnataka. I think uh, with that uh, introduction, we'll hand over to Dr. Murli Mohan to enlighten us about management of pulmonary artery hypertension. Over to you, sir. Thank you to the chairpersons, and it's really wonderful to uh, be here. Thanks, Dr. Geller, for inviting me, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I have been invited to talk on pulmonary hypertension, and I thought there have been quite a lot of updates recently, so I can go ahead and speak on this topic. I bring you greetings from Narayan Tradialia, Bangalore. We've learned a lot in the last thousand years about the pulmonary circulation, first learning about the pulmonary circulation as early as 1250 AD. But unfortunately, not many changes occurred until about 20 or 30 years ago when we had the first symposium on pulmonary hypertension. And since then, at frequent intervals, we've had increasingly uh, useful world symposia on pulmonary hypertension. The most recent was in 2018. We also had last year, the European Society of Cardiology and the ERS, European Respiratory Society guidelines. So a lot of what I'm going to talk on is based on the Six World Symposium, the 2022 ESC ERS guidelines. And my colleague, Dr. Syed and I have written the chapter on the lung in heart disease or heart in lung diseases uh, in Tandon's textbook of cardiology. And I think all these three are useful reading for postgraduates. The definition of pulmonary hypertension has changed over time, and this is the most recent definition. It's defined as a mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. And what the mean pulmonary artery pressure, how it is measured, I'll come to later. So remember this first figure, a mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 20. We recognize three subgroups within this, a pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, an isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, and a combined pre- and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. What separates these? All of them have a mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 20. The pulmonary capillary or the pulmonary artery wedge pressure is less than 15 or equal to 15 in pre-capillary. It's more than 15 in post-capillary, and it can be associated with more than four, 15 millimeters of mercury in combined but a pulmonary vascular resistance, which is also high. So we look at two things. We look at what is the pulmonary vascular resistance. If it is more than two good units, it tells us that there is a problem within the pulmonary artery, arterioles, arteries, or capillaries. If the pulmonary vascular resistance is less than two good units, that means the problem is not within the pulmonary arteries, arterioles, or capillaries, but beyond that, in the pulmonary veins or in the left heart. So that would be isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. But sometimes you can get both. You can get a high pulmonary artery wedge pressure, meaning there is a problem in the left heart. And you can get a pulmonary vascular resistance, which is high, meaning that there is also a problem in the pulmonary arterioles. And then it becomes a combined pre- and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. And why have we changed this definition from the earlier 25 millimeters of mercury mean pulmonary artery pressure to 20 is because the several studies like this one have shown that when you have a mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 20, this is the RVSP, the right ventricular systolic pressure. Once it crosses about 21 or 22, mortality at both the one year and the five year mortality start rising sharply. So we know that beyond 20 millimeters of mercury mean pulmonary artery pressure, there is definite move away from normal and so we should define this as pulmonary hypertension and again as i'll tell you later if you have a high uh, pulmonary pressure it worsens mortality so it's very important to pick this up early and treat it early because early treatment makes a difference to outcomes we define five groups of pulmonary hypertension group one to group five there are details in this slide but i'll summarize it in the next slide saying Group one is pulmonary arterial hypertension, where the pulmonary arteries themselves are the source of the problem. 
Group two is when the pulmonary arteries get affected because of left heart disease, the classic example of post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. So a rise in the left heart pressure reflects back onto the pulmonary circulation. Group three is pulmonary hypertension associated with hypoxia or lung disease, which pulmonologists are interested in. And whenever there is hypoxia, there is vasoconstriction, and this starts the cycle of leading to pulmonary hypertension. Group four, again of interest to us, is pulmonary hypertension due to pulmonary artery obstruction. Here, there are obstructions to the pulmonary artery, either in the form of clots, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, or it could be, for example, tumor emboli, or indeed anything else that obstructs the pulmonary artery physically can cause this. Group five is when there are miscellaneous causes, or there are multiple mechanisms all operating together to produce pulmonary hypertension. Why is it important to look for pulmonary hypertension? It's because when there is pulmonary hypertension, survival is much poorer, that's the orange line, as compared to when there is no pulmonary hypertension, and this is across a group of diseases where survival is very much better. So pulmonary hypertension worsens outcomes. Take, for example, COPD. When you have COPD, even with the mean pulmonary artery pressure of just 25 to 30, 39, which used to be called mild pulmonary hypertension, you can see that outcomes are pretty bad. In fact, their median survival is only about three and a half years. On the other hand, when it goes into a moderately severe pulmonary hypertension, mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 40, it falls even more and becomes only about two years, in fact, less than two years when you have pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension worsens survival. And this is true when you have RV dysfunction or you don't have RV dysfunction. The presence of RV dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension and the presence of both, in fact, makes the survival worst of all. Whereas if you have no pulmonary hypertension and no RV dysfunction, you have the best survival of all. When you have one of these two, either pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction, survival is somewhere in between. So always look for pulmonary hypertension. It's not enough to just look for pulmonary hypertension. It's also important to look for the etiology of the pulmonary hypertension. So, for example, here you will see pulmonary hypertension associated with left heart disease. Yes, it has a poor prognosis, but much better than pulmonary hypertension associated with the lung disease. So our patients do the worst of all. Pulmonary hypertension associated in group one, that is pulmonary arterial hypertension, does somewhere in between. You take group one pulmonary hypertension itself and you can see various different outcomes. Patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension have the best outcome of all, while patients with pulmonary veno-occlusive disease have the worst outcome of all. So again, you can see very, very poor survival in patients in group one pulmonary hypertension, depending on which is the etiology of the pulmonary hypertension. So one is, please look for pulmonary hypertension, please look for the etiology, but also look for the functional class. What do I mean by functional class? It's very similar to the NYHA classification that you all all learned in your first clinical year. When there is no limitation of activity, it's group one. When there is severe limitation of activity, where any activity causes symptoms, or the person has overt right heart failure, that is group four or class four. In between, you have class two and three, just like the NYHA classes. Why is this important? Because survival depends on the functional class. The worse the functional class, the worse the survival. You can see that patients with a functional class four, those who are symptomatic at rest, have a median survival of just about a year, while patients with a functional class two have a median survival which is much better than that. In fact, most of them are alive at three years or more. One of the things we know, and this is obvious, is that the functional class correlates with a six-minute walk distance, which we all do. So when you have a worse functional class, you obviously have a shorter six-minute walk distance. Why is this important? Because when you test your patients, you can predict what functional class they belong to. And we know that functional class correlates with mortality. So six minute walk distance helps you to predict mortality outcomes. So what do we do? We initially suspect pulmonary hypertension based on symptoms, signs and history. And what do we look for? We look for, does this person have breathlessness? Does this person have easy fatigability? Does this person have signs of right heart failure? All these may be seen in our patients with lung disease. But when these are out of proportion to what we expect given the severity of lung disease, it usually means that they have comorbid pulmonary hypertension 
or complicating pulmonary hypertension. Based on this, we decided to do an echo. And on an echo, we can decide if a person has a high or at least an intermediate probability of pulmonary hypertension or a low probability of pulmonary hypertension. If the person has a low probability, you consider other causes and you investigate for the other causes or just follow up the person. However, if there's a high or intermediate probability, then we look for left heart disease, we look for lung disease and so on by a variety of investigations, which I will not refer to. At some point, if you're not very sure, please refer to a pH expert center where they will do the further investigations, including a right heart catheterization and decide on treatments depending on whether you some specific diagnostic test like looking for connective tissue disorder turn positive or we have to look for other causes. We usually start with an, start with an echocardiogram. An echocardiogram, the beginning, I must tell you, is not always right. In fact, you get a difference between the pulmonary artery systolic pressure measured at right heart catheterization and by echocardiography. And you'll find that there's a 10 millimeter difference or more in almost 50% of patients. How do we improve this prediction value it has been now given in the 2015 and subsequent 2022 echo, uh, sorry, ESC ERS guidelines of pulmonary hypertension. So the first thing we look at is the pulmonary tricuspid regurgitation velocity. Very often, this is the only thing looked at, unfortunately. If the peak TR velocity is less than 2.8, but it's not measurable, then if there are no other echo signs of pulmonary hypertension, you could be pretty sure that this person doesn't have pulmonary hypertension. The echo probability is low. On the other hand, if the uh, peak TR velocity is more than 3.4, almost definitely you have a very high probability of having pulmonary hypertension. The problem comes in between. If you have somebody with a TR velocity uh, of 2.9 to 3.4, then you have to look for other pH signs. If the person has other echo signs of pH, then you'll say, yes, there's a very high probability. The person doesn't have any other echo signs, but your TR velocity is between 2.9 and 3.4. Or if the initial TR velocity was low, but there were other TH, uh, pH signs, then you have an intermediate probability of pulmonary hypertension. So we look at low, intermediate, and high. So you can see that looking for other pH signs is very important, and you need to persuade your echocardiographer or cardiologist to look for these other echo signs and not just measure the TR velocity. What are these signs? I won't go into the details too much, but I'll tell you that you'll have to look at the ventricles, how the ventricular diameter at the base compares with the left ventricle diameter at the base, and is it wider than the LV? Second is, see if the IV septum is flattened and therefore your IV, uh, sorry, your LV looks like a D rather than looking like an oval as it normally does. You'll have to measure the RV uh, outflow Doppler acceleration and you look for uh, pulmonary regurgitation also. And finally, you look at the IVC diameter. That's something that's routinely done. How is the diameter of the IVC and what is its variability with respiration? So all these help us decide whether we are looking at the other echo signs of pulmonary hypertension. So you put all these together and decide whether you have a good probability of pulmonary hypertension, a low probability, or it's somewhere in between. So I'll stop at this point for the first session and say there are some important learning points. So when treating a patient with breathlessness and fatigue, especially if it is out of proportion, Consider that they have pulmonary hypertension, identify the etiology, assess the functional status, check the six-minute walk distance, and confirm by echocardiography whether there is pulmonary hypertension or not. This should be done initially when you're working up the patient and ideally at each follow-up because these are all easily reproducible. And remember that the etiology, you can always get new signs which will change your assessment of the etiology of this patient. So every time the patient comes back, Please look for all these. Remember that most studies of the drugs that we have in pulmonary hypertension have been done in pulmonary arterial hypertension. What is pulmonary arterial hypertension? Remember, it's different from pulmonary hypertension. It's applied specifically only to group one pulmonary hypertension, and only a minority of pulmonary hypertension is due to pulmonary arterial hypertension. The vast majority come into group two and group three, secondary to lung disease 
and secondary to left heart disease. When you have PH and PH, they have different etiologies, they have different treatments and different prognosis, as I've already shown you. And the pulmonary vasoactive medications like the endothelial receptor antagonists, the PDE5 inhibitors and so on, have been proven to be useful only in group 1 PAH and not in most pulmonary hypertension. And there was a good study published two years ago in the pulmonary circulation which showed that when you put patients in group 2 and group 3, that is heart disease and lung disease, on pulmonary vasoactive medications, you actually had worse outcomes. So the red is patients who were exposed to a pulmonary vasodilator. The black is whether they were not exposed to a pulmonary vasodilator. And you can see that survival was poorer in patients who received this medication as compared to patients who did not receive this medication. And this was almost a overall a 14 to 15 percent worse survival when you had patients giving given these vasodilator drugs. So please be very careful about deciding just because a person has pulmonary hypertension on using pulmonary vasoactive medication. So that's the key learning point I want to emphasize. Don't hesitate to use pulmonary vasoactive medications early in group 1 pulmonary hypertension, that is PAH. Do not use PAH medications in group 2 and 3, except with expert guidance and close monitoring, and that will be the next part of my talk. Having confirmed a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, that's group 1, what do you do next? Remember that we have defined treatments only in group 1 and group 4. In group 4, it is surgery. And in group one, it's the drugs that we're going to be speaking about soon. But the optimal treatment is not very clear in group two, group three, and group five, except to treat the primary disease. And that's what we have to do, treat the primary disease. What are the pathways that cause pulmonary hypertension in group one? And these will also be the main targets for treatment. The first pathway is the endothelin pathway. The endothelin uh, molecule works on receptors called the endothelin receptor A and B. Endothelin receptors trigger off vasoconstriction and proliferation in the smooth muscle cell of the pulmonary vessels. So what happens when you use an endothelin receptor antagonist, whether it's selective to ETA or it's a dual receptor blocker, is it prevents vasoconstriction, in short it causes vasodilatation, and prevents proliferation which underlies group 1 pulmonary hypertension. So they are vasodilatory and anti-proliferative in action. The same thing happens with the nitric oxide pathway. Nitric oxide triggers the conversion of GTP, guanosine guanine triphosphate, into cyclic GMP. And PDE5 breaks down cyclic GMP into ordinary GMP, uh, guanosine monophosphate. So what we do is we can stimulate the production of GTP, making it cyclic GMP using soluble guanylate cyclase and this works through reosiguat. On the other hand, you can prevent the breakdown of cyclic GMP by inhibiting PD-5 inhibitors and you can increase the production of this with uh, remaining there to have vasodilatory and anti-proliferative actions. So you can use cyclic GMP, uh, increase cyclic GMP by either using reosiguat or preventing its breakdown using PDE5 inhibitors. The third pathway is the prostacyclin pathway. Now, the prostacyclin directly causes vasodilatation and antiproliferation, which is what happens with cyclic GMP also. So, what we do is we try and stimulate these receptors by using a prostacyclin analog or a non prostanoid IP receptor antagonist such as Celexipag. So, both these, you use agonists with endothelin receptors, you use an antagonist. And we have a variety of these that are available to us. I'm not going to go into the details. All of you know these drugs. So how do we use these drugs in group 1 pulmonary hypertension? Do you use them early or late? Do you use monotherapy or combination therapy? Are there any additional therapies that we can use? And what should we look out for? So early therapy provides benefits. You can see in this early study, as it was called, where they com compared early use of bosentan with placebo. And you can see the mean change in the six-minute walk distance starting very early, while at six months, patients who were receiving placebo received no uh, improvement. Their six-minute walk distance declined 
and therefore it was a good idea not to use these sorry somebody is calling me i'll shut it off so early uh, improvements were obtained when you use bosentan early rather than late early referral to a pulmonary artery hypertension specialty center also improved survival and this is probably because they received treatment early they had a right heart catheterization early and went on treatment early so you can see definite improvements in survival the blue curve as opposed to the red curve where they did not receive referral to a specialty center and you can see that patients who were referred early when they had early symptoms class 1 and 2 symptoms did much better than patients who received a uh, later diagnosis you can see the survival curves in patients who received early treatment as compared to this those who received late treatment so early mortality occurs in patients who had a morbidity event early so these were patients who had a mortality morbidity event early they also had a higher mortality the ones in blue whereas patients who did not have a morbidity event which took them to hospital or needed a change in treatment or required lung transplant early these patients had a much lower mortality than those who had one of these events again telling you that if you started treatment early you got much better outcomes and we saw this that when you put patients at a higher dose of mazepentam like 10 mg they did better than patients who received a lower dose of mazepentam but both no matter which dose did much better than patients who received placebo and this difference was obtained very early with within a couple of months you started to see a difference in event rates including mort mort mortality and the same was true of selexipag early differences rather than you know late improvements in outcomes we also learned that combination therapy works much better than monotherapy so these were people who received either ambrisenta or tadalafil the monotherapy pulled whereas when you gave them combination therapy they all did much better with event free survival and this difference again started very early and you can see that outcomes are much better when you use combination therapy no matter what drugs you use this was mazepentan as combination therapy along with background therapy and this was selexipag whether you use selexipag as monotherapy did better than placebo when you gave selexipag in addition to a pd5 inhibitor they did better than those who received placebo in addition to pd5 inhibitor again when you gave selexipag in addition to an endothelial receptor antagonist much better than when uh, they gave placebo in addition to endothelial receptor antagonist and when you gave selexipag in addition to dual therapy you got much better outcomes so what we are hearing now is that monotherapy is better than placebo dual therapy is better than monotherapy and placebo and triple therapy is better than monotherapy placebo and dual therapy so the earlier we get into dual therapy or triple therapy the better it is so we decide on dual therapy or triple therapy by doing a risk assessment and you can see that when you do a risk assessment and you use several criteria we use standard four criteria this is this orange bar outcomes are much better and you have good treatment free uh, transplant free survival when you have a good assessment done and you modify treatment according to these four criteria what are these criteria that have been pooled you can get this uh, calculator called the reveal light 2 risk calculator it's available on your smartphone you just put reveal light 2 you can get the risk score of these patients you can find this i'm not going to go into the details but all these are clinically available you have to just do a few uh, lab tests available everywhere and the others are clinical measurements what do we mean by risk score where you have a list a score of 5 or less it's a low risk 6 to 7 is intermediate risk 8 or more is high risk risk for mortality within 1 of 1 to 5 years so we're really looking at what is the mortality risk in these patients by using the risk scores there are more detailed risk scores such as given in the ESC ERS guidelines but these require invasive tests also hemodynamic measurements like the rap the uh, right right atrial pressure the uh, cardiac index and the mixed venous oxygen so these are more difficult to do and the outcomes are not very much better than using the reveal to uh, light to so based on this 
how do we approach a patient and treat them? First of all, make sure the pulmonary artery hypertension is confirmed by an expert center, which means you've ruled out group 2, group 3, and group 4 disease, a very, very important step in the management of these patients. All patients require some me general measures and supportive therapy. They could be on anticoagulants and so on. They undergo right heart catheterization. And during the right heart catheterization, an important step is acute vasoreactivity testing. If they are vasoreactive and certain criteria have been laid down, I won't bore you with those. These patients, and this accounts for less than 10%, and probably even less than 1% have consistent maintained vasoreactivity. They qualify for calcium channel blocker therapy using a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like uh, amlodipine or nifedipine. Most patients don't qualify for this. And then you have to define based on the risk score that I just showed you, whether they are low risk, intermediate, or high risk. Low risk patients, you can decide whether you just want to follow them up. Intermediate risk patients, certainly, and maybe even low risk patients, you usually put on oral combination therapy. A few patients who maybe cannot tolerate combination therapy can be put on initial monotherapy. If the patient falls into a high risk, you usually start them on triple therapy immediately. You reevaluate at three to six months and you try to move the patient at least one risk step lower. So if they were initially on an intermediate risk, you hope that, that they have moved to low risk. If they're initially at high risk, you hope they've moved to intermediate risk. If a patient is now in low risk category or the patient came to you already on therapy in the low risk category, you can just follow up on the same treatment every three to six months. However, if they remain in intermediate or high risk or if they move to a higher risk, you add on one step. If they were initially on monotherapy, you make it double. If they were on double therapy, you make it triple and you reassess again at three to six months. Still no response, you maximize the therapy and you do this stepwise. If they still remain in high risk, you refer for lung transplant evaluation. Remember that those who are at high risk initially itself start off with triple combination, which includes a prostacyclin analog. And if you do not have a response to these, you can switch between the different analogs and see which suits the patient better. But you're still not getting a response, refer early for lung transplant evaluation. And there are certain targets that you aim for, and you try to use these same measures to move the per person into a lower risk category. But if you're looking at the mean pulmonary artery pressure, we want to get the mean pulmonary artery pressure to 40 or less. And that is why the outcomes are much better when you manage to get them to 40 mean pulmonary artery pressure or less, while those who have a greater than 40 millimeters of mercury have a much worse outcome. And for those of us who started out treating pulmonary hypertension several years ago, we used to give an expected survival of 2.8 to 3 years. And you can see that now with current treatments, after enrollment in these studies, this was on hereditary pulmonary artery hypertension group 1, the cumulative survival rate is almost 100% when you can get them to a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 40 or more, even at 15 years. So it's amazing the change in survival that has happened, and I'll come back to this briefly. Can you use these pulmonary vasoactive drugs in other groups? In CTEF, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, we use it as a bridge to pulmonary endarterectomy. We can use it in inoperable patients, whatever the reason for in inoperability. And we've done a surgery, pulmonary endarterectomy, but they have persistent pulmonary hypertension. We use pulmonary vasoactive drugs. And what we usually use is Riosigwat. We can also use Macitentan. But the group we are particularly interested in, pulmonary vasoactive drugs in group 3, we have to differentiate because there are some patients who have lung disease but who have predominantly what looks like group 1 pulmonary arterial hypertension. They have changes in the arteries that are very similar to what we see in idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And this is particularly seen, for example, in connective tissue disease-associated pulmonary hypertension. So you've seen a lot of patients with uh, systemic sclerosis, they can present with predominantly pulmonary hypertension and very little lung involvement. There's another group with systemic sclerosis who present with predominantly ILD. So this is a classic group where you have to decide, am I dealing with predominantly group 1 or group 3 pH? How do we make this differentiation? We first look at their ventilatory function. If they have an FEV1 greater than 60% in a patient with COPD or an FVC greater than 70%, meaning very little restriction, 
in a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, then we know that the lung function is not very badly impaired. This is not likely to cause hypoxia, not likely to lead to pulmonary hypertension. Whereas these cutoffs of less than 60% FEV1 or less than 70% FVC in IPF and earlier in COPD, then it's very likely that the lung disease is causing the pulmonary hypertension. We go on to do a CT scan. If the CT scan shows only mild changes or modest changes, then it's more likely to be group 1 pulmonary artery hypertension. Whereas if it is very significant changes on a CT, a lot of the lung is involved, or the airways typically show changes, emphysematous changes, then you're most likely to be dealing with group 3 pH. You can also do a CPET. I'm not going to go into details of this. But for example, you're doing the CPET and the carbon dioxide remains low, normal, doesn't change, then you're probably dealing with group 1 pulmonary hypertension because it tells you that this person's ventilatory reserve is good. On the other hand, if the CO2 starts rising when you're doing the CPET, it means they have poor ventilatory reserve, means they have probably got lung disease, and that is responsible for the pH. So what you can do is you can use pulmonary vasoactive drugs in group 1 predominant pH, whereas you don't use those, then you just treat hypoxia and the primary lung disease in group 3 pH. Okay? The only change in this came about with the study called the increase study, a phase 3 RCT, not a very large study, but right heart catheterized and confirmed pulmonary hypertension in patients with ILD. They gave them inhaled pre preprostadil and found an improvement in the 6-minute walk distance and the NP pro BNP. Why is this probably effective? It's because it's inhaled. And we know that in group 3 pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary hypertension occurs because of early vasoconstriction, which is probably induced by hypoxia, something called hypoxia-inducible factor that causes vasoconstriction, smooth muscle proliferation. The areas that the uh, drug is being in, uh, delivered to when it's taken by inhalation is the better ventilated areas. So the initial attempt at vasoconstriction is to restore VQ match. Whereas if we now give a drug IV or orally, which carry, is carried to all parts of the lung, then areas where there is vasoconstriction, which is protective, is destroyed and VQ mismatch worsens. Whereas if it's taken through the inhaled route, it reaches the better ventilated areas where you want better perfusion and therefore it may improve outcomes. But this is still an early study. As I showed you, it's a small study. Let's not go into this slide, but I'll tell you that the future is very exciting. We've recognized many, many targets in pulmonary hypertension. Drugs are being developed, some already available, some still in development, looking at targeting these various different target uh, receptors and we hope that we'll see very very good outcomes and these are some of the potential targets that are being seen in patients with pulmonary hypertension so the future looks very very good i'll summarize my talk with this one slide which is again available in the esc ers guidelines of 2022 the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension globally is about one percent so that's a large large population pulmonary congestion in postcapillary pulmonary hypertension is one of the etiologies in group 3 and you get pulmonary vascular disease causing obstruction or obstruction in precapillary pulmonary hypertension so recognize precapillary and postcapillary pulmonary hypertension the classification group 1 pulmonary artery hypertension group 2 associated left heart disease group 3 associated lung disease group 4 associated pulmonary artery obstructions, typically chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and group 5, where there are multifactorial or unclear mechanisms. Group uh, 2 and 3 are very common and common. The other groups are rare. So you'll see a lot of these and look for them because these patients have the worst outcomes of all, especially group 3 pulmonary hypertension. What are the therapeutic strategies? In group 1, you can use pulmonary vasoactive drugs and lung transplant. In group 2 and 3, you treat the underlying condition, the left heart disease or lung disease. And you can treat with pulmonary vasoactive drugs in very few patients using expert guidance. In group 4, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, you use pulmonary endarterectomy or you can use balloon pulmonary angioplasty. And in few patients, you can use pulmonary vasoactive drugs. So I'll stop 
which showing you this very exciting slide. Over time, from 1981 to 85, the survival has improved dramatically from a less than three year, roughly two and a half year median survival. It's now more than 90% five year survival, which is excellent outcomes in patients with this previously a uh, devastating condition which was called a death sentence. I'll stop at this point, tell you there's light at the end of the tunnel, and this is a very exciting time to be treating patients with pulmonary hypertension. I'll stop, thank the chairpersons and uh, the audience, and of course, Dr. Geller for this opportunity given to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mulliman. Uh, that was an extraordinary talk. Uh, I think in the interest of time, uh, one question from the audience. Uh, Shwana? Yeah, uh, while uh, they are getting ready, I think my co-chair, Dr. Preeti, if you have anything to comment. Hi, sir. Good evening. That was a wonderful evening. coverage of uh, how to manage a case with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Dr. Preeti, it's so lovely to see you here as a chair. And I've watched your growth from your uh, UG days to PG days and now being a very, very good pulmonologist. Wonderful to see. It's an honor for me, sir. Same here. Dr. Vishwana. Right. So, uh, Thank you very much, sir, for the exhaustive talk, actually. Uh, even though it's late in the evening, you have st uh, managed to stay back and then answer uh, our questions, actually, and gave an exhaustive talk even at uh, 7 o'clock in the evening. Sir, uh, the question which I wanted to put you is, a lot of times we keep seeing uh, physicians and uh, like even pulmonologists and some people writing pulmonary artery hypertension medications for sleep apnea-related pH, which comes under uh, class 3. In fact, that's one of the essential tests that you should consider doing in a patient with pulmonary hypertension. I had a patient who was diagnosed as uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, but going into a history, I thought there was a suspicion on looking at her. We put her on treatment and every time she took her treatment regularly, that is the CPAP treatment, her pulmonary pressure, mean pulmonary artery pressure came down from 80 to 40. Then she'd get bored of using it, stop it, and it'd go back to 80. Every time, and this happened four times, I remember, in the course of about the four years that I was treating her, every time it would come down to 40 and stay there, the mean pulmonary artery pressure, which we know is good outcomes. But if she stopped using it, it would go back to 80. So it's a good indicator that in every patient with pulmonary hypertension, please look for the possibility of obstructive sleep apnea. Treat it if it is there. And very often, it may not become normal, but it certainly improves outcomes. Sir, if you feel that uh, the patient is having a significant sleep apnea and uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension due to sleep apnea, in spite of uh, treating with uh, CPAP machine, if your pulmonary artery pressures are high, would you recommend an vasodilator therapy after CPAP in this set, subset of patients? Absolutely. I would definitely try it, but monitor very carefully, as I said. The danger is you could drop the pulmonary pressures very badly. You could drop the systemic pressures very badly. So it's important to monitor them carefully. But yes, you've tried everything else and you know you have a suspicion that it's not coming down adequately and there are other evidences that I showed you, then I think I would definitely use pulmonary vasoactive medication. Yeah, but I, you. ideally, you should do a, a right heart catheterization before that. Yeah. So, do we do right at, we, we can do that, right, sir? Here, you know, Dr. Rajiv, question to that. Yeah, uh, we uh, quite routinely do uh, right heart cath. Actually, uh, when we do right heart cath, the amount of information which it gives is extraordinary. I think uh, just uh, uh, one comment, sir, with your permission, uh, because there are a lot of young minds here. Uh, being a cardiologist, uh, we come across a lot of patients who are diagnosed as PH. Uh, please remember that group 1 pH is almost a diagnosis of exclusion. And uh, here, uh, certain things, especially high output uh, heart failures, is something which is routinely missed. We have had uh, patients who have been diagnosed as idiopathic pH, uh, who were having beriberi, uh, patients who had Abernathy malformation, patients who had uh, peripheral AV fistula. A very simple thing of just measuring the blood pressure and seeing the pulse pressure. If it's a high pulse pressure, a prominent ejection systolic murmur in the pulmonary area, 
these uh, simple measures actually can immediately give us a clue that there is something else going on. It's not just idiopathic pH. And it's a completely reversible condition. No drugs are needed. Just uh, treat that reversible condition and the patient becomes all right. Uh, one other uh, thing which we have come across is the issue of missing CTEF. So uh, there is a common misconception that CTPA actually rules out a CTEF. It doesn't. And uh, it's absolutely necessary that something like a VQ scan should be done or a pulmonary angiogram should be done to make sure that we have ruled out CTEF. Again, here we have burnt our fingers, we ourselves have made mistakes, CTEF missed and it's a totally reversible condition, a good center, they do surgery and the patient becomes completely alright and leads a normal, uh, as a normal lifespan. So these two aspects I think is uh, something where we have committed mistakes, we have seen others commit mistakes and uh, uh, that's something we can learn from others and uh, probably save many lives. And uh, don't uh, just dump them saying that they have a irreversible condition from which uh, they cannot uh, uh, come out of. So, so. Well uh, said, sir. I completely agree. And it's much commoner than we think it is CTEF. In fact, every week in our multidisciplinary meet, we discuss four to five cases of CTEF. So it's a very, very common condition. Should not be missed, as you said. And as you said, you know, we've had patients with a AV fistula for dialysis, many of whom go into pulmonary hypertension and just taking down that fistula helps so much. Well said, sir. So one more thing, actually, we have had the patients, if you remember, Dr. Rajiv will remember, we have had patients who had pulmonary arterial hypertension, a normal transthoracic echo, there was no atrial septal defect. However, because of a fixed split, uh, we had gone for a trans uh, esophageal echo and we found that there was an uh, ASD, actually, which was not picked up on the transthoracic uh, echo. I, I became aware from Dr. Rajiv that there are certain ASDs which do not get picked up on the transthoracic echo. So every PAH patient, uh, should we make a point to do a transesophageal echo or what are the subset of patients in which we should do a transesophageal echo? Yeah, uh, very interesting points again, uh, Vishwanath. Uh, basically, if you do a simple bubble contrast, that gives a lot of information. Just do a simple bubble contrast. No pH uh, should have an echocardiogram done and go off without doing a bubble contrast. Okay. There are a lot of things which we miss. Then, of course, uh, the clinical suspicion, uh, having an ECG which shows a right bundle branch block, all these things, again, uh, will help you in uh, suspecting that there is a sinus venosus ASD, is something which we tend to miss on a trans uh, thoracic echocardiogram. And that, again, should be uh, part of a routine protocol. So, bubble contrast should become a protocol, basically, in all the things. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, you can understand that uh, even at this time, there's a lot of excitement. <laughs> and I think uh, the whole thing uh, became more exciting with your wonderful talk. And uh, again, thank you so much for uh, 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 sparing your time and then enlightening us about uh, so many aspects about uh, pH, including diagnosis and management. I think with that, uh, you, we'll move on yeah. to the next talk. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. you have one... Thank you, sir. Bye. We have one last talk, I think. One last talk. The last topic for the day is very important for the postgraduates and also our daily practice. That is how to approach a patient with interstitial lung disease. To tell us about the same, we have Dr. Shajal Duria, Associate Professor of Pulmonary Medicine from... So, interstitial lung diseases in India, and we uh, derived our data from our own study at the PGI Chandigarh of about 2,000 subjects and uh, combining it with about a thousand subjects from the ILD India registry. In our registry, amongst the 2000 subjects, the most common interstitial lung disease was sarcoidosis, which occurred in 37% of the patients. Next was connective tissue disease related ILD, which was seen in about 19%. Then 17% was idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This was hypersensitivity pneumonitis in about 14% and 13% of the ILDs our other ILDs or miscellaneous ILDs. In the ILD India registry uh, published about four years back, hypersensitivity pneumonitis was the predominant interstitial lung disease in that multicenter registry of about 1000 subjects. We also calculated based on uh, the spectrum seen in our region, the annual incidence and prevalence of interstitial lung disease. There have been no data available from India till date. And this is these are the first data. So. Uh, if you take ILDs as a whole, uh, the annual incidence in our region was about 10 to 20 per 100,000 uh, subjects. 
or 100,000 population. And the prevalence was 50 to 100 per 100,000 uh, population in the Tri-City region consisting of Chandigarh, Panchkula and Mohali. Moving on to the clinical evaluation of interstitial lung disease. History is uh, one of the most important uh, things in finding out the subtype of ILDs and certain features in history affect our thinking of where uh, we are taking the subtype diagnosis towards. So if it's a patient who is uh, in his young adulthood, uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 years, you would come across more of sarcoidosis, connective tissue disorder related ILDs, hypersensitivity and neuronitis, and certain familial ILDs and cystic ILDs. In the middle age group or 40 to 60 years, you will have hypersensitivity and neuronitis and CTD ILDs predominantly, in, but also uh, there will be a lot of patients with sarcoid in this subgroup also. And then other uh, diseases like smoking related ILDs might come up in this age bracket. And if it's an elderly or older individual, more than 60 years, you would suspect IPF, idiopathic and SIP, but some of the fibrotic HP might also present in this age. Gender is an important discriminant. So certain disorders like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, occupational lung diseases, PLCH and rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD occurs more commonly in men, while connective tissue disease related ILDs, uh, most of them except for RILD, sarcoidosis and LAM occur in women. The onset of symptoms can give us a clue on the ILD subtype. So certain ILDs present acutely or subacutely, like organizing pneumonia, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, acute interstitial pneumonia, certain CTD ILDs, and sometimes even sarcoidosis. Uh, some ILDs will have a chronic or indolent course, typically uh, with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and idiopathic NSIP. You see a very chronic course over months to years. Even some sarcoidosis patients present over, uh, with uh, symptoms that uh, extend to months to years. Pneumoconiosis is often in CDS and occurs over years. Uh, one disease which can present in any fashion acutely in a subacute manner or chronic in, chronically in, and in CDSly, it is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Moving on to a clinical approach to diagnosis of interstitial lung disease and we'll discuss certain thumb rules. And we'll also go through a stepwise approach to the diagnosis of ILDs and its subtype. So first of all, one has to identify the presence of interstitial lung disease in the clinic. And uh, that can be done with what I call the three, four, five rules. So ILDs are characterized by three important symptoms, prolonged cough, dyspnea, and sometimes fatigue is an important symptom even without the other two. There are four important signs which should be looked at in a patient with interstitial lung disease or a suspected interstitial lung disease. And those are typically crackles, clubbing in advanced disease, uh, signs of pulmonary hypertension again in advanced disease and hypoxemia at rest or an exertion is a very typical feature of uh, interstitial lung involvement. Five initial investigations which can be done in a patient suspected to have ILD would be spirometry and chest radiograph followed by a thin section chest computer tomography or CT chest, and a diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide and six-minute walk test also add to physiological data. The next step, once you identify an ILD, one has to exclude any particular, uh, any particular uh, known causes of interstitial lung disease, and there I call it the CDEF rule. So one has to rule out connective tissue disorders, any drug exposure related to the onset of interstitial lung disease, environmental exposures, and familial disease. Uh, so CTDs can be identified uh, with the help of history. So certain features like joint pains are common to all, uh, in, all CTDs, uh, while features like joint swelling, morning stiffness, or deformities occur typically with rheumatoid arthritis. Raynaud's phenomenon, skin thickening, and puffy fingers are features of systemic sclerosis and mixed connective tissue disorder. Muscle weakness occurs with myositis. Oral ulcers malaria are typical of SLE and dry eyes and dry mouth are typical of Sjogren's syndrome. Certain drugs may be associated with interstitial lung diseases like uh, most of the chemotherapeutic agents, but especially bleomycin, immunosuppressants, especially methotrexate, and sometimes even other immunosuppressants can cause diffuse lung abnormalities. 
antibiotics like nitrofurantoin, which is used for uh, prolonged therapy in UTI, amiodarone used for cardiac arrhythmias, and statins. Uh, there are a host of drugs which can cause uh, abnormalities uh, in the pulmonary interstitium, and one can always have a look at this website, pneumotox.com, which gives which summarizes the drug toxicities from the lung point of view. Exposure-related ILD is a very important cause of ILD in India. Uh, the first is smoking, which would cause idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, RB, ILD, and DIP. But other uh, exposures like to birds, farm dust, cattle dust, molds can cause hypersensitivity and immunitis. Occupational history would be very important in this particular uh, section of history taking. And then uh, a history of exposure to radiation is also important, which can uh, cause uh, acute, subacute, or late radiation pneumonitis. So whenever we are asking about environmental exposures, we must always ask the entire lifelong occupation or employment of the patient, uh, because even past uh, occupations might be related to the appearance of ILD today. So farmers, factory workers, stone quarry workers are uh, predisposed to uh, having occupational interstitial lung diseases. Certain hobbies can be associated, for example, keeping of birds, and certain pets may be associated with hypersensitivity and immunitis. Uh, it's important to ask the occupation hobbies of spouse and family members because they might bring in the occupational dust to their homes and cause diseases to their family member. Exposure to air conditioners, humidifiers, hot tubs, water damage to walls and carpets, dam falls, construction and demolition dust have all been associated with hypersensitivity and immunitis. But as these are very common exposures in day-to-day -day life, one should always make sure that there is a definite temporal correlation uh, with the exposure to uh, the symptoms or the onset of disease. Family history is important because familial IPF and sarcoidosis may also be sometimes familial. Certain diseases may be inherited in, uh, as a Mendelian inherited uh, inheritance disease. Uh, so IPF, uh, familial IPF, tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis may be inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, while Nyman pick disease, Bosch's disease, Hermann's Kaplan syndrome can be there as an autosomal recessive disease. So after history taking comes the step of physical examination and one should examine to identify ILD. So basal fine crackles like a Velcro are very typical of IPF, especially early in the disease. But as the disease progresses, the reticulation becomes coarser and so do crackles. So crackles also become more coarse and other IAPs sarcoidosis and HV might also have somewhat coarser, coarser crackles. Then findings may be present in the upper and anterior part in sarcoidosis and HV as these are upper low predominant diseases, but sometimes these two diseases uh, can have absolutely normal auscultation. If there is wheeze, it can occur in ILDs which involve the airways, especially sarcoidosis, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, smoking related uh, IPs and uh, combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, the so-called CPFE. Uh, late inspiratory bronchians, walks are very typical of HP, but they might sometimes occur with bronchiolitis also. The next step uh, would be examining for identifying any CDDs. If uh, you have been able to pick up certain symptoms of CDD in the history, that's well and good, but also examine for any signs which could have been missed by the patient. So hands are a very important guide to CDD examination. They can give you clues like calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomena, arthritis and joint deformities, mechanic hands and gotron spapules, puffy fingers, clerodactyly and skin thickening and digital ulcers can be remembered by the mnemonic cramps. Uh, the face is the next most important organ to or part, body part to look at. So puckered faces can occur with systemic sclerosis, heliotrope rash can occur with uh, dermatomyositis, malar rash can occur in patients with SLE. And then in a busy OPD, you can just make the patient stand from the squatting position to examine for any significant proximal muscle weakness. And also you can make the patient raise the arms over the head to do the same for the upper limbs. So the next step after history and physical examination would be certain investigations which can be obtained in all patients with ILDs or suspected ILDs. So the first step is to have a chest radiograph followed by a spirometry. But the most important investigation in ILD diagnosis is a high resolution CT scan or a thin section uh, CT with high resolution reconstruction. Certain autoantibodies can be obtained in all patients with ILD. We typically obtain rheumatoid factor and antinuclear 
antibodies to uh, give us a clue on the presence of any CTD if something has been missed on history or examination. Uh, pulse oximetry and six minute walk test along with looking at the ex post exertion desaturation are very important tests in elderly patients and then certain routine tests should be obtained uh, because uh, any prescription of drugs would anyways need these tests. They also can be used to look at certain uh, comorbidities in these patients. In selected patients based on the suspicion the following tests can be obtained so certain autoantibodies linked to specific CDDs, for example, anti-SCL70, anti-PMHCL for scleroderma, anti-JO and other myositis specific uh, antibodies for anti-synthetase syndrome or myositis related ILD, anti-RO and anti-LA for Sjogren's syndrome. Then uh, nowadays good uh, quality panels are available uh, which look at specific IgG for hypersensitivity pneumonitis by using fluorescence immunoassay. And if there is a suspicion of HP, the same can be obtained. Diffusing capacity in lung volumes uh, may not be done in all patients, but mostly if DLC, if a good quality DLC is available in your lab, better to go for it because it helps to monitor the disease over long term. Arterial blood gases in advanced patients with hypoxemia. Uh, echocardiograph in right heart catheterization for comorbidities and for looking at pulmonary hypertension and other tests for specific etiologies. The next step in the and the most important step in ILD subtype diagnosis is imaging. A thin section that is 1.5 millimeter or less collimation CT chest is the most important investigation. A volumetric acquisition is preferred rather than uh, discrete sections done at intervals. Expiratory scans should be obtained in all patients to look at small airway disease. And prone scans are required only if there is early basal disease that is giving you an indeterminate pattern. So interpretation of HRCD is a full lecture in itself, but I'll give you just certain tips. So a patterned approach should be followed. Look, one should look at abnormalities with increased attenuation and abnormalities with a decreased attenuation. So abnormalities that cause an increased attenuation include linear and reticular opacities, nodules or nodular opacities, and parenchymal opacification or consolidation. While decreased attenuation is caused by cystic lesions or emphysema, mosaic perfusion or air trapping that is seen on expiratory scans. So linear and uh, reticular opacities are the most important, which uh, can be characterized as reticulation, which may be coarse or fine reticulation, the so-called interlobular or intralobular septal thickening. So this is interlobular septal thickening, a kind of coarse reticulation. This is fine meshwork-like lacy pattern, which is called intralobular interstitial thickening. Then there can be peribronchovascular thickening along the bronchial and vascular bundles. And honeycombing typically starts from the periphery with a uh, multiple stacks of cystic spaces suggestive of uh, a fibrotic process as opposed to the common lung cyst which does not suggest fibrosis. So this is a CT showing typical interlobular septal thickening. So these are large interlobular septa which are clearly thickened. This is a more meshwork like pattern of intralobular septal thickening. So you see this fine lacy network like pattern, uh, which is uh, called intralobular septal thickening. And honeycombing is just like the honeycomb of a honeybee. So it is just stacks of these cystic spaces arising from the periphery. Peribronchovascular uh, thickening occurs along the bronchovascular bundle. So this is a bronchus, there's a vessel, and along this, there's a thickening which is nodular. So there are nodules over this thickened peribronchovascular septum. This is ground glassing, which is opacific, airspace opacification in the form of haziness, which does not obscure the underlying details of the vascular network. So this is all ground glassing. This is consolidation, where there is airspace filling with uh, complete obliteration of the underlying vessel. So you cannot see vessels beyond this particular part of parenchymal opacification, and you can also see air bronchograms. So, uh, whenever you are interpreting a CT in the context of an interstitial lung disease, always look at the distribution of the abnormality, the predominant abnormality, and then the other abnormalities. And the first step would be to differentiate UIP from other or non-UIP patterns. So, a UIP pattern or usual interstitial pneumonia pattern consists of a subpleural basal predominant disease, where the predominant abnormality is a retical, retical abnormality or reticulation. There is also presence of honeycombing with or without traction bronchiectasis. 
And then there is absence of features which are listed as inconsistent with UIP. So what are the features which are inconsistent with UIP? They are discrete cysts, micronodules, upper or mid lung predominance, peribronchovascular predominance, any extensive ground glass opacities, mosaic attenuation or air trapping, if it is diffuse, and consolidation, which can be segmental or lobar. Because all these different abnormalities point towards diagnosis, which take us away from UIP or IPF. And this can be remembered as, uh, because I'm uh, talking at the AIG hospital, I would say AIG is an excellent, has an excellent chest medicine unit in a predominantly gastro-medical center. So you can easily remember this uh, particular uh, features inconsistent with UIP with this mnemonic. Uh, so, uh, so what kind of pattern this is? Is this UIP or NSIP? So first we'll look at the distribution of abnormality. So this is the upper lobe, this is the middle part of the lung, and these are the lower lobes. So it's clearly a lower lobe predominant disease. And uh, what is a predominant abnormality? Predominant abnormality is in the form of this lacy fine net pattern. Which is consisting, uh, which consists of reticulation or intralobular septal thickening. So there is basal predominant. It is also subpleural disease. Lot of subpleural disease, and the central parts of the lung are relatively spared. So basal subpleural disease with reticulation. Also there is traction bronchiectasis here, and some bit of honeycombing can be seen in this part of the lung parenchyma. Also some early honeycombing here, some honeycombing here. So this is a pattern which is consistent with definite UIP. Again, a similar pattern with reticulation, which is basal predominant, subpleural predominant, and absence of other features like cysts, peribronchovascular thickening, or uh, micronodules, or profuse, uh, profuse uh, ground glassing. And so this, again, fits with a definite UIB pattern. While this particular pattern is more central, it is pairing the subpleural parenchyma. It is consisting of mostly ground glassing and some interstitial thickening in the form of interlobular septal thickening. And so this is a non-specific interstitial pneumonia pattern. <coughs> this particular pattern has lots of peripheral consolidation, which is patchy in some places. And so it is called the organizing pneumonia pattern. This is the typical atoll sign or reverse halo sign of organizing pneumonia, where there is ground glassing surrounded by an arc of consolidation. And this is a pattern where you see a lot of fine ground glass nodules, which are distributed randomly or diffusely. And there are also these areas of decreased attenuation, which are uh, called areas of mosaic attenuation in or expiratory on an expiratory scan, they would be called air trapping. So this is a typical pattern of non-fibrotic HP. While fibrotic HP would have upper low predominant disease, upper and mid zone predominant with reticulation and traction bronchiectasis. Some part is also showing a lot of honeycombing. And then there is also uh, features of uh, small airway disease in terms of mosaic attenuation in the lower part of the lung. This is a pattern of sarcoidosis with bilateral hilar enlargement, uh, suggestive of lymph nodes, and uh, a lot of peribronchovascular thickening or uh, more central thickening. And on a CT, you can see this typical nodular peribronchovascular thickening. So once you have got the imaging, then with the history examination, autoantibodies and imaging, you'll be able to point out the diagnosis in most of the cases. But at some places, you will not be able to pinpoint an ILD subtype diagnosis and there a lung biopsy may be needed. Previously, a surgical lung biopsy was considered the gold standard for diagnostic confirmation of ILDs, but it is not no longer the same. Uh, so when can we do without a biopsy in interstitial lung diseases? So whenever the clinical context and CT chest pattern and other laboratory details give you a confident diagnosis, for example, uh, when the CT is consistent with a definite UIP pattern and the patient is, say, uh, an old smoker, then IPF would be the likely disease. A CTD-related ILD would not need a biopsy because there, finding out the ILD, uh, the ILD pattern would not help change the management. So it is not worth the risk. And hypersensitivity pneumonitis with a typical CT with typical exposure history would also not need a biopsy to be performed. So what is the role of transbronchial lung biopsy in ILDs? It is useful in patients suspected of sarcoidosis, non-fibrotic HP, organizing pneumonia, and certain other diseases where special tests can be done to look at uh, 
uh, special, with special stains and immunohistochemical analysis to look at certain diseases. It also helps exclude mimics of IITs like infections and malignancy, especially lymphangiitis, carcinomatosis, but it has no role in the diagnosis of idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. When to go in for a surgical lung biopsy? When there is an indeterminate pattern on HRCT chest, when it is mostly uh, early uh, subpleural disease, other IIPs, fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, and if there is a failed diagnosis on forceps, uh, flexible forceps lung biopsy, then you can go in for a surgical lung biopsy. But as an alternative to surgical lung biopsy, this procedure has come up in the last decade, which is called the cryoprobe lung biopsy or bronchoscopic lung cryobiopsy, which has an yield of about 80 to 85 percent. And it has advantages over SLP in terms of having less comorbidity and complications and less mortality. So it, as compared to a TBLB, a cryobiopsy gives you a very good tissue from the lung, which gives you a very good histopathological picture. Uh, if we compare all these three techniques, the yield is about 85% with TBLC, 65% with TBLB, and 95% with the VATS biopsy. But with the VATS, there is a 2.3% mortality risk, and all of these patients will require an ICD after the procedure. So TBLC might be a good balance between yield and complications. Other bronchoscopic samples like bronchial alveolar lavage might help sometimes in the diagnosis of HP and sarcoid. And endobronchial biopsy and EVAS TBNA can be obtained in stage 2 and stage 1 sarcoidosis. So the final step after we have obtained all the relevant data would be a multidisciplinary discussion where a team of pulmonologists, thoracic radiologists and pulmonary pathologists should discuss all these details and one can also include a rheumatologist if required. In patients with typical clinical and HRCT features of a DPLD, for example, IPF, a typical case of sarcoidosis, a typical HP, an MDD is not required. It is required only in cases where there's a challenge, where there are conflicting data. So uh, there I end my lecture, the stepwise approach, uh, which I have elaborated on. And so the take home message from my lecture is that interstitial lung diseases are a heterogeneous group of disorders with common clinical, radiologic, physiologic, and pathologic manifestations. They are grouped as autoimmune-related, exposure-related, uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, cyst and air spilling, air space filling-related, and sarcoidosis. Uh, then sarcoidosis, CTD, ILDs, IPF, HP, and non-IPF IIPs are the most common ILDs in India in that order. Uh, a good clinical history, especially including the history of smoking, occupational and environmental exposures, drugs and radiation, and features of CDs is crucial for accurate diagnosis. A thin section CT or a high resolution CT is the single most important diagnostic investigation. First of all, you should make an effort to uh, differentiate a UIP pattern from other patterns. And then a lung biopsy should be obtained in appropriate cases with the correct modality. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, sir, for a very extensive and in-detail presentation. You made it very simple and easy. I'm sure all the postgraduates can now identify the patterns on HRCT and how to look for clinical features and uh, evaluate for the etiology. Any questions or comments from the audience? Pattern recognition definitely for the sake of PGs actually. We have archived all the talks in the YouTube actually. Uh, so you can always go back and see all the talks. I know it has been very exhaustive for all of you actually. From morning 9 o'clock till now 8.30 now. So I appreciate all of you for staying back patiently and listening. But I think definitely it's going to help you in your uh, uh, exams and also to improve your uh, concepts in the subject. Whoever has uh, spoken till now actually as all, they're all experts in their particular fields actually so we have kept it in the aig hospitals youtube thing and you can go back and watch all of these things like the pattern recognition and everything that's it a lot of times we keep seeing that uh, patients with uip keep receiving steroids and patients who are having nsap receiving only antifibrotic and they do not are not on uh, uh, any steroids actually and as a result patients are not improving and they keep shopping from one place to other place so pattern recognition is going to be very very important i need to i think you need to revise all these topics once again all this maybe you can divide and then see them each at a day or so something like that 
any uh, inputs from your side uh, priti any any comments from the audience anything you wanted to know more about the uh, ild or anything if there are none then uh, we'll close the session so end of day one so i'd like to uh, invite dr vishnu sir to hand over the token of appreciation to dr priti and there is one small uh, announcement so today's uh, chest x ray spotters uh, talk is postponed to tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock okay so please be on time so tomorrow morning the session will be starting at 8 o'clock sharp so uh, tomorrow i request all the delegates to come by 8 o'clock so that uh, we can start on time and then uh, again we can leave early today actually i think um, uh, at 9 o'clock there was nobody in the hall actually which also caused a bit of delay so i would request all the delegates uh, to assemble here at 8 o'clock complete your breakfast early and then come here and the first session as dr kautam has mentioned is going to be very very interesting and in, in all your exam uh, actually in the viva you will be shown the exercise different exercise and uh, asked questions about if any of you don't answer the common exercise you will be failed in the examination so that is one thing we should keep in mind and then i think exercise everybody should come and listen this is going to be by dr ravindra babu sir uh, uh, break